Chapter 681 Homesickness The Pudu Mountain Sulphur Mine Shinjuku Camp is located on a volcanic rock platform not far from the magma waterfall. Not only were some slave sheds built here, but all the supplies that Serdak could not take away from the desert were piled here, of which the pasture for horses accounted for 10%. Covers a large area. Since there is a river of lava not far from here, magma splashes occur from time to time. These haystacks are arranged very scattered to prevent the haystacks from being connected together after being ignited. There are also many blood-stained leather armors ripped directly from the sand bandits in the sulfur mine camp. Because there were too many leather armors seized, Serdak transported them all back to the sulfur mines. There are about 50 kobolds here in the camp who are carefully cleaning these leather armors. They need to soak these leather armors in the pool to wash away the blood stains on them. The washed leather armors will harden and return to alkaline after being dried in the sun. Apply some horse oil evenly on it and it will effectively soften the leather nails. As for how to repair the leather armor, the leather workers in Alanza City need some advice. The grain stored by the sand bandits were not mainly wheat and chestnuts. They also stocked up on many beans, dried vegetables, dried meat, and cheese. Most of the food in their hands was snatched back from the pastures or mountains around the desert. So there were various types and everything was available. The sand pirates were not picky and they would plunder everything as long as it was edible. Now concentrated here in Soldak, there are many things that he has never seen before. If Luke hadn't said that these dried vegetable stews were extremely delicious, Soldak would have almost thrown these dried vegetables into the hay pile. Luke led the cobalt slaves and spent nearly half a month building a cement road between Paglos Mountain and Pussy Mountain. Later, a lumberyard was opened in the pine forest at the foot of the southern foothills of the Paglos Mountains. The cobalt slaves cut down some wood in the lumberyard and transported it back to Pussy Mountain in four-wheeled carriages. Although the horses were all killed by Serdak requisitioned. But these four-wheeled carriages were pushed and pulled by human power and used just as well. Everything is lacking here. But there is no shortage of cobalts on the cliff of the magma waterfall. These woods were used to build a Z-shaped ladder. This ladder made a total of 13 turns from bottom to top. The wooden frame was built vertically along the rock wall and immediately became the only way for the cobalt slaves to climb to the upper reaches of the lava river. Serdak walked out of the void gate and happened to see a group of cobalt slaves carrying sulfur or on their backs. Slowly walking down the stairs, a long line of cobalts climbed up and down the wooden stairs, looking like lava. The reserves of sulfur mines in the upper reaches of the river are very good. And the sulfur mines in the upper reaches are also easy to mine. Otherwise, there would never be such cobalt slaves carrying or every day. Now Luke has begun to lead a group of cobalt slaves again to build a cement road from here to the central pass of the Great Rift Valley. The last time Serdak saw him was a week ago. Aphrodite was lying on a flat volcanic rock. The rock was covered with a layer of soft fur. There was a bottle of wine next to her. She was holding a magic book and was fascinated by it. It seemed that she was living a good life here. Very pleasant. Serdak walked over and sat opposite Aphrodite, with a lazy and tired look on her beautiful eyebrows. In the recent period, Aphrodite did not know how many times she had used the summoning magic circle. Only then did Serdak move such a huge amount of materials to the sulfur mining camp. Didn't you say last time that you wanted to go with me to take a look in the lava mine? Serdak was going to feed the red dragon Izer and teach him rune number 33, which is the last rune. When? Once the red dragon Yisl has learned all 33 types of runes, he will have to learn simple rune languages. The previous few times, Serdak was in a hurry when he entered the lava mine, and had no time to take Aphrodite to visit the red dragon's secret room. Now that the war has come to an end, Serdak felt that he could take Aphrodite to visit the chamber. Rodi went to visit the secret room. He was really looking forward to what kind of expression Aphrodite would have when she saw Israel. Aphrodite raised her delicate eyebrows and said nonchalantly, What's so interesting? Could it be that there are any secrets in that lava mine besides red crystals and salamanders? Listening to what she said, I knew that she must have been to the lava mine recently. And she also discovered a group of salamanders deep in the mine. Wouldn't it be easier to find out if you go in and take a walk? Serdak smiled and said to Aphrodite. Aphrodite put down the magic book in her hand sat up from the rock, looked at Soldak curiously, and then asked after hesitation. You didn't come here at night this time. Weren't you in a hurry to move supplies? Are you saying this desert trip is over? Yeah. Soldak nodded and admitted. Aphrodite's eyes lit up. Her brows spread. And she said excitedly, So I don't have to stay here all the time? Sardak hesitated for a moment and said to Aphrodite, Oh, we have to hold on for two more days. 
If you want to leave here, you have to come back here in my place. Are you tired of living here? Come back as soon as possible. I'll be back from the desert in one week. Aphrodite was wearing a long black dress. She was sitting on the stone slab with her hands on her knees. She turned to look at the magma waterfall not far away and the lava river meandering at the foot of the mountain. However, she did not show any impatience. Sertica knew that she was a succubus who yearned for freedom and liked the outside world. If he hadn't led the team into the desert, he probably wouldn't have let her stay here. Aphrodite shook her head at Serdak. She shook her shoulders habitually. This was probably a habit she developed when she had flesh wings. Even if her flesh wings were chopped off, her body would become a little uncomfortable if she maintained one movement for a long time. I feel stiff and want to flutter my wings and stretch my muscles. Then Aphrodite withdrew her gaze and landed on Serdak's face before saying, Fortunately, the environment here is similar to that of the fiery hell. The sky is full of gray clouds, and there are volcanoes and lava everywhere. If it weren't for these cobalt slaves, I'm afraid this is an inaccessible place of death. Compared to the flame hell, there are no meteorites falling from the sky and no fission in the earth. So it is much safer than there. Seeing the embarrassment on Serdak's face, Aphrodite showed a rare look of nostalgia and said to Serdak, If I say that I am a little homesick, will you believe it? As she spoke, she stood up from the volcanic rock, raised her finger and pointed to the midway of Pudu Mountain, and introduced to Serdak, My home is on the mountainside on the northern slope of a volcano. Our succubus clan built a town there using volcanic rocks. Although the volcano is always erupting. Almost all the magma erupted from the crater flows to the south of the mountain and formed a magma lake there. And there are many fire-type monsters living in that lake. The hunters in our town mainly hunt the low-level monsters in that magma lake. She opened her hands, looked up at the sky where the volcanic ash was falling, and continued, Every time volcanic ash falls from the sky, it's like a heavy snowfall in a deserted land. Except that the snow is gray. Just like the volcanic ash here. Except that the volcanic ash is hot and will cause strong burning when it falls on the body. Feel. Serdak raised his hand and received a piece of volcanic ash that was falling down. The volcanic ash touched the palm of Serdak's hand and instantly collapsed into very fine ash. I can't feel the burning sensation that Aphrodite mentioned in my hand. It seems that the volcanic ash here is still very different from the volcanic ash in the Flaming Age. L. Seeing Serdak's silly look, Aphrodite smiled slightly and said, Meteorites fall from the sky every month near our town so everyone often needs to repair their houses. Occasionally, the mountains at their feet will crack. Over there, the land is very barren and can only be planted with some drought-tolerant night charms. There are always more boys and girls in the succubus clan. Each family is very large. My father has 23 wives and nearly 200 concubines. My mother has she as one of the concubines. She has lived a cautious life, without any freedom at all. And it seems that she has never left the volcano in her life. Serdak was a little surprised. He didn't expect that the men of the succubus clan actually lived like emperors. I can't help but ask, is the ratio of men to women in the succubus clan so disparate? Aphrodite explained. The disparity in the ratio of men to women is due to our tradition. The journey to adulthood for every male in the succubus clan is extremely difficult. Many people will die on that path of cultivation. Only the strongest luck, only the best warriors can come out of purgatory. Only the best male succubus has the right to choose a mate and he has the absolute right to choose. As long as the female succubus is chosen by these succubus warriors, there will be no rejection. Power. The elders of the succubus clan believe that only the descendants of these warriors can give birth to more powerful succubi. Serdak asked in shock. What kind of strength will a succubus come out of purgatory have? Based on the level of Warcraft, it can almost reach the level of the peak level for Warcraft. If calculated based on the combat power of the Imperial people, each of them is a second-level powerhouse, Aphrodite said. Is that why you want to go out for a walk? Soldek asked. Aphrodite shook her head slightly and said, All succubi want to leave HL, but I chose a completely different path, and I am the luckiest one among those succubi. She sat down again, facing the slowly flowing river of lava, with a look of infinite nostalgia on her face, and said with emotion, I have been out for so long, and I haven't felt anything. After I got here, I saw the gray clouds in the sky and the lava rivers all over the mountains and plains, only to realize that I miss home too. You're not leaving here and returning to the flame hell, are you? Serdak asked dumbfounded. Aphrodite rolled her eyes at Serdak as if she was looking at an idiot. 
reached out and patted her shoulder blades and said to Presley, These wings have been chopped off. How can I still go back? Besides, if you want to return to HL, you also need to connect to the passage. And it's not like you can just go back. Although Zoldak had no expression on his face, he was relieved in his heart. Aphrodite asked the cobalt slaves to build a very unique stone house out of volcanic rocks at the entrance of the lava mine. The roof was covered with wooden tripods, and there was even a wooden roof on top, just inside the entrance of the mine. Since the wind in the lava mine blows from inside the cave, there is no volcanic ash flying in at the entrance of the cave. Aphrodite did not follow Zerdak into the lava mine, but chose to continue reading outside. When Zerdak rushed to the treasure secret room, the red dragon Izer was already waiting impatiently in the secret room. When he saw Zerdak hurriedly walked in, he opened his big mouth and stretched his neck to Zerdak. The lower belly of the dragon let out a dull roar. Zerdak, I'm hungry. This is the most commonly used sentence among the several daily expressions that Israel has learned. With this loud roar, Zerdak felt as if a hurricane was blowing in front of him. And Israel sprayed saliva on his face with smoke and smoke. He felt that this guy might have just eaten some monster meat and the flesh and blood residue was still left between his teeth. How have you been lately? What's new? Soldak walked to Iser and greeted him cordially. There are many words that the red dragon Iser can't say, but that doesn't mean that he can't understand them. Eating a big bird. The red dragon Israel seemed a little proud. Every time he was proud, he would raise his chin high and his head would almost touch the roof of the treasure room. Is this bird very powerful? Sirdek said as he walked to the dragon egg to get the magic crystal inside. Israel could only keep nodding. It could not describe the big bird in imperial language yet. So it could only say very simply, It's big! By letting out a series of low roars. He seemed to be describing the big bird to Serdak. Unfortunately, Serdak couldn't understand Eser's language. After a brief exchange, Israel made Serdak understand that the bird he had eaten could fly very high, even above all the clouds. And the most important thing, was that the bird could actually control lightning. A bird that is good at controlling lightning and has a huge body. In Suldak's impression, only the Thunderbird has such strength. Boom. The red dragon Izer put his head on the high platform of the secret room and stared at Suldak curiously. Zerdak grabbed a magic crystal and said to the red dragon Izer, I guess what you ate may be a Thunderbird. It is said that each Thunderbird has three feathers that inherit the power of thunder and lightning. You didn't eat it in your stomach too. Did you? Israel shook her head in confusion. You may have to learn the language of runes today. Let's start with the simple ones. However, I haven't figured it out yet. I have to explore a little bit. Serdak said calmly. Serdak shook the magic crystal in his hand again and said, These may be real dragon language magic. But when you learn it, you must be restrained and don't destroy this place. Israel's head moved closer. Eyes widened. Staring at Serdak. Chapter 682 Triumph Soldak led the cavalry battalion to re-enter the desolate land full of gravel. A familiar scenery appeared in front of him. The veterans of the cavalry battalion broke away from the team one after another and rushed into the desolate land with their horses. No longer did half of my legs sink into the yellow sand every time I took a step. And walking became much easier. A group of knights rode ancient boli horses and ran happily on the hard ground. A few veterans were a little too excited. They rushed directly to the cliff of a fault mountain and crawled on the brown red rock mass. Regardless of the cold north wind, they pressed their faces against the rocks beneath them. It seemed that this was the only way to express their love for this place. Only their love for the land can express their inexplicable joy at walking out of the desert alive. A month ago, this group of veterans joined the cavalry battalion from various villages in the deserted land. After only three days of training in Wall Village, they followed Serdak into the desert. Serdak still clearly remembered when they left Wall Village on horseback embarrassed look. Their equestrian skills are also learned along the way. Before entering the desert, these veterans had just been able to sit firmly on their saddles and march quickly. They suffered a lot during the desert march. The sand bandits were superb equestrians. They circled around the desert with the veterans of the cavalry battalion. Only the mercenary group's mercenaries only Bing and Weilu can pose some threat to those sand bandits on horseback. But it was such a group of veterans of the cavalry battalion who personally drove the sand bandits into the depths of the desert leading them like bereft dogs. Before setting off, this group of veterans probably never thought that after chasing sand pirates in the desert for nearly two months, they would be able to step back into the desolate land. These veterans brought back a lot of trophies, including their thick leather armor and some precious metal accessories. 
They seemed impatient to go home and tell their relatives how many sand bandits they had killed on the battlefield this time. To the villagers in the deserted land. The sand bandits are like a pack of wolves that can wreak havoc in the deserted land at will. But now, in the eyes of the veterans of the cavalry battalion, this group of sand bandits is no longer scary. Serdak was riding a horse, standing in front of a group of reserve knights. As their immediate superior, Soldak was not satisfied with the performance of the young reserve knights on the battlefield this time. They did not show the professional qualities they had gained after studying and training in the knight academy, in addition to their proficiency in equestrian skills. Besides, there isn't even anything worthy of praise. This desert experience trip taught these 50 guard battalion reserve knights a lot. At least they had the ability to march alone and no basic marching knowledge such as setting up tents in the wild, cooking marching rations, and arranging sentries at night. The reserve knights raised their swords and light shields high and cheered loudly to return to the deserted land. For them, coming back alive was victory. They did not expect that this operation to clear up the sand bandits would last for nearly 50 days. Almost every reserve knight had their skin roughened by the cold north wind and the yellow sand. And their hands and thighs had a thick layer of calluses. No matter how poorly they performed on the battlefield. Among the 50 reserve knights. After all, there was not a single deserter who ran away from the battle. This outdoor experience may be regarded as a real experience trip during their graduation season. I don't know how many people were hiding in tents in such a difficult environment, listening to the howling of ghosts and wolves outside and howling in the north wind. I don't know how many people were holding powerful crossbows and almost lost their bile after firing in the face of the sand bandits. They all vomited it out. I don't know how many people got used to sitting around the fire burning the body of the sand bandit baking wheat cakes and drinking broth. No matter what, he finally came out of that desert with nothing. This is the greatest victory for the reserve knights. Entering the deserted land means that the mission of the CE Giant Mercenary Group has been successfully completed. Captain Gabriel Jerry was not prepared to return to Wall Village with Serdak's army. In order to leave a good impression on his sponsor, Baron Serdak, he planned to separate from the army led by Baron Serdak. Detouring from the east and west sides of the Great Rift Valley, you can search for small groups of sand bandits hiding in the deserted land along the way. If you encounter one, Captain Gabri doesn't mind helping to clean it up. Captain Gabri was thinking in his mind that this time, the Sea Giant Mercenary Group had earned almost 3,000 gold coins from Serdak. According to the current exchange ratio of gold coins to magic crystals of 1 to 7, it could probably be exchanged for 430 magic crystals. Crystal. With such a magic crystal, the Sea Giant Mercenary Group can not only cultivate comfortably for a period of time, but also add two sets of magic pattern structures to the Mercenary Group. After buying two sets of magic pattern structures, the life of the Sea Giant Mercenary Group will be much easier in the future. He stretched out his hand to hold the reins of the war horse, stopped and waited for Serdek, who was behind the team, to ride up. A group of mercenaries were arrayed on horseback behind Captain Gabri, and a group of warriors who had reached rank 1 in power stood together and their momentum could still cause a lot of pressure. If each of them is given a set of magic pattern construction, they will be a construction team of 30 people. However, in this mercenary group at this moment, only the first level high level warriors have a few magic pattern components. For them, replacing some more practical magic equipment, the mercenary group the combat effectiveness will be greatly improved. Serdak rode up to Captain Gabri. Before he could speak, Captain Gabri said, Baron Serdak, Let's end this mercenary mission here. Our mercenary group plans to detour from the west side of the Great Rift Valley to the Paglos Pass. And then return to Halensa City through Oak Ridge. We hope to get a taste of winter in the middle of nowhere. Even if Captain Gabri did not do this. Soldak planned to let Andrew lead a group of veterans of the cavalry battalion to make a detour to the villages along the way to check if there were any traces of sand bandits nearby. Seeing that Captain Gabri took the initiative to undertake the reconnaissance mission of the West Road. Soldak also knew that it was only based on the happy cooperation between both parties. Although the commission of the Sea Giant Mercenary Group is a bit higher than that of other mercenary groups. Now it seems that it is worth the money. But seeing that the team was followed by a large group of dark war horses and nearly a hundred camels. One knew that Serdak had also made a lot of money in the desert. Serdak actually did not expect that the problem of purchasing a war horse that troubled him would be solved by the sand pirate. Serdak said to the leader of the Sea Giant Mercenary Group. Captain Gabri, this time the Sea Giant Mercenary Group showed strong combat power in the desert. If there is a chance in the future, I hope to continue to cooperate. Take care along the way. As he spoke, 
He raised his hand in front of his chest in a knightly salute. Captain Gabriel quickly straightened his body, returned the salute politely, and said solemnly, If necessary, come to us at the Mercenary Guild at any time, Baron Serdek. Speaking of which, the performance of the Sea Giant Mercenary Group in the desert this time was remarkable. They were almost entirely responsible for scouting and reconnaissance during the march, on duty at night, and during the battle. They served as an offensive force to drill through the sand pirates from the center. Not only the veterans and reserve knights of the cavalry battalion learned a lot from these mercenaries, but even Soldak and Andrew felt they had benefited a lot this time. Serdak felt that this good relationship with the sea giant mercenary group should be maintained. It must be said that war is a hugely profitable industry. The winner can control everything on the battlefield. Serdak thought for a moment and shouted when Andrew came. He asked him to take out 30 war horses from the horse group behind and give them to Captain Gabri. When the mercenaries of the sea giant mercenary group left, each mercenary was riding an ancient horse and leading another behind. As soon as the large group of people led by Serdak appeared in the desolate land, they were discovered by the villagers in the northern area of the desolate land. 250 cavalry, plus more than 600 female prisoners, nearly a thousand war horses and more than a hundred camels, would trample the earth to make bursts of thunder no matter where they passed. It was already winter in the desolate land. Tail, as long as the north wind does not blow. The snow on the sunny slope south of the mountain ridge has begun to slowly melt. This time also means that the dry season in the barren land is coming. Several villages in the desolate land near the edge of the desert look even more dilapidated. As Soldak led the team towards Wall Village, the villagers in the villages along the way spontaneously organized themselves and brought their few belongings with them. At the back of the team, we migrated south together. Serdak knew the plans of these villagers. No matter whether they entered the desert this time in victory or defeat, the result would be the same for the villages in the desert near the edge of the desert. That is, they would have to fight in the next few days faced with the ensuing retaliation of the Sand Bandits. No village could stop the Sand Bandits' revenge. Therefore, after suffering for two full months, the villagers here took advantage of the weather to get slightly warmer and prepared to move south. Until Serdak's large army appeared, the villagers saw Baron Serdak snatching hundreds of women, hundreds of horses, and a large amount of supplies from the desert. They also heard that Baron Serdak was very tough and burned everything nearby. The desert oasis, then knew that the deserted land had a deadly feud with the sand bandits. Regardless of whether there is still a green valley that can be settled in the southern foothills of the deserted land, he gritted his teeth and took all his belongings with him to join the team of Baron Serdak returning to Wall Village. Of course, Serdak did not abandon these villagers. He immediately mobilized the horses in the team to help these villagers carry all their belongings. He also sent people to ride fast horses back to Wall Village and mobilized the idle horses from the village. The unused four-wheeled carriages formed a convoy and came out from the village of Wall. Along the way, Serdak's team continued to grow like a snowball. By the time Serdak led the team back to Wall Village, the team had expanded to 1,500 people. This population was almost the current population of Wall Village. Ten times the quantity. 200 veterans of the cavalry battalion. 50 reserve knights of the guard battalion. More than 600 women brought out from the desert. And more than 600 villagers, who migrated from the northern part of the deserted land. These people can only be resettled in what for the time being. On the flat tidal flat of the river bend outside the entrance of Ursuin. Fortunately, Serdak entered the desert this time and seized a large number of felt tents. Even if these villagers could not find a house to live in, they would not be exposed to the north wind in the open space. Hundreds of felt tents were erected along the banks of the artificial canals almost immediately. Seeing that Serdak had brought back one third of the population of the deserted land at once, the female captives, wearing colorful clothes, frowned almost almost screwed together. It is impossible to feed so many people on the current land in Wall Village alone. The old village chief stood under the dead tree at the entrance of the village, looking at the dark mass of war horses and camels in front of him, and then turned to look at the livestock pen in the village by the river. Even if all the idle land beside the river was enclosed, I am afraid that there was no room for these war horses. He took another look at the lonely wheat pile next to the sheep pen. Those straws were probably not enough for these war horses to chew for half a month. The sudden large-scale battle completely stunned the old village chief. Date, you brought back so many people and so many big animals. How are we going to house them, them? Wall Village is such a big place. And it can't accommodate so many people anyway. The old village chief bright rubbed his hands, looking up at Serdek on the horse and asked, 
Serdak jumped off the horse and handed the reins to a young guard battalion reserve knight behind him. He turned around and looked at the dark crowd behind him, stepped forward and gave the old village chief a big hug, and then said to the old village chief, Let them live by the river first. If they have a place to live, I won't stop anyone from leaving. If they want to stay, they can live in these felt tents for the time being and wait until it gets warmer. At that time, we continued to build a few rows of row houses in front of the row houses at the entrance of the village. We used volcanic ash to repair part of the stone houses and put up wooden roofs. It was not difficult to build some houses. Luke had already opened a direct connection from here to the south of Padlo's Mountain. The cement road at the foot of the mountain will allow our four-wheeled carriages to travel smoothly from here to Padlo's Mountain. I built a lumberyard there and can transport any wood we need back from there. The original wall village was a loose thatched hut built along the creek in the valley. Now the wall village has built rows of rows of small buildings in the valley. In order to resist the horse thieves and rebels who drove straight into the village. They also built at the entrance of the village. A row of arc-shaped row houses was built here. Which usually serve as warehouses for merchants in the market at the entrance of the village. And as a cobalt camp. Only in winter do some rooms become unused. According to Suldak's idea. Several rows of such row houses should be built at the entrance of the village to accommodate the northern villagers who have migrated to Wall Village. Now Wall Village has become a trumpet shape and is constantly expanding outwards. Serdak knew what the old village chief was most concerned about. So he added, As for the food to eat, I will provide it for the time being. Half a month of wheat cakes and half a month of grains. Haven't you been complaining about the lack of manpower? You can let them join in building the road. Team! I want to build a road network leading to the Great Rift Valley. As long as they have work, they can use their labor money to buy food. But I will take away a large number of people recently. Serdak patted the Gubalai horse beside him and said to the old village chief who looked worried, I have also arranged the food and grass for these horses. I estimate that Luke will be back soon by this time. Old Sheila, Natasha, Rita and Little Peter stood at the front of the crowd at the entrance of the village, watching Serdak's safe return. Everyone's faces were filled with joy, but everyone in the village was frightened by the scene before them. For a while, no one except the old village chief dared to come out. Little Peter broke free from old Sheila's restraints, spread his arms, and ran toward Suldek. Suldek held him in his arms, dragging his armpits with his hands and raising them high above his head. At this time, the whole village burst into cheers. Chapter 683 Letter The afterglow of the setting sun revealed only a golden line on the mountains and this golden line soon became silent among the mountains. There is still a small townhouse vacant in Wall Village for the time being. Although the reserve knights of these guard battalions are as weak as a pile of scum on the battlefield, they need to properly arrange their accommodation here in Wall Village. These 50 reserve knights have already joined the guard battalion. As long as there are no special circumstances, they will all be converted into formal knights in a short time. Although they are currently in the security squadron of the security battalion under Serdek, this is only the starting point of their life path. With their superior status as knights, they could not continue to live in tents in Wall Village. So Samira led them into Wall Village and assigned rooms to these young reserve knights before it got dark. Well, the housing is limited and only four guard battalions can live in one room. Wearing a salamander tight armor, Samira hid her face in her hood and led 50 knights from the guard camp leading their horses into Wall Village. These young reserve knights began to look at the village again staring at the salamander leather armor on Samira's body and whispering about what kind of person their commander was. The village was noisy and the veterans of the cavalry battalion needed to maintain security in Wall Village. There were many of them. So Andrew led them to live in a row house in the market at the entrance of the village. This townhouse was originally a cobalt slave camp. There were four rows of large bunkhouses built with wooden frames. Some reed mats were spread on the wooden frames. The cobalt slaves were not afraid of the cold. The room still looked like a rough house. There was air leakage everywhere. The room was a little cold. And some fire pots had been lit for heating. Several villagers were temporarily using a piece of felt to nail to the frosty north wall. Such a barracks can accommodate at least several hundred veterans. The veterans of the cavalry battalion have won several battles in the desert and accumulated some wealth. Sleeping bags and warm camel hair blankets are essential items for marching in the desert. If you spread these luggage in the barracks, even if there is no fire inside, you won't feel cold if you lie down in the sleeping bag and sleep. Andrew, with a group of veterans, was planning to build a temporary stable before dark so that the horses and camels could be enclosed in the stable. When the old village chief came to his senses, 
he arranged for several cooks in the village to prepare dinner for the cavalrymen in the cavalry battalion. This time, Serdak led the cavalry battalion on an expedition. Not only did they drive away the bandits in the desert, they also brought back so many war horses and more than a hundred camels. Many villagers gathered around the cavalry battalion's horses and looked at the horses eagerly. In order to support Serdak's expedition, almost all the horses in the village were mobilized. This time Serdak brought back so many horses that the team in Wall Village could resume work. Some villagers even couldn't wait to take the horses away on the spot. Naturally, the veterans who were looking after the horses couldn't let the villagers take the horses away. So they caused some disputes outside the village. Someone found the old village chief. Mayor Bright was instructing the cooks to prepare dinner. Someone had already brought five large iron pots from the village and was setting up a stove under the big tree at the entrance of the village. The old village chief heard that some villagers ran to the stables without permission to pick up their horses. As he ran towards the temporary camp of the cavalry camp, he cursed angrily. These lazy guys usually act like turtles when things happen. But now they are picking fruits. For fear of falling behind. Val, go and tell the others that if anyone extends his claws here again, I will break his legs. Val is now doing odd jobs with the old village chief and he is considered to be the most courageous and intelligent among the young people in the village. The old village chief led Val to the temporary stables and saw a group of people still gathered here. Several carriage drivers from Wall Village were surrounded by a large group of people, still clamoring to take the horses away. Andrew was talking to the villagers negotiated, but it was clear that the villagers did not buy Andrew's account. A villager with a short riding crop in his hand, who was quite drunk, pointed at Andrew's nose and cursed angrily. Andrew. You are a biting dog under Duck's feet. Why do you stop in front of us? As he said that, he pushed out his fat belly, trying to make himself stronger than Andrew, but found that he always had to raise his head to look at Andrew. But he shouted with a sense of superiority. Dak and I have grown up wearing the same pants as Dak. How dare you control us? What have we done wrong? What did we do wrong? He asked in a high-pitched voice. He patted the neck of an ancient bolai horse with some excitement and said loudly, we are just taking back the horse that was lent to Dake. Is it wrong to take back the horse that belongs to us? Before he could finish speaking, he felt his companion pull hard on his clothes and secretly poke his ribs with a riding crop. Don't stab me. I haven't finished speaking yet. The villager, holding a riding crop, shouted to his companions while still drunk. At this time, the crowd split to two sides. The old village chief strode up to him with an angry look on his face, stretched out his hand to pull his ears and pointed at several tall ancient horses that they had led out of the horse pen. Bo Lai's horse walked from beginning to end, almost tearing his ears apart. Casual, tell me, that horse belongs to you. Which pair of pants are you wearing? Duck has also worn them? The old village chief asked angrily. The villager named Kasua was holding the old village chief's wrist with both hands, and he did not dare to break away. He could only beg for mercy and said, Uncle Bright, you heard me. Wasn't this just a metaphor? The old village chief hit his forehead hard with his index finger, causing Kasua to lean back repeatedly. What you eat now, what you wear on your body, and the house you lie down and sleep in are all obtained by Dake, who did not fund the village with his own money. How can you have the courage to come here to make trouble? Is there an adobe house without a roof in the past two years? You haven't lived enough, and you still want to go back to the days when you had nothing? The old village chief shouted and Kasua suddenly broke into a cold sweat. The old village chief dragged Kaso to Andrew again, kicked him to the ground, and angrily said, Andrew is the captain of the security squadron of the Hellanza guard camp in the deserted land. When will you see the night? Are you so brave? Did you receive too few whips on your body, and your whole body feels itchy? Kasua was kicked to the ground. He covered his ears with one hand, and touched his thigh with the other. He said with infinite grievance, Uncle Bright, look at what you said. I just saw that Dak brought back so many good horses. I'm happy for him from the bottom of my heart. I have no other purpose in choosing horses here. It's just to improve the foundation of our village's team. Only then did the companion next to him react. He quickly came up to hold Kasu up and said repeatedly, Uncle Bright, we just came to take a look. We really don't have any other meaning. This guy Kasu drank a little too much. We are here. Just pull him away. The old village chief roared with an angry look on his face. If you let me see something like this again, you guys will go to Pussy Mountain and work as cobalt overseers. The villagers were so frightened that they ran away with their tails between their legs when they heard the old village chief yelling. 
Some young people in the village gathered around the female captives, laughing and joking while making comments. Some of the women who were robbed by the sand thieves were young women who were robbed by the sand thieves from villages in the desert. There were also mountain people in the mountains in the central part of the desert and nomads in the Salta province in the westernmost part of the desert. Women from different regions have obvious differences in appearance and clothing. These young people gathered around some nomadic women boldly. They had totem patterns on their faces. Some young people even curiously inquired about these women. The meaning of totem decoration. The female prisoners have followed Serdak around in the desert for the past two months and suffered a lot. Now they are returning to Wall Village. They are afraid that Serdak will sell them as female slaves to the slave market. So they hid after setting up camp. Entering the tent. I didn't dare to move around at all. Several young people from the village secretly went to the female prisoners' camp to see the women. They saw that the camp was too quiet. No matter how they teased the female prisoners, the women did not dare to resist. At first, they stood in the camp and took advantage of the conversation. It was an advantage. But later it was discovered that the female prisoners seemed to dare not resist if anything was done. And they became more and more courageous. And some even wanted to get into the tent of the female prisoners before they could lift the blankets and use their bodies to measure the female prisoners' bodies. They saw the tent being opened from the outside. The old village chief stood outside the tent holding a cane, jumping on his feet and yelling at the young people. Do you see what you are like now? What is the difference between you and those sand bandits? You are just as dirty as them. All of them only know how to lift women's skirts. But they can't hold a knife. Get out of here. Several young people from Wall Village escaped from the camp of the female prisoners in despair. The old village chief's angry scolding came from behind. You guys go to Alinsa City tomorrow to sign up for military service. Even if you are used as cannon fodder on the battlefield. It is better than staying in the village. Hearing what the old village chief said, the cooks who were cooking at the entrance of the village stared at the running young people with worried faces. Serdak let little Peter sit on his shoulders and, surrounded by a group of people, walked upstream of the village along the flat village road. Serdak's home is located at the uppermost reaches of the village next to the low dam of the fifth level reservoir. It is still a long way from the village entrance to Serdak's home. Little Peter hadn't seen Serdak for a long time, so he naturally refused to jump off Soldak's shoulders easily. Soldak greeted old Sheila, asked Rita and Natasha about the current situation at home, and then introduced Viru to the family. Viru was considered a guest brought back by Serdak, and was invited to live in his home. When Natasha and Rita saw the guests coming to the house, they quickly plotted to rush home first, preparing to move the dusty house. After the guest room was cleaned, they quickly walked out of the crowd. The group stopped at the central square at the entrance of the village, and the villagers and other people clustered behind them dispersed. Old Sheila walked slowly, panting after walking only a short distance. Her body had weakened rapidly in the past two years, and she was not so energetic at ordinary times. She often dozed off in the rocking chair in front of the fireplace throughout the winter. When she arrived at the village, he didn't want to take another step in the middle square took little Peter's hand, and asked Soldak to take Vera home first. The last time Vera came to Val Village, Serdak introduced Viru to the current situation of Val Village. Villa looked coldly at Natasha's back in the distance, with a strong and strange emotion in his heart. It was as if there was a cold, sharp arrow behind him that could be shot out at any time. No matter who is stared at by Vilu, he will feel as if he is suffocating. Fortunately, there is a turn in the road ahead. Natasha endures her physical discomfort. After turning the turn, she immediately feels much better. He reached out and patted his swollen chest. He didn't understand why he was so flustered when Serdak came back. Serdak walked upstream, looking at the snow on both sides of the village road that had been cleared very cleanly, and thinking about how to divert water into homes. I heard Weiru standing aside and asking Soldak, Is she your wife? Serdak knew he was asking Natasha and didn't even raise his head. Yes. Soldak paused and said calmly, that's your son? Viri didn't look back. But he could make Soldak understand that this sentence referred to little Peter. Yeah. Serdak answered briefly. He could feel that Viru was in a bad mood. As if he was holding a rage in his heart and was about to explode at any time. Serdak didn't know whether the temper of the second level powerhouse would change after he advanced. He only felt that Viru's mood was a bit dull when he entered Wall Village. Viru lowered his eyelids and nodded lightly. Even though I had seen the five-level reservoir above my head before, when I saw this large upstream reservoir again, I still felt that it was very majestic, just like an artificial stone cliff and waterfall. However, the dry season is coming. 
and the reservoir is very majestic. The water in the pool is strictly managed, and the creek is usually dry. It wasn't until they walked home dully, and Natasha and Rita entertained Vera very warmly, that the ice color on Vera's face gradually melted away. After running around outside for so long, the first thing I do when I get home is to lie down in the bathtub and take a nice hot bath. As for the veterans of the cavalry battalion and the knights of the guard camp outside, Soldak believes that the old village chief can make arrangements. Immerse himself in a bathtub filled with hot water. Soldak held his breath until he was about to faint from lack of oxygen before getting out of the water. Natasha and Rita were busy preparing dinner in the kitchen. Soldak reached out and picked up a letter from the side of the bathtub. He used the paper knife in the tray to cut a slit in the envelope and pulled out a cover. It comes with a parchment letter stamped by the Duke of Luther. This letter was handed to him by Natasha herself when he returned home. Natasha said that a messenger from Benes City made a special trip to Wall Village before leaving. Serdak originally thought it would be a letter from Hathaway. But when he opened it, he discovered that the letter was written by Marquis Luther. The amount of information written on it was quite large. Serdak held up the parchment and read it for a long time. Put the letter in your hand aside. Chapter 684 Recruitment Order The house where Soldak lives is built next to the reservoir. The whole house is very grand. It has five master bedrooms, five guest bedrooms, two living rooms, two dining rooms upstairs and downstairs, and a large living room on the first floor. The kitchen comes with a storage room, since steel bars and volcanic ash cement were used during construction. The span of the room is very large, so there is a lot of room for imagination and layout design. During the decoration design, some of Soldak's suggestions were also fully adopted. The arched dome and the main beams and stone pillars next to the inner corridor all have a bit of Rococo style. Just one bathroom is almost as old as the original Sheila family. It is as big as a whole thatched house. The marble bathtub is placed next to the glass window in the room. Although it is a little cold in winter, you can see the snowy scenery outside and the fifth level low dam of the reservoir through this glass window. Sir Duck held the parchment paper in one hand and carefully read the letter written by Marquis Luther. Maybe it was written by someone. The handwriting on the letter looked very graceful, but it was not Hathaway's handwriting. Natasha walked in carrying a large bucket of hot water, put her hand into the bathtub to test the water temperature, and then added some more hot water to the bathtub. She put on a linen skirt that she usually wears at home, covering her slightly plump figure. Soldak sat up from the bathtub, leaned his upper body, held Natasha's round and delicate white face with his hands, and kissed her soft lips. Half kneeling next to the bathtub, Natasha was kissed by Soldak until her neck flushed. Panting, she grabbed Soldak's restless hand and whispered, While the water hasn't cooled down yet, I'll rub my back first. After saying that, he asked Soldak to turn around. Serdak lay on the stone shelf carved out of the bathtub, just enough to expose his back under the water. Natasha squatted aside and gently wiped Serdak's back with a piece of loofah pulp. Serdak put the parchment letter aside, leaning his face on a piece of oak, and asked Natasha to wipe a warm piece of paper on his back, putting a hot towel on his face. He closed his eyes and enjoyed Natasha's delicate massage. But his mind was thinking about the letter that Marquis Luther had just written. The current situation in Bena province is relatively stable. Among the entire provinces of the Green Empire, the security and economic conditions of Bena province have not declined significantly. Although Duke Newman is currently leading the main force of the Bena Legion to participate in the war on the Warsaw Plain. It is a reinforcement force after all. As long as the top brass of the Legion is aware of it. The war situation in the plane is not so optimistic. You can evacuate the plane at any time. But you have to give up all your vested interests in the plane. But at least in the plane's control by Duke Newman and the major lords of Bena province. No plane war is broken out yet. And no signs of infiltration by the Dark Legions of the Abyss forces have been found. Only the Maka plane has encountered a siege by a large group of H. Lounds. But that was just the demon bird of H. L. Demon Clan accidentally throwing the space channel into the plane of Maka. And the chaos quickly subsided. On the other hand, the mainland of Bena province has always been uneasy. Some time ago, bandit groups and other bandit troubles broke out in various places. Some bandit groups fleeing from other provinces took advantage of the fact that the main force of the Bena army was no longer on the main plain and arrogantly entered the Bena province. Territory. Plundering villages and towns everywhere and sometimes even threatening some remote cities. The security battalions in each city had no choice but to expand their establishments and extend their outposts on the outskirts of the city to remote areas. 
It was for this reason that the senior officials of the Hellanza Guard Battalion decided to establish the Deserted Land Security Squadron. Last year, the Hellanza City Guard Battalion wiped out dozens of people. A gang of robbers formed. And the security here suddenly improved a lot. When winter came, Constantinople was besieged by bandits. And the firearms workshop outside the city was captured by bandits. According to the confessions of captured bandit prisoners, Lord Macdonald was related to the bandit siege, which made Bay the situation in the Terrapagan area in northern Na province suddenly fell into a very delicate state. The lords of Terrapagan are now squeezed in the cracks, unable to make a choice, and miserable. It's hard to say what Lord Macdonald wants. But with the current garrison in Bena province, even if a dispute occurs, they may not be able to get any benefits. The Bena army is stationed in the Warsaw Plain, and it will be difficult to escape in a short time. Therefore, Bena province, the current situation in the province is very delicate. In fact, Lord Macdonald does not fully control Terrapagan. His territory of power only radiates to the south of the tower. It was also under this situation that the Bena Provincial House of Representatives passed the decision of Marquis Luther to station in the Belan Plain. Now that Lord Macdonald has taken control of the Ganbu Plain, the Belan Plain at this moment is very important to Bena. For the noble lords of the province, it is even more crucial. Marquis Luther's army stationed in the Belan Plain was also to strengthen the strength of the Belan Plain garrison. In the letter, Marquis Luther informed Soldak to lead the cavalry battalion to gather in Bena City. Calculating the time, if he wanted to reach Bena City in mid-March, he would have to lead the team at least in early March. There is also a recruitment order attached to the envelope. Without such a recruitment order, if you want to lead the cavalry battalion to leave the territory at will, it will violate the relevant regulations of the Green Empire Lord's Law. In the early morning, the dazzling sunlight fell on the room. Serdak woke up from his sleep and found that Natasha around him was gone. Hearing someone talking in the yard, Soldak opened the bedroom door and walked onto the terrace. Facing the bright sunshine, he saw Vera standing on the third level embankment of the reservoir in the distance. His whole body was actually in harmony with the mountain. Become one. At this moment, Serdak had the idea in his heart that Vera could shoot through the dam of the reservoir that had been built with so much painstaking efforts. Is duck up? Mayor Bright. Charlie and Luke walked in from the door and chatted familiarly with Rita. Rita was wearing a long burlap skirt and was cutting grass in the yard. When she saw Mayor Bright walking in, she stood up obediently and called Uncle Bright. Soldak, who was bare-chested and only wearing a pair of trousers, was not afraid of the cold wind outside and stood on the terrace. He held his hands on the railing and said to the old village chief in the yard, Uncle Bright, why did you come here so early? Already? If the cavalry stationed in the townhouses want to live there permanently, they need to renovate the townhouses today. At least, they need to do some cold proofing. The large shops can also be slightly spaced so that several rooms can be separated. Ten rooms are out. There is still some wood in the carpenter's workshop. If you think it's okay, I'll help with this matter. The villagers from the deserted land who followed you back, and the female prisoners of war you brought back. Where are you going to place them? They can't always live in a tent outside the village. The old village chief said straight to the point. Soldak touched his nose, waved to them, and said, It's quite cold outside. Let's talk about it after we come in. You haven't had breakfast yet. Rita, please invite Uncle Brett, Charlie, and Luke to the living room. I'm preparing three more breakfasts for Natasha. With that said, Serdak walked into the bedroom with his arms crossed, put on a pile of clothes on the bedside, and hurried downstairs. Arriving at the restaurant, Natasha had already served hot pancakes and a bowl of milk-scented cereal. Charlie and Luke were not polite and were eating milk-based cereal. However, the old village chief was because there is something on my mind and I can't eat. Serdak took a sip of the hot porridge, grabbed a piece of burnt pancake from the plate, stuffed it into his mouth, and then said to the old village chief, I have received a call-up order from the House of Representatives of the province of Bena. In the next few days, I will lead the cavalry battalion to the city of Bena and report to the Marquis Lutheran army. This time, I will not only take away all the cavalry battalion. We need to recruit some new troops to form a cavalry battalion of 500 people. Hearing what Soldek said, the village chief, Charlie, and Luke all looked at Soldek in astonishment. They had heard Soldek talk about this before, but they didn't expect it to happen so quickly. Serdak tried hard to swallow the food in his mouth, and then said to the three of them, Those captured women can be arranged to live in row houses temporarily. Some of them were originally villagers in the deserted land. If if you want to go home, 
inform their family members to come to Wall Village to pick them up. Some of them are the families of the Sand Pirates. While I am here, they probably don't dare to do anything. Once I lead the cavalry battalion to leave Wall Village, be careful of their revengeful actions. The old village chief Bright couldn't help but frown and lowered his head in thought. Soldat continued, There are some women here who were robbed by sand thieves from neighboring provinces. Their identities are mixed, and I don't have time to identify them. If anyone wants to write a letter home, we can we must actively cooperate and help them contact their families. As for the remaining homeless people who have returned, they will probably have to be reported to the Hellanza City Hall, and it will not take long for them to be allocated. They thought that Serdak was going to use some of the prisoners of war as slaves and sell them to the slave market. After hearing what he said, I realized that he had no such plan at all. This is different from other lords. Serdak rubbed his forehead and thought for a while before saying, As for the villagers who have migrated here, they need to be resettled properly. If they want to go somewhere else, at least let them bring enough food. If they want to stay in with temporarily, in Ertsuin, some row houses are being cleared, and those vacant rooms can be occupied. I originally wanted to integrate these people into Wall Village, but I was also worried that the old households in Wall Village would collectively reject these outsiders. So I had to let them live there. Whether you accept it or be accepted, there is always time to adapt. Serdak then warned the old village chief. They may not carry much food, and some may even have nothing at all. The village can send people to Halensa City to purchase some miscellaneous grains and provide them with some food every day. Free grain porridge, stewed dried vegetables, etc. In short, we can't let them go hungry. If the village's road construction team and construction team hire workers, they can also give priority to these people. At least give them some means of livelihood. The latter words were said to Charlie and Luke, who managed the village's construction team and road construction team respectively. Since Soldak transferred all the horses to the cavalry battalion, the convoy was still idle for the time being. Charlie currently manages the village's construction team. The bricklayers who built the reservoir in the village have now joined Charlie's construction team. The construction team received its first order last fall. For Carl Caseman, the Baron built a villa. The main body was made of steel bars and volcanic ash cement. The structure was very solid, but the project was a bit slow and it was never completed. Charlie. Didn't you go to Carl's Manor? Why did you come back so soon? Soldak asked Charlie, who had lost a lot of weight. Only then did Charlie put down the pancakes in his hand, raised his head, and smiled at Soldak. The construction of Baron Carl Casement's manor has almost come to an end, and I can't help much with the decoration or anything else. I have been back to Wall Village for almost half a month. Some nobles in the city of Valenza saw Baron Carl's villa. It is said that several of them also want to use volcanic ash cement to build some houses in the manor. Recently, many people have come to Wall Village. Come here. You have been outside. And we are still waiting for you to come back to make up your mind. Charlie said cheerfully. I will go to Hellanza City in a few days. I will ask tax collectors Carl and Bert about this matter to see which business can be accepted. But not every noble master has money in his hands. And I don't want to give it to him for free. They build houses. Soldak told Charlie. Charlie clenched his fists, waved them vigorously, and said happily, I ran here early in the morning, just waiting for your words. Serdak said to Luke again, I thought you would have to wait until today to transport the grain and grass back. Without horses, it must be very hard to transport so much grain and grass back with only cobalt slaves pulling it manually. Luke raised his head, his mouth still full of pancakes, and said vaguely, I'm not working hard. It's the cobalt slaves who are working hard. After taking a sip of water and swallowing the food, Luke said, The road from Pudu Mountain to Wall Village is very easy to walk. We set off early again. So we arrived outside the village last night. I didn't expect you to bring so many people back. There are also horses and camels. Well, in short, I gained a lot from this trip, Soldek said. The horses that were eliminated from the cavalry battalion this time will be handed over to the village. After the convoy is reorganized, it will be specially used to transport buildings for the road construction team and the construction team. Material. Until there is no person in charge. Uncle Bright. You have to help me manage this team. Dak. You brought almost all the villagers from the northern part of the desolate land back to Wall Village. Is there still a need to build roads in the desolate land? Luke asked. Of course. Our goal in the first half of this year is to establish some road networks in the area between Pussy Volcano, Wall Village, and the Great Rift Valley. 
as well as establish some strong outposts at various key points. From now on, I will be responsible for the desolate areas to maintain public security in the area. Of course, we must establish a garrison here, Serdak said to Luke. If I still have extra energy, I would also like to renovate the mountain road from Helensa City to Wall Village. Every time I go back to Wall Village from Helensa City, I have to walk a full length of Oak Ridge on horseback. God! In addition to the long distance, the rugged mountain roads will also consume a lot of time, and you have to take time to take care of the sulfur mine on the Pudu Mountain and the lumber yard at the foot of Paglo's Mountain. In the future, the wood will probably be transported back from the lumber yard, Serdak told Luke again said. Soldak and the others were chatting in the restaurant, and there was another sound of the door being pushed outside. After a while, Andrew and Samira walked into the restaurant. Chapter 685 New Army You're here just in time! I'm going to send someone to the police station to look for you too. Serdak wiped his mouth with a napkin and invited Andrew and Samira to sit down and eat together. Rita brought a bowl of cereal and filled Andrew's plate. Natasha followed Rita's footsteps and brought a plate of fruit in front of Samira. People who are familiar with Samira will naturally know her eating habits and likes fish and fruits. In the past two months, this half-elf archer has not only been guarding Wall Village, but also continued to train members of the militia battalion in archery at the police station every day. The village has also organized a group of young people who have not served in the military to conduct training. This winter, in addition to practicing basic swordsmanship, the greatest progress has been made in actual archery. Except for those sharpshooters. The archery skills of ordinary archers on the battlefield are very different from those of hunters. The biggest difference is the control of the overall situation. Hunters usually hide in the dark like sharpshooters and carry out precise strikes on their prey. Ordinary longbow archers pay attention to the coverage of long-range arrows. Samira spent most of the winter training these young men who were not serving in the military in archery. According to the requirements of the old village chief, Uncle Bright, even if these boys cannot become cavalry, they must at least be selected into the archer camp. Samira lifted her hood. Even though the people at the dinner table had seen Samira's delicate face many times, when she lifted her hood now, they were still attracted by that crystal clear face. Only that her pair of light red pupils made her look incompatible with other elves. Every time Serdak would think of the scene on the archery tower of the Wazimra city wall, with his cold eyes, he stood on the high archery tower and looked down at the H, L dogs under the city wall. He was unwilling to back down even when he was in a desperate situation. Because the arm frequently used the power of blood to pull the bow string. The blood vessels and meridians exploded into bloody pieces. Serdak smiled at the half-elf archer Samira and asked, How are the training of the young people in the village going? Samira curled her lips, showing some dissatisfaction, and spread her hands helplessly, saying to Soldak, If you use an alloy bow, you can hit the target almost 30 meters away. Such results are no better than those of novices. The results are really bad. Soldak laughed dryly. He said to Andrew at the end of the table. Otherwise, let the young people in the village form a squadron of longbow archers. The longbow archers do not have high requirements for the accuracy of archery. They have mastered the most basic volleys and throws. The training during this period will at least be of some use on the battlefield. Andrew nodded. Serdak asked Samira again. What about other aspects of training? I have learned some basic swordsmanship and defensive postures, but I still don't know how to ride a horse, Samira said truthfully, seeing Village Chief Bright, Luke, and Charlie looking at him with puzzled expressions. Soldak explained, This time, I will lead a cavalry battalion to Benes City. In addition to the current cavalry battalion, I have 200 cavalry, and I need to recruit some more cavalry. My idea is to recruit from the deserted land first. If the number of cavalry is not enough, I plan to go to the Hellanza City Hall to recruit some new recruits. Maybe in the there is a squadron of longbow archers in the cavalry camp. So no one should mind. How many more people do we need to recruit? The old village chief asked Soldak. I plan to take away a cavalry regiment of 500 people. So I have to recruit 300 new cavalrymen. Soldak said. There are less than 80 young people participating in the winter training this time. We only have so many young people from neighboring villages. Now it seems that the cavalry battalion is still short of at least 200 people. I will go to each village to have a look. It should be there are young people of the right age who are willing to join. Or this time, they see the gains of the veterans in the cavalry battalion in the desert. And those veterans who have been hesitant before can also figure it out this time, and are willing to join the cavalry battalion. The old village chief said, There are only so many people in the deserted land. 
so it is not easy to gather a cavalry battalion. Later, Saldak asked about the placement of the Andrew Cavalry Battalion. After breakfast, Saldak and the old village chief arrived at the row house, where the cavalry battalion was stationed. The veterans temporarily formed a horse farm with straw ropes and tree sticks in a dry river nest. Here, Serdak's biggest harvest in the desert, nearly 900 war horses and more than 100 camels, were kept. A group of war horses walking in circles around the horse farm. The sand on the river loop was trampled into dust for a while. The horses were breathing heavily. On such a winter morning, it was like there was a steaming mist in the horse pen. Fifteen veterans of the cavalry battalion squatted on the ground to cut hay. A haystack as high as a hill was beside them. A group of cobalt slaves crawled out of the haystack. They slept in the haystack last night. The cobalt's the row house has been occupied by veterans of the cavalry battalion. Fortunately, the cobalt slaves are covered in natural fur and are not too afraid of the cold. The cobalt slaves seem to have never seen so many scenes of galloping horses and was stunned by the horses in the racecourse. These cobalts were brought back by Luke last night. They pushed the four-wheeled carriage and delivered some fodder from Pudu Mountain overnight. These nearly a thousand animals were kept in horse pens and consumed a huge amount of fodder every day. Air Village did not prepare so much fodder, which is why Luke rushed back overnight. The waiting veterans poured the grass cut with guillotines into the manger. So many horses crowded in together, and the horse pen was filled with the smell of horse manure and urine. So many war horses can almost form two cavalry battalions. Standing outside the horse pen, Luke said in amazement. He just came from Pudu Mountain at midnight last night. He didn't see so many war horses at night. When he saw the horses now, he couldn't help but exclaim. Even if he was planning to build a cavalry battalion, Soldak didn't know how to gather 500 cavalrymen. He had no plans to build two cavalry battalions at this time. So he asked Andrew and the old village chief. Then just pick and choose some with the best physiques and keep them as war horses. The number of these war horses should be controlled at about 600. And the remaining horses will be left to the village to form a team. Mayor Bright frowned and asked Soldek. Approximately how many horses do you have here? Almost nearly 900 horses. Serdak didn't know the specific number and could only give a rough number. It's 916 horses. Andrew added on the side. Uncle Bright, the old village chief, frowned and asked. Does that mean that after excluding the 600 horses in the cavalry camp, there are still nearly 300 horses left for the village? That's pretty much it. Soldak nodded and admitted. Uncle Bright lowered his head and considered for a while before saying, You don't want to see if the village can afford it. There are already hundreds of yellow sheep in the village. And the Bago grassland is only that big. Even in a year with sufficient rain. The grass that grows can't support these yellow sheep and horses at all. Let's see. The village's fleet only needs 100 horses at most. And we can't even support the remaining horses. Duck, you can handle it yourself. They didn't know when the ogre Gulitum came up from behind and suggested to Serdak excitedly. How about killing all the remaining horses and drying them into dried horse meat? Uncle Bright, the old village chief, was so angry that he blew his beard and stared at the ogre with an angry look on his face. These are war horses, not just yellow sheep that can be slaughtered casually. A war horse can at least be exchanged for something on the battlefield. Forty yellow sheep. Gulitum. Don't give up on this idea of yours. The ogre Gulitum was standing behind everyone, smirking at the angry village chief Bright, scratching his head and then said, Then we might as well take out the unused horses and replace them with yellow sheep. And then are you killing the meat to make it into jerky? Sardak thought Gulitum's idea was good, but of course it was not to sell horse meat, but to sell the remaining horses to the horse market. Even if 200 war horses are sold for 20 gold coins each, they can still get back 4,000 gold coins. In this way, they can earn back all the fees paid to the Sea Giant Mercenary Group and still have a surplus. So Soldak took the opportunity and said, Gilliam's proposal is good. We will pick out all the good horses and bring all the remaining retired war horses and injured horses to the horse market to sell them. The old village chief and others did not expect that everyone would decide the fate of all the horses after just a few minutes of discussion in front of the horse pen. Soldak thought that there were several veterans in the cavalry camp who were good at raising horses. They should also be good at looking after horses. So he ordered Andrew. Andrew, you go find the grooms in the cavalry camp and come here to select them. For war horses, we will first select 600 war horses for the cavalry battalion and then select 100 for the village team. We will take the rest to Bina City and sell them. Okay. Pause. Andrew agreed quickly. 
in order not to miss anything when choosing a war horse. Serdak found an empty tent, started the sacrificial ceremony, and added the blessing of the Eye of Truth to himself. When walking back to the racecourse, several grooms were already standing in the horse pen and began to select excellent war horses. Almost all the war horses they selected. Serdak had to be rescreened to see if these horses had any hidden injuries. After picking and choosing, I didn't expect that there were less than 600 horses that could still go on the battlefield. I managed to scrape together 550 horses for the cavalry battalion. Then several grooms selected 150 horses and gave them to the village chief Bright, asking him to reorganize the village's fleet. The remaining more than 200 inferior horses that have been eliminated must be transported to the horse market in Benna City. According to normal routes, these horses need to be driven to Benna City by land to be the most economical. It's just that Soldak wanted to lead the cavalry battalion to Benna City. And there was no time to transport so many horses back to Benna City by land. Fortunately, he had a recruitment order for the Benna province in his hand. This recruitment order was the largest. Its function is to recruit any magic airship at the airport terminal to carry the cavalry battalion to any place in Benna province. Therefore, this time Serdak led the team to Benna City without paying a high ticket, and could even pick up the airship. Privately, he also brought 200 inferior war horses to Benna City. Serdak's trip to the desert can be regarded as training 200 veterans with rich combat experience. When recruits are recruited to join the cavalry battalion, the 200 cavalry will be dispersed and scattered among the various teams of the cavalry battalion, allowing them to lead these the new army quickly adapted to the lifestyle of the cavalry battalion. In the morning, the old village chief asked the villagers to spread the news that the Serdak cavalry battalion was recruiting new troops. In the afternoon, Soldak returned to the police station in Wall Village. Fifty young reserve knights have been waiting in the police station all morning. They have not been idle in the police station. This trip to the desert has greatly touched them. There are many things that need to be discussed and learned. Not just field marching life and combat methods. The veterans of the mercenary regiment and the cavalry battalion use two completely different tactics. The sea giant mercenary group pays more attention to the personal strength of the mercenaries. On the battlefield, these mercenaries face several bandits at the same time and basically did not fall behind in the battle. The veterans of the cavalry battalion paid more attention to the combat power of the group. Under the halo of Serdax Knight, they were as brave as chicken blood. It is precisely because of the nearly two months of contact that these young reserve knights of the guard camp are completely convinced of Serdak. At least in front of Serdak. Those lazy habits have disappeared and they stand upright one by one. When it's on the chest, it looks more like a knight. When facing Andrew and Samira, there was no contempt anymore. To say that the courses at the Knight Academy are somewhat useful. At least the riding skills of these young knights are pretty good. Seeing Soldak walking into the security center with Andrew and Samira, 50 reserve knights from the guard battalion stood up and saluted Soldak. Serdak stood among a group of guard camp reserve knights and said with a serious face, After this period of experience, I think you have understood the cruelty of war. The desolate land is located in the most remote area of Alanza City. Various bandit groups appear here all year round. The entire area is very vast. And the guard camp is here. The purpose of setting up the security squadron is to maintain the security of the deserted land. If you plan to stay in the deserted land security squadron, you must be mentally prepared to fight against the bandits. If you are still like two months ago, you just want to hang out here, then I ask you to leave as soon as possible. Of course. I also welcome everyone to stay and help me manage the security of the deserted land. If everyone stays, then in the next period of time, I will work with you in the security squadron. Let's talk about your mission. The deserted land security squadron currently only has eight teams. Serdak said a lot to these young reserve knights in the security station. And no one chose to quit the deserted land security squadron. These reserve knights who want to become official knights will probably not give up their status as guard camp knights easily and since they have suffered so much in the desert. There is no reason to quit now. Serdak led the knights of the guard battalion around Wall Village and promulgated the system of the security squadron, including punishment for vacation duties, and so on. This time, Serdak led the cavalry battalion to the Belen Plain. Samira and Andrew were bound to set off with the army. So the security of Wall Village would fall on these young people. Chapter 686 Departure the 50 young guard battalion knights of the guard battalion security squadron are temporarily responsible for the security of the deserted land. Serdak selected eight captains from this group of young people and asked them to be responsible for the daily work of the guard battalion. 
the militia battalions were dispersed to various villages. And Soldak also provided more than 20 horses to the militiamen of the 13 natural villages, so that the militiamen could patrol around the villages in time. And they could be in time when the bandits attacked the villages. Report to the Wall Village Sheriff's Office. Baron Soldak's cavalry battalion recruits young recruits. As long as the recruits pass the assessment, they can serve in the cavalry camp in Serdek. The news was like a letter with wings, reaching the ears of young people in each village one after another. It was a great blessing for the young people in the desolate land. Serving in the cavalry camp of Baron Soldak was destined to be a disaster. They would become cannon fodder on the battlefield. Not to mention that Baron Serdak was the lord of the desolate land. All the natives of the desolate land were considered to be the subjects of Baron Serdak. Just talking about the cost of setting up a cavalry battalion. The total value of a cavalryman's war horses, armor, weapons, and daily marching items must be at least 60 or 70 gold. Naturally. Such a large cost investment cannot be reduced to nothing on the battlefield. Cannon fodder. Whether it is a cavalry battalion or an archer battalion, they will not be abandoned casually on the battlefield. This kind of recruitment of cavalry has never happened in the deserted land. No noble lord will make a special trip to a remote place like the deserted land. Recruit cavalry. Such news spread from Wall Village. And the villages in the deserted land became excited. Young people in various villages who have not yet completed military service are preparing to join the cavalry battalion. Almost at the same time, the news that Soldak led the cavalry battalion to clear out sand bandits in the desert also spread like wildfire. Especially the veterans in the cavalry battalion entrusted some of the trophies to be brought to their families. At this time of winter and spring, almost every villager has to survive the long drought period in spring. Grains, cassava, wild vegetables, and grass roots are almost common in the stomachs of the villagers. Therefore, some valuable trophies at this time are extremely precious. And at least they can last for the family. Lie the hardest days. After some villagers came to Wall Village, they discovered that Serdak's victory in the desert was far more glorious than they thought. Horses, grain, and women were all crowded in this small mountain village. Although the deserted place the population was even less than 2,000. But it took almost an afternoon for the cavalry battalion to recruit 300 recruits. Such a fast speed greatly exceeded the expectations of Soldak and the old village chief. In order to reduce the pressure of population gathering in Ware Village, after obtaining 150 war horses, the Ware Village fleet was quickly formed. The village currently has nearly 64 wheeled carriages. The old village chief ordered 54 wheeled carriages with a stroke of his pen. The carriage followed Luke's road construction team into the depths of the deserted land to build cement roads. At present, the cement roads Luke is mainly building are almost the road network between Wall Village, Pussy Mountain, and the Great Rift Valley. In the past, the main force in building roads in the village were cobalt slaves. Now some villagers in Huangbei, who have no money to eat have also offered to the old village chief, willing to join the road construction team in the village. Just for the two meals a day, these villagers moved with Serdak's cavalry battalion from the northern part of the deserted land to Wall Village. Due to the limited arable land here, the villagers could not immediately be allocated fields to grow wheat. The rations they brought from the deserted north were not available. There wasn't much. If you wanted to survive the dry season and settle down in Wall Village, you had to leave as much of these rations to your family as possible. Some of the strongest laborers chose to join the road construction team. The villagers in the outer village were willing to work with Luke to build the cement road. And Soldak was not going to let them work in vain. So he discussed with the village chief Bright how much living allowance should be given to these villagers. The village chief Bright was also considering this matter. They couldn't let their family members starve in a tent outside Wall Village after they joined the road construction team. So after much calculation, they settled on a monthly living allowance of 10 silver coins. The money used to buy grains is still enough to feed a family. But it is just enough to fill the stomach. In this way, the village will have to provide nearly 10 gold coins for living allowance every month. The income from the Puyubeo Mountain Sulfur Mine is temporarily in the hands of the old village chief. It is not difficult for the village to come up with this money. With the arrival of spring, the village's construction team will continue to build a five-level reservoir. According to Soldak's design, this reservoir will be composed of a low shallow pool, which will become a reservoir in the future. The overflow pool in the rainy season will also become a large swimming pool in Wall Village in summer, because the depth of the pool will not exceed one meter. In addition to building a water reservoir, Soldak also plans to expand more rowhouse-style buildings along the rowhouses outside the village entrance to accommodate the villagers who migrated north to Wall Village. In addition, these female prisoners of war 
who have been plundered from the desert can also increase the population base of all village. However, if you want them to stay and cannot be slaves, they need to integrate into some families in Vol village. This kind of thing will be more or less rejected by the hostess of the family. Only the old village chief Bright is best suited for this job. Serdak led the cavalry battalion to Bena city. The fastest way was to take the magic airship from Alinsa city directly to Bena. We also need to recruit magic airships in Alinsa city. This matter cannot be solved in one day. If the construction team of Wall Village wants to continue to develop and grow, it must get out of the desolate land. Now it has a good start. So Soldak was going to take Charlie to the city of Alinsa to let him get to know his network of contacts in the city. In this way, he could receive business from the nobles in Alinsa city. Moonlight. Silent night. Selina was lying on the wooden bed like a white sheep. Her arms and slender legs wrapped around Soldak's body like an octopus. Her fair and delicate skin, as white as milk, and her bronze skin covered with burned scars showed a distinct contrast. Contrast. She gently scraped Soldak's slightly hard Adam's apple with her little finger. There were extremely fine dark lines under the skin. Selina would feel the throbbing in her soul every time she touched it. Coercion. In the night, her eyes were as gorgeous as sapphires, and her straight nose almost stuck to the side of Soldak's face. She panted slightly, and her legs exerted a little force to resist Serdak's aggression. Take me to buy Lin's plane. Okay. She hugged him tightly. Serdak didn't expect Selina to make such a request. Obviously, bringing Selina along will greatly increase the combat effectiveness of the cavalry battalion. But the trouble is her identity. Such a formal expedition to the Belan plane for a defense change mission with an unidentified woman by his side, is a big trouble. She is still the apostle of the dark goddess, although the temple of liberty has been completely lonely. Such a heretical identity will still not be accepted by everyone. What's more, the magical arts she is best at are basically related to the night, and it is easy for others to mistake her for a black magician. The Grim Empire Magic Guild spared no effort in attacking black magicians. Just thinking about it gives me a headache. The Belan Plain is not a deserted place. So how to conceal one's identity is definitely the most troublesome thing. Take me, Selina insisted. Serdak pretended to think and said, Let me think about how to conceal your identity. Selina leaned into his ear and whispered, Didn't you take Aphrodite to Bena City last time? How did you keep her away from the sight of those magicians? I will do the same. Well hidden. Serdak slapped his forehead hard. Well, I'm a little worried about leaving you in Wall Village. It's better to follow me to the Belan Plain. Serdak said in compromise. The next moment, Selina kissed her. The moonlight penetrates the snow and falls through the glass window onto the bedroom floor. On the first day of March, the warm westerly wind from the southern pipe plateau finally reached the interior of Bina province, blowing away the cold wind on the ice and snow tundra. The thin layer of ice and snow covering the desolate land seemed to melt most of it overnight, exposing large areas of red rocks and gray-white limestone allowing the land to reveal its original appearance. The snow on the surface is the last bit of water in spring, quietly seeping into the underground water veins of the desolate land, and it is about to enter a four-month dry period. This warm westerly wind only reaches Oak Ridge and is blocked by the mountains. Serdak's cavalry battalion gathered at the entrance of Wall Village. 750 war horses and 500 cavalry made this team appear unprecedentedly large. Serdak sat on the Gubo war horse. Andrew and Sammy Law. Viru and Charlie were riding horses on both sides of him, and the cannibal Gulitum was standing behind the crowd carrying a bone-crushing stick, whether it was a war horse or Selena's white camel. Seeing the cannibals every time I see a demon, I tremble all over. As Soldak waved his hand, the cavalry vanguard quickly rushed towards the Paglos Pass, climbed over the pass, and quickly entered the rugged oak ridges of the mountain road. Arrive at the city of Aranza before sunset. It is impossible for a cavalry battalion of 500 people to enter the city directly. Soldak must submit an application to enter the city to the Haranza City Hall and the Guard Camp General Assembly. At this time, the city gate when it was about to close. Soldak asked Andrew to lead the cavalry battalion to be stationed in the woodland next to the hotel outside the city, entering the city of Haranza with only Samira, Selina, Viru and Charlie. Just after seeing a cavalry regiment coming outside the city, the City Defense Department of Holanza City quickly received the news. In the past two years, the gangsters had made people panic. When the guards on the city wall saw the cavalry battalion stationed next to the hotel, their hearts dropped slightly in their throats. But the city defense guards still did not dare to take it lightly. 
when they saw several knights entering the city under the afterglow of the setting sun. The guards at the city gate realized that the one walking at the front was Baron Soldek. This time, they were completely relieved. They quickly moved the roadblock away. And Serdak and his party finally entered the city of Aranza, just before the city gate closed. Baron Soldak! The guards at the city gate saluted Serdak. They didn't even question the identities of the four people behind Serdak. But they looked curious when they saw the white camel Selena was riding. Chapter 687 Arrival After Soldak entered the city, he did not check into the hotel. Instead, he took people directly to the airport terminal in Helensa City. On the airport terminal at dusk, the afterglow of the setting sun shines through the two tall towers on the airport, leaving two huge shadows on the ground. There happened to be a magic airship slowly sailing into the airport. There were two magic airships hovering on the high tower platform inside the airport. At this time, the magic patterns of the floating device on one of the magic airships all lit up. And a team of coolies carried it. The goods and wooden boxes and sacks walked into the airship in an orderly manner along the front passage of the magic airship. The high tower of the airport terminal was brightly lit. And four-wheel trucks were waiting below the airport terminal. Unloading goods quickly. There was a lot of people on the pier, and it was very noisy. A group of crew members were walking out of the airport shoulder to shoulder. It seemed that they wanted to have a drink in the tavern in Helensa City. And maybe chat with a street girl about life. Serdak rode into the airport. When he saw the badge on Serdak's chest, the airport staff, who originally wanted to stop him, quickly stopped and cast a flattering look, walking directly to the ticket gate of the airport terminal. Soldak jumped off the horse. At this time, almost no one bought tickets. A female airport employee sat on the chair at the ticket gate and dozed off, her head on the table, almost buried between his arms. Serdak stood in front of the wooden platform and tapped the wooden platform with his fingers. Tuck, tuck, tuck. The female employee at the airport terminal woke up with a start and looked up to see Soldak staring at her with a smile. She quickly sat up straight and quickly wiped the saliva from the corner of her mouth. She glanced at Soldak a little embarrassedly. First, let's focus on Serdak's noble emblem. My Lord Baron, where do you want to go? I can help you check the sailing schedule. Seeing that Serdak was a noble, the female staff member had a very upright attitude. She sat up straight, tied her scattered hair back again, stood up and said to Serdak, Been a city. Serdak replied. The female staff member looked at the schedule intently and said, Well, there happens to be an airship parked at the high tower pier, but we haven't collected the supplies yet. It will probably stay for about three or four days. Recently, magic airships have been traveling very frequently between Helensa City and Bena City. Even if you can't keep up with the sailing schedule of this magic airship, this magic airship that has just arrived at the port also takes the route between Helensa City and Bena City. After saying that, she took out the tickets for the different magic airships from the bill folder, just as she was about to ask Soldak which time period to buy them. She saw Soldak pull out a paper order from his arms and push it to in front of the female staff. She said calmly, I need the airport terminal to help me clear out two magic airships. I will set sail to Bena City before dusk tomorrow. This is the recruitment order. The female staff member looked at the recruitment order in surprise and quickly asked Soldak, Ah. Do you need to recruit two magic airships? That's right. Soldak nodded. I'm going to call the supervisor right now. And I'll handle it for you right away. The female staff member quickly picked up the recruitment order and walked quickly to the ticket sales desk. She didn't forget to ask Serdak. A plane war has also broken out in our Bena province. Yet? Performing official duties. No comment. Serdak refused to answer the female staff member's question. Serdak only waited for a short while before he saw a female employee walking over quickly with an airport terminal supervisor. The mid-year-old manager looked at Serdak up and down and carefully checked his noble badge. After confirming that there was nothing wrong with Serdak's noble status and the recruitment order, he said, Lord Baron, we will arrange two magic airships for you immediately. The boarding conditions can be met before tomorrow evening. Do you have any special instructions? Water, food and other things. Serdak thought for a moment and said, Prepare water and food for 500 people during the voyage. And also prepare some fodder and drinking water for the war horses. About 750 war horses will have fodder. And there will be no need for anything else. Trouble. Okay. These will probably be ready for you tomorrow. The airport supervisor said tentatively. He was afraid that Serdak would ask the magic airship at the airport terminal to set sail immediately. And that would be the worst. It's so late now. Even if you want to gather the crew of the magic airship, it's impossible. 
Serdak was not so anxious and nodded in agreement. When the airport terminal supervisor took Soldak through the formalities, he almost got the green light all the way. And the boarding time at the airport terminal was set with almost no effort. Although the airport terminal director was very curious about which plane Serdak would go to, he ultimately refrained from asking. He returned the recruitment order to Serdak, ensuring that the two magic airships would set sail as scheduled tomorrow afternoon. Serdak then left the airport terminal. Of course, he didn't know that just because of this recruitment order, the airport terminal was in a state of chaos all night long, and the two captains of the magic airship had to recruit all the crew members overnight. This kind of recruitment is very common in Bena province. And according to the laws of war promulgated by the Green Empire, whether it is an airport terminal or a magic airship, it must fully cooperate with the military dispatch for magic airships. Although this kind of military control flight does not make much money, but there are also a lot of benefits. At least some taxes can be exempted. And you can also apply for the best commercial routes from Bena province with the call order. At present, no magic airship in the Green Empire dares to openly refuse the call order unless the magic airship itself has a huge hidden danger of malfunction and has to enter the shipyard for repair immediately. Otherwise, once it is investigated by the military intelligence department, it will just be an excuse to delay. And what will follow the punishment is definitely much greater than the price paid for temporary recruitment. When we left the airport terminal, the sky had completely darkened. At this time, it was too late to apply for permission to enter the city from the Haranza City Hall and the guard barracks. So Soldak chose to stay at the Garden Plaza Hotel. Carl was waiting in the hotel lobby. And when he saw Serdak pushing open the door and walking in, Carl stopped chatting with the hotel owner Cohen and faced Serdak directly. Carl! Why are you here? Serdak walked into the hotel with Samira, Selena, Veru and Charlie, and saw Carl coming out. Carl knew the half-elf archer Samira, and had only met Selena, Charlie, and Veru a few times. His eyes stayed on Veru for a moment. Vera's body was almost covered with bandages, and only his pair of eyes could be seen. His pupils were as cold as an abyss, and he looked back, unable to see clearly what kind of strength Vera had. Carl asked Serdek, I haven't heard that there is a cavalry battalion stationed outside the city. Not only has the city defense guard raised the alert level, but even the guard battalion has taken action. When I saw Andrew, I realized that you actually formed it without saying a word. A cavalry battalion. In that case, have you received the call-up order? A few people sat down in the rest area of the hotel lobby. The proprietress, Mrs. Cohen, brought black tea. When she saw the delicate and sexy Selena, she couldn't help but take a few more glances. There was a hint of sourness in the smile on her face. Serdak said to Carl, Well, I received a recruitment order from Bennis City when I came back from the desert. I was thinking of going to the guard camp to submit an application for entry into the city tomorrow morning. Although Carl had known about this for a long time, seeing that Soldak actually organized the cavalry battalion, Carl was naturally very envious and said, TSK, TSK, this time I am completely tied to Marquis Luther's chariot. With this cavalry battalion, I have made it clear that I am going to earn merit. And maybe when you come back, you will be a viscount. How about you come with me? Soldak put his hand on Carl's shoulder and asked him with a smile. Forget it. Life in Helensa's city is still comfortable. I don't want to go anywhere for the time being, Carl said lazily. Soldak also knew that Carl would say this. So he added, You come here, which saves me from looking for you. I brought Charlie here this time, because I also want to ask you to communicate in private. This year I plan to let Charlie if you lead the construction team out of Wall Village and receive some projects in Helensa City. You will usually have to take care of the construction team. That's no problem. Carl agreed readily. Charlie and I are also very familiar with each other. If you encounter any trouble, just come to me directly. The next morning, Soldak got the permission to enter the city from the city hall and left the city immediately. Before noon, he led the cavalry battalion into the city of Halanza. 500 cavalrymen lined up in a long line on the central street. Many of the cavalry battalion recruits had never even been to Halanza. Seeing the dazzling array of goods in the shops on both sides of the bustling street, their IQs almost plummeted. He looked around like a goose with his eyes fixed on his head. However, veterans were assigned to each team in the cavalry battalion. With the veterans' reminders and prompt remediation, there was finally no trouble in the city. The residents of Valencia City were very curious about the ogres. A group of half-grown children chased the cavalry battalion for three streets in a row, just to get a few more glimpses of the ogres. 
some residents felt that another plane war might have broken out somewhere. So they couldn't help but ask questions. The cavalry battalion of Serdak is like a pebble. Just a small splash in the big pond of Alinsa City. More than 700 war horses swaggered through the city. And onlookers crowded the central street. However, the chaotic scene did not last long. Serdak led the cavalry battalion to the airport terminal. Two magic airships had been moored at the airport terminal on the high tower platform. The cavalrymen led the horses and walked along the, the tower rotated up the stairs to the platform. And the war horses were led by the veterans into the temporary stables at the bottom of the warehouse. The boarding process was extremely smooth. And the sun had not yet set when the magic airship took off. Serdak, Veru, and Andre were standing on the deck of the bow. Helensa was a mountain city with a very exquisite layout. It was bathed in the golden light of the setting sun. And the roof tiles were like golden scales. At the end of winter and the beginning of spring. The cold wind in the sky is biting. Just standing on the deck for a while will make your whole body freezing. And after a while, you will be frozen to death. Serdak did not dare to stand on the deck for too long. He pushed the door open and walked into the room. Feeling a wave of heat immediately hit his face. I saw Zygna sitting by the window. Looking down at the city of Alanza in the setting sun. Her big clear eyes full of infinite excitement. This time Selina followed Serdak to the Belan plane. And she would not be able to return in a few months. Naturally, Selina could not leave Zygna alone at home. So she took her on the road together. Along the way, no one noticed that there was a little girl hidden under Selina's long skirt. Uncle Dark, is this the city of Alanza? She blinked her big black eyes and asked Soldak. Yes, this is Alanza. Serdak stood beside Zygna and stroked her hair with his hand. Where are we going? Zygna put on a well-behaved look. Go to Bena City and then go through the portal from Bena City to the Belan Plain. Soldak explained patiently. It feels so good that you didn't leave me behind this time. Zygna gave Soldak a sweet smile, then happily climbed onto the second-tier bed in the cabin, got into the bed, and when she closed her eyes, her long eyelashes were still trembling slightly. The magic airship successfully arrived in Bena City on the morning of March 12th. The airport terminal outside Bena City is dozens of times more prosperous than the airport terminal in Helensa City. There are a row of magic airships waiting to land floating in the sky outside the terminal. High towers stand at the airport terminal. And the magic airships enter the port in an orderly manner. Even from high in the sky. It is impossible to see the whole of Bena City clearly. There are stretches of slums outside the city. As well as some shacks where homeless people live. There has just been a light rain here. And a faint green has appeared in the fields. The breath of spring has filled Bena City. But the air the chill didn't seem to subside much. The veterans and recruits of the cavalry battalion were all crowded on the deck, pointing at the bustling city of Bina. A veteran introduced to the new recruits that the city of Bina is full of gold. Some veterans said that as long as they have money and power. This place is like a paradise where the high-level council lives. But for the poor, this place is like H.L. Far less comfortable than life in Helensa City. Chapter 688 Transaction There are a large number of magic airships in the vicinity of the Bina City Airport Terminal every day. Recently, various regions in the Bena province have seemed a little restless. The House of Representatives of the Bena province has frequently mobilized the armies of the lords of various regions in an attempt to suppress the riots in various regions. This has also caused the supply of supplies in various regions to be suppressed. Due to frequent transfers, land routes are difficult to travel in winter. Although the magic airship transportation cost at the airport is very high, it is more reliable and efficient than land routes. In addition, before the arrival of spring every year, a large amount of materials will be shipped in from the southern provinces, which makes the airport terminal of Bena City operate at full capacity. When the magic airship that Serdak rode arrived at Bena City, the airport terminal was even busier than ever. There was actually a row of airships waiting to enter the airport. As the capital of the province of Bena, Bena City is not only the political and commercial center of the province, but there are also a large number of garrisons stationed around Bena City. The capitals of other provinces in the Green Empire are similar, with a large number of troops stationed here. There are many garrisons outside Bena City, and some temporary military stations have been created to receive missions. With the recruitment order in Soldak's hand, the cavalry battalion can live in the military station, so there is no need to find another place to live. The conditions of the military station are only it's just a little better than setting up a tent. The biggest advantage is that it provides two meals a day and hot water, so you can take a shower. There is also a large playground and horse pen in the military station. Soldak knew that once he reported to Marquis Luther's regiment, 
the cavalry battalion would be incorporated into the regiment. It would be difficult to have free time. So several private matters in Bena City must be completed first. Just after noon, Andrew stayed in the cavalry camp. Soldak took Samira, Selina and Zigna to hire a magic caravan outside the military station and drove unimpeded into Bena City. Although Samira had been to Bena City once, she had almost no time to appreciate this prosperous big city. Although she was just passing through Bena City this time, her mood on entering the city in a magic caravan was completely different from last time. She casually looked at the shops on both sides of the street. The wide street was crowded with carriages, and a team of guards camped. Knights wearing full armor walked slowly along the street, maintaining order on the street. After the magic caravan entered the city, it walked along the avenue for seven streets and turned at the intersection in front, heading towards the free magic market in the magic district. Selina and Signa sat side by side. They were a little nervous when the magic caravan first drove into Bena City. Although there were many magicians in Bena City, they found that the magicians on the street were in a hurry. After coming out of the store, he rarely looked around. Basically, he quickly got into the magic caravan and drove away from the store quickly. Zigna bravely opened the car window to let in the outside air. Selina raised the curtains and looked towards the long street, where there were many people walking on the street. The province of Bena is located in the middle of the Green Empire, and March is the beginning of spring. The street trees on the streets of Bena City have sprouted new green buds. In the urban afternoon, women have dared to walk on the streets, wearing open-colored knitted dresses. Some young girls even dared to show off their pink and white lotus-like arms. And calves, walking together on the long street. Selina hugged Zigna and looked at the women on the street with envy. No one in Wall Village dared to dress like this. The magic caravan drove into the edge of the free magic market. It was very lively here. The magic caravan could only move forward at a very slow speed. There were some food stalls on the roadside with fragrant smells. The Bena people liked to eat fried bagels and potatoes. Tiao. The food at the food stall next to the market is very cheap. You can buy a pancake bigger than Zigna's face for three copper coins. The boiling oil pan is frying food almost continuously. People crowded together, holding coins in their hands and handing them out. There are also large round-bellied iron pots set up on some small stalls. The braised meat juice inside exudes a rich aroma. And pieces of crispy bone and mutton are piled inside. The meat here is more expensive. And you can buy a full plate with just one silver coin. Put the crispy mutton on a plate. Pour a spoonful of fragrant gravy. Sprinkle some chive leaves. And spoon a spoonful of soft chickpeas. Finally, the stall owner was able to take out two crispy scones from the oven. Soldak took Zigna out of the magic caravan and took everyone to buy two large plates of bone and mutton from a stall in the corner. He also went to another stall to buy a fried fish and let everyone fill their stomachs first. After that, he bought three glasses of sweet and sour pomegranate juice for Zigna and Samira Selina next to the pomegranate stall, and then took the three girls into the bustling free magic market. The free magic market is located in a square. There are almost magic shops on both sides of the street. There are hundreds of stalls in the entire square. Sandor's butcher shop is in the free market. It is usually full of magic shops. Buy some fresh meat from low-level World of Warcraft, such as Mora fish and demonic antelope meat. Several butcher stalls are almost lined up together, and the other stalls are almost filled with all kinds of low-level monster meat. Only Sander's stall has almost nothing on the meat table, except for a few dried Mora fish hanging on it. No. People who can afford to eat World of Warcraft meat are either rich or noble. Most of the people responsible for selling meat are housekeepers and cooks. When they pass by Shonda's stall, they will always ask Shonda, has the goods not arrived yet? Sandy lay on the wicker chair like a salted fish, shaking his head with a look of despair. Serdak and Sander agreed to send fresh meat from monsters to Bena City via magic airship every month. Fortunately, last month, a whole mailbox of salamander meat arrived as scheduled, although Sander planned to sell it in limited quantities every day. Some. Even so, it only lasted half a month before it was sold out. But starting from the second month, there was no news from Alinsa. Until March. Sandy still failed to receive the goods from Alinsa City. Sandy has been thinking about it these days. If there is no news again, buy a boat ticket and fly to Alinsa City to have a look there. Sander, if you ask me, you can put some other monster meat or other things on the table. No matter what you do, it's better than lying around doing nothing. The stall owner of the neighbor's shop said very familiarly. Xander rubbed his somewhat stiff cheeks with both hands and said, I'll wait. The owner of a stall selling animal bones diagonally across the stall said with a smile. 
Xander, let me tell you. Look at your empty place. It's empty. Otherwise, lend me some animal bones, and I'll share the money you make. Booth Fee, that's not okay. I specialize in animal meat here. If I put animal bones on the table, people will think I'm okay. Xander turned over lazily and said. Several stall owners were chatting away. And then, they saw Brunei, the manager of Rossi Fur Trading Company, standing in the narrow aisle. Soldak's transaction with Rossi Fur Trading Company in Benna City was also done by Sean Sean. Delai was in charge. Sandy had already traded with the Brunei manager once. But the transaction that was supposed to take place last month had been delayed until the beginning of this month. There was no news yet. So the Brunei manager seemed a little anxious. He walked to the butcher stall and asked anxiously, Sander, is there any news from Baron Soldak? There is no Brunei manager yet. If there is no news in the next few days, I will go to Halinsa City. Sandy saw the Brunei manager coming to the door in person. So he had to sit up from the wicker chair and responded very formally. The Brunei manager wiped his smooth forehead with a handkerchief. Although the weather was still a bit cold, he felt a trace of cold sweat on his forehead. If you have any news, remember to tell me. The Brunei manager only said this, then waved to Sander and planned to leave. Sander raised his head and glanced at the Brunei manager, only to see a young man dressed as an aristocrat next to the Brunei manager said with a gloomy face. Could it be that Baron Soldak gave us a big deal? There is no way for subsequent transactions. It's just a matter of not having a shadow. Huh? The Brunei manager happened to have signed an order for salamander leather armor. The company's stock of salamander skins was only enough to complete half of the order. Seeing that the delivery date was approaching, he felt very anxious and impatient. But the company needed a source of such high-grade leather. Worried about being heard by Sander and reaching the ears of Baron Serdek. So he did not dare to speak casually like Harvey Gofello. And only told some of the information he knew. Master Harvey. Maybe Serdak Baron Dark has been restrained by something. I heard that the Luther family's legions have been mobilized frequently recently. Could it be related to this matter? Harvey Goffro squinted his eyes, thinking that he had met Beatrice a few days ago and could not get any precise information from her. So he complained very rudely to the Brunei manager. That is to say, the stubborn Beatrice is willing to believe him. He said that five pieces of salamander leather are sold out every month, and they are out of stock in only the third month. The two chatted while walking, without deliberately lowering the conversation. There were many people in the free magic market. The two of them talked while walking without paying much attention to the pedestrians around them. Sorry, the shipment is a bit late this time. I have been leading troops to eliminate bandit groups in the desert last month, and I was unable to deliver the fresh meat and leather in time. I heard someone say this not far away, and the voice was somewhat familiar. The Brunei manager quickly raised his head, and saw Soldak standing in front of the stall with a calm expression, holding a little girl of five or six years old in his hand. The little girl was holding a glass of pomegranate juice and a pair of black eyes. The big, bright eyes looked over. The Brunei manager opened his mouth and watched Baron Soldak walking over step by step. He wanted to kick Harvey Gofello away. Unlucky Crow's mouth. Baron Soldak, you are here. This matter is my responsibility. The Brunei manager quickly stepped forward and explained to Soldak. Soldak glanced at Harvey, who looked embarrassed, and said to the Brunei manager, When I have the opportunity to come to Benna City this time, I will bring the salamander skin directly here. The Brunei manager quickly said respectfully, looking at what you said. I know you must be a little busy recently. You shouldn't be so anxious. It's just that we signed a supply and sales contract for leather armor substrates last month. And it's about to arrive. It's due. There are many people in the magic market. And Soldak and the Brunei manager standing in the middle of the road talking will block the way of others. Soldak then dragged the Brunei manager back to Sander's butcher shop. When Xander saw Soldak suddenly appear, he jumped up from the wicker chair and welcomed several people into the aggrieved wooden room of the butcher shop. Soldak didn't care much and asked the Brunei manager and Harvey Goffalo to sit down on the bench. On the other hand, the little girl looked curiously at the dried mora fish hanging on the hook with surprise written all over her face. Soldak waved his hand for Sander to sit down and asked, To settle the last transaction, Manager Brunei, do you plan to use magic crystals or gold coins? Let's take gold coins. Magic crystals have depreciated very quickly in recent times. Brunei took out a bag of gold coins that he had prepared and handed it to Soldak. Serdak pulled out a magic sealing box from his magic belt bag and opened the lid. Inside were five completely peeled salamander skins. 
as the manager of Rossi Leather Trading Company. It was impossible for Brunei not to know about the Goffalo family. Seeing that Soldak didn't care about what Harvey Goffalo just said and successfully completed the transaction, the Brunei manager finally felt relieved. On the side, Xander was busy in the narrow wooden house. Although this wooden house was small, it was fully equipped with everything. He made a few cups of black tea for everyone and then sat down happily. But he refrained from asking about the ingredients for the salamander thing. After counting the gold coins, Soldak said again, By the way, Manager Brunei, does Rossi Trading Company purchase low-level Warcraft leather? Low-level Warcraft leather? With that kind of property? Brunei was slightly startled and asked casually. After thinking about it, I was relieved. Since people can hunt salamanders stably, they can naturally hunt some low-level monsters. Wind wolf skin, Serdak said. The Brunei manager replied without thinking. That's okay, but the leather of this low-level monster cannot be used to make magic pattern structures. It can only be used for ordinary leather armor and magic pattern paper. So the price is very low. The profit margin is also very thin. And this kind of leather can only be profitable if it is formed in a certain amount. I happen to have some in my hand. Serdak smiled. And after speaking, he pulled out an ordinary wooden box from the magic waste bag and placed it on the table. Serdak casually opened the wooden cover, which was filled with wind wolf skins that he didn't even have time to clean up the blood stains on. The Brunei manager was a little dumbfounded. Even if it was a low-level monster leather, it should at least be placed in a magic sealing box. Probably seeing the expression on the Brunei manager's face, Soldek chuckled and said, We met more wind wolves than expected. There are not enough magic sealing boxes, so we can only put them in ordinary wooden boxes. The Brunei manager looked up at Serdak in confusion. I have about 50 wooden boxes full of wind wolf skins like this. The Brunei manager's eyes widened, and he quickly stood up, and pulled out the hard wind wolf skins from the wooden box one by one. After a rough count, there were 19 wind wolf skins stuffed into one wooden box. Serdak said truthfully, Some wind wolf skins are in good condition, and some wind wolf skins have some holes on them. The Brunei manager's eyes were a little straightened, and he quickly said, These wind wolf skins can be used to make a batch of wind attributed magic paper. This type of magic paper is still very popular on the market. Chapter 689 Life in the City even if some people have extreme, proud, and withdrawn personalities due to certain relationships, they are destined to be unable to become enemies with him. Such as Harvey Goffaro. Serdak could feel the hostility in his eyes. He was sitting at the square table in the small wooden house of Sanders' butcher's shop. His eyes were full of all kinds of disgust on his face. Sander usually lived in the house most of the time. In the butcher's cabin, the cabin was filled with the smell of grease and putrefaction. Harvey was sitting on a long bench as if several needles were stuck in his butt. He kept changing his sitting position, but he still couldn't be satisfied. Harvey Goffalo was of course extremely embarrassed inside. He sat on a long bench, like a Warcraft that was locked in a cage and admired at will. He didn't even want to look at Soldak. He just hoped that this transaction could end quickly. He asked Brunei the manager hinted several times to speed up the process. But he knows the Brunei manager. He is the kind of person who does things meticulously and will never do it because of himself. He was a little impatient, and his eyes fell on Zigna, who was standing at the window looking up at Mora's dried fish. He was suddenly attracted by that fair and tender face. We can't put those wooden boxes in the butcher shop, or we have to trade outside? Soldak stood up and said to the Brunei manager. The Brunei manager clenched his hands into fists and said excitedly, I'm going to prepare the carriage. How about you wait for me on the street outside the market first? That's fine, Soldak said. After saying that, he patted Xander on the shoulder and asked him, Will you wait for me here, or go together to see the wolf skins I hunt? I'll go out with you to take a look. Two. After Xander finished speaking, he hurriedly put away a few more of fish hanging outside. Two nobles passed by the butcher shop and saw Xander locking the door. They also saw some people standing around. One of the nobles' eyes lit up. He stopped and said familiarly, Xander, is it you? I have salamander meat in my hand again. I ordered it in advance. So don't forget to leave a portion for me. It's really hard to increase your fire affinity now. Sander turned around, saw the two nobles on the street, and said quickly, Don't worry, Baron Glodia. I will definitely not miss your share, as long as the goods are available. I will notify you as soon as possible. The two nobles nodded politely to Harvey and Soldak, and continued walking into the market. Soldak pulled Zigna, 
walked to Selina and Samira, who were bargaining with the stall owner, and told them to leave together. Samira was holding a bundle of fine steel arrow clusters in her hand, and the tight-fitting salamander leather armor on her body almost perfectly highlighted the outline of her body. Even if she couldn't see her face with the hood on, she knew she would not be ugly. This is a magic market. The goods on the stalls all have some magical properties, so the prices are also very expensive. Just a bundle of fine steel arrow clusters cost Samira almost two gold. And the arrow clusters only contain a touch of fire attribute. This kind of arrow is a bit like an igniter. When rubbed against a boulder, a cloud of sparks will burst out. What did you buy? Soldak asked Selena and poked his head over to check. I didn't buy anything. Samira bought a bunch of arrow clusters. Selena pushed her loose long hair behind her ears and whispered to Soldak. The gentle smile in her eyes was definitely not what a subordinate would say to her. What a commander should look like. Harvey stood next to the butcher shop, looking coldly at the two beautiful women next to Soldak, wondering what he should say to make Beatrice and Hathaway believe that Soldak was a shameless person. Liar. But it seems a bit too late to say anything now. After all, he has already made an engagement with Soldak. Thinking of this, Harvey's anger grew even stronger. Arriving on the street outside the free magic market, Soldak chose a street with fewer people and watched magicians in twos and threes walking through the crowd. Selina went from feeling guilty and panicked at the beginning to now being able to face it calmly. In fact, the adaptation process didn't waste much time. The Brunei manager came quickly and stopped on the street with a four-wheeled horse and fork. Serdak pulled out the wooden box from his magic belt bag and stacked it on the street. Looking like a low wall, a magic belt bag can only hold about 20 wooden boxes. He has two such magic belt bags in total. And there are three magic belt bags with magic sealing boxes filled with wind wolf meat. Because he needs to put the wind wolf meat into them. In the demon sealing box. So many wind wolf skins could only be packed in the most ordinary wooden boxes. Serdak did not expect to hunt so many wind wolves. Sander and the coachman loaded the wooden boxes filled with wind wolf skins onto the carriage. And then the manager of Brunei relaxed his heart and took Harvey, who had a gloomy face, to board a car with Gopher behind. The magic caravan with the Luo family emblem quickly disappeared into the bustling crowd outside the market. Seeing Harvey Goffaro leaving in the magic caravan, Selina complained to Suldak in a low voice. Do the nobles in big cities like to be cold-faced and silent? He wants to show how powerful he is. Aloof? Sometimes it's difficult for us to break the invisible wall between nobles and commoners. Serdak could only smile and said to Selina. Sander and Sander returned to this somewhat small butcher shop. Serdak took out a box of salamander meat. Sander had been waiting for almost a month for this box of salamander meat. He saw that Zigna was still staring at it while holding Mora's dried fish. He asked her, Do you like to eat fish? Zigna didn't say anything and just stood there obediently. Sander directly selected a dried Mora fish with the best quality, handed it to Zigna and said, Take it if you like it, but it's a bit salty. It's best to soak it in water before eating. This kind of mora fish is very strange. The front half looks like a ferocious trout. But the back half has eight tentacles like an octopus. And the tip of each tentacle has a paralyzing toxin that can poison a giant elephant. After the adult fish is dried, its body is curled up and it weighs dozens of kilograms. Soldak felt that Zigna was just curious. And she probably never thought about eating such strange things. I saw Serdak put in a magic ceiling box and placed it on the square table. The entire magic ceiling box was filled with a halo of magic. Many people in the magic market know that Sander specializes in salamander meat. But the butcher shop has been out of stock recently, making the place seem deserted. The amount of salamander meat is not large. Serdak does not hunt the salamanders in the territory without restraint. Only the salamanders crawling out from the depths of the lava mines will be hunted. So as to ensure the salamander population of normal reproduction. Serdak then took out a magic sealing box, which was filled with wind wolf red meat. There is no way in that desert, apart from sand bandits, there are only these wind wolves. They never give up easily when they focus on their prey. And unfortunately, a large number of wind wolves focused on Serdak's team. Therefore, the best way to get rid of these wind wolves is to kill them. Sander asked excitedly, Will you also give me these wind wolf meats for sale? Serdak said to him, of course. The scope of our cooperation is not limited to salamander meat. Just like now, I hunted the wind wolf. And I will also bring you the wind wolf red meat. After looking around, this butcher shop was really a little small. Serdak patted the large magic ceiling box and said, 
These wind wolf red meats almost occupy all my magic ceiling boxes. This one we can't fit it in the house. So you may have to rent a smaller warehouse. Sander did not hesitate and took Soldak directly out of the butcher's shop. As he walked, he said, Then I will rent a warehouse now. It is actually very easy to rent a warehouse in the free market. Some properties on the periphery of the free magic market are mostly temporarily rented by vendors here. Some vendors do not have wooden houses like Sander in the market, but just set up stalls to sell their own goods. Many such vendors will choose to rent houses nearby and live in them. Nearby is the most convenient. There are also many houses nearby that can be used as warehouses. And the lease terms can be accurate to the day. The rental house that Xander found was just an independent room. Located on the third floor of a row of enclosed buildings on the south side of the free magic market. This room did not have any windows. When the door was opened, it was dry enough. Xander was very interested in Serta. Kay said, Baron Serdak, your majesty, you can put those boxes here. Selina and Zigna saw Serdak making deals with vendors in the market for the first time. They followed Samira quietly and watched him pull out the magic sealing boxes one after another from his magic belt bag. One, two, three, seventy, seventy-one. A total of seventy-two boxes of wind wolf red meat. Counting down the whole process, Serdak actually took out seventy-two magic sealing boxes, almost filling the warehouse. Sander looked at these boxes in shock seeming to have forgotten what to say. Soldak patted Xander on the shoulder and said to him, This time, I will follow Marquis Luther to the ground station. It will take a long time to come back. There may be problems with the supply of salamander meat. And you will have to wait for a long time like today. If sometimes the Warcraft ingredients cannot be set as scheduled, you have to be patient. Xander recovered from the shock and said, Well, Lord Baron, are you going to fight in the plane so soon? I wish you good luck. Before the city gate of Bena City closed, Soldak took Selina, Samira and Zigna out of the city. Because tomorrow morning, he had to drive 200 eliminated horses to the horse market for trading. For Serdak, this was a big deal. Although it was 200 eliminated war horses, at the current high price in the horse market, each war horse was worth about 20 gold coins. The price of 200 war horses is about 4,000 gold. The value of these war horses is much higher than those of wind wolves. The horse market in Bena City is located in the southeast corner of the south of the city. In order to facilitate the trading of horses and large livestock, horses enter the city through the city gate here. And the inspection does not need to be so strict. In the early morning of March 13th, Andrew led 20 veterans of the cavalry battalion and drove 200 eliminated horses into the horse market. He was immediately surrounded by a group of horse dealers at the entrance of the horse market. 20 veterans of the cavalry battalion. Chaos Sean would probably have one or two horses taken away by these dishonest horse traders. It is rare to see some unfamiliar faces in the horse market. The horse dealer saw that what Serdak was preparing to sell were all ancient bow lie war horses. Although some were in poor health and some were injured, these small problems did not affect the horse dealer. Enthusiasm. These horse dealers, who have been dealing with livestock for a long time can tell at a glance that these horses are war horses that have been on the battlefield. Even if they cannot return to the battlefield, they still have several excellent bloodlines. As long as they can live for a few years, you can breed some ponies. And their value as a stallion will not be much worse than that of a war horse. The 200 war horses barely had time to reach the horse market and were divided up by a group of horse dealers at the entrance of the horse market. Serdak's original expected price for each horse was about 20 gold. Except for the seven war horses with hidden diseases that were almost incurable, which were discounted. The remaining 193 war horses were all sold for 20 gold. Good price. When the morning sun climbed up the city tower, and its dazzling light spread all over the horse market, Soldak had already left the horse market with Andrew and a group of veterans. So far, all the expenses spent on this trip to the edge of the desert in the desert have been fully recovered from these war horses and wind wolves. Andrew looked at the money bag in Soldak's hand and couldn't help but said to Soldak, Boss, let me just hunt those group of sand thieves in the desert. This is better than hunting wind wolves or something like that. More profitable. I heard that the group of sand pirates in the central area of the desert are not easy to deal with. We just dealt with some trash fish that were expelled from the desert this time. If we want to enter the desert, our current strength is not enough. Sertica led a group of people out of the horse market and said, Soldak also wants to purchase a batch of weapons for the cavalry battalion. Now the veterans of the cavalry battalion have a variety of weapons. Some are weapons carried by the veterans themselves. 
some are junk from Wall Village, and some are simply them. Wearing these weapons after snatching them from the Sand Pirates, they look more like a miscellaneous army. As a regular army with the military establishment of Bina Province, Soldak did not want the cavalry battalion to look too shabby, especially when he still had some spare money on hand. Since Serdak has prepared full coverage heavy armor, this cavalry will develop in the direction of a heavy cavalry regiment. The cavalry battalion is equipped with a batch of sophisticated night lances, heavy flails, night long swords, night light shields with metal skins, and standard military crossbows to be fully equipped. I have long heard that at the munitions department in Bena City, you can buy high quality standard weapons of various prices. And as long as you are not pursuing magic weapons, the prices of ordinary standard weapons are still quite cheap. After taking care of the chores at hand, Soldak had some breakfast on the street outside the horse market, then rode the ancient Bolai horse directly along the streets of the civilian area towards the Marquis Luther's mansion. In the morning in the civilian area, a large number of civilians hurriedly took to the streets. They wanted to go to various workshops in Benes City early to start a hard day's work. Compared with the homeless people who cannot eat every day, these civilians have some stable jobs in the city. Although they work hard every day, they can at least survive in this big city. Their lives are also full of troubles. Without competition, you will lose your job. When you can't fill your stomach, you will take a temporary job in addition to your original job. Almost every day, you will live under the squeeze of the workshop owner. For those living at the bottom of society, life is not full of opportunities, and it is not easy to escape poverty. Every citizen of the Green Empire has a chance to turn over when he is 12 years old. As long as he awakens the magic pool during the magic awakening ceremony, he can become a magic apprentice and turn a crow into a phoenix in an instant. Of course, you can also enter the war college and study hard for several years. Only war will be full of opportunities. Chapter 690 Smile Soldak rode to the Marquis Luther's mansion and handed a letter of visit to the foreign affairs steward in the gatehouse of the Marquis mansion. The housekeeper quickly invited Serdak and his party into the living room, and a maid served tea and cakes to Serdak and others. The housekeeper sent a maid to spread the news of Soldak's visit to the Marquis mansion. Since Soldak successfully proposed to Miss Hathaway more than two months ago and was recognized by Marquis Luther and Lady Marion, it is much easier to visit Marquis Luther's mansion than other nobles even if he is invited to stay at this time. The Lutheran palace is no surprise. Is the Marquis in the mansion? Soldak raised his head and asked the young foreign affairs steward. The butler said very respectfully, Your Excellency went to the House of Representatives in the morning. There have been a lot of issues in the House of Representatives recently. Your Excellency has been busy until late almost every day. Recently, many nobles from the Terrapagan area have fled to Benes City for refuge. Unexpectedly, Marquis Luther who received the playing garrison task, would be so busy every day. The situation in the Bena province was not as optimistic as it seemed on the surface. It has been more than four years since Duke Newman led the Bena Legion into the Warsaw Plain. The situation in the Warsaw Plain is still unclear. If this drags on, it will not be a good thing for the Bena Legion. For the sake of the Warsaw Plain the price paid by the noble lords of Handenar County and Bena province was too high. Lord Macdonald's desire to break away from the Bena province seems to have been made clear. Marquis Luther is the representative of the war faction in the Bena province. Naturally, he cannot miss such a meeting. Soldak was not prepared either. So he asked the housekeeper again. What about Miss Hathaway? Miss Hathaway joined the Foreign Affairs Bureau of Bena City a while ago. She handles official business at the Foreign Affairs Bureau every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday morning. Soldak did not expect to find a job in the Foreign Affairs Bureau. His last letter to Hathaway was written two months ago before leading the army into the desert. At that time, he also told Hathaway in the letter that he was leaving Wall Village for a period of time, during which I was unable to write to her. Unexpectedly, two and a half months later, when I returned to Bena City, I found that Hathaway had actually found a job. She was probably too bored staying at home. For a moment, Soldak's thoughts flew far away. Baron Soldak, Madam Marion is waiting for you in the drawing room, the butler said in front of Soldak, calling him back from his distraction. Lady Marion's personal maid saluted Serdak at the door and said softly, Baron Serdak, Madam asked me to come and pick you up. Soldak quickly stood up and followed the maid out. The place where Mrs. Marion received Soldak was a small living room. There were two rows of tables and chairs on both sides of the room. The walls around the room were covered with gorgeous wallpaper. Soldak saw Mrs. Marion wearing a golden dress. 
The iris-style palace dress was sitting on a chair in the middle of the living room. A beam of light shone in from the colorful window glass behind her, forming streaks of light on the floor of the living room. There were four maids standing on both sides of Madame Marion. Soldak walked into the living room, and all eyes fell on him. Salute and sit down. Madame Marion's soft eyes fell on Soldak and asked, Dak, are you coming to Venice City this time to rush to the Belan plane with the army? After receiving the recruitment order from Marquis Luther, I led the cavalry battalion to Venice City, Soldak said. The maid brought out the milk tea and placed it in front of Serdek. The teacup contained a faint aroma. The maid leaned over Serdek, stirred the milk tea evenly, and squatted beside him. Mrs. Marion stared at Soldak and asked, When I was chatting with Mrs. Annabelle a few days ago, we also talked about your formation of a cavalry battalion. So are you ready now? Yes, ma'am, Serdak replied. A trace of surprise flashed in Mrs. Marion's eyes. And she said, Ferdinand wanted to help you at the beginning. After all, forming an army will be very difficult at the beginning. I didn't expect you to do it so well. I just recruited some new soldiers and veterans who have retired from the battlefield. Many of them have never been cavalry before. But they are working hard to train their riding skills. I believe they will soon adapt to the life of the cavalry. Sewer Duck said a little cautiously. The maid squatting beside him peeled off a lavender fruit twisted it with two fingers and brought it to his mouth. As long as he wants to eat, he can eat it by opening his mouth. Soldak had never tried this kind of service before. He didn't know how to do it. He blushed and asked Mrs. Marion, How is Miss Hathaway lately? Recently, Wei seems to be interested in some foreign affairs. So she went to the Foreign Affairs Bureau to find a clerical job. She happened to be on duty today and won't be back until the afternoon. Mrs. Marion pursed her lips and controlled the smile on her face. Madame Marion felt satisfied knowing that Serdak did not have a noble family background. So he did not have some bad habits that only nobles had. If I want to see her now, what do you think I'm rude? Soldak stood up from his seat and asked Mrs. Marion. He was tall and tall, looking a bit heroic. And he looked like he couldn't wait to see Hathaway. Mrs. Marion used a fan to cover the slightly upturned corners of her mouth and said happily to Soldak, You want to see Hathaway now? If so, I can send someone to guide you. After speaking, he waved to the maid standing aside and ordered, Take Baron Soldak to the Foreign Affairs Bureau to find Hathaway. Thank you, Mrs. Marion. Soldak performed the knighthood to Mrs. Marion. Soldak followed the maid in a luxurious magic caravan and left the Marquis Mansion. Andrew and a pair of cavalry followed closely behind, walking down the long street, looking very grand. He leaned on the soft leather sofa, and his whole body seemed to be embedded in it. The feeling of being half-wrapped in leather seemed to quickly eliminate the fatigue on his body. Through the glass window, Soldak looked at the yellow sweet-scented osmanthus flowers blooming secretly in the cold spring on the street. And suddenly he felt in his heart, This is the life of an aristocrat. Many of the most distinguished nobles in Benes City are gathered in this area. These mansions are almost surrounded by Duke Newman's castle. This area is collectively known as the North District of Benes City. Of course, the City Hall of Pena City and some other offices are almost concentrated in the northern part of the city. The city hall was built on the south side of the Peace Square in front of the Newman Castle. The entire row of buildings here are administrative units and offices. The Foreign Affairs Bureau is also among this row of buildings. This is the political center of the province of Benna. There are many famous names in the history of Benna. All strategic decisions are issued from here. The Foreign Affairs Bureau accepts invitations and visits on business and government matters above the provincial level. The Bena province is an inland province of the Green Empire and one of the few provinces that has not been invaded by the Dark Legion of Hell. Although Duke Newman and the Bena Legion were restrained in the Warsaw Plain, the development of the Bena province has not stagnated. Nowadays, official letters are often delivered from other provinces of the Green Empire, many of which invite the great lords of the Bena province. They jointly sent troops to resist the Dark Army of the Abyss. Of course, this kind of help is not in vain. Most of them will give up large areas of territory, including some rich mines, herbal gardens, World of Warcraft forests, etc. As the situation in the Green Empire becomes increasingly tense, it is said that the Mo Legion, which is located in the Kinda Plain and guards the Walla Valley, has sealed the magic eye there with the full cooperation of the Royal Knights and the two major legions of the North and South. The main force of the Mo Legion has been temporarily relieved and officially joined the fight during the battle with the Dark Legion of Hell. At the same time, the South Wind Legion in Hayinsi City signed an armistice agreement with the Nadia Sea tribe of the Endless Sea. 
under the leadership of Prince James. The South Wind Legion formed the main force of the constructed Knights to join the Plain War. After Duke Jing Yu Eli took charge of the North Wind Legion, the North Wind Legion fought several battles with the Ice and Snow Tundra barbarians in the past two years. The balance of victory gradually tilted towards the North, allowing the North Wind Legion to begin to have enough energy to trample the Iron Cavalry. Enter the battlefield. The Plain War in the Green Empire is raging, and the noble and lords of various provinces in the Empire are also ready to take action. However, the stakes of the war are a bit high, and the lords are still unwilling to act rashly until the situation is clear. It was under such circumstances that the Foreign Affairs Bureau of the Bena province became extremely busy, with official letters on various commercial and political matters coming in almost every day. Hathaway was sitting in her office. Opposite her desk were official letters that needed to be reviewed. These official letters were applications submitted by small lords from other provinces. After all, looking at it now, Bena province was one of the few that had not been invaded by the dark forces of the abyss. One of the provinces in the private plain. These small lords from other provinces applied to join the Bena province for some reasonable reasons. The land in the main plain of Bena province has been divided very loosely. And it is simply unable to accept the joining application of such a lord. At this time, of course, we must choose some outstanding lords to join the Bena province. Hathaway's current job is to review, organize and classify which is the work of a junior clerk. She only has three working days a week. And each working day is only half a day. The official letters on her desk are already one foot high. As Hathaway's personal assistant, what the round-faced Beatrice has to do every day is to receive official letters and register them. Then sort them out and move them to Hathaway's desk. I think that Beard is deliberately looking for trouble. He is trying to get you to notice him. Beatrice held a hot water cup, took a sip of sweet milk tea, squinted her eyes, and curled her long eyelashes. Again, her desk was a little messy, but the handwriting on the account book was quite neat. Seeing Hathaway's desk, Beatrice knew that today's afternoon tea might be left in this office. This is also my job. I went to look at the official letters on the desks of other clerks, and there were almost as many. Hathaway was wearing a tube skirt and a white shirt with lace on the chest. She looked like a professional woman, but with a faint smile in her beautiful eyes. She glanced at the birds on the branches outside the window and saw the buds sprouting from the treetops. Spring is here. Beatrice rolled her eyes, knowing that her best friend's thoughts were flying away again. But she still wanted to nag. Maybe once she said such complaints, she would feel better in her heart. She puffed up her red apple-like cheeks and babbled. I only saw them from teacher Sabrina before. I didn't even know they were nobles from Benna City. But now they decided to stick up. They were all talking about their political opinions at night as if the senior members of the House of Representatives had adopted their suggestions, and the plain war would end immediately. They could only live in sorrow at the dance, but no one appreciated their talents. My old man God. Hathaway, I don't want to attend another boring dance like this. Hathaway accurately threw the quill into the ink bottle, stretched out on the chair, and said, Forget it. Just ignore him. No matter what we do at this time, it will make him feel good about himself. It's just that there are so many things. It's really annoying. I also want to go horse riding in the manor outside the city. Hathaway rubbed her forehead, looking at the increasingly dense spring color outside the window with some distress, and said quietly, Do you think we should write him a letter? Beatrice asked, blinking. Hathaway shook his head, walked to the window and said, The family army is ready to go. He should be coming soon. If he is not in Helensa City, I don't want the letter we wrote to be received by his wife. Take it apart. Would you feel a little embarrassed if that were the case? Beatrice put her hand to her forehead and closed her mouth. A magic caravan was parked in front of the steps downstairs. Although the dense branches obscured the full view of the magic caravan. For a moment, Hathaway could still clearly see the silver family emblem on the car. Although it was a bit strange. She did not often ride in it. Of the carriage. But still said to Beatrice. I saw our carriage and I was surprised. Why did it come to pick us up so early today? Beatrice's eyes lit up, and she said excitedly, It's so early. Why don't you go out for lunch? I think we can try the dwarf-style restaurant at the corner of the street. I heard the run there tastes good. The bread is very authentic. Baked by the dwarf bakers invited from Stan. Ah! Hathaway let out a scream, covered her mouth, waved vigorously to Beatrice, turned around and rushed out of the office quickly. Even wearing a tube skirt seemed not to be able to stop her. Beatrice didn't know the situation. 
but followed her without hesitation. When she rushed out the door, she didn't forget to grab their fur coats in her hands. She followed Hathaway closely, standing on the wooden floor of the office. A series of rapid notes came out. Beard was coming up from the stairs, holding a roll of maps. When he saw Hathaway rushing towards him, surprise appeared on his face. Just as he was about to speak, he saw Hathaway quickly passing by him and rushing downstairs. The surprise on his face changed and he quickly asked, Hey, where are you going? No one responded. He quickly turned around and held the guardrail of the spiral staircase with both hands. He leaned out and asked downstairs, Miss Hathaway, what happened? Beatrice also ran downstairs quickly from him. Beard tried to grab Beatrice's arm and said to her sincerely, Beatrice, do you need my help? Beatrice threw his hand away without looking back. Beard immediately chased after Beatrice, trotting and asked, Did something happen at home? My carriage is parked outside. In a blink of an eye, I ran to the lobby on the first floor. At this time, the glass door of the Foreign Affairs Bureau lobby was opened by the door guard. A tall figure walked in from the door, followed by a maid. He walked into the lobby and looked at the first floor curiously. The layout of the hall seemed like it was his first time here, and he was a little unfamiliar with it. He was about to turn back and say something to the maid behind him. Hathaway rushed out of the stairs and shouted casually, Deck. There were many clerks in the hall, and everyone was attracted by Hathaway's call. But she rushed over without stopping and threw herself into the arms of the tall figure. Beatrice, who was following Hathaway, also exclaimed and rushed over. The tall figure could only stretch out one arm and hug Beatrice in his arms. Wow. At this moment, the map scroll in Beard's arms rolled and jumped from his arms and scattered on the marble floor at the entrance of the stairs. He looked at Suldak standing at the door with dull eyes, holding Hathaway in his arms, who he had spent countless thoughts trying to catch up with. At this moment, it seemed like it was getting dark. How did you come? Hathaway hugged Suldak fiercely. When she calmed down, she found out that this was the office hall of the Foreign Affairs Bureau. She immediately felt a little embarrassed. Her fair face was like a red apple. She held Suldak's hand. Arms, half pulling and half dragging him up the stairs. When passing by Beard, Suldak smiled politely at him. Chapter 691 Relationship There is plenty of light in the office. And through the glass window, you can see the sidewalk across the street. Most of the pedestrians passing by have their heads lowered and their hands put into their coat pockets. This office is not very big and can only accommodate two desks. Hathaway's desk is by the window and Beatrice's desk is placed at the door of the room. There was no sofa in the room. Soldak sat on the chair opposite the desk and looked at the layout of the room. There was only one glass window in the room. The white gauze curtains on both sides of the window were covered with exquisite hollow patterns. The desk there was a mountain of official letters piled on top, which was a bit messy. Hathaway was pulled in front of Soldak. She tied her blonde hair on top of her head and wore a tube skirt and lace shirt. She looked smart and capable, which also highlighted her slender waist and perky breasts. She held her soft waist and looked up at her green eyes. She was born as a swordsman and has a very well-proportioned figure, with a faint smell of perfume on her body. Hathaway took the tea cup from Beatrice. He took a sip of the warm black tea. When did you arrive? Hathaway asked Soldak, sitting on the desk. Yesterday. I went to the magic market to complete some transactions. I'm sorry that I didn't come to see you immediately. He took her green-white fingers and intertwined them together. Her nails were painted with beautiful nail polish, both light and dark. They have completely different skin tones. And the skin on the palms of their hands is so delicate. Miss you. Hathaway hugged Soldak and said. Her arms were wrapped around his neck. And a light and sweet fragrance rushed into his nose. Bilet also came over from behind Serdek and the three of them looked like human-shaped sandwiches. I miss you too. When Soldak said this, his heart beat a few times, and something in his heart seemed to have broken through the moral cage. It wasn't until someone frequently passed by the door of the office and responded with a polite smile, and their eyes would always fall on Soldak, that Hathaway restrained her inner joy and took the initiative to leave. She didn't want to be treated like a fight. The monsters in the animal farm were watching like that. Serdak asked the two of them, why do you suddenly want to work in the Foreign Affairs Bureau? Hathaway stretched, sat down on the chair opposite the desk, and said slowly, You have to find something to do for yourself, so that your life will not be so boring. Beatrice and Hathaway huddled together and said in a slightly complaining tone, I haven't heard from you all winter. 
Didn't I say that you went to the desert to clean up sand pirates? Serdak nodded and said casually, I killed some desert bandits and robbed some of their horses. I lived in the desert for almost 50 days before returning to Wall Village and then rushed back to Benna City without stopping. He didn't mention what he had seen with Harvey Gofello yesterday. He took out two exquisite silver knives from his arms and handed them to Hathaway and Beatrice. The scabbards were inlaid with red, blue and green gems. Looks extraordinarily gorgeous. Is this a gift to us? Beatrice asked happily, holding the silver knife and comparing it with Hathaway's. Serdak nodded and said, I think the trophies I snatched from the sand thieves are pretty good, so I'll bring them to you. Hathaway looked through it carefully, then brought it to her mouth and smelled it. She found that there was no peculiar smell. She pulled out the knife and saw that there were fine gold lines on the blade. While admiring it, she said, It's a good gift. I have to give it a try. It's so bloody. The blade of this knife seems to be mixed with fine gold. There were no marks on the knives, and they were snatched back from the robbers. The provenance of these two exquisite knives could not be traced. Fortunately, both women liked them very much. Would you like to visit the environment where I work? Hathaway asked Soldak with a smile. Okay, Serdak said, seeing that her colleagues in the Foreign Affairs Bureau were particularly curious about Soldak. Hathaway simply took Soldak for a walk in the courtyard of the garden behind the Foreign Affairs Bureau and introduced him to the surrounding buildings. The three of them walked side by side, walking in the arched cloister covered with ivy. The low shrub wall in the courtyard has just sprouted buds, and the air is filled with the faint fragrance of tree oil. This place looks pretty good, Serdak admired as he looked at the brightly lit office building. The buildings in Benna City are indeed much more grand than those in Alinsa Mountain City. Not long after, the clear and melodious bells on the top of the building were heard. The bell startled a group of pigeons, who had landed on the bell tower to rest. When the bell rings, it means the lunch break has begun. The lunch break for Binnick City Municipal officials is about two hours. Many people don't like to work in the afternoon and will choose to work half a day. You can go. Beatrice couldn't wait to pull Soldak towards the door of the Foreign Affairs Bureau. The Luther family's carriage was parked on the side of the road. Hathaway and Beatrice boarded the magic caravan and finally relaxed. The bold Beatrice even pulled her long skirt up a little and sat astride it. Serdak's legs were wrapped around his neck, and her soft lips pressed against hers, making Serdak feel how hot her heart was. The magic caravan did not stay where it was, but slowly merged into the traffic on the street. The scenery outside the window kept moving backwards, and Soldak asked, Where are we going this afternoon? Hathaway and Beatrice looked at each other, and then looked out the window. Hathaway said, I haven't decided yet. Let's go and find a restaurant to eat first. I know that a good restaurant has opened on the street by the east gate of Newman Castle. It is popular to eat chilled fish in the Green Empire this year. And the fish in that restaurant is pretty good. Beatrice told Soldak who recommended. Serdak actually doesn't really want to eat fish in his heart. In the Green Empire, fish seems to be a favorite food of elves and Naga sea tribes. Empire people prefer whole wheat bread, cheese, broth, vegetable salads, etc. To match, the life of common people is simpler. Scones and oatmeal are essential things in life, especially the more a fish hanging in Sanders' butcher shop, which looked like a combination of ghost swordfish and octopus. Even if he knew that eating this kind of fish could enhance the body's resistance to water elements, Serdak didn't have much interest. Then let's go there and try it today, Soldak agreed. He didn't want his personal preferences to dampen Beatrice's interest. I used to look at the castle in Pena from a distance, and I just thought that the Newman Castle, located in the northern part of the city, was very majestic. Now when I drove to the ring road outside the castle wall, I realized that the castle was even bigger than what I saw. There are many, and the outer wall alone is nearly 20 meters high. If it is in other places, a 20 meter high building can almost build a five-story building. But here it is only three stories. The windows opened and the outer walls are all small, which are convenient for observation and archery. It is impossible for adults to get out of such windows. The castle is made up of countless buildings piled up like a hill. The high roof has a bit of gothic style. When people stand under the castle, a sense of unnaturally arises in their hearts. The circular road outside the castle has a high wall on one side and a river bank on the other. The entire castle is surrounded by clear river water. There are some shops opened by nobles on the other side of the river. This is the center of Beicheng district. The shops here only accept nobles. And the prices are at least twice as high as in civilian areas. Of course, the services you receive are absolutely different. This restaurant is very new. 
and the dishes it makes are no better than other high-end restaurants. However, the location of the restaurant is just across the river bend. The scenery outside is very good. Sitting by the window of the restaurant, you can enjoy the panoramic view of Newman Castle. Serdak ate the last piece of fish on the plate, thinking that he could take Samira here to try it if he had a chance. He put down the table knife in his hand, took a sip of the sweet wine, and looked out the window at an arched stone bridge 200 meters away. It looked very lively, with pairs of knights on war horses and vehicles loaded with supplies. Keep driving across the bridge, Serdak asked curiously. Why is it so lively over there? Hathaway walked up to him, followed his gaze, and explained to Soldak. We started to change defenses at the beginning of the year, probably every day. A large amount of supplies and troops went to various private planes, and there were also people from the plane. For the troops returning from their rotation, that bridge is one of the main roads connecting the inner garden of Bena Castle, so it is certainly more lively than other places. Serdak still remembered that the expedition to the Maka plane was in a square. There was a portal made of dragon bones in that square. It looked very shocking visually. So he asked, When we went to the Maka plane, when I was in the plane, it seemed to be in a square. And I don't remember walking across this bridge. Many planes, including the Belan plane, are the private planes of Duke Newman. Naturally, they will be built in the back garden of Newman Castle. The Maka plane is the coordinates of the plane bought by the lords of the Bena province. That's why the portal was built in Don Plaza. Hathaway also looked at the bridge curiously. How about we go to the inner garden to take a look at the plane portal over there? I haven't been to the garden over there for a long time. It seems like no one has held a dance there recently. Beatrice suggested. Hathaway frowned and said hesitantly. It's too crowded over there. The road should be under military control at the moment. It's probably difficult to sneak in without a pass. Hathaway turned to Soldak and asked. Dak, what else do you have to do before going to the Belan plane? Sirdak thought for a while and then said, I plan to take time out in the next few days to go to the Bena City Military Logistics Department to purchase a batch of standard weapons. The weapons used by the cavalrymen in my cavalry battalion are very mixed. Only by unifying the weapons can we form a more uniform weapon. Strong combat effectiveness. How about we accompany you to the military supply office? Beatrice and Hathaway looked at each other and said almost at the same time, Okay. I also want to know where the munitions department is in Bena City, Serdak said as he patted his forehead. Military supplies department in the back square of the Bena City Hall. There is a large yard outside the military supplies logistics department. This yard is filled with all kinds of magic caravans. It covers an area as big as a water park. There are almost 1,000 people exchanging supplies here. There was a sea of people, and nearly 20 long queues zigzagged into the courtyard. Looking at the long queue, Serdak couldn't help but have a headache. He found himself standing at the end of the queue. And if he wanted to be in line, he would probably have to wait until tomorrow morning. Obviously Beatrice and Hathaway also misjudged the excitement here. Soldak looked to the left and right sides and said, Otherwise, let my men line up here first. Probably tomorrow morning. It's my turn. This place is actually more lively than the inner garden. But we don't need to wait when we get here. Hathaway's classmate and I work as logistics quartermasters here and we can ask her for help. Beatrice said, Classmate of the Swordsman Academy? Serdak asked. Yes. She is one year older than us. She has been working in the military logistics department since graduation. You guys wait for me here while I go find her. Beatrice said. Not long after, Beatrice followed a young female swordsman and squeezed through the crowd while talking and laughing. After seeing Hathaway, the two hugged each other. The heroic woman the swordsman put his arms around the shoulders of Hathaway and Beatrice and said happily, We haven't seen each other for a long time. Haven't you two attended the dance recently? Beatrice glanced at Soldak next to her and said with a smile, The dance here is just a few familiar faces, which is really boring. We don't need to attend the dance right now. His name is Soldak. From the city of Alanza. I have heard others mention it before. He is so tall and tall. Is Alanza also in our province of Bena? The female swordsman stretched her brows, and the three women whispered, of course. Beatrice took the female swordsman's hand and said, Senior Sister Agnes, we are looking for you this time to exchange for some military supplies at the military supply office. Exchange for military merit or purchase with gold coins. The female swordsman asked Serdak directly. She looked at Serdak curiously. Bye, Serdak said. The female swordsman nodded slightly and asked again, What supplies are needed? Magic cloth, magic beast leather, various magic metal materials, etc. 
These are easier. If you want magic herbs, I can't do anything about it. Now there are magic herbs. The management is very strict. And I can help you with everything else. I want to buy some cavalry-style weapons, Soldek said. The female swordsman looked to the left and right, and then said cheerfully, That's it. Then come with me. A group of four people walked through the crowd, with the female swordsman walking at the front. She skillfully pushed aside the crowd blocking the way. Can the supplies here be exchanged for military merit? Serdek followed and asked. The female swordsman's eyes were a little surprised. But she still said, Of course. But nobles rarely exchange military merit for supplies. Soldek had already made some plans before he came. He took out a detailed list from his arms, handed it to the female swordsman, and then asked, This is the purchase list. See what you can't buy. The female swordsman glanced at the list and said casually, We have all the standard weapons in the warehouse. Follow me to go through the transaction procedures. Chapter 692 Cavalry Battalion Weapons Through the crowded crowd, the female swordsman Agnes walked in front and whispered to Beatrice from time to time. The surrounding environment was very noisy and their voices were very soft. Serdak could only listen to them intermittently. He was talking about topics related to himself. As if he was talking about the escape experience on the hilly pasture at the beginning of their acquaintance. Hathaway took Soldak's arm and followed. Serdak couldn't help but murmured in a low voice. Do you still remember our experience of escaping on the hilly pasture? Hathaway glared at Soldak and said with some resentment, I was almost mad at you at that time. I always thought you could help me more. Now think about it. If you didn't help us at that time, I'm afraid I may not be able to get out of that meadow safely. After speaking, she looked at Soldak's side face and gently rested her head on his shoulder. Do you still remember the craftsman who can repair catapults? I don't know how he is doing now. Serdak sighed and then said, There is also Nitrolop. It is estimated that his injury has been cured long ago. Come on. The arm holding Soldak's arm became tighter and the warm body pressed against him. The sudden tenderness made Soldak's heart feel slightly warm and he clasped Hathaway's fingers tightly with his backhand. Agnes walked through the service hall of the munitions department, walked directly to an empty window, waved to a civilian employee inside who was holding a stack of documents, and ordered, Hung, come here. When the young clerk saw that Agnes was greeting him, he immediately trotted to the window and said cautiously, You are looking for me, Lady Agnes. Agnes raised her hand casually and said to the young clerk inside the window, Go and get an application form. You can help me fill out an application form for standard weapons. After speaking, Agnes handed the detailed list in her hand to the clerk named Horner. Okay, Lady Agnes. Honge got the detailed list. Read it carefully. And then said after confirming that there were no problems. Do you have any other instructions? Agnes rubbed her brows and said, After filling it out, Let Colden stamp it and send it to my office. Okay, I'll do it right away. Lady Agnes. Horge immediately put down his work and quickly filled out an application form inside the grating of the counter. The documents to be handed over were only being able to be by his side temporarily. Agnes took out a white handkerchief and wiped her hands. She stood upright and looked at the crowded service hall. She said to the three of them, It will take a while to complete the process. We don't want to be here. This is occupying public resources. Let's go and sit in my office for a while. As she spoke, the female swordswoman Agnes took the three of them upstairs, passed through the patio on the second floor, and came directly to the door of the Logistics and Materials Statistics office. There were several employees sitting inside with their heads buried in documents. Each person had a desk. The piles of information in front are several a foot high. Senior, I feel like your place is much busier than mine. Hathaway whispered to the swordswoman Agnes in a low voice. Swordswoman Agnes smiled and asked Hathaway, Last time at the party, I heard that you went to the Foreign Affairs Bureau. She stopped at the door of a room. A female assistant quickly stood up and opened the door for Swordwoman Agnes. Swordwoman Agnes invited everyone to come in and sit down. Well, I just want to experience it, Hathaway said casually, looking at the spacious office. Agnes invited the three of them to sit down on the fabric sofa in the rest area. There was a soft wool carpet here, and they stood on the clouds when they stepped on it. The female assistant brought refreshments, and the female swordsman Agnes brought them the sword at his waist was hung on the wooden stand. He turned to Hathaway and said, Didn't Uncle Luther always want you to join the family legion? Has he given up on that idea? Hathaway glanced at Soldak, pursed her red lips, and smiled with a hint of shyness. 
Swordswoman Agnes slapped her forehead valiantly, and then said to Serdak, Oh, I remembered. Your name is Serdak, and you are the Baron High recognized by Uncle Luther. Sevi's fiancé? You are such a lucky guy. She stood in front of Soldak again, stretched out her hand toward him, and said, It must be hard to form an army. Right. Nice to meet you. Let me introduce myself again. I am Agnes. Hathaway and Bill Atri's best friend and senior sister. Soldak looked at the noble badge on her chest, stood up and said to her, Nice to meet you. Chief Agnes, I really want to trouble you this time. Swordswoman Agnes smiled slightly and asked Soldak to sit down. The look in her eyes that examined Serdak became a little different. And she said, Call me Agnes. You have to thank Hathaway and Beatrice. If it weren't for them, I wouldn't be dealing with these specific matters. This time your Luther family's legion will rush to the Belland Plain to garrison. Are you also preparing for this? Swordwoman Agnes asked. Yes. Serdak answered honestly. This senior Agnes is relatively talkative and has a strong personality, always taking the initiative in the topic. However, with Beatrice interjecting from time to time, she deliberately avoids sensitive topics. So the atmosphere is pretty well maintained. Not long after, the clerk named Honge was brought in by the female assistant and handed the stamped application form to Agnes. Swordswoman Agnes glanced at Horange, then took the parchment application form and nodded slightly to let Horange leave. After getting the application form, Agnes took Soldak directly to the door of warehouse number 7 of the munitions department. She happened to see two warehouse managers pushing a flatbed trailer to transport a load of supplies to the warehouse. When he saw the female swordsman Agnes, he quickly stopped what he was doing and saluted the female swordsman Agnes. Swordswoman Agnes nodded, walked into warehouse number 7, handed the detailed list to one of the warehouse managers, and asked him to prepare all the standard weapons on the list. The female swordsman Agnes, Soldak, Hathaway, and Beatrice were waiting at the entrance of the warehouse. Serdak was a little curious about what was in the warehouse. But the warehouse was such an important place that the swordwoman Agnes had no intention of taking them in to visit. Not long after, two warehouse managers rolled out a flatbed trailer filled with long wooden boxes. The two quickly unloaded the wooden boxes at the door of the warehouse. The female swordsman Agnes stepped on the lid of the wooden box with one foot. He pulled out the long sword from his waist, cut off several iron nails on it, and opened the lid of the wooden box. Inside, there lay a dark and shiny knight spear with a spiral pattern. The surface of the spear was full of metal texture. Serdak bent down and picked up the knight spear, which was heavy. It was far different from the knight spear that Serdak had seen in the cavalry regiment before. It seems that this should also be a privilege that the female swordsman Agnes can grant. This kind of standard weapon is definitely a sophisticated level in the military department. Only 500 knight spears required two warehouse managers to transport them back and forth eight times. The entrance to the warehouse was almost full of such long and narrow wooden boxes, and then heavier flails, such as chain hammers with short handles, were shipped out. The texture is also very fine. The spikes on each hammer head are triangular, and the handle also has some anti-slip textures. When the total price was finally calculated, Serdak realized that these standard weapons were not cheap, including five standard weapons, knight's lance, flail, knight sword, light shield and hand crossbow. Among them, hand crossbow and knight's lance were the most expensive. They are expensive, costing five gold coins each. The flail and the knight's long sword cost three gold coins, and the knight's light shield is the cheapest. Only 80 silver coins. But even so, the total price of these standard weapons reaches more than 8,000 gold coins. Hathaway and Beatrice were also surprised when the swordswoman Agnes finished calculating the prices of the weapons on the list. They were worried that Serdak would not be able to afford such a huge military expenditure. So they quickly said Serdak Dak pulled aside, and Hathaway whispered to Soldak, Do you have enough money? Beatrice and I still have some savings here. Serdak patted the money bag on his waist and said to the two women, When I was cleaning up the sand thieves in the desert this time, I seized a lot of gold and silver magic crystals. Yesterday, I also disposed of 200 horses that were eliminated. War horses, nearly a thousand wind wolf skins, and wind wolf red meat. These three transactions alone are enough to pay for these weapons and equipment. I didn't know there were so many warcraft in the desert. I didn't expect that hunting junior warcraft would be like this. Of making money. Beatrice and Hathaway were also a little surprised that hunting low-level monsters could lead to such huge profits. 
if low-level monsters were always so easy to hunt. Those adventure groups and mercenary groups would have already made a lot of money. How could there still be adventure groups living a hard life of not being able to make ends meet? Beatrice asked Soldak. Will it be so profitable to wipe out the desert bandits? Sirdak smiled and said, If I have the chance, I will take you to the desert to see it. But I'm afraid it won't be possible in a short time. The oasis on the edge of the desert has been completely wiped off the map by me. Those desert thieves have no place to stay at the edge of the desert close to the desolate land. After speaking, he walked towards the swordswoman Agnes and took out two money bags filled with gold coins from his arms to pay for the military expenses of these weapons. Where are these weapons going to be transported? The munitions department can be responsible for delivering these military supplies to any place within the city of Bena. Female swordswoman Agnes found the tax officer and the clerk in charge of transactions at the munitions department. Ask them to count the gold coins. Soldak told the location of the military station where the cavalry battalion is located. Agnes nodded and said, Are you going back to the military station with the carriage later? I plan to send Marquis Luther tonight. But my men are still waiting outside the military commissary. I can let him return to the military station with the carriage later, Soldak said. Swordswoman Agnes nodded and said to Serdak, Baron Serdak, if you need supplies from the commissary department in the future, just come here to find me. Soldak asked Andrew and the 20 accompanying cavalry to return to the military station outside the city along with two four-wheeled carriages loaded with goods, while he stayed in Benna City to wait for Marquis Luther's summons. Marquis Luther has been attending Parliament in the House of Representatives all day recently. He is usually not seen during the day, so he can only wait until he returns home at night. Walking out of the munitions office in the city hall, Soldak saw that the hall of the munitions office was still crowded with people, and the number of people queuing up to receive supplies continued unabated. The noise in the hall was almost continuous. The three of them walked out of the hall. Soldak suddenly felt much more relaxed, and the surroundings became extremely quiet. Hathaway and Beatrice had no intention of returning to the Marquis Luther's mansion. The three of them walked slowly along the long street, and the magic caravan of the Marquis Luther's mansion followed behind them silently. Aunt Annabelle wrote back and said that when the bandit riots broke out in Constantinople, you happened to be there. If it weren't for your help, many people might have died at the Constantinople guard camp and firearms workshop. Auntie, it's rare to praise someone like this. Hathaway held Soldak's arm, and looked at the shop windows on the roadside while walking. This is considered one of the most prosperous neighborhoods in Benna City. The shops on both sides of the street are high-end shops that cater to nobles. Soldak did not expect that what happened in Constantinople would reach the city of Benna. And he said modestly, I just did a little bit as much as I could. Unfortunately, these cannot change the current situation in Benna province. Hathaway stopped in front of a display window and said, Recently, the nobles of the entire Benna city have been discussing Lord Macdonald and the Ganbu Plain. If the Ganbu Plain is lost, what will happen to the Benna province? The nobles in the Terrapagan area have indeed suffered a big loss. I heard that the Benna Legion was restrained by evil spirits in the Warsaw Plain and is currently unable to easily leave the war zone. Inside the display window, there is a set of magic pattern light armor on a wooden shelf. The light armor is covered with golden magic pattern lines, giving it a strong magical flavor. Soldak didn't pay too much attention and just asked Hathaway, Is the situation in Warsaw already so bad? I'm afraid it will be even worse. Hathaway nodded. As the daughter of Marquis Luther, Hathaway naturally has certain insights into the situation in Benna province. But she did not expect that she would also maintain a pessimistic attitude towards the war in the Warsaw Plain. Will Marquis Luther's defense change mission be affected? Soldak asked. Hathaway pushed open the glass door of the store and stepped inside. It is inevitable to be affected, but there will be no change in the defense task. It is possible that the main swordsman group of the family will not enter the Belan Plain with a large army. My father proposed to unite with other lords of Benna City and enter Warsaw Plain to pull the entire Benna army out of the quagmire of the Warsaw Plain War. However, many people in the House of Representatives are worried that this reinforcement group will also be stuck in the quagmire and unable to escape in time. By then, the situation in the Benna province will worsen, and no one can limit Lord Macdonald. Hathaway introduced to Soldak the serious problems currently exposed in the Benna province. Chapter 693 Conversation The sky was swallowed bit by bit by darkness. Night falls, and the sky is filled with stars. The cold wind blew through the treetops, making a wine-like sound. A gorgeous magic caravan with the emblem of the Luther family sped past the street. 
The carriage slowed down slightly at the entrance of Marquis Luther's mansion. The guards at the door quickly ran out and pushed the iron gates to both sides. The magic caravan was not there. After stopping here for a moment, the coachman used the most skillful technique to press against the quickly opened door, drove into the Marquis Palace and stopped in front of the steps of the main building of the manor. The guards from the Marquis Mansion quickly ran over and opened the carriage door. Marquis Luther, dressed in gorgeous aristocratic clothing, walked out of the carriage with his head lowered. A hint of fatigue under his cold appearance. Climbing the steps, he saw Soldak and Hathaway standing together in the crowd at the door. Marquis Luther stopped and looked at Soldak, indicating that he should come up and speak. Under the light of the door, Soldak walked out of the crowd. I thought you would arrive in two days. Are you ready? Marquis Luther asked, putting his hand on Soldak's shoulder. That hand was generous and strong, which made Soldak feel warm in his heart. Marquis Luther is a very charismatic person. Perhaps he has been in a position of power for too long, and he has an aura of calmness and authority. When people get close to him, even their breathing will slow down. Soldak turned his head and glanced at Hathaway beside him. Hathaway walked naturally between the two of them, holding their arms with both hands. Soldak suddenly felt that the pressure transmitted from Marquis Luther was relieved. Quite a few. Hathaway and I went to the munitions logistics office in the morning and bought some standard weapons there, so that we can complete the equipment of the cavalry battalion. Soldak said as he walked, Marquis Luther did not expect that he not only organized a cavalry battalion, but also had all the equipment of the cavalry battalion fully prepared. This matter is of course nothing to those young nobles with family backgrounds. But Serdak came from a poor family and relied little by little on his military exploits and posture to become a knight. It shows that, being jointly recommended by Marquis Luther and the noble lords of Benna City to become a noble baron, it is certainly impossible to say that he has any family background. But now he spent tens of thousands of gold coins to form a cavalry battalion which surprised Marquis Luther. However, Marquis Luther did not know everything. He was slightly startled and then said, I heard that you gained a lot from clearing out the sand bandits in the deserted land. I think the gain is not small. At least I helped you solve the problem of war horses. But before you accumulate the constructed knights, don't go deep into the desert to eliminate those sand bandits. As far as I know, those sand bandits have a very complicated network of interests behind them, and they will not let you run rampant in the desert. Marquis Luther was worried that Soldak did not know the details of those sand thieves. So he warned him. The province of Salta borders the northwest corner of the province of Bena. The deserted land belongs to the province of Bena. This desert is the buffer zone between the two provinces. The interests here involve the province of Salta. Some lords. So it is not appropriate to go too far into the desert at the moment. Duke Newman once led the Bena army in an attempt to open up the trade route between the provinces of Bena and Salta. Unfortunately, it was ultimately blocked by some forces hidden in the desert. The plan was ultimately shelved. Serdak did not expect that there would be shadows of other noble lords here. And cold sweat broke out on his back. And he said to Marquis Luther, The deserted land has been invaded by sand pirates in recent years. This time I have cleaned up the oasis on the edge of the desert so that they have no place to live on the edge of the desert. If they want to plunder the deserted land, they must at least passing through a dead land without any vegetation. Marquis Luther couldn't help but look at Soldak again, and said, Young people always have an aggressive spirit in doing things. You have to be careful of those desert bandits you drove away, who might turn back and attack. They may not dare to find you. It's your trouble. But you can't stop them from attacking other civilians in the deserted land. Hathaway saw that Marquis Luther and Soldak were chatting very harmoniously, and the others could hardly get a word in. So he hugged their arms tighter. After all, he was going to take away his daughter. Soldak glanced at Marquis Luther with some worry. Seeing that he was not angry at all, he said cautiously, I have asked all the villagers near the edge of the desert to report to him. Migrate south, give up all the areas north of the Great Rift Valley in the desolate land, and set up militia camps in the villages south of the Great Rift Valley. Lay out road networks, build outposts, and strive to connect the southern areas of the desolate land a whole. Marquis Luther's eyes lit up. He didn't expect that Serdek had done so many things in the two months since he returned to the desolate land. He immediately said with great interest, Did you bring the map of the desolate land? He did not go into the hall on the first floor, but turned around and opened the door and walked into a war council hall. The entourage and several wives and daughters who followed him all stayed outside the door and did not follow Marquis Luther in. 
Serdak took out the map of the deserted land with countless lines from his magic belt bag. Although this rubbing plate has been simplified a lot, it still looks messy at first glance. However, Marquis Luther laid the map flat on the table, and Hathaway helped flatten the two corners of the parchment map with paperweights. Lean next to Marquis Luther, staring at the map with a confused look on his face. Marquis Luther glanced at his daughter lovingly and said softly, Usually, you have been asked to minor in war strategy and war art at the Swordsman Academy. You always have many excuses to shirk it. Now you can't even understand an exquisite map. Bar? Hathaway glared at Marquis Luther with some embarrassment and said nothing. Marquis Luther looked at the markings on the map carefully and said, This map is very well drawn. Not only is it detailed, but it is also marked very clearly. These suggested symbols are also very clever. At least they can let people know the entire area clearly at a glance. As for the general outline, the Knights Union and City Hall of Halinsa City do not have such a clear regional map. This was drawn bit by bit when we were patrolling the deserted land. Soldak pointed to the lines on the edge of the desert and said, The map of the desert area was also drawn bit by bit in the past month. Yes, but we have destroyed all the desert oases. There is really nothing to mark here. Marquis Luther raised his head and motioned for Soldak to sit down on a chair nearby. The walls around this room were covered with maps. If you didn't look carefully, you would think they were covered with wallpaper. Hathaway poured two cups of black tea for the two of them, then stood obediently behind Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther said to Soldak, Next week, the Legion will make its final assembly. This time the situation in the Bena province is more complicated. Before the situation in the Terrapagan area is clear, the constructed swordsmen in the Legion, well I'm afraid the regiment won't be able to rush to the Belan Plain to perform garrison missions. The most elite troops under Marquis Luther were these two regiments of constructed swordsmen. Unexpectedly, due to the situation in the Terrapagan area, they would all have to stay in Bena City. Faced with Lord Macdonald's frequent actions, Soldak thought that the Bena province was a little slow to respond. But he did not expect that the Bena City was secretly mobilizing elite troops in full swing. Not only that, the Langdon family's constructed knights stationed in the Berlin Plain had now withdrawn from the Berlin Plain. The other cavalry and infantry regiments of the Langdon family are also waiting for my legion to arrive at the station. They will return to Belan after completing the handover ceremony. Naxing Province. Marquis Luther continued. At this time, Serdak knew what Marquis Luther meant by what he said. The Belan Plain was empty. Marquis Luther added. This time, I can't rush to stay in the Belan Plain for a long time. The deputy commander of the army, Chester Great Swordsman, will be the highest commander of the Luther family's garrison in the Belan Plain. Tomorrow morning, you meet me and the Great Swordsman Chester. Soldak asked worriedly, Well, what is the character of Mr. Chester? But then he thought again, This Lord Chester should be a confidant of Marquis Luther, and there should be nothing to worry about. His personality is the same as his sword. A little too sharp but not bad at all. Marquis Luther smiled, but there was something intriguing in his smile. Marquis Luther brought Soldak to a wall, pointed to the eggplant-shaped map on it and said, This is a map of the occupied area of the Belan Plain. Our Beta province is located in the central city of the Belan Plain, Wilk City. There are 43 satellite towns radiating around the city. Our Luther Legion will be stationed in the eastern theater of Wilk City. You can choose to be stationed in these 20 satellite towns. Unlike other plains, after the Imperial Army occupied the plain, they would vigorously develop several cities to watch each other. The lords of the Bena province occupied the Belan Plain and only developed a central city with a portal. And the others were a few. Satellite towns surrounding the central town. Marquis Luther continued, But I want to remind you that the closer the town is to the central city of Wilkes, the longer it will be ruled by the Green Empire. And the public security and order of the town will be better. The farther away the satellite town is from the central city, the less order it will have. It's getting worse. Especially in these towns on the edge of the territory. There have been frequent conflicts with local indigenous people recently. They have to patrol every day. The garrison is also responsible for hunting down the plain monsters that break into the territory. The local garrison often reports casualties. Number of people. Of course, if there is a bad side, there is also a good side. Marquis Luther said with emotion, Those towns in the suburbs of Wilk City are less likely to encounter Warcraft. And the army will lose an extra income. In addition, only the army stationed in border towns will have the opportunity to contact the undeveloped areas of those plains. As long as you occupy these undeveloped areas, 
according to the Green Empire's 433 territory rules. You will own about 40% of the developed territory. Territory is the foundation of the nobles. Those nobles without land can only be down and out nobles. Those with land only nobles are called noble lords. Soldak felt that the latter sentence was the theme of Marquis Luther's words. He wanted to have his own territory in the Belan Plain. Being able to be favored by Marquis Luther shows that the land in this plain must be very rich. Marquis Luther ignored Soldak's inner fluctuations and continued to say to him, The first problem you have to face when you arrive at the Belan Plain is how to deal with the conflicts between the imperial colonists and the local aborigines. How to maintain the imperial colonization while ensuring the safety of their lives and property. We should also try our best to avoid unnecessary conflicts with the local aborigines. Try not to use force to suppress them and let them integrate into the imperial social system to maximize their own value. I think you might be able to do this better than me. He stared into Soldak's eyes and said, You know, even I still have the old ideas of traditional aristocrats in my mind. Sometimes I know that such ideas are not advisable. But I still can't avoid the deep-rooted class concepts. The two chatted in the war room for a long time. Until Mrs. Marion pushed the door open and walked in from the outside. Urging the two of them. How long do you two want to talk? Everyone is waiting for you to have dinner. Marquis Luther then laughed and pulled Soldak away from the map. Hathaway was already leaning on the most comfortable sofa in the war room. Dozing off with her chin propped up on one hand. Marquis Luther said to Soldak, Let's go and see what we have prepared for tonight. After saying that, he patted Hathaway's face lovingly, woke her up, and said to Mrs. Marion, who was smiling at her side, Dak is the only one who is willing to listen to my nagging. In the past, Hathaway call me, and before I even say a few words, she will fall asleep leaning on the chair. Just like this. It can make people so angry that they can't eat. I want to hear your nagging. There are many people in the family, and it is obvious that you are too picky. Mrs. Marion said nonchalantly from the side. Marquis Luther shook his head, sighed and said, Even if those idiots want to listen to my nagging, they still need me to be in a good mood. They can't understand anything they say. So what can I say to them? Those idiots think they command the most elite army, and they will arrive. He is invincible everywhere. But who knows? Is there any elite army that he did not create with his own hands? Probably because Boo Man was woken up by Marquis Luther. Hathaway rushed over from behind took Marquis Luther's arm and said, Knights of the Royal Griffith. She was probably the only one in the entire Marquis Luther's mansion who dared to act so boldly and recklessly. Marquis Luther looked at her tenderly and said, Yes, there is only one special case. Although the Royal Gripen is the most powerful knighthood in the Green Empire, it is not a whole. It is a combination of interests in the Green Empire and a group that represents the interests of the Dukes in the Empire. That group every construct knight in this group will be the future duke of the Green Empire. And this cannot represent other construct battle groups. When the four of them walked into the big restaurant, it turned out that the restaurant was already full of people. In the past, only Hathaway and Lady Marion sat next to Marquis Luther. Now, Soldak's seat was added to Hathaway's side. Although the other members of the family did not say anything, they did exchange frequent glances. Chapter 694 Face-to-Face -face Teaching Chapter 6 94 683 Face to Face Teaching In the largest dining room of Marquis Luther's mansion, the surrounding walls are covered with gorgeous wallpapers. The magic wall lamps emit a yellowish warm light, and the vaulted domes in the room are covered with colorful murals, which are like the ones on the roofs of many buildings in the Green Empire. Draw pictures of Cloud City, High Council Paradise, Dragon Cliff, etc. The glass windows of the restaurant have white gauze curtains with lace flowers. A row of maids stood by the wall holding trays. Seeing Marquis Luther walk into the restaurant, the butler in the restaurant quickly waved the maid to come up. Place tableware in front of Marquis Luther. Choose pre-dinner liqueur, appetizers, etc. If Beatrice hadn't introduced this series of choices softly next to him, Soldak would have chosen the same one as Hathaway. If that's the case, I'm afraid he can only drink a little milk and mushroom soup for this dinner because Hathaway wants to maintain his figure and basically doesn't eat anything at night. And Beatrice is almost the same. Soldak's appetite is much larger. He eats almost a large piece of steak and smoked fish, as well as a large plate of vegetable salad, white bread with butter, etc. When the dishes were served one after another, Soldak realized that in the front part of the table, Luther, and he seemed to be the only ones with such an appetite, the dishes in front of the ladies basically only had a sweet soup 
and Marquis Luther also had a very big appetite. Well, there was a large piece of fresh red meat steak on his dinner plate. It looked only medium cooked. The steak was only a thin layer of cooked on the surface. When the knife cut it, some red blood seeped out of the bone china dinner plate. It was not clear that it was fresh meat from a Warcraft. Marquis Luther just cut the steak into four parts with a table knife, then stuffed it into his mouth and chewed it hard. If young people want to gain strength quickly, they must have a good appetite. Only with a good intestines and stomach can they quickly absorb the energy needed by the body from these flesh and blood. Marquis Luther sat on the main seat and said to Soldek said kindly. He ate very quickly, as if this was a habit in the army. While he was talking, he had already eaten two large portions of steak. Serdak ate a piece of steak and felt the rich earth element breath entering his body, limbs and bones through his gastrointestinal tract. His body was extremely sensitive to magic elements. Just before the earth element breath dissipated, the countless elements in his body, the lid node seemed to have a slight suction, constantly sucking in the earth elements watering in his body, but not even a trace of earth elements dissipated from his body. It was a strange feeling. Serdak's body was like a shriveled hydrogen balloon. The earth element breath slowly filled into Serdak's body and was constantly absorbed. Serdak the breath in the body also continued to expand. It seems that Marquis Luther also felt this change in Serdak. He signaled the butler not to serve the food according to Serdak's order, but continued to serve him this kind of Warcraft steak. Serdak even ate it. Only then did Sequai realize that the aura of the earth element was filling his body, almost out of his control, and the power of a two-faced four-armed demon was about to appear behind him. Everyone else at the table looked at Serdak with horrified eyes, as if he had done something extraordinary. Good guy. At the peak of your strength, you actually ate four pieces of white rock rhinoceros ribs in a row. The earth element breath has not overflowed from your body. If I didn't know in advance that your awakened magic perception is a sacred element, I would definitely think that you master the power of the earth element. Marquis Luther's eyes fell on Soldak. His eyes were bright, and he said with admiration. The butler was about to serve another rib, but was stopped by Marquis Luther. Okay, let's change him to other dishes. The earth element in his body is completely saturated, and it will be useless to eat more white rock rhino ribs. Serdak was secretly surprised when he sat next to Hathaway. It was not like he had never eaten Warcraft meat before, especially salamanders and wind wolves, but he did not have such a strong feeling. In addition to high-end Warcraft ingredients, you must also have advanced cooking methods so that these precious ingredients can play their best role, Marquis Luther said to Soldak. Mrs. Mabel sat under Mrs. Marianne, and her three daughters sat quietly beside her. At this time, they also secretly looked toward Soldak and Hathaway, with jealousy almost hidden in their eyes. Unable to help it, I could only lower my head frequently and control my emotions. Other members of the Luther family were sitting on both sides of the dining table. Almost all of them were middle-aged people in the middle of the dining table. Almost all the young people were sitting at the end. They were obviously only the nephews and nephews of Marquis Luther. They were whispering at the end of the dining table. And it seemed that the topic was also on the table. Discussed Serdak. At this time, Marquis Luther stood up from his seat. He raised his hands as if to embrace the air in front of him. And there was a sudden silence in front of the dining table. All eyes were on him. He said to everyone at the table. Everyone here is a member of the Luther family. You are my elders, brothers, and nephews. Maybe you think that Soldak is about to become Hathaway's husband and my son-in-law. So I am so partial and support him. Here, I want to say to everyone that I treat the members of the Luther family equally. Whoever has the ability, who has the potential, who can create more glory for the Luther family, I will favor him and support him. Some people may say that I can't find a chance to express myself. So tonight, I will present this opportunity. I believe everyone already knows that the Luther army is about to enter the Belan Plain for garrison. And this time Luther, the Luther family, will share half of the defense zone in the Belan Plain. Such a large area includes 20 satellite towns. Every member of the Luther family will have the opportunity to express themselves when they enter the Belan Plain. If any of you have entered the Belan Plain and participated in the garrison mission, you can bring it up now, and I will absorb you into the Bena Legion. However, don't think that you will be arrogant in the Belan Plain. I will you are unified into the border towns of the Belan Plain. I hope you can open up some territory for your family and yourself and become the lords of the younger generation of the family. If anyone is willing to join by Lin's Plain, you can bring it up now, or you can come to me in private after dinner. You are welcome at any time. 
no one from the Luther family responded. And the atmosphere at the dinner table was particularly dull for a while. Lady Marion sat next to Marquis Luther, raised her hand and pulled his arm, asking him to sit down, and then said to Marquis Luther, They are still young and have not participated in much experience. Don't be so strict with them. It's good to give them some opportunities, but don't let them go to the most dangerous places all at once. Madame Marion's fair words immediately made several young people from the Luther family at the dinner table look at her with gratitude. She glanced at Suldak again and said casually, Dak's situation is different from theirs. He has been training on the frontline battlefield of the Warsaw Plain for four years before he is what he is now. I heard that you are in Warsaw. In this plain, you once fled Hathaway to escape the pursuit of a group of evil ghosts. At that time, your strength was not as strong as those evil ghosts. And you also faced the most dangerous situation? Serdak nodded slightly and whispered about his experience in the heavy armored infantry regiment. Listening to Mrs. Marianne and Suldak discussing this past incident, Hathaway and Beatrice were deeply touched. They grabbed his hand under the table in unison. And the eager eyes in their eyes made other young people at the table even more excited. People are extremely jealous. After dinner, Marquis Luther continued to call Suldak to the war room to discuss the current situation in the Belan Plain. At the same time, he also revealed to Suldak the situation that the Luther family had in the Belan Plain. Marquis Luther stood next to the map pointed to the black dot at the top of the map, and said to Soldak, This time you go to Wilkes City in the Bell End Plain. I don't recommend that you choose a suburban town. It is not suitable for the growth of your cavalry battalion there. I hope you can go to the northernmost town of Doden. This small town the town was only established for a short period of 15 years. And the relationship between the imperial colonists and the local aborigines there has almost reached a freezing point. Some conflicts often occur and sometimes even lead to large-scale armed fights. Moreover, the aborigines here are still in conflict with the unexplored people. The indigenous people in the area are closely connected, so a strong army is needed to be stationed here. Hearing what Marquis Luther said, Serdak probably also understood that Doden Town was the most chaotic and dangerous among these satellite towns. Otherwise, he would not have dispatched an order of constructed knights to take charge here. Marquis Luther continued to say to Soldek, Originally stationed here, was a constructed knight group of the Langdon family. In the past few years, they have been suppressing the local indigenous people and unable to raise their heads. However, after all, they have lived in this land for thousands of years and are deeply rooted in this land. Even if a team of constructed knights is stationed there, not much land has been opened up to the north in the past few years. If you continue to walk north along this wetland for 200 miles, you can reach Invercargill at the northern end of the White Forest Plain. Warcraft Forest. He picked up a baton and pointed at the fuzzy mountain range on the map. Soldak nodded repeatedly, indicating that he had memorized it. Marquis Luther continued, At present, it is the most extensive boreal forest among the known monster forests in the White Forest Plain. Most of the monsters there are ice and earth monsters. The resources are very rich, and the plain is garrisoned. It is probably rare to encounter plain wars. And there are only a few ways to make profits, first develop business groups, take caravans wherever they settle, and transport local products and resources back to the Green Empire for profit. Cernak knew about this business group model. Compared to plain garrison, the caravan model was more suitable for plain warfare. Many caravans like to take risks and follow the army. As long as the war is won, a large amount of loot will be captured. If the army continues to fight, it will sell these loot to the business groups at the cheapest price. It has to be said that war is the most profitable industry. But there is a prerequisite that you must win. The second is to open up new territory and develop and build on your own territory. Marquis Luther said, This is what almost all noble lords do. If you want to be promoted to a title, you must have enough merit and a territory that matches your status. In fact, this is what Marquis Luther wanted Serdek to do. He didn't want a noble baron to marry his baby daughter at the wedding so he spared no effort to help Serdak form a private army. Marquis Luther continued, The third is to occupy mines in undeveloped areas. Mining is the most profitable industry. As long as the raw ore is transported back to the Green Empire, nutrients can be continuously drawn from the plain. I know there is a sulfur mine on your territory. I believe you must be deeply impressed by how profitable the mine is. Serdak nodded. At present, the development of Wall Village and the construction of the barren land are inseparable from the financial support of the sulfur mine in Serdak. Marquis Luther said, The last option is to enter the Warcraft Forest. 
whether you hunt Warcraft or collect magic herbs, you will make a good income. At present, there is a large market in the Green Empire, especially for precious Warcraft materials and magical herbs. So if you have a chance, I suggest you go to Invercarble Monster Forest to have a look. The last one, Sernak has not tried yet. However, many adventure groups and mercenary groups use this as a means of making a living. In addition, according to the information obtained by the family, there is an open pit iron or vein 60 kilometers due north of Duodan town. It is not yet clear how much reserves there are. I hope you can move the area north of Duodan town by occupying it. You will not only have a fertile territory, but also a mine. If you can develop this mine, it may be able to support you with greater military expenditures. Marquis Luther pointed to a mine above Duodan town. Location. Seriously? Serdak did not expect that Marquis Luther not only selected the garrison location, but also investigated the surrounding situation. Knowing that there was an iron ore vein here, Serdak knew that he could not refuse it no matter what. Duodan town was indeed very suitable for him. At night, Soldak stayed at the Marquis Luther's mansion. Unfortunately, Hathaway did not drag Soldak to admire her boudoir. Madame Marion specially sent a maid to help Soldak go to bed. But she did not see Hathaway and Beatrice before falling asleep. Nobles and wealthy families still have very strict restrictions on young unmarried couples before marriage. And this matter has risen to the level of family glory. The next day, after Serdak met the deputy commander of the Luther army, Chester Great Swordsman, Serdak's cavalry battalion officially entered the Luther army. In the following days, Soldak also followed the cavalry battalion and ate in the military camp. In order to enable these recruits to adapt to the battlefield as soon as possible, Soldak and Andrew formulated a very strict training plan for the cavalry in the past few days. In daily training, since half of the cavalry battalion are young recruits, in order to make their thin bodies wear heavy armor this morning, they have to undergo high-intensity physical training in the morning, basic combat skills and riding skills training in the afternoon and additional training in the evening. It is really miserable for these recruits to learn about tactical formations. Fortunately, the recruits in the deserted land have grown up in a difficult environment. They can endure hardships better than others, and have extremely strong perseverance and resilience. If their physical fitness is not up to standard, they will strengthen their physical training without complaint. In addition to the Luther Legion standard meals, Serdak also wanted to add some nutritious meals such as meat, eggs, and poultry. After seven days of brief rest in the military camp outside Benes City, the Luther Legion officially entered the Balan Plain. Chapter 695 The Beginning of Balan In late March, the sky was covered with a layer of light gray clouds. The southeast monsoon from the endless sea brought warm, salty air and filled the land of Bena province with new green. A group of city defense guards climbed onto the wall of Bena City, facing the rising sun, their armor reflecting golden light. A large number of civilians in the city took to the streets and rushed to work in their own way. This group of people accounted for 80% of the population of Bena City. But they were crowded into the small civilian area in the southern district of the city. They worked diligently every day to contribute to the city. A lot of wealth is created. But the wealth that can fall into their pockets is pitiful. They are busy every day just to have a warm bed, a fragrant baked wheat cake, and a plate of hot vegetable soup. The central street of Bena City was once again crowded with knights in armor. When the procession passed through the long street, the streets were crowded with people watching the farewell. Soldak rode an ancient bull-eye horse and stopped on the arch bridge. He waited for his cavalry battalion to pass smoothly across the arch bridge before following the team towards Duke Newman's castle in the north of the city. The Lutheran army has eight cavalry units today. The battalion, two battalions of long archers, and ten battalions of heavy armored infantry must pass through the portal in the inner courtyard garden and enter the city of Wilkes in the White Forest Plain. The Luther Family Legion has completed its assembly in Benes City and is ready to set off. Finally, on the first day of the fourth week of March, it obtained the interdimensional recruitment pass from the House of Representatives. The Legion immediately entered a wartime state and the temporary camp was packed up in the morning. As early as a week ago, the Luther Legion's logistics troops had entered the Belan Plain to make preliminary preparations. Now the main force of the Legion will also enter the Belan Plain, announcing that the defense of the Langdon family station in the Belan Plain will be officially controlled by the Luther Legion. Take over. In the past, this kind of plain garrison mission was the best way for young nobles to earn merit. However, with the frequent outbreak of plain wars in the Green Empire, this kind of plain garrison mission is more like holding a fire scale that is about to explode at any time. 
I don't know when. Once a war breaks out in the plain, the first ones to suffer the bloodbath are destined to be the plain garrison. The Dark Legion of the Abyssal Forces has not yet been discovered in the Belan Plain. The currently known Dark Legion mainly consists of four major races. They are the Nakma Legion, the Nibra Spider-Man Legion, the Evil Ghost Legion, and the Faceless Men Legion. Among them, the Dark Army that captured the Warsaw Plain ruled by the Busman family was the infamous Evil Ghost Army. The Dark Army that captured the Hero Plain ruled by the Duke of Samoyed in Durva province was the Nibra Spider-Man Army. The Dark Legion of the Vashki Plain ruled by the Mensa family in the province of Lestina is the strange and powerful Legion of the Faceless Men. Serdek has been understanding the situation of the Plain War in the Luther Legion these days. He did not expect that wars broke out in so many places. And soldiers died on the frontline battlefields every moment. Seeing that some of the new recruits in his cavalry team could not bear the weight of heavy armor. Soldak felt a little headache. At present, improving the physical fitness of the new recruits was the first priority. Otherwise his cavalry battalion would not be able to bear the weight of the heavy armor at all. It cannot cope with any emergencies. However, this cavalry battalion is not so useless. After all, there are still 200 veterans who can hold up the cavalry battalion's frame. The Lutheran Legion walked north along the circular road on the edge of the inner river outside the castle. The front cavalry battalion had entered the inner garden of Duke Newman's castle. Serdak rode down the arch bridge. Selina, Andrew, Samira, Gulitam, and Villa were waiting under the bridge. Everyone moved forward with the cavalry battalion. Great Swordsman Chester rode a green scaled horse and looked at Soldak, who was slowly walking down the arch bridge. He frowned slightly. He hoped that during the period of garrisoning in the Belan Plain, this man who was captured by Marquis Luther with the young people selected can be more calm and not so sharp. He knew that the young nobleman wearing a red light leather armor had performed very well in the Maka Plain. There were also many rumors about him within the Legion. He heard that he was a rare holy light knight in the entire Green Empire. And he does not believe in the Statue of Liberty. Now that the temple has completely withdrawn from the Green Empire, such a holy light knight is a life guarantee for the entire Legion. He was engaged to Hathaway and brought his own private army into the Luther Legion. It was obvious that Marquis Luther had more than a little appreciation for him. Serdak was tall and tall, and his body seemed a little unable to suppress the power that was surging out of his body. Others didn't feel it so obviously, but Deputy Commander Chester, who was a second-level swordsman, felt it the most profoundly. That is the sign that can be shown when the level reaches the critical point. For some unknown reason, Serdak did not put on the magic pattern structure on such an important day. Normally, a knight at the peak of level 19 should wear a full-coverage magic pattern structure. Great Swordsman Chester would not think that Soldak could not afford it, since he has such a well-equipped private army. So buying a set of magic patterns is certainly not that difficult. On the contrary, one of his indigenous warriors is wearing a top-level magic pattern structure. What does this mean? In addition to this indigenous warrior, it seems that his followers are a bit different. A mixed blood elf who likes to hide his face in his hood all day long. A demon hunting archer who likes to wrap his body with bandages. A, a woman in black dress who does not wear magic robes but exudes a unique aura. An ogre with thick steel plates hanging on her body. However, Marky Luther didn't seem to care about this. On the horseback, he closed his eyes slightly, thinking about whether there was anything he missed when entering the violin plane this time. It's not that Serdak didn't think about customizing a set of magic patterns for Samira. Salamander skin armor can be an excellent base material for the magic pattern construction. But Samira's right shoulder is implanted with the life magic pattern of the Great Devil Ape. This magic pattern armor not only increases Samira's strength, but also makes her more powerful. Samira has the ability of double strike, and her arms are her burden. Now that she has such a powerful magic pattern equipment, the carrying capacity of her body is greatly limited, and she cannot carry a set of magic pattern equipment at all. Her situation is different from that of the indigenous warrior Andrew. Andrew has the berserker soul, and his body's carrying capacity is doubled. Even with the explosive flame, he is fully capable of wearing the earth shield. The cavalry battalion was sandwiched in the team and entered the back garden very smoothly. The fountain, sculptures, green plants, and marble corridors constructed this beautiful courtyard. They passed through the long and narrow pool and reached the circular platform in the center of the garden. On the platform, Filled with countless magic powers. Arcs of magic light gathered in the six corners of the platform to build a portal in the center of the platform. There was a crackling arc of electricity next to the portal. One after another. 
the cavalry led their horses into the portal. They were very careful when they entered the portal, for fear of accidentally touching the arc of the portal. Serdak was no stranger to passing through portals. He was worried that the veterans in the deserted land had little experience in doing so, and would walk through them carelessly. If the portal malfunctioned, it would be a big trouble. So he rode his horse to the front of the team, and led the horse into the portal first. It felt like falling silently into a deep pool. Just before my body lost control, my eyes suddenly opened up, and I had entered a bright world. In front of him was a wide square. There were many broken blue stones on the square. The knights who arrived first were neatly lined up in the square. Each cavalry battalion was counting the number of people. There were many more on the roadside around the square. Onlookers. Serdak led the horse out of the portal, and couldn't help but raise his head. There were light white clouds floating on the light blue sky. There were no high-rise buildings around the square. So the field of vision was very broad. Lord Baron, welcome to Bylin's Plain. The guard at the teleportation door said to Suldak earnestly. Serdak turned around and looked around the entire square, only to find that the other half of the square was filled with stacks of various materials. It looked like a temporary material transfer center. There were rows of wooden boxes and linen bags, and some the supplies were loaded onto the magic caravan and transported away, and some supplies were unloaded from the magic caravan continuously. Not far away, an armored guard called them to line up over there, and Serdak realized that they couldn't block the teleportation door. Soldak quickly called the cavalrymen from the cavalry battalion to line up there. The whole process was very smooth. Only some war horses would be disturbed when passing through the portal. However, each knight held the war horse. And the frightened war horses were stopped with all their strength. Just hold on, and it will soon soothe. The eight cavalry battalions of the Luther Legion entered the Belan Plain first, followed by two longbow archer regiments. Finally, ten heavy armored infantry regiments will enter the Belan Plain one after another. The cavalry battalions here will not wait. Only when all the heavy armored infantry regiments come over can they act in a unified manner. After the 8th cavalry battalion passed through the portal, the cavalry battalion left the square and made room for the longbow archer regiment to line up and count their numbers. Soldak led the cavalry battalion through the streets of Wilk City. It is almost impossible to see buildings higher than three stories here. The tallest buildings in the city are the bell towers distributed in various areas. The streets are crowded on both sides. It is filled with various trading houses, and there are many double-story row houses in the streets and alleys. The walls of these houses are painted with white paint, gray roofs, and lush street trees line both sides, giving the city a distinct color. A young girl was hanging out the laundry in the attic. On the stone steps at the street entrance, several old people were sitting in the shade chatting. Seven or eight white birds flew through the sky at extremely fast speeds. There were very few magic caravans on the street, but there were many four-wheeled carriages carrying goods. The roadside was almost full of such vehicles. Wilkes is only a central city on the plain, but it is larger than Serdak imagined. After riding on the street for nearly two hours, Serdak finally led the cavalry at nearly noon. The battalion passed through the city gate, stepped on the wooden suspension bridge over the moat, and walked out of Wilkes City. The logistics regiment of the Lutheran army built a temporary military camp outside Wilkes. The cavalry entered the military camp first to report. There were logistics regiment officials responsible for arranging accommodation to receive the cavalry. Serdak knows that everyone will not stay here for long. After a little adaptation to this plane, he will proceed to the satellite town agreed upon before, go there to change defenses, and completely remove the Langdon family's garrison from the Belan Plain. Liberated? Sure enough, the great swordsman of Chester arrived at the military camp that night. Although all 15,000 heavy armored infantrymen passed through the portal, more than half of the infantrymen were still stranded in Wilk City. Swordsman Chester summoned the commanders of the eight cavalry battalions, although their respective defense zones had already been decided. Swordsman Chester pointed to the sand table and reiterated that the cavalry battalion had better mobility and combat capabilities. The strength is significantly higher than that of the heavy armored infantry regiment. So the eight cavalry battalions are basically arranged in the satellite towns farthest from Wilk City. And the eight cavalry battalions are very far apart from each other far away. It is difficult to rely on each other. The town where Serdak is responsible for garrisoning is called Doden. If you travel on horseback, it will take at least five days to reach the town of Doden. Early the next morning, Soldak received a week's marching rations for the cavalry battalion from the military camp logistics regiment. Before everyone outside the heavy armored infantry regiment arrived at the military camp, he left the temporary camp and rushed to the town of Doden in order to prevent the cavalry battalion from getting lost on the road. 
The Legion Logistics Department also arranged two local guides. After leaving the city, Serdek learned the origin of the name of the White Forest Plain. In the nearby woods grew a tree with leaves that looked like oleanders. The leaves of this tree were light cyan on the front and white on the back. Frost color. When the wind blows through the woods and the leaves flutter, the woods instantly turn white. So it is called the White Forest Plain. It is said that the leaves of this tree are very rich in oil and are a very resistant fuel. The local indigenous people like to use this kind of leaves to make fires and cook meals. In addition to this kind of tree with oleander-like leaves, the leaves of many herbaceous plants on the White Forest Plain have such characteristics. Serdak's cavalry battalion traveled north along the river, and many plants grew along the river. White-stemmed reeds, with some water birds flying back and forth among them. The ogre Gulidum saw a few white scales appearing in the sparkling river water, and without hesitation, he took big steps and jumped into the clear river water, swung the bone-crushing stick in his hand, and hit hard the river was smashed. The air-breaking sound of the bone-crushing stick was mixed with the sonic boom. The stick hit the river. Suddenly, a layer of sound waves pushed the river water and spread around. There was an exaggerated explosion sound from the river surface. There were explosions on the river surface, and countless the water droplets formed a series of water arrows and rushed around. And then countless fine water droplets fell from the sky. I thought the ogre saw the river and wanted to vent his anger. The next moment, a white-scaled fish floated out of the water. And then many white-scaled fish appeared one after another, floating belly up on the water. The ogre stood in the waist-deep river water, stretched out his big hand like a cattail fan, and fished out all the white-scaled fish. Chapter 696 People Are On A Journey the first impression that the white forest plain brought to Serdak was that the colors of the plants were lighter, like a world for those with mild color weakness. This road leading to the north along the river is covered with chest-high white dry reeds on one side, and on the slope on the other side is covered with a kind of wild grass called sword grass. The thorny vines make this seemingly flat slope not so easy to walk on. Those vines block it like a snagging rope. When the cavalry battalion took a short rest, the Gubalai horse was led to the slopes by the guides to graze. This is the ranch of the Goss family. It covers a very large area. It will take us about a day. They raise at least 5,000 Gubwa horses here and have 14 herds of horses, large and small. Morning and evening, the herdsmen will bring the horses to the herd rush to the river to drink water. And the road we were going to take happened to pass through the pastoral area. And the noble men of the Goss family did not mind the passing horses eating some wild grass on the roadside. A guide introduced to Suldek. The accent of imperial language is a little weird. But people can understand what he is saying. How long do we have before we can get out of this grassland? Serdak squinted his eyes and looked into the distance. The grassland could not be seen to the end. The guide replied, I'm afraid we won't be able to pass through this pasture today. We will camp next to the river upstream at night. We will not be able to leave this pasture until tomorrow morning. Then we will arrive at the village of Desavats in the evening. We can stay overnight in a villager's house. The cavalry battalion can camp outside the village. The girls in that village are very enthusiastic. If the baron needs to make arrangements, you can tell me in advance. Standing on Gulidum's shoulders, Andrew looked towards the distance of the pasture and couldn't help but sigh. This pasture is really big. The guide stood aside, looking up at Andrew on the ogre's shoulder with some awe, and explained. The Goss family participated in the initial development of the Bellan Plain, and this pasture was probably exchanged for a larger piece of land. Yes, in fact, this pasture only extends north along the river. Pasture without water sources is not valuable here. After all, no one is willing to drive the horses for a long time just to drink a sip of water. Andrew jumped off the ogre's shoulders and said to the guide, Even if there is no river, you can still dig a well. In Belan, you have many choices. When the guide said this, a look of pride appeared on his face. The rest time is always very short mainly because the new recruits of the cavalry battalion are not used to riding horses for long periods of time, and they cannot eat, drink, and eat on horseback, so they have to dismount and rest every once in a while. Even so, many recruits had worn out inner thighs. When they dismounted and walked, they grinned, bent their legs, and walked in a duck step, which was funny and ridiculous. However, no one complained about the hardship and exhaustion of this kind of marching life. They were a group of recruits who came out of a deserted land. They had not eaten enough of the marching rations made into a paste. Four fried wheat flour. Dehydrated dried vegetables. Dried, I was looking forward to the marching rations of meat meal and salt. And wished I could eat them three times a day. 
Even the guide felt that the marching rations distributed by the Green Empire were the most convenient food to eat. All you needed was to light a fire and boil a pot of hot water. If it was an emergency, it would not be difficult to swallow even if you use cold water. It's good, but it's too expensive. Two copies of these marching rations can be sold for one silver coin in Wilkes. With one silver coin, you can order a plate of war in the best restaurant in Wilkes City. Act steak. Only the Bene Troop stationed here will have the luxury to eat this kind of ration, the guide said with great envy. As soon as these words were said, these marching rations immediately went up a notch. The cavalry battalion continued north. In the afternoon, I finally saw a business group of nearly a hundred people in front of the avenue. There were more than 24-wheeled carriages filled with various supplies. The supplies on the trucks were also various. Most of the supplies were packed into wooden boxes or some linen bags. It is difficult to guess what kind of goods are contained inside. A mercenary group was walking in front of the caravan and found a cavalry group in the rear. Several mercenaries in front rode around to the rear of the caravan. Although they did not rush over, they were paying attention to the cavalry battalion. The cavalry battalion did not move very fast. But horses could still easily catch up with the four-wheeled carriages in the caravan. When the distance between the two sides was reduced to within a hundred meters, the steward of the caravan and the leader of the mercenary group walked out of the team at the same time. After greeting Serdak proactively, they saw the noble badge on Serdak's chest. And most of the vigilance in their eyes dissipated. Lord Baron, where are you going? The caravan steward jumped off his horse and asked humbly. Standing in front of Soldak, Serdak felt that this kind of thing was no secret. So he replied, Don't in town. The caravan steward grinned and said, Oh, it's actually so far away. If I remember correctly, that's the northernmost border of our occupied area. Serdak also asked, Where are you going? The caravan manager looked back at the caravan and replied in a low voice, There is no specific destination for the time being. We just want to sell these goods and then go to the Vale Valley to buy some black iron concentrate and sell them to Bena City. Many business groups on the plain will organize such caravans to travel between Bena City and Wilk City. However, whether it is in Bena City or Wilk City, during the time when the caravan is traveling back and forth, no matter whether it is in Bena City or Wilk City, coming or going, the car will always transport some local high quality and cheap goods to another city for sale. As long as it is profitable, there is nothing that cannot be sold. The caravan manager had a reserved conversation with Serdek and actually moved two boxes of cactus fruits from the truck to give to the cavalry battalion, and then asked the four-wheeled carriage of the convoy to stop by the roadside to make way for the cavalry battalion. Two boxes of cactus fruits were divided equally among the 500 cavalrymen, giving each person exactly one. Eating one of this sweet fruit during the journey can indeed make people feel happy, although the cost is not much. The caravan's ingratiating behavior has won the favor of many cavalrymen. Selina, who was riding a white camel, and Samira, the half-elf archer, each shared a few more berries. No one seemed to notice that Selina secretly stretched out a small white hand from under her skirt, grabbing a cactus fruit, quickly retracted. After nightfall, the cavalry camp camped on a slope by the river. The recruits were quite skilled in setting up tents, and the food was extremely simple marching rations. The recruits fetched some water from the river, and the veterans had already taken out the fire-gathering scrolls, unfolded them, and lit the bonfire for cooking. Chapter 697 Herding Horses by the River The grassland by the river looks very quiet at night. The cool wind blows through the white dry reeds, and the reeds rise and fall one after another. The white forest river flowing through Wilk City sparkles with sparkling light at night, like a precious pearl necklace on the chest of a plump woman. Stars appeared in the night sky. The star map here was very different from the star map in the night sky of Halanza City. Serdak knew that this place must belong to a different star field from Roland Continent. Fireflies hiding in the grass merge with the stars in the night sky, forming a sky full of stars. The ogre Gulidum was sitting on the grass by the river, holding a bunch of grilled fish in his hand and munching, looking at the brown and crispy grilled fish. A group of recruits, who ran to the river to fetch water couldn't help but devour them. Foaming at the mouth, I suddenly felt that the marching rations I had for dinner didn't taste so good. At this time, the recruits were filled with emotion. No one of the veterans said that the food would no longer taste good after eating it. If there is grilled fish, it must be mushy like a squid. The half-elf archer Samira sat alone on a grassy slope. Everyone knew that she was a bit withdrawn. Except for Serdak, Andrew, and Gulitam. She never paid attention to anyone. So no one bothered her. Under the night, 
she took off the hood on her head. Her light red eyes were like crystal clear rubies. She held a few cactus fruits in her arms. She peeled off the somewhat prickly peel, and the orange flesh inside exuded. With a sweet smell, her eyes chased the fireflies flying in front of her, seeming to be completely immersed in this beautiful night scene. Viru, who was all bandaged, sat down next to Samira, stared at the half-elf archer's ruby-like eyes, and said very calmly, No wonder you wear a hood every day. It turns out you have elf blood. Not to be outdone, Samira asked. What about you? What secret is hidden under the cloth? Weiru slightly pulled the strip of cloth on his left arm, showing the scales on his body in front of Samira's eyes, and then said, We are almost the same. You have more advanced elf blood. And I have lizard blood. We are born archers. Only male lizards in the wild swamps have obvious scales on their bodies. Generally, the scales on half lizards are very light. How do you know our captain? Samira asked curiously. Weiru's eyes fell on the Belan River in the distance as if he was lost in memories. And he said slowly, I used to be his captain, but our adventure group has been disbanded and everyone has gone their separate ways. Maybe he and I are the only ones alive now. I don't have anywhere to go for the time being. So I followed here. Samira took a look at Villa's arms and found that his skin had scaly lines. No wonder he would wrap his whole body. His eyes were indeed like those of a lizard, cold and emotionless, like a poisonous snake hiding in the grass staring at him giving people a bone-chilling chill all over his body. What about you? How did a mixed elf know Sernak? Weiru asked. In was Zimra's city in the Kindaplane. Our city was under siege by hell dogs. The captain was a knight from the guard camp who came as reinforcements. I happened to need a sum of money at that time. And he advanced my salary for five years in advance. I sold these five years to him, Samira said calmly. After saying that, Samira stood up and left with the cactus fruit in her hands. Want to be a Hawkeye? Velu asked Samira, who was walking closer to the edge. Samira stopped and turned to look at him with confusion. I want to be a Silver Moon Ranger more than Hawkeye. After saying that, he shook his red hair and left without looking back. There was a lantern hanging on the tent plane, and some mosquitoes were flying under the light. Zigna was lying on a soft blanket, practicing writing on a piece of parchment with a charcoal pen. She looked very serious. The dromedary white camel lay quietly aside seeming to be curious about what Zygna had written. Serdak walked out of the military camp, sat on the grass outside the tent, took off his salamander skin armor, and sat next to Selina wearing only a linen shirt, resting his head comfortably on her round and delicate thighs. Looking up at the clear starry sky, Selina was sitting outside the tent wearing a nightgown, gently caressing Suldak's cheek with her fingers. Maybe this place is more suitable for me and Zygna to live. Serdak looked up at Selina's soft face and asked curiously, why do you say that? You have such a feeling when you see this vast grassland? Selina shook her head and said softly, I want to give it a try to see if I can spread the teachings of the Dark Goddess here. The influence of the Goddess of Liberty on the people of the Green Empire is almost imprinted in the bones of every Imperial person, even those who the priests and battle priests have been away for so long. And the temple is overgrown with grass and almost abandoned. But everyone still hopes that one day they can return with the God's blessing dot. Then he closed his eyes again, as if to feel the world of this plane with a sense of smell, touch, and hearing. When she closed her eyes, her spiritual power spread like a tide. It might be different here. I didn't see the abandoned Liberty Temple in Wilkes City. There probably aren't many believers of the Statue of Liberty here, Selina said with her eyes closed. Before Soldak could speak, Selina seemed to feel something. She turned her head and looked northwest. The distance was shrouded in night and everything was pitch black. She said to Suldak, There is the sound of horse hooves over there. Many horses. Serdak stood up and looked in the direction Selina pointed. At this time, Weiru, who was sitting alone on the slope, also stood up and looked in the same direction as Serdak. Almost a quarter of an hour later, the rumble of horse hooves came from far and near like rolling thunder from the sky. In the dark night, several herdsmen drove a group of horses from a distance directly to the river. The horses gathered by the river. Several herdsmen held long whips and blocked the flow of the horses on the river bank. Which horse rushed towards the river and stepped out of the river? One step and you'll be whipped. Five or six herdsmen actually suppressed the commotion of hundreds of horses. What are they doing? Why don't they let the horses drink? Although it was dark, Selina could still clearly understand their every move. This was the ability given to her by the dark goddess. Serdak didn't have Selina's ability. 
He couldn't see the situation of the horses over there. When Selena said this, he guessed, I'm probably worried that the horse's lungs will explode. When a war horse runs fast, the entire lungs need to inhale a lot of air. If you drink cold water at this time, if you accidentally inhale it into the lungs, it will probably explode. By then, even if the horse doesn't die, it may be ruined. After the horses calmed down, the herdsmen let the horses walk into the knee-deep river and lowered their heads to drink. The herdsmen also seemed to have noticed the military camp stationed here, but they did not move away or come closer. They just kept a certain safe distance. Two herdsmen built a bonfire with horse dung and set up a black burning iron pot, probably hoping to prepare dinner. For other herdsmen pulled out a horse from the herd. There seemed to be a person lying on the horse's back. They carefully lifted the man off and let him lie flat on the grass. From a distance, it looked like someone was sick. It looks like someone is sick, Selena said to Soldek. Serdek said to Selena, Let's go over and take a look. Maybe we can help. Then we can talk to them to see if they have no faith as you said. Chapter 698 Writing Skills The herdsman had just put the multigrain cake on the iron drill, inserted it next to the bonfire, and tried to use the temperature of the bonfire to bake the multigrain cake until it became charred. The water in the iron pot boiled loudly. He threw a handful of washed wild vegetables with roots into the iron pot then squatted aside and nailed a prairie dog caught from the field to the iron pot. On the wooden board, peel off the skin with a knife. Run to the river and briefly clean the internal organs. Throw all the meat and bones into the soup pot and finally add a little salt. Two herdsmen were responsible for taking care of the horses by the river and two other herdsmen carried the stretcher to the fire. Several herdsmen sat together with gloomy expressions as if they wanted to wake up the herdsmen on the stretchers. After struggling for a long time, they got nothing. Even the water they fed flowed out from the corners of their mouths. They saw a cavalry camp not far away. There were probably many armies and caravans passing by on this road. But the few herdsmen didn't seem to care. Soldak and Selina walked over holding Zigna. And a guide followed behind him. Several herdsmen who were about to have dinner quickly stood up and bowed awkwardly to Serdak. Serdak waved his hand and walked to the injured herdsman. Seeing that he was lying unconscious on the stretcher, he squatted down and asked, what happened to him? The horses were frightened. Jeb rode forward and tried to rush to the front to stop the leading horse. But he was accidentally caught on the rope and fell off the horse. He was trampled by the horses behind and broke his ribs. We wanted to send him back. In the village, the herdsman said. Then he added, The horses can't run anymore and need to rest and drink water. So we stop here. The herdsmen who spoke imperial were not very good at it. And their words were mixed with some unintelligible local aboriginal languages. Fortunately, there was a guide nearby to help translate. The imperial language that Serdak spoke did not sound difficult to the herdsman. The injured herdsman was sleeping. His breathing was very weak. And his face was as white as a piece of paper. Can you see his injuries? Serdak asked the herdsman. At this time, several herdsmen came over and stared at Serdak. Selina and Zigna with wary faces. One of the herdsmen chatted with the guide in the local indigenous language for a few words. And then said, Of course. Please see, this is the rib that was broken by the horse. As he spoke, he lifted the blanket covering the injured herdsman and saw that the chest of the injured herdsman was trampled by the horse's hoof and had a fist-sized dent. It seemed that the back of the ribs had collapsed and the chest was full of bruises and purple marks. Serdak frowned slightly. He originally thought it was just a fracture or something, but he didn't expect that the ribs on his chest were stepped on and broken. The broken ribs were probably inserted into the injured person's organs in reverse direction, which caused the injuries in his eyes. The herdsman smeared some paste like green herbs on the wound, but it didn't seem to have any effect on the injury. He was seriously injured and had several broken ribs. The herdsman said this. He knew how badly his companion was injured, but he couldn't do much to help. Several other herdsmen were also silent beside him. Soldek asked, Are you from the village in front? The herdsmen were like a few silly geese nodding at the same time and talking in a flurry of words. We are all from the village of Desavats, and the baron of the Goss family hired us to herd their horses. Soldek glanced at Selina and asked, Is there a wizard in your village? The herdsmen shook their heads at the same time. Selina blinked and couldn't help but look at the herdsmen a few more times. As he spoke, a ball of holy light had gathered in Serdak's palm. It was like a warm ball of light spreading outwards from Serdak's palm. Several herdsmen couldn't help but stare. He closed his eyes and stared at the ball of light in Soldek's hand, his eyes changing from surprise to shock. 
one herdsman couldn't help but exclaim. Are you the priest in the temple? No. I'm just a knight leading an army passing by here. I happen to know some treatment methods. Soldak covered the injured herdsman's sunken wound with his hand. The injured herdsman seemed to feel a bit of pain in his sleep. And his face, there was a struggling expression on his face. His ribs are broken. The broken ribs may have penetrated into the organs. Now I have to cut a wound on his body and remove the broken ribs. Soldak stopped and said to several herders who were watching. After saying that, he took out a skinning knife from his thigh, rubbed it on the belt twice, and without any hesitation, he cut the herdsman's chest with the knife, cutting open the dent. Fortunately, the ribs were not injured. Instead of reaching the heart, it was inserted into the lungs, and there were as many as three. Soldak pulled out the three broken ribs from the chest with his hands. Blood suddenly spurted out from the wounds. And at this time, the herdsman's breathing also followed. Stopped. Serdak quickly used the holy light spell again to forcefully heal the herdsman's wounds. At the same time, Serdak uttered the words Nesolith. In the dark night, a magical halo suddenly flashed across his throat. He hand-drawn a magic pattern array on his chest, which is a rune language composed of a set of runes. Among the magic crystals left by Lord Johannes the Red Dragon, there is a very simple rune language. It took Serdak nearly a month to master its drawing method. The success rate of each spell casting is only about 30%. However, fortunately, this time it was a success. This runic language known as brilliance can allow people to strengthen themselves, increase vitality, transfer 15% of damage to the arms, enhance magic resistance, and a series of beneficial effects. Seeing a magical power pouring into the herdsman's body, the herdsman's breathing suddenly became smoother, and his pale face turned rosy. Serdak breathed a sigh of relief. This was the first time that he combined the runes into a more powerful rune language and used it to inspire the holy seal. This power fell on the herdsman as he wished. This magical power only lasted for less than a quarter of an hour before dissipating silently. During the entire treatment process, five herdsmen stood around, watching Soldak carefully pull his companion back from the hands of death. Seeing his chest recover, the wound scabbing quickly, and then wrapping it with a hemostatic bandage before finally breathing become calmer. Soldak took out a handkerchief and wiped the sticky plasma on his hands, and said to several herdsmen, His injury has stabilized temporarily. It is not suitable to move at the moment. He needs to be observed overnight until the condition has not worsened tomorrow morning. If so, his life will be saved. After saying that, he stood up and turned back to the cavalry camp without waiting for the herdsmen to say a word of thanks. The five herdsmen were frightened by Serdak's way of rescuing people. They were so surprised that they were speechless when they saw Serdak pulling out the broken ribs from their companion's chest with his bloody hands. Serdak left and even forgot to say some words of thanks for a moment. Only the horses by the river neighed. Selina took Zygna back to the tent. After getting into the tent, Selina asked Soldak, What did you cast just now? That magical power seems to be very powerful. Serdak tried again to draw a simple rune in front of him. A faint magical halo rose and was then injected into Serdak's body. He took a deep breath, as if he felt the inexplicable power explained to Selina. It is said to be the holy seal of the night. I realized it. It feels good, but the effect lasts a little short. However, using it in battle can instantly increase a person's strength. Son! Zygna raised her head and glanced at Soldak, with a complicated expression in her eyes. Serdak only stayed in the tent for a while. When he saw Selina spreading out the leather mattress in the tent, Serdak said, you guys go to bed early. I will go to the camp to inspect it again. The new recruits in the cavalry camp have no experience in living in the wild. We are in the Belen Plain, and we can't make any mistakes. I don't want to just walk out of Wilk soon. We will lead them back in despair. Selina knew that Serdak needed to get used to the cavalry battalion recently. After all, his cavalry battalion was newly established and many things he had not yet formed a habit of. Selina yawned, helped Zygna lay out the blanket, and said to Soldak, you should also go to bed early. A silver line lit up on the horizon, and the light of dawn spread across the grassland. The leaves of the weeds are covered with dewdrops, which appear crystal clear in the sunlight. Walking among the grass, the leather boots stirred the grass leaves, and clusters of dewdrops exploded in the grass, and the trouser legs would soon get wet. The horses were still grazing on the slopes. Several herdsmen not far away were surrounding the injured herdsman in a small tent. They watched him wake up from his drowsiness opened his eyes, and asked for water from his companions. Several herdsmen the herdsmen cheered in unison. It's really a miracle. 
Jeb was so seriously injured that it only took one night to heal. I originally planned to take Jeb back to the village while he was still breathing to give him one last look. The family never expected to rush to the river, meet the Baron, and actually heal Jeb's injury. A herdsman babbled over and over again, speaking an aboriginal language. Another herdsman poured some water from the clay pot, fed it into the mouth of the injured herdsman from the clay bowl, and asked casually, Should we thank the Baron again? The nagging old herdsman raised his head and said, This is very necessary. Which of you will go with me? Some herdsmen. Look at me and I look at you. I will go with you. One of the young and tall herdsmen said. The two herdsmen stood outside the cavalry camp and expressed their gratitude to Soldak. After daybreak, Serdak finally saw their faces clearly. The skin color of these two herdsmen was as yellow as beeswax. And the interpupil distance of their eyes was slightly narrower than that of the imperial people. They had fine braids on their heads. But their bodies were there were no special tattoos. But it was obvious that they were natives of the Belan Plain. The two herdsmen were dressed in rags like beggars. But their bodies were very strong. With muscles bulging out from their open chests. They can speak a lot of simple green empire language. And when they are in a hurry to answer. They can speak the indigenous language smoothly. Lord Baron. Thank you for your help. The older herdsman said that his face looked a bit long and thin. With deep wrinkles on his face. Serdak originally planned to patrol outside the camp. But when he walked out of the camp. He met these two herdsmen. Who came specifically to express their thanks. Serdak quickly called the guide over. And said to the two herdsmen. It's not a big deal. It happens to be within my ability. Whether he can wake up depends on his own will to survive. I have treated many of them. With such serious injuries. Some people have survived and others have died. So the help I can give is still very limited. The elderly herdsman put his hands on his shoulders, bowed his head in greeting to Serdak, and said, You have helped us, but we don't have any decent gifts for you. If it is convenient, please be sure to stop in our village. Now, our village is not far to the north, and it's called Desabots. Serdak turned to look at the guide and confirmed with him. It seems that we are indeed going to pass there? Yes, Lord Baron Serdak. The guide replied respectfully, as if Serdak had saved a herdsman. Even the tone of the two guides changed, and the look in their eyes changed from strange to full of kindness. Breakfast is still monotonous and boring, but it is still delicious for the recruits in the cavalry battalion. There are no trees around this grassland, and the cavalry are not in the habit of collecting horse dung. Fortunately, before Serdak's trip, he prepared some fire-gathering technique scrolls. Although the cost of living and cooking is a bit higher, son, fortunately it is convenient and quick. After breakfast, the cavalry battalion packed up the camp and set off in formation. The herdsmen also followed the cavalry battalion with their horses. They tied the injured herdsmen to their horses and drove the horses towards the north. The five herdsmen showed the Soldak cavalry what riding skills are. They rode on smooth horses, and their bodies were almost integrated with the horse's back. No matter how exaggerated the twists were, they could regain their strength back on horseback. They can drive their horses to sprint twice as fast as the cavalry. Or let the ancient bull-eye horses trot all the way. Adjust the ancient bull-eye horses' breathing method. So that they can run for a long time without getting tired. According to the veterans in the cavalry camp. This is the real riding skill. In fact, Serdak didn't know this either. He had been studying at the Knight Academy for nearly half a year. And had no idea that riding included these things. In addition to short-handled long whips. Several herdsmen only have a long rope hanging around their waists. It is said that this long rope is used to tether horses. They swung the rope on the grass and threw it casually among the horses. And they were able to hit the neck of an ancient horse. This skill made the cavalry in the cavalry camp very envious. Along the way, I watched the performances of several herdsmen. Near noon, the cavalry battalion arrived at the village of Desavats. Chapter 699 The Tired War Horse Desavats Village this village is not too big. There are some dilapidated and low wooden houses everywhere. And the roofs are also made of wooden boards. It looks very depressed. The only eye-catching thing is the huge livestock pen next to the village. The herdsmen drove the horses into the livestock pen. And the horses ran in familiarly. There was a well made of stones at the entrance of the village. When the horses were heard in the village, a large group of villagers ran out. Several villagers fetched several buckets of water from the well and smashed a rock with crystalline particles, threw it into the bucket, stirred it vigorously, and carried it to the horse to drink. A group of horses crowded around the water trough, fighting for a drink of water. This village looks very poor, 
and all the villagers are local indigenous people. However, they are not as friendly as the five herdsmen. Their eyes are wary and hateful, and they do not dare to get too close. They stand at the entrance of the village with indifference. His eyes looked at the cavalry not far away, but no one was willing to take a step forward. Serdak looked around and saw that only the upper half of the wooden houses in the village was exposed above the ground, while the other half was buried under the soil. The doors were dug down step by step to get into the mud houses. Because of this, these wooden houses are built very low and are somewhat damp inside. Some old people and children were lying outside in the sun, and the children ran to the entrance of the village to watch the fun. These herdsmen who went out to herd their horses were welcomed into the village like heroes returning in triumph. When the villagers saw an injured villager on the back of a horse, they panicked and shouted something to the crowd. Everyone hurriedly lifted him off the horse and laid him flat next to the well at the entrance of the village. Two old villagers separated from the crowd and walked to the front. While checking on the injured herdsmen, they also asked several herdsmen who had just returned from outside. Ask what happened. Two women in rags squeezed out of the crowd, followed by several children, who gathered around the injured villagers. Some dried fish, dried wild vegetables, mushrooms, dried radishes and other foods were dried on the roof. The guide in the cavalry camp introduced Soldek. This is the village of Bisowak. Most of the people in this village herd horses and manage the horse herds for the Goss family. Their ancestors were a group of nomads. Every day, every time I pass by here, I usually rest at the entrance of the village. This well is the greatest wealth in the village. Andrew held the horse's reins with one hand and asked the horse to stop. He looked at the desolate village and said with emotion, The life of the indigenous people here is worse than ours. He was talking about the Nanai tribe in the jungle of the Maka Plain. The guide smiled and said, The situation in this village has been settled. At least the people in their village can help Mr. Goss. Seeing the eyes of Soldak, Andrew and others falling on him. The guide explained, Once some places are occupied by nobles, the people living on that land will move away. If they cannot adapt to the life in Wilk City, they must move north to the edge of the Warcraft Forest. Many people reluctant to move to the edge of the dangerous Warcraft Forest. They move to those small towns. And in order to survive, they had to work for the wealthy people in the towns. The little money I earned back is not enough to buy brown bread. But it won't make people starve to death. Everyone is like living in a cage. In order to survive, they will inexplicably lose many precious things, such as dignity. Free. If you live in a small town for a long time, you will find that even if you want to leave here, it is impossible. The tribesmen have lost their living skills in the wilderness. And this land has no place for them. The situation of the villagers here is better. At least, they can still ride horses and run as they like on the grassland. Serdak glanced at the guide, but he didn't expect that the guide would have so many thoughts. The colonists in Beta province need some obedient indigenous people to open up farms, pastures, mines, workshops, etc. in the plain. The last thing they want to see is that these indigenous people become extremely lazy because of their wealthy life. Freedom is even more undesirable. If everyone has their own ideas, it will be difficult to manage. The nobles are willing to come to the Belan Plain in order to open up some plain territory and expand their private property. Marquis Luther asked Serdak to lead the cavalry battalion to garrison here, mainly to earn military merit and be promoted to a title. And he also wanted Serdak to encircle a piece of land for himself when he had the opportunity. It's just that in the current Belen Plain, if you want to open up land, you have to go to the northernmost town of Duodan, which is already close to the famous Warcraft Forest in the Belen Plain. The civilians of the Bena province came to the Belan Plain through the portal, mostly to make more money. To them, the natives of these plains are a group of cheap labor, and only by letting them work hard can they create wealth comes. When the Bena people entered the Belan Plain, they used force to suppress the local indigenous people until they surrendered. Finally, they must be absorbed into the Green Empire's plain people. Once the situation stabilizes, more Bena people will continue to enter the Belan Plain through the portal. They will occupy a large area of the Belan Plain and continue to squeeze it. Their living space draws nutrients from the Belan Plain and feeds back to the Green Empire. In the eyes of the Bena people, these aboriginal people are a group of second-class citizens. From birth to death, they are used to be exploited. Only by exploiting them can they quickly create wealth. This is deeply impressed upon them. The deep-seated obsession of the imperial people. The guide in front of him turned out to be a very special aborigine and it was hard for Soldak not to be impressed by him. At this time, the herdsmen who herded their horses probably heard that it was Serdak 
who saved the injured herdsman. The old man in the village walked cautiously toward Serdak. Dear Lord Baron, all the villagers of Desavat's village thank you for your selfless help. The old man saluted Serdak. Serdak dismounted and asked the old man, Are you the village chief here? Although Serdak is the garrison commander of Bena province, who came to the Belan Plain, and can be regarded as a ruler-level figure, he feels that at least there are superficial things, such as politeness, gentlemanly demeanor, chivalry, etc. Yes, it should still be there. As expected, the old man was the elder of Desavat's village. For these aborigines, the elder was the village chief. Serdak was just passing by here, so he had no intention of having too deep contact with him. Therefore, he did not accept the elder's invitation and entered the village. Instead, he stayed outside the village for a while and prepared to lead the cavalry battalion. Depart from the village of Desavats. Andrew quickly called out to the cavalrymen who were resting at the entrance of the village. Everyone, we are setting off. The cavalry mounted their horses one after another and marched to the north in formation. As soon as they set off, before the team had gone a few steps, they heard a guba horse neighing. And then the war horse roared in the team. He fell down with a sound. The cavalryman on horseback was very flexible. He jumped off the horse the moment the horse fell and was not crushed by the body of the horse. The moment the war horse fell, it struggled on the spot twice more. Its two front legs supported half of its body. The war horse stood up again and shook its body hard. The heavy materials on the horse's back were shaken. There was a loud crashing sound. Serdak, Andrew, Samira, and Wailu rushed over immediately. Serdak jumped off the horse and walked to the horse to check its physical condition. He could feel that the muscles of the horse were trembling. But he didn't know what was wrong. Villa pulled the frightened and pale cavalryman up from the ground and patted him on the shoulder to calm him down. Surrounded by a group of villagers, the village elder walked up to Soldek. He stepped forward and looked up at the tall ancient horse. There was a hint of unbearability in his cloudy eyes. He turned to face Soldek said, they are all in poor physical condition. They have not received adequate rest. They are very tired and not suitable for walking long distances. If they continue like this without making any changes, more horses will continue to fall. Serdak did not expect the elder to say this. So he asked the elder, Are these horses sick? The elder shook his head. Can't you eat? Soldek asked again. The elder shook his head. He sighed softly, walked up to the war horse and put his arms around the horse's head as if to comfort the war horse. He was still muttering some indigenous words in his mouth. It seemed that the war horse was not repulsive. He then put his head on the war horse's forehead, closed his eyes, stretched out his hands, and gently stroked the war horse's ears, as if whispering to his lover. After remaining like this for a while, the elder raised his head and said to Soldek, It said that it came to a very distant desert, experienced some thrilling battles, was cold and hungry along the way, and then sat on an airship for a long time. The wounds left by standing in the battle have never been fully recovered. Their physical strength they can no longer meet your needs. Not only do they have to carry such heavy supplies, heavy armor, and weapons, but they also need to carry a strong warrior. They not only need rest, but also need comfort and careful feeding. Unexpectedly, this elder could actually communicate with the war horse, which made everyone in Serdak stunned. Serdak also immediately realized the problem faced by the cavalry battalion. These war horses were not strong enough to bear the weight of heavy armor, weapons, and cavalry. After all, the ancient Bolai horse is more suitable for forming light cavalry. Serdak was also a little worried. If he rushed to Doden town with a cavalry battalion like this, how many war horses would fall on the road? This group of war horses was not very wealthy to begin with. He said to Andrew, I thought I could form a cavalry battalion with one person and one horse. But now it seems that these horses are far from enough. I don't know if the Goss family ranch sells Gubo war horses. He asked the guide next to him. Do you know the Goss family's estate here? The guide immediately stood up straight and replied. Yes, Lord Baron Soldak. Mr. Goss's manor is right next to the small town of Killen. It's a day and a half's journey from here to there. Soldak walked to the elder of Wet's village and thought for a moment before saying to the elder. If possible. I would like to hire a few young people to join the cavalry camp. I don't need them to help me fight. I want them to be able to teach my cavalry with their knowledge of horse breeding and superb riding skills. I will treat them as horse trainers on the payroll. And if my request embarrasses you, just pretend I didn't say anything. The elder did not expect that Serdak's request did not have any coercive tone. He turned to the group of people behind him and asked, 
Which of you is willing to join the Baron's cavalry camp? Help him take care of these horses. And teach these soldiers to ride horses in his camp? A group of aboriginal villagers behind him looked at each other in confusion. They exchanged a few words in low voices. And then said a few brief words to the elders in aboriginal language. The elder also pondered for a moment, and then said to Soldek. Speaking of which, we are still herdsmen in the Goss family ranch. Specifically herding horses for Baron Goss. If you want us to join your army, I'm afraid we have to say H, low to Mr. Goss. Soldak originally wanted to meet the ranch owner and discuss buying horses with him. Then he said, I will. Let's go to the small town of Killen and take the opportunity to visit Baron Goss. After hearing what Serdak said, these villagers felt relieved and stood up one after another, expressing their willingness to join Serdak's cavalry battalion. Considering that the new recruits should become familiar with these war horses as soon as possible, Serdak almost refused to accept all comers and recruited a total of 27 herdsmen with excellent equestrian skills to join the cavalry battalion. He also adopted the advice of the elders of the village of Wutz and shared the heavy armor. Heavy knight spears and flails carried by the war horses with the other 50 horses carrying some supplies behind the team in order to reduce the burden on these horses. However, the number of idle war horses is too small after all and it is impossible to carry all the heavy armors on the horses. Some heavy armors can only allow Serdak to temporarily put them into the magic pocket. But Serdak's magic waste bag is also full of supplies and cannot hold these heavy armors. There was no other way and we couldn't inform Aphrodite to activate the summoning circle in full view of the public. So we could only let the cavalry battalion be stationed outside what's village and rest for a day. Serdak might as well take advantage of the night to quietly return to the lava cave of the sulfur mine in his tent, take the opportunity to transfer his belongings, and then go to the secret room of the red dragon treasure to feed the red dragon Izer. Serdak knew that it was not easy to lead a cavalry battalion, but he did not expect to encounter such trouble as soon as he arrived in the Belan Plain. If I had known earlier, those 200 war horses would not have been sold to the horse market. It would be good to carry some supplies for us. Serdak told Aphrodite his troubles. The succubus lay lazily on a stone bed, supporting her side cheek with one hand, looking at Soldak with a smile and said, Didn't you say that those horses have been eliminated? Even if they are kept in service, they will not last long. Serdak frowned and said, It won't take long, but it's better than nothing. When I first arrived in Belen Plain, I had to consider buying a horse. I don't know if I can buy it yet. If you think about it, I have gained something this time. At least I have hired some local natives who are proficient in raising horses. Although the succubus Aphrodite comforted Serdak in this way, there was a clear expression of gloating on his face. No cover up. Serdak waved to Aphrodite and walked towards the lava mine. Chapter 700 Killen Town The town of Keelan is located directly north of this prairie. The cavalry battalion rested for a day and night outside the village of Wutz. Taking advantage of this period, the indigenous herdsmen screened all 550 Gubalai war horses. Although there appears to be nothing wrong with these war horses, they are all in a state of fatigue. Marching every day prevents war horses from getting adequate rest, which ultimately leads to a rapid decrease in body fat. This is also the main reason why some war horses collapse under the weight. After a day of rest and lightening the load in time, the condition of the war horse seemed much better than yesterday and it was considered to be ready for travel. With guides and local herdsmen leading the way, the cavalry battalion continued northward along the Belan River. The road is monotonous and long, and in some places only the rutted tracks are not covered by weeds. In the distance, a field of wild leek flowers looks like white clouds. Several local natives are squatting on the grass, picking wild leek flowers. There are also a few horses grazing leisurely on the side. The entire grassland looks like a light green ocean from a distance. The wind blew and the grass blades rose and fell like waves. It wasn't until the continuous mountains appeared on the distant horizon that Serdak realized that this fertile grassland was about to come to an end, and the undulating mountains gradually grew larger in his field of vision. After a day's journey, finally on the fourth day after leaving Wilk City, I saw the town of Keelan hidden at the foot of the mountains. I heard from the guide that the Belan River changes direction in front of Jilin Town and flows westward, forming a lake and wetland not far from the town. The Jilin River flows all the way west and will flow after bypassing this mountain ridge, entering a canyon. It flows westward into a huge inland lake. The town is built along a gentle slope, and the rows of houses are many times better than what's village. It is built next to the lake formed by the Belan River, and it is like building this exquisite manor, which is blocked by a white birch forest. 
unexpectedly. I met this caravan again in Jilin Town. The carriages in the caravan parked in the open field outside Jilin Town. They laid out the goods they brought, forming a small market outside the town. The residents of the town were allowed to choose at will. And the types of goods were also there is a dazzling array of items, ranging from silks, furs, cloths to various gold, silver, and bronze wares. But most of them are iron pots with round bellies and hanging rings. It seems that the business is pretty good. Many residents of the town gathered here. Some people even bought barrels of fruit wine from the caravans. These oak barrels are not too big and can be easily carried on their shoulders and transported home. Dinner was being prepared in the camp behind the caravan. A large iron pot was set up behind to simmer broth. And three cooks were making scones in front of a pan. A group of children from the town stood outside the camp, looking here curiously. They seemed to be very interested in the food cooked here. They squatted on the low wall with their bare feet, laughing and laughing. But there was no one there. Dare to get close. The women in the caravan were washing clothes by the river. They wore cool skirts and slippers. They washed the basins of clothes and dried them on the grass by the river. Then, they squatted in the shallow water by the river to wash their hair. The river water wetted their skirts, revealing their hot and youthful figures. The young people in the town couldn't help but squat on the only wooden bridge in the town, looking over the wooden railings and pointing at the women in the caravan from time to time. It seemed that having a row of wooden railings blocking their bodies would make them feel safer. In fact, these women in the caravan are not expensive. As long as you take out ten silver coins, you can ask them to spend a wonderful night. Perhaps those young people have this kind of mentality and watch from a distance. A group of cavalry came from outside the town, which naturally alerted the troops stationed in the town. The private army of the Langdon family stationed here thought that the replacement troops were coming. The head of the infantry regiment came over happily and wanted to hand over the defense with the cavalry battalion commander Soldak. When Soldak said that his team, the cavalry battalion was about to go to Duodan town. And for a while, it was difficult to hide the disappointment on their faces. Later, I heard Soldak introduce that the heavy armored infantry regiment of Luther Legion had entered the Belan Plain three days ago, knowing that the day of his return to Bena province was just around the corner. His disappointment was quickly relieved. These infantrymen suddenly became very excited again and allowed Serdak's cavalry battalion to be stationed outside the town. So with the permission of the local garrison, Soldak and the cavalry battalion were stationed outside the town. The caravan steward saw Serdak and his cavalry battalion from a distance and came over to say H, low to Serdak. Since they had greeted each other on the previous trip and the other party had given Serdak two boxes of cactus fruits, Serdak had no reason to be cold to the caravan manager this time and act like he was not allowed to enter. The caravan manager was also a very measured person. He did not enter the cavalry camp, but just stood at the entrance of the camp and said to Soldak with a smile, I thought you would walk in front of us, but unexpectedly you fell behind us. Serdak patted the war horse beside him and said, We spent a day repairing in what's village, which delayed some travel. As for rushing to kill in town this time, it was also a temporary decision. I heard that Baron Goss lives in a manor near the town, and I plan to pay a visit. The caravan manager turned his head and glanced at the manor by the lake outside the town and introduced to Soldek. I have dealt with Baron Goss several times before. He has moved to Killen Town for many years and has been managing this pasture. In addition to raising several large groups of horses, there are also some yellow sheep and cattle on this pasture. Every year, a large number of sheep and cattle rush to Wilk City. It is one of the top ranchers in this area and the largest meat supplier. Soldek asked again. Do you know what the relationship between Baron Goss and the Goss family of Alensa City is here? The caravan manager pondered for a while, and then said, I haven't heard of this. Maybe he is a relative. Then the caravan steward's eyes fell on the native herdsmen who were managing the horses in the camp, and he lowered his voice and said to Soldek, But I see that you let some local aborigines join the cavalry camp. With all due respect, many of these aborigines are related to horse thieves on the grassland. They are not trustworthy. They may sell you to horse thieves one day. You when you first come here, be careful no matter what you do to avoid being scammed and causing disputes. Thank you for the reminder. I will pay special attention to these. Serdak whispered to the caravan steward. The two chatted casually for a few more words. And then the caravan manager was called away. It was said that he was going to discuss a business deal. Serdak also has some trivial matters waiting for him to deal with. News that the cavalry battalion was stationed outside the town soon spread to the town. Some residents of the town stood outside the military camp 
holding some items. Some were holding a basket of cabbage. And some were carrying two silver-scaled fish. There were also some seasonal fruits. And some people set up food stalls outside the military camp. The fragrant fried food was put out. And the aroma immediately attracted many new soldiers in the military camp. If Guaidam hadn't rushed to the lake to catch fish, I'm afraid the food stall would have made a lot of money today. Even without the ogre as a big customer, the recruits surrounded the food stall and bought up all the fried food on the food stall. Seeing that the tents were set up at the camp, Soldak took Selena and Samira into the town. Jalan Town doesn't look too big, with only a cross-shaped main street. There are many shops on these two main streets, and they seem to have all kinds of businesses. There are some shops and workshops mixed in, including weapon shops, leather shops, tailor shops, magic potion shops, restaurants, and hotels are all located in the most conspicuous places on the street. The plaques of these shops are very clear hanging outside the shops. It can be seen that almost all the shop owners here are immigrants from Bina province. Some shop assistants are also Bina people. Some local aborigines can only see their voices in some workshops. Most of them are remade. Some hard work. The life atmosphere in the town is very rich. The main streets are paved with stones, and flower ponds are built at the intersections. Although the town is not big, it is well managed. It is next to a mountain that is not too high. There are sparse trees growing on the mountain. Some trees have been transplanted in the town. But the number of these trees is not large. It seems that the residents in this town live a very comfortable life. It would be nice to think about it if they could live here for a while. Every morning when I open the window, I can see the lake outside the town. Seeing the vast grassland, Selena sighed as she walked. When Serdak passed the restaurant, he saw that almost all the people inside were from the Green Empire. And the looks they cast towards him were also very cordial. This is one of the few towns closest to Wilk City. And the security is of course very good. The guide followed and introduced Soldak and others. The small town of Jilin used to be very lively. There used to be a copper mine in the mountains behind the town. However, that copper mine was dug out a few years ago. Now the miners in the town have long after moving away from this place. Most of the remaining residents are engaged in refining magic copper. However, in recent years, the population of Jilin Town has been uncontrollably decimated. The guide pointed to the mountains behind the town. Serdak did not see any metallurgical workshops or large chimneys in the town. So he did not expect that this place would once be rich in copper mines. Samira stopped in front of a fruit stall and picked up the green fruit on the fruit stall to taste it. It must taste good, because she bought some more. Zigna followed Soldak and looked at the town curiously. She held the fruit that Samira handed her in her hand and nodded. The sound was very crisp. There were probably very few outsiders in the town. And the people in the town looked at Serdak curiously. But they probably saw the noble badge on his chest. So no one dared to approach them. This is also a privilege enjoyed by the nobles. At the end of the long street was a wide square. When Soldak and his party walked over, they found that some small town residents were actually watching the excitement in the square. Soldak planned to visit Baron Goss, who lived by the lake. He did not intend to waste time. So he walked directly through the town without stopping. He saw that there seemed to be people in the square watching something. So he did not intend to go. Just watch the fun and avoid getting into trouble. On the other hand, Signa and Samira couldn't stop and wandered around in the square. Signa took advantage of her short stature and the crowd couldn't stop her. And she quickly got to the front. People are still gathering in the square. Most of them are aborigines with beeswax colored skin. They keep coming and gather in the square. Not long after, Zigna and Samira ran back. Dak, Dak, go and save that girl. She is tied to a rock and is not given food or water. If this continues, she will be scorched to death by the sun. Zigna ran back. Like a koala. Suddenly hugged Soldak's thigh. Pointed with one hand to the place surrounded by the crowd. And begged Soldak. Soldak asked in shock. What's going on? Seeing that Zigna couldn't explain clearly, the guide stood up with a heavy face and said, I'm going to find out what's going on. Serdak and his party had no choice but to wait at the edge of the square. Not long after, the guide walked back quickly from the crowd, but the atmosphere in the square had begun to become tense. A large number of indigenous people gathered in the square, and no one talked. The atmosphere in the huge square was actually very dull. There is indeed a local girl tied to the punishment stone over there. Her employer said that she had stolen a beautiful colorful vase. So he tied her to the punishment stone and wanted to torture her to find out the whereabouts of the vase. 
But the girl was very tough. Has not said anything. Tortured for so long. Without food or water. The whole person is about to die of dehydration. The aboriginal people in the town think this is unfair. Spontaneously gathered here. The guide looked worried. Said lustfully. How are you doing? Soldek patted his forehead. Now that I have encountered this kind of thing. I can't ignore it. I saw the sound of quarreling coming from the center of the crowd in the dull square. I didn't go too close to see the specific situation clearly. But I think it's not too optimistic. The aborigines next to the punishment stone are very excited. The guide said to Soldek. Let's go over and see what's going on. Serdak decided to go over and have a look, and said to the guide, seeing a nobleman walking towards the punishment stone in the center of the square. The town residents on the side quickly backed away to both sides. Soldak walked to the punishment stone effortlessly. This was the first time that Serdak saw the punishment stone. A dark black rock placed in the center of the square, like a huge stone bed. There are several dark iron rings inlaid on the boulder, and a black iron chain extends from one of the iron rings. The iron chain is not too long and the other end is connected to a heavy shackle, which ties a ragged girl to the torture chamber. On a stone, the girl's lips were already chapped and her face was sallow. She was lying on the punishment stone dying, for guards and armor stood around the punishment stone. They looked at the aborigines coming up all around with vigilant faces. They kept tapping the swords on their sides with their hands and shouted, Back off! Everyone! Back off! Chapter 701 Bottle The midday sun made the square a little hot and even the wind blowing was warm. People crowded in the square, and a group of aboriginal people held up some wooden boards and surrounded the punishment stone in the center of the square, trying to surround the girl on the punishment stone to block the scorching sun. Some people even wanted to pour water from the water bottle on the girl. The four guards held their spears horizontally, blocking the crowd from getting too close. She was lying on the black reef. Her skin exposed outside her clothes was sunburned red by the dazzling glare. Her mental state was very poor. Her eyes were half closed. And even though her lips were chapped and her eye sockets were sunken, she could not hide her beautiful face. She looked a little thin, with a pointed chin and a straight nose. Her skin color was slightly whiter than that of other aborigines. But her face was full of stubbornness. She was probably only 11 or 12 years old. The long linen skirt she was wearing had become tattered. Her thin arms and legs had almost no flesh on them. Her bare feet and legs were curled up and her body was almost flat. At the Black Reef, it was burned red by the hot punishment stone. Several aborigines in the crowd seemed very excited. They tried to rush away from the guards guarding the punishment stone, but were blocked by the guards. There were many onlookers in the square, but the imperial people who had immigrated from Bena province just watched coldly from a distance, their eyes full of contempt and indifference. The sun burned the rocks to a boil, and some water poured on the girl's face. She tried hard to curl up, but was blocked by two metal chains. Serdak walked through the crowd and stood in front of the girl. The moment he looked up, his eyes revealed the desire for life. Seeing Serdak approaching, the girl closed her eyes with an indifferent expression, raised her pointed chin, let her head lie on the black reef, and covered her embarrassed face with one hand. The guards didn't dare to stop Serdak. Seeing Serdak's unfamiliar face, they didn't know what to say for a moment. After all, the silver noble medal hanging on Serdak's chest prevented them from showing any disrespect to Serdak. Several people dressed as nobles were watching from a distance. Seeing that the scene was a bit out of control, they whispered a few words to the subordinates behind them. Two guards walked quickly to the center of the square and squeezed in from the crowd of aborigines. They saw Soldak standing next to the punishment stone with two female dependents and a little girl, followed by a local guide. These two servants were hesitant beside them, not sure whether they should come up or not. They hesitated for a moment, then seemed to remember the purpose of coming here, and began to help the guards maintain order on the field. They also told the guards that someone had gone to the garrison barracks in Jilin Town to apply for garrison reinforcements, and asked them to hold on a little longer. The guards, who were initially flinching, heard their subordinates say this, and their legs became a little stronger, and they became more determined to push back the aboriginals. Selina pulled Zigna and stood beside Soldak. Just as she was about to walk towards the girl on the Black Reef, she was stopped by a guard. We are under orders. Ma'am! No one is allowed near her. Selina hesitated a little and looked at Soldek beside her. Serdek said calmly to the guard. Listen, guard. She needs to drink some water. If this continues, she will die. 
The mayor ordered that no one can get close to her until she explains the whereabouts of the stolen goods. One of the guards said persistently. Serdak took a look at the four guards. They should all be Bena people who came through the portal from the Green Empire. However, their accents were different from those of the Bena people. They may have lived here for a long time. Reason. Soldak glanced down at the guard and said with a serious face. I need to take a look at the judgment of the House of Representatives Court or the authorization signed by the Archon of Killin' Town. The guards did not expect that the noble baron in front of them would show a business-like attitude. They did not dare to resist the order of a noble baron. But they refused to get out of the way. They could only bite the bullet and said, These certificates are not in our hands for the time being. Samira, who had been standing behind Serdek, suddenly flashed out like a ghost, stepped in front of the guard, clasped her arm around the guard's neck like a poisonous snake, and stared coldly with a pair of light red eyes. The guard shouted coldly, Then get out of the way! The guard didn't even feel any push, and his body took a few steps back involuntarily. Samira was wearing a set of expensive salamander skin armor and a hood, covering her face tightly. She walked to the black reef, reached out and took off the water bag from her waist, and pulled the aboriginal girl on the black reef. He half-hugged, half-hugged, snuggled into her arms, put the water bag next to her chapped lips, and fed her some water. Selina and Zygna quickly stepped forward to help. The guard who was shouted back quickly caught up with him and wanted to stop Samira. But he didn't dare to get close. He just tried to persuade her with a grimace on the side. You can't be so barbaric. You can't take her away. She is a thief. He stole a beloved ceramic vase from Lord Goss. It has exquisite colorful patterns. You must know that this kind of vase was brought from the Roland continent. Expensive porcelain is so expensive. But it's this aborigine who stole the vase. We want to get the vase back and give her some punishment. This is not too much. Selina took out a blanket, covered the girl's body, and scolded the guard. How long has she been here in the sun? She is already dehydrated. Do you want her life? The guard muttered something in a low voice. The surrounding aboriginal people did not expect that someone would stand up and speak for them. For a moment, they were so excited that they surrounded the black reef and blocked the water system. Someone among the aborigines came up with an earthen pot, gingerly lifted the blanket, and smeared a light green grass juice on the girl's sunburned skin. The girl drank some water and regained some energy. She looked at Samira blankly, and her wrists became a little eroded where they were worn by the shackles. Without saying a word, Samira took out a sharp dagger from her thigh and struck the shackles on the girl's wrist hard, which immediately made Serdak's heart tighten. Although the Green Empire's standard weapons were made with very sophisticated craftsmanship, but if you use a standard dagger to forcefully cut off the prisoner's chains, the dagger will inevitably break. The shackles snapped, and Samira asked the aborigine, who walked up boldly, with a pot of medicine to apply the medicine on her wrists. The guard on the side turned pale with fright when he saw Samira cutting off the shackles. He even dared not come forward. He just held the spear in his hand and said to Samira in a trembling voice, You can't let her go. She hasn't told you the whereabouts of the vase yet. Samira looked up at the vicious sun above her head and wanted to carry the girl to a shady place. There were only a few poplar trees on the edge of this square. When she stood up with the girl in her arms, the surrounding native people also followed her. The four guards and two retinues crowded into the crowd, struggling to stop Samira and the others. But they stood in front and refused to give an inch. Samira handed the girl to Selina beside her, took off the alloy bow from behind without hesitation, put on an arrow, and fully pulled the bow's string. The sharp arrow tip almost touched the tip of the guard's nose. The guard was so frightened that he was sweating profusely on his forehead. If you dare to block me again, I will shoot you to death with an arrow. Get away! Samira shouted coldly to the guard. The murderous aura he brought back from the battlefield seemed to be about to shoot the guard through in the next moment. The guard was so frightened that his legs weakened, and he hurriedly stepped aside with his companions. The square is located on the west side of the town, not far from the parliament hall in the center of the town, and the town's garrison camp is also within sight. The commotion in the town square has attracted the attention of the garrison camp. It will take some time for the infantry to rush over. At this time, several people dressed as nobles standing on the edge of the square saw that their subordinates could not control the situation and could no longer stand by the square and watch. So they hurriedly came towards Soldak and his party. Walking in front was a young man wearing aristocratic clothing. He had a fair complexion and no sword on his waist. He was probably used to living a pampered life. But he did not wear a noble badge on his chest. Not even a knight badge. No, 
he walked up to Serdak and said to Serdak very enthusiastically, My Lord Baron, who are you? Serdak stood up straight and said to the young man, Baron Serdak, the sheriff of the desolate land of the guard camp of Halanza City in the Bena province, belongs to the Lutheran Legion Cavalry Regiment in the Bena province. This time I was ordered to rush to the Belan Plain to garrison and replace the Langdon family army. Who are you? Hearing Serdak say such a list of names, the young nobleman smiled unnaturally and said with some unconfidence, I am Arlo Goss. My father is a baron like you. I manage this ranch here for the Goss family. It turns out that he is the son of a baron. No wonder he is wearing aristocratic clothes, but no aristocratic insignia. Normally, these young people can choose to enter the Knight Academy. After graduation, they have the opportunity to directly become a knight officially canonized by the Empire. However, his face is fair, his figure is thin, and he has no clothes on, no leather armor, no sword and he didn't look like a knight. Maybe it's because there is no knight academy nearby, Soldak thought. But this means that this Arlo, Goss was just a commoner, wearing gorgeous aristocratic clothes, which obviously did not agree with his identity. At this time, a middle-aged woman from the aboriginal crowd ran out and saw her crawling on the ground in Arlo, in front of Goss. He hugged his calf and almost pressed his face against Arlo, Goss's boots, begging him, Master Arlo, Please let Nika go. She really didn't steal your vase. Arlo. Goss wanted to kick the aboriginal woman away, but his legs were not that explosive. So the subordinates on the side forcibly dragged the aboriginal woman aside. Arlo. Goss smiled awkwardly at Suldek, looked at the shiny leather boots he was wearing, and said, You see how barbaric they are. Then he realized that he could not let Serdak look down upon him. So he puffed up his chest and said, You just came to the Bell End Plain. So you may not know much about the situation here. These unruly and poor aborigines are a group of thieves. Rogues and beggars. They cannot stand the hard life and often steal the property of our foreign colonists. This time I just want to get my vase back and I haven't done anything outrageous. So isn't this okay? Perhaps he has been accustomed to living a life of pampering and privilege. And his tone of voice has become accustomed to the toughness of those in power. I was just exercising the rights of a noble. I don't think I violated the laws of the Green Empire. What do you think? Baron Serdak. Several servants stood aside with grimaces. They really didn't know how to remind their young master what tone he should use to speak to a real noble baron. Serdak did not expect that a vase would trigger the case. He heard Arlo. The tone of Goss's words made him feel a little unhappy. He thought that he was going to see Baron Goss and wanted to buy some war horses from him. And he felt a little regretful for being rashly involved in this matter. It was just impossible to withdraw. So he said smoothly, You lost a vase at home? Maybe I can help you find the whereabouts of the vase. Serdak thought that he might be able to find the real thief with the help of Aphrodite's urge and charm. Arlo. Goss did not expect that Serdak would say this. He was stunned for a moment. A vase was nothing to him. He just wanted to take this opportunity to make the aborigines in the town fear him. The life and death of the girl and the vase, he didn't care much about his whereabouts. Tell me. Did you take that vase? Soldak turned to look at the weak breathing girl in Selena's arms and whispered in her ear. Listen, if you took it, as long as if you return the vase to him, I can guarantee that you will not be punished. Under the gaze of several people, the girl still stubbornly shook her head. Serdak glanced at Selena, who also shook her head slightly. Apparently she didn't think that the aboriginal girl had stolen the vase. So she turned around and faced Arlo. Who else was in the house when the vase was thrown? I want to meet each of them, Goss asked. That's the study room. Except for Nika who goes there regularly to clean it every day. Almost no one goes there. Occasionally, my father will read in the study room. But he happens to be out these days. So I usually don't pay much attention to what's done here. Joe told me about throwing the vase. And Joe is my brother. Arlo. Goss pointed at a chubby noble boy beside him and introduced him to Soldak. The little fat man noticed Soldak looking over and forced a smile. Seeing his eyes flickering, showing some inner struggle, perhaps knowing something inside, Soldak reached out and touched the little fat man's head and said to him and the people around him, As a knight who believes in the power of the holy light, I have the blessing of God. I can see truth and falsehood. No one who lies can escape my eyes. As he spoke, he released his power in the square and a five-meter tall double-faced for armed demon god appeared behind him. The god's face slowly turned towards the front, facing the little fat guy with sweat on his forehead. 
He stared closely at the little fat man and shouted to him. If you don't want divine punishment, then don't lie and tell me where the bottle is. When the little fat man saw Soldak's sharp eyes, he was so frightened that his legs became weak. He sat down on the ground, pinched his ears with his hands and cried loudly. I accidentally broke the bottle. I'm worried. I was scolded and didn't dare to tell the truth. I didn't want to hurt anyone, nor did I want to hurt Nika. I just wanted to buy another one from the grocery store in the town. But there was no identical one in the grocery store in the town. I want to find a chance to say it. But I'm really scared. Chapter 702 People in the Small Town So you just watched her being tied to the black reef and lying in the sun to be exposed to the scorching sun? Soldek squatted beside little fatty Joe and looked into his eyes and asked. The crowd in the square was still watching the shadow behind Serdak. Not everyone had never seen the world before. Apparently some people were looking at Serdak with suspicion, thinking that the shadow looked more like Serdak. Graham has the potential. Those subordinates also saw that it was Soldak's power, but they didn't have a chance to speak at all. Little Fatty Chiao had already told the truth. Little Fatty Chiao said with some panic, I thought about delivering water to her, but the person I sent was stopped by the guards. He wanted to show Serdak that he still wanted to do something. He raised his head with some fear and watched the two-faced, four-armed demon behind Serdak slowly disappear. Several of the retinues carefully protected Arlo and Chiao, fearing that the Baron would beat up the two young masters in his anger. Judging from his expression, it was clear that he was holding back the anger in his heart. Arlo Goss stared at his brother fiercely, wanting to kick him hard on the butt. He didn't feel sorry for the vase, nor did he care about the truth of the matter. He just cared a little about what the town residents thought of him. And he didn't want to embarrass himself in public. He likes to see the humility and awe in the eyes of the natives. Likes to look at everyone with a superior look. And likes to watch those people obey his orders. He even regretted that he had not been able to study hard at the Knight Academy for a few years. If he had persisted, he might have become a knight holding a sword and shield after graduating from the Academy. Without being intimidated, his younger brother Joe revealed the truth in front of Baron Soldak who was so angry that his face was livid, looking at his younger brother, who was sitting on the ground crying and submissive in front of Serdek. His face was so gloomy that it was almost dripping with water. The surrounding aborigines became even more excited when they heard the truth of the matter. They felt extremely angry that the guards locked people on the black rock without any investigation. Their breathing was a little heavy, and they tried to separate Arlo, Joe, and the four of them. One guard and two retinues surrounded the center. The guards and subordinates worked hard to control the situation, holding up the spears in their hands, pushing outwards to resist the crowd, trying to open a way to take Arlo and Joe out. Serdak glanced at Arlo and Xiao, and ignored the fact that the two sons of a noble family were besieged by the natives, and went to save the girl in Selena's arms in the crowd. The girl was unconscious in Selena's arms. He squatted in front of the girl, stretched out his hands to condense the power of the holy light on his chest and the power of the holy light was like a burning incandescent flame. The crowd around him almost didn't dare to look directly, and there was a low cry from the crowd, as the power of holy light slowly infused. Only Serdak and Selina, who was holding the girl, could truly feel how unique the girl's body was. She was like a transparent piece of pure color. The crystal stone and the holy light poured into her body, as if they had entered a vessel, and could no longer escape from her body. She was actually born with an affinity for the light attribute. The holy light technique was like a stream of heat. When it met the burnt and sunburned areas on her body, all the wounds healed at an unimaginable speed. The girl's body was also thinning out some impurities, becoming more and more pure, and a hot ball of light even burst out from her chest. The heat made Serdak feel a strange warmth. Hiding behind Selena, Zygna secretly looked at the girl. Her eyes became extremely sharp for a moment, and then her expression returned to normal. Perhaps seeing the holy light in Serdak's hand. The aborigines in the square worshipped Serdak. This made Selina a little frustrated. This group of people didn't even ask Serdak if he was a believer in the Statue of Liberty. They thought he was a fighting priest from the temple. As if he was sent by the temple to walk around the world and save this place. Suffering people. This appeal alone is currently unmatched by the dark goddess. After all, Arlo and Joe failed to break out of the crowd. Several guards were pushed to exhaustion by the crowd and stood back to back, like rocks submerged by waves on the sea. However, because Arlo and Chiao had higher status, the aborigines did not dare to attack them and just trap them in place. At this time, they began to worship Serdak, and no one paid attention to them. Arlo Goss saw the holy light in Soldak's hand and looked at him in shock. 
because the glow that appeared in Serdak's hand, whether it was magic or divine magic, meant his noble status. Although he was the son of a baron, he was not arrogant enough to be an enemy of a priest. Arlo Goss looked at Soldak with a gloomy expression, unwilling to say another word. Probably seeing the chaos here, two infantry squads were already rushing towards this direction from the garrison camp in the distance. Soldak stood up straight, turned around and said to little fatty Joe with a serious face, Due to your personal fault, she suffered such hardship and unfair treatment. According to the laws of the Green Empire, you need to be punished or compensated. I think you must not want to be whipped. So compensate her with some money. Serdak felt that giving the little fat man two whippings would not solve any problem, but would only make him accumulate more resentment in his heart. He will eventually leave this town. The Goss family has absolute say in the town, if they want to cause trouble for the mother and daughter afterwards. No one can stop them. He wondered whether he should become a notary to the town's governor and settle the matter directly. At this moment, the aboriginal woman, who had just hugged Arlo Goss and begged, but was forcibly dragged away by the guard squeezed in again. Her face was bruised and bruised, but she did not appear to be in any pain. She stepped forward and held the girl Nika in her arms, crying softly and said, We don't want compensation from Master Arlo. We just want Master Arlo to let Nika go. Her voice was trembling, and even more tragic. She was so humble and pitiful, but her low status did not diminish the maternal love in her. She turned to look at Serdak as if looking at the last straw. She didn't dare to go too far, for fear that Serdak would leave regardless. I'm afraid that at this moment, she didn't even understand why Soldak stood up. In her heart, according to past practice, she would only think like this. Isn't he from the Empire? Aren't they together? How could he stand up for himself? She looked at herself. Her skin was dark, brown, and dry. And then she looked at Nika in her arms. Her body was so skinny that even if her limbs were amputated and sold as meat, she wouldn't weigh much. She thought, how could a noble like Serdak lack servants? Serdak was also more happy for them to give up the so-called compensation. At least this would save the mother and daughter some trouble. If you don't need compensation, you can go home. Master Arlo Goss, what do you think? He asked the two nobles Arlo Goss and Joe Goss, who were surrounded by the crowd. Although the two groups of garrison infantry had already rushed to the square and began to drive away the indigenous people with sticks in their hands. Arlo knew that these infantrymen did not dare to attack Serdak. He glared at little fatty Joe and said. The attendant beside him said, Let's go! After saying that, he took advantage of the chaos and left the town square. The four guards who were responsible for guarding the girl Nika, as if they were seeing their relatives, grabbed the garrison infantry captain and pointed out the rudeness of these indigenous people to them. These garrison infantrymen were not willing to listen to the complaints of the guards at all. They just habitually picked up the sticks in their hands and rushed into the crowd to drive away the crowds. These aboriginals did not dare to resist at all. They were some in society. The oppressed people at the bottom were forced to flee in all directions after being beaten a few times and quickly left the town square, barely even having the courage to argue. After all, the owners of this town are still the imperial people who are constantly exploiting the indigenous people and rapidly accumulating wealth. Having said that, Serdak is actually one of them. When he came to the Belen Plain, he even wanted to open up unoccupied areas and obtain some territory of his own. The garrison infantry were driving away the crowd. Serdak and a few people stood in the square like air. Some people were running around from Serdak, wailing, roaring, cursing, and jeers could be heard from time to time in Serdak in front of Ku. Everything in front of him was like a stage play in which he was not a participant. Hey, you have offended the Goss family. Don't you still want to visit Baron Goss and buy some Guba horses from him? What should you do now? Selina watched the aboriginal woman take advantage of the chaos and take away her daughter. She turned around, brushed her long and messy hair, and asked Serdak. Soldak picked up Zygna with one hand, put it under his arm, pulled Selina out of the chaotic square, and said, Forget it. If you can't buy it, then you can't buy it. You don't have to buy it. With that said, the group of people walked towards the town. Since he came to Jilin Town, Soldak wanted to see what local products there were in the town and wanted to buy something he had never eaten or seen before. You could also buy some unique food here and bring it to the military camp for the cavalry to try. He was not familiar with this town, but this did not prevent him from wandering around. And there was a guide with him. So he began to discuss with the guide what he could buy. The Goss family's ranch manor beside Belan Lake is the largest of the Goss family's many ranches. The fertile grassland here 
is the most suitable for raising ancient Borai horses. There are 11 horse herds on the pasture, and each herd has hundreds of ancient Borai horses. This also means that the number of ancient Borai horses raised in this pasture alone with horses. The Goss family can quickly and gradually arrive with 10 cavalry battalions. The Goss family is considered a prominent family in the Bina province. The wealth accumulated over dozens of generations has been passed on to future generations. Although there has never been an outstanding leader in the family, the family business has been managed very well. Whether it is the Belan Plain, the Maka Plain, or the Ganbu Plain, there is land from the Goss family. Even in the Warsaw Plain, in Handenar County, the Goss family also has property there. Baron Merlin Goss was lying on the couch. He was a branch of the Goss family. By his generation, the blood relationship had almost faded to the limit. But he still had a place in the Goss family with this ranch. His family has been the manager of the White Forest Plain Ranch for generations. His father, grandfather, and great-grandfather all managed the ranch here. Every three years, the ranch will send a batch of high-quality Gubo war horses to Benna City. It is also his greatest contribution to the Goss family. He is also proficient in ranch management. So his position has never been replaced by other members of the Goss family. The owner of the horse farm is actually a bad guy. Especially after the plain war broke out. In the past two years, the price of a high-quality Gubo Lai war horse has basically been more than 20 gold. Except for the necessary supplies to the Goss family. In addition to excellent war horses, some ancient Borai horses will also flow into the hands of horse traders. As long as he can ensure a stable output, no one will investigate the specific number of ancient Borai horses. Although Jilin Town in Bailin's Plain is in a remote place. And even the street girls in the town have old faces that won't change much for decades. It is a good place to make money. Merlin Goss. The Baron has recently been thinking about whether to buy some more military merit while plain wars are happening frequently. So that he, the second class Baron, can advance one level further. He likes to lie on a wicker chair in the yard and bask in the sun drink refreshing watermelon juice, and listen to the sound of waves hitting the fine sand on the shore of the lake. He can sleep until sunset. Arlo and Joe ran back to the manor in embarrassment and ran to Baron Merlin Goss. They did not dare to hide the truth of the matter and told Baron Merlin Goss what happened in the town square, which immediately aroused Merlin Goss's thoughts. Baron sees anger. A Baron who was passing by with a cavalry battalion actually refused to give the Goss family face. Baron Merlin Goss smashed the wicker chair hard sat up from the chair, and cursed angrily. How dare he, a foreign nobleman, be so rude to the Goss family? Where are they? Wait until I find Captain Langdon and Archon Alec, and have a good discussion with him. As Baron Goss said this, he asked the maid to prepare the noble dress, and prepare to go out. Besides those horses, what else do you have? Merlin, can you put down the cider and become more sober? Baroness Goss, who came over after hearing the news, quickly stopped her husband and asked him, Do you know the background of the Baron who passed by with the cavalry battalion? Just now when I had afternoon tea with Baroness Langdon, I heard that he was a garrison from the Lutheran army who came to the Belan Plain to change defenses. That is to say, the Langdon family's heavy armored infantry regiment will soon be transferred out of the Belan Plain. In the next period of time, the Luther Legion will be stationed here. You don't want to have a good relationship with the local garrison and question him. Why do you want to bully your two sons? The Baroness's series of words were like a heavy hammer that hit Baron Goss's heart, instantly knocking out the anger in his heart and causing him to sit down on the wicker chair again. I heard that the Luther Legion is one of the most powerful legions in Bena province. When they reach the Belan Plain, they are destined to open up the situation here. Do you want to be just a Baron for the rest of your life? The Baroness pursed her lips and looked at the husband, blushing and sitting on the wicker chair. Asked. She glanced at her husband again with a trace of a hunter's desire for prey hidden in her eyebrows. She raised her lips slightly and said, How about I go and get in touch with this Baron Serdak first? I heard that they took a detour to Keelan Town. Maybe it has some purpose. Chapter 703 Cooperation Looking at the lonely town of Kieran not far away, which seemed to be on the edge of the world, Baroness Goss felt as if she had been abandoned by the whole world. It didn't even take a quarter of an hour to walk from east to west in the town. The few shops and workshops in the town were so small that she didn't even bother to take a look at the familiar faces inside. The proprietress of the tailor shop has a waist thicker than a water tank, and the long skirts she cuts are just a simple cylinder, or three holes are cut out of the sacks, which has no sense of beauty at all. The owner of the leather shop wears a pair of leather trousers with suspenders all year round, 
when he sees a customer come to the door. He smiles like a fool, especially his rotten teeth. He doesn't know how his three wives can stand him at night. What she looks forward to most is that the grocery store in the town has some new products. Or a business group comes to the town. For Baroness Goss. These are changes in daily life. This town is too remote for her. She likes lively big cities. Busy streets. Dazzling merchandise and shops. And the minstrels playing the organ in the square in front of the opera house. Instead of basements filled with piles of mold that they don't know how to spend their money on. Of gold coins. There are no grand auctions in this town. There are no luxurious balls filled with guests. There are no art salons filled with young talents. There are no black market boxing matches full of passion. Blood and sweat. And even hunting in the wild is just a fun activity. How can life be so dull with monotonous horse riding? She had always wanted to settle in Wilkes City. But Baron Merlin Goss needed to live here and guard the ranch. She didn't want to leave this manor completely and easily give up her position as the hostess of the manor which was envied by many people. Here at least she had the final say. With the help of the maid, she tightened her waist petticoat until her breathing was a little unsmooth. She could only take a small breath in to prevent her ribs from hurting due to the tight waist. She looked in the mirror at her white, greasy breasts that were almost bulging out of her cup. She touched the shallow crow's feet at the corners of her eyes. She took out a hairpin to pin a strand of messy hair on the side of her temples and then spread it on her face. With a layer of powder, the face in the mirror seems to have regained some of its youthful appearance. At this time, the butler's voice came from outside the door. Madam, the carriage is ready. Baroness Goss stretched out her hands, and the maid quickly put the dress on her body, and stepped out of the room. The maid behind her hurriedly tied the last ribbon, picked up the skirt trailing behind her, and followed Baroness Goss, walked through the courtyard cloister and boarded the carriage under the steps. The carriage slowly drove out of the manor, the manor was about one kilometer away from the town of Jilin. A straight country road led to the town. Looking at the green pastures and Belan Lake outside the window, she closed her eyes and thought about how she should approach the young baron. To impress him, before she got married, she had been living in the prosperous Bena City. At that time, her father was still a down-and-out noble in Bena City. In order to maintain the dignity that a noble should have, she studied at the Bena Swordsman Academy for a while. After a period of time, Later, in order to change the situation at home, my father took the initiative to participate in the plain war. But his luck was so bad that he died on the battlefield within two months. Her mother became the lover of a lumber dealer in the city. She sold her property soon after and followed the lumber merchant to the Belan Plain with all her might. Later, the lumber merchant got tired of sleeping with her mother and fell in love with her again. I don't want to be trapped in that forest farm for the rest of my life. Fortunately, she met Merlin Goss in the city of Wilkes. At that time, she was eager to marry her. She didn't even have a choice but to marry Merlin, who was still young and wealthy. At that time, he he was just a son of a nobleman and had not inherited his father's title. He was often treated coldly in Wilkes City. I thought that after inheriting the title, becoming Baroness Goss would lead a better life. Perhaps she would join the group of aristocratic wives and attend afternoon tea parties, listen to operas, attend art salons, dances, etc. all day long. What she had hoped for came true after paying a small price. But the life that followed was not as she wished. In order to inherit the family's wealth left in Killin Town, Merlin Goss took her to this remote town. I have lived here for nearly 20 years. How many more 20 years are there in life? Baroness Goss, who was sitting in the carriage, looked out the window inside. The cavalry camp is located next to the business group. Originally, Baroness Goss planned to visit the business group. But looking at the row of carriages parked there, she knew that the business group had brought a lot of good things this time. Goods. Unfortunately, I don't have time to look at it right now. The outside of the town has become a lively market. And the stalls are crowded with residents of the town. Most of these people are immigrants from the Green Empire. There are only a small number of aborigines. They don't even want to go to crowded places. In this place, the products purchased are also daily necessities such as salt silk thread, pots, and glauber salt. The tents of the cavalry camp were stationed very neatly. A large group of horses were grazing on the grass not far away. A group of cavalry was standing by the river, carefully washing the horses. There were only two guards at the entrance of the military camp, and the magic caravan was stopped by the guards at the entrance of the military camp. Serdak was looking at the Belan Plain map in the tent, and was studying the next trip with the two guides, Andrew and Samira. After all, 
He was delayed for a day in Wat's village. And now he is in Jilin. The town was delayed for most of the day. According to the scheduled itinerary, the cavalry battalion arrived at Doden Town at least two days later than expected. The current state of the cavalry battalion's horses is not suitable for excessive consumption of the horse's physical strength for rapid marches. Fortunately, the deadline for changing defenses with the Doden Town garrison is still sufficient. But Zerdak does not want to delay here any longer. Otherwise, once the heavy armored infantry regiment behind the Luther army catches up, he will first change defenses in Jilin Town. At that time, it seemed that the cavalry could not outrun the infantry. Leave tomorrow morning. Count the number of people tonight. And don't let the cavalry leave the camp. Soldak said. Okay. Boss. Andrew replied. Standing up straight, a guard stood at the door of the tent and shouted. Report. Come in. Serdak responded. The guard opened the curtain and walked into the tent. He saw a group of people discussing the map around the square table. Serdak raised his head and stared at him. He quickly stood up straight and said loudly, Baroness Goss wishes to visit you. Serdak looked at the guard in astonishment and asked him, Are you sure it's Baroness Goss? Not Baron Goss? Yes, my lord. The guard replied loudly, standing up straight, as if he could not demonstrate his loyalty by doing so. Invite her in. Soldak ordered the guard, and then said to Samira and Andrew next to him, I thought Baron Goss would show up this time. The magic caravan drove into the military camp and Baroness Goss stepped out of the carriage in front of Soldak's tent. When he saw Soldak, who was wearing a barren badge on his chest, his burly figure and handsome face, his pair of slender and long pairs of his eyes brightened. It was only then that her eyes fell on Selina, who was standing next to Soldak, and her pupils shrank suddenly. A faint aristocratic smile appeared on her face, and she said to Soldak, You must be Baron Serdak. Her imperial dialect had a faint Bina accent, and her voice was also very soft. I am Nellie Goss, the wife of Baron Merlin Goss. Arlo and Joe have caused trouble for you this time. We usually neglect these two children and always get into trouble everywhere. The white breasts of Baroness Goss made Soldak couldn't help but squint his eyes. Seeing Selina's disdainful look on the side, Soldak quickly looked away and said to Baroness Goss, It's nothing. After all, the two young masters have not committed any fault, and you don't need to apologize to me. I just hope that this incident will serve as a warning to the two young people. If this incident happened in Helensa, Joe would likely to get whipped. Soldak raised the curtain of the tent and made a pleased gesture to Baroness Goss. Then he added, Fortunately, this is Kieran. Baroness Goss did not expect Soldak's tone to be so sharp. As she walked into the military camp tent, she said, For outsiders who have just arrived in Keelan, they are not familiar with the folk customs here. At least half of the population in the town are immigrants from Benes City, and the other half are local aborigines. They are uncivilized local aborigines, for the laws of the empire are very indifferent, and they are still wild and often make some bold and barbaric actions. Of course, the town has been conducting basic education on this group of indigenous people, hoping that they can abide by some rules. She walked into the tent and turned around inside. The gorgeous skirt of the dress was like blooming flowers, and matched with her face that was so delicate that her age could not be seen. She showed the charm of a mature and beautiful woman to the fullest. She asked Serdak who followed her into the camp. Baron Serdak, I heard that you are from Haranza. Well, I work for the Helanza guard camp and am the sheriff of the deserted land outside the city of Helanza. This time I was invited by Marquis Luther to officially join the Luther army and enter the Beland Plain to accept the garrison mission. Serdak sat down and said, Baroness Goss was about to sit on another chair and the maid behind her quickly adjusted the long skirt behind her. She asked kindly, If you put it this way, does that mean the garrison in Jilin Town is about to change its defenses? That's right. The heavy armored infantry regiment heading to Jilin Town is already halfway there. Our cavalry battalion is just one step ahead of him. Sernak knew the news even if he didn't tell it. Three days later, the heavy armored infantry regiment of the Luther Legion upon arrival in Killin Town. The news will also be made public. Soldak also didn't know what etiquette should be followed when talking to a baroness. He was extremely lacking in this aspect. He thought that if Hathaway or Beatrice were there, the situation would probably not be so embarrassing. After a short moment of silence, Serdak said, Baroness Goss, how long have you and Baron Goss lived here? Well, I mean running the ranch in the Bellend Plain. As if it was a bit hot in the tent, Baroness Goss held a handkerchief to her chest and kept fanning her. 
When she glanced at Soldak, she replied with a half smile, It's been a long time, long enough to be remembered. For some time, from the foot of the mountain here to the outskirts of Wilk City, the Belan River area has been our pasture. The exquisite magic pattern silk handkerchief intentionally or unintentionally scratched her turbulent chest muscles, and she said in a disgusting voice, If Baron Soldak wants to buy livestock such as cattle and sheep in the future, he must take care of our Goss family's pasture. The white sheep on our pasture are tender and juicy, and I don't know how delicious they are. Serdak was not only a little big-headed, but he thought that no matter how hungry he was, he would not be interested in a middle-aged lady whose sons had participated in the coming-of-age ceremony. He coughed slightly, glanced at Selina next to him, looked away from her, thought for a while, and said to Baroness Goss, I don't have any plans to purchase cattle or sheep for the time being, but I would like to buy some high-quality war horses. You must have noticed that I have a cavalry battalion. But the number of war horses is only enough to satisfy all the cavalrymen. A mobile and flexible cavalry battalion is far from enough. I also need to continue to replenish war horses to the military camp. I wonder if your ranch, Baroness Goss, would be willing to sell me some war horses? Baroness Goss probably didn't expect that Soldak would also propose to buy a war horse at this time. She was slightly startled and asked, Baron Soldak, how many war horses do you need to buy? Soldak thought of the high-quality ancient Bolai horses on the pasture, stretched out a hand and said, 500 horses. Baroness Goss did not expect that Serdak would buy so many war horses at once. After thinking about it, she asked, 500 war horses are still available for our ranch, but I want to know what you want. What to pay with? Magic crystals? Gold coins? Magic crystals and gold coins are all fine. Soldak said, Baroness Goss was silent for a while. Then she stared at Soldak and said, I don't want your magic crystal, nor your gold coins. I wonder if there is another way of cooperation between us. Serdak didn't expect that the other party didn't want gold coins. So he asked doubtfully, In what way? We cooperate with each other's families. Baroness Goss said with a smile, The Goss family will provide you with war horses and some logistics materials, so that you can recruit more cavalry warriors in the future, and then occupy those Balan plains to open up the world. The land that you occupy, according to the Green Empire Code, is the 433 distribution rule for nobles to open up territory. I hope that some of the land you occupy belongs to the Goss family. Sorry, Baroness Goss. I cannot accept your proposal. I would rather you raise the price of the war horse than this. Soldak decisively refused without even thinking. Afterwards, Baroness Goss left without chatting for too long, watching the magic caravan slowly leaving the camp. Soldak couldn't help but wonder in his heart that the gift given to him by Marquis Luther was hidden in the Warcraft forest north of Doden Town. How could he be here? It's time to talk about cooperation. Even if you want to cooperate, you have to talk about cooperation with the Luther family, the Goffro family, or the Casement family. It's too ambitious to talk about cooperation just with a few war horses. Chapter 704 The Slums of Killin Town The Slums and the wealthy areas of Killin Town are clearly separated from each other on both sides of the streets. To be precise, the two most prosperous streets in Killin Town are located within the boundaries of the wealthy areas. The dividing line between the slums and the rich areas is the high courtyard wall on the south side of the shops on the south side of the long street. It's like if the courtyard wall is not built higher, things will be lost in the warehouse in the yard. The rich people in Jilin Town almost they are all immigrants from Benna City. They have lived in Killin Town for so many years and have accumulated some wealth. As for the people living in the slums, they are almost all local aborigines. They were deprived of their land by the army and forced to move to small towns. At that time, they had nothing. Now they have nothing but some shacks that leak rain in summer and let in wind in winter. Outside, there is still nothing. The rich build their houses on the slopes of the mountains. The further up the mountainside you look, the more gorgeous the houses become. The poor people's shacks are built at the foot of the mountain. The further you look towards the foot of the mountain, the simpler the shacks become. Wait for those the shacks spread to the Belan River. They were even simple shacks made of a few curved logs that formed a four-corner frame and were surrounded by straw mats or felts. These aborigines lived on the ground in the shacks. Many poor families do not even have an iron pot. It is common for several poor people to share a pot. Usually this pot will always keep boiling water. Everyone only eats one meal a day, which is one at noon. Before lunch, the poor families who share this iron pot will put some food into the iron pot, such as broken rice, vegetable leaves, animal meat, 
etc. As long as they can be cooked and eaten. If you don't want to put food in the iron pot, don't run over with a wooden bowl to grab food when eating. Usually the person guarding the iron pot is the most respected old man from several poor families or the real owner of the iron pot. The aboriginal girl Nika, who was rescued by Suldak, lived in a shack by the river. She was carried home from the square by her mother. Her injuries were already healed, but she was still there. The punishment stone was chained for nearly three days. His physical strength was severely exhausted and his body was extremely weak. When he returned home, he could only lie down in a damp shack. It is summer now, and there are always some white-scaled fish in the Belen River. So the life of the poor is not bad. There are always some half-year-old children with good water skills, who can fish out some white-scaled fish from the river and throw them into the iron pot. Boil it into fish soup. At this time, there are endless wild vegetables on the grassland. Guinea pigs and hares can be found in some burrows, and snakes and lizards are often seen. As long as you are willing to put in a little effort, you can always get some food. The friends who usually envy Nika's ability to work as a maid in Baring Goss's manner were sitting silently next to Nika. Nika usually took good care of them and always brought back some food from the Baron's manor that they didn't try. This time, Nika was tied to the punishment stone and almost sunk to death. The shock to them was really too great. A girl gave Nika a little water with a wooden spoon. Only then did a boy say, Nika, you are so lucky. If it hadn't been for Baron Saldak today, you might have died on the punishment stone. Although there are so many people on our side, once the infantry regiment in the garrison camp if we go out, I'm afraid no one will dare to block the spears of the infantry regiment. He was telling the truth. Although everyone sympathized with Nika and were willing to run to the square to demonstrate for her and raise wooden boards to shield her from the sun. Once the infantrymen in the garrison camp ran to the square to disperse them. No one would do it for a long time. The spear front held on too long. Once the local garrison determines it to be an aboriginal riot, Nika will not be the only one to die. Another girl also said from the side, We know that you definitely didn't take the vase. But what's the use? The young masters of the Goss family believe that it was you who did it. And no one can argue with it. The girl holding the wooden spoon in her hand said, Nika, I think you and your aunt should go thank the Baron. Maybe this is what he wants. He is willing to save you from the punishment stone. At least we should thank you. Nika opened her eyes and looked at the girl. Her eyes a little moved and a little timid. But she was extremely weak and couldn't get up at all. At this moment, a child suddenly shouted outside, Nika, Nika, the Baron who saved you at noon is coming to your house. The slums and the slums were closely connected together. The child's voice was almost heard by the poor people in many surrounding shacks. And many people ran out of the shacks to watch the fun. The girl holding the wooden spoon in her hand said happily, I will say that the Baron must have taken a fancy to Nika before he was willing to save her from the punishment stone. The boy sitting next to Nika looked sad, lowered his head secretly, and said no more. On the other hand, Mother Nika, a middle-aged aboriginal woman sitting at the door of the shack, was at a loss for a moment. She wiped her hands on the linen dress in a panic and said absently, What should I do? There isn't even anything decent at home. The girl holding the wooden spoon stood up and said to Nika's mother at the door, I'm going to see if lunch is cooked. How about we treat the baron to some wild vegetable fish soup? I am a baron, and I will be willing to eat your big pot of chowder. So save it. One of the friends said, Sernak and Samira walked along the river. In addition to the fishy smell, the road here was also very muddy and difficult to navigate. Although these aboriginal people in the slums look very pitiful, sometimes they cannot fully attribute the responsibility to the cruel exploitation of the imperial people. They are poor for their reasons, especially their muddled life attitude, the kind that they have nothing to eat today. They don't think about tomorrow. And their lazy thinking about winter, when it's not cold in summer, is another reason for their poverty. The frightened natives ran outside the tent and watched Serdak walking past their door. Serdak just asked a child where Nika's home was. Unexpectedly, the child actually enthusiastically took Serdak all the way to Nika's home. When he got to the back, there were some aboriginal people on both sides of the road. They even asked a road was open leading to Nika's house. The child pointed to a shack surrounded by some felt and tattered linen and said, Sir, that is Nika's home. Serdak and Samira looked at each other and approached slowly, only to find Nika's mother bending over and waiting outside the shack. Seeing her humbly prostrate on the ground, Serdak said to her, Quickly get up. We're here to see what's going on with Nika. Nika's mother got up from the ground, 
without even bothering to brush off the dirt on her knees, and said respectfully to Soldak, Thank you, Lord Baron, for saving Mika. Serdak glanced into the shack. The girl lying on the mat was so shy that she covered her face with her hands. There was almost nothing else in the shack except two clay pots and a wooden basin in the corner. All the linen cloths, felts, and straw mats were covered with the shack. There were also piles of food in the corner of the shack. Some red plant rhizomes are probably only a little thicker than your little finger. Serdak did not get into the low shack, but stood outside the shack and said to Nika's mother, I came here this time to ask you and Nika to come with us. We will leave Jylan tomorrow. I'm worried that Baron Goss will still cause trouble for you. We are going to Doden Town. If you are willing to follow us, please come to me at the cavalry camp before tomorrow morning. Chapter 705 Choice A group of aboriginal boys and girls stood at the door of Nika's house. Watching Soldak and Samira leave, they all got into the tent and looked at Nika, who barely got up from the straw mat with Indy on their faces. Said, Nika, that Baron is going to take you out of Jylan Town. He looks really gentle. The streets in the slums are filled with sewage. Weeds grow on both sides of the road. And there are dirty puddles everywhere on the road. When Serdak and Samira left, they both walked slowly. For a half-elf archer whose sight and hearing are too keen, Samira hates having people following behind her like a tail. She turned back and glared at the aboriginal child hiding behind the shack. The aboriginal boy who had secretly been following behind the shack was so frightened that he ran away. Samira turned back and continued walking, ignoring the boy who looked frightened. The boy ran back to Nika's house out of breath, holding his knees with both hands, and said to Nika, I took a sneak peek at the archer who accompanied him. I'm sure she is an elf. I saw her hiding in the hood. The ears are long inside, and they are as crystal clear as rumored. And I can even see the capillaries under the ear skin. The slums are very close to the river, and some shacks are even built on the river. A group of young men and women were sitting on the raft. Although Nika was injured, she was also sitting with everyone. She looked at the dim sunset in the distance, her eyes shining with hope for tomorrow. One of the girls who had a good relationship with Nika glanced at Nika, who looked a little worried, and comforted her and said, Nika, stay with the Baron and learn more skills from him. It's best to become one of them. He also hired some of our herders in his military camp. Since he is willing to take you away, I guess at least not I'll hate you. Yes. Nika nodded seriously the look in her eyes becoming firmer. Another girl put her arm on Nika's shoulder and said to her, Nika, if you become rich in the future, don't forget us. If you have a chance to come back in the future, take us out of here. I'm really fed up with this place. Yeah. Nika agreed again. I really envy you. Although you have experienced a disaster, you also have such an opportunity. The girl squinted her eyes and looked at Nika's thin face seriously. Her nose was straight and her thin lips were in the shape of a water chestnut. She was slightly raised, and although she still looked a little embarrassed, she already showed the appearance of a beautiful woman, and she said with a bit of sourness in her heart. Nika hugged her with her back and said to everyone confidently, If I can get ahead in the future, I will definitely come back. Golden scales shone on the sparkling river, and at the end of the grassland was the horizon, where a patch of gray clouds was dyed red by the setting sun. We haven't left Jalan Town yet. So don't make promises lightly now. The girl who was the best with Nika warned her softly. Nika boldly jumped into the waist-deep river, regardless of the water soaking her tattered dress, and held up the clear river water to her face with both hands. The river water fell on her body, making her feel much better. She put her hands into the river. The skin on her arms that had turned red due to exposure to the sun turned into dead skin and fell off bit by bit, revealing the fairer and pinker skin underneath. Could that Lord Baron be a priest? He must have used divine magic. Otherwise, how could he heal Nika's injury so easily? The girl sitting on the raft looked at Nika in surprise, talking with Envy. Nika seemed very excited and ran home only after it got completely dark. Even when she got home, she could not suppress her excitement. She sat on the straw mat in the shack with some excitement and said to her mother, who was sitting on the straw mat in a daze, Mom, what do you think we should bring? Do you want to pack up these tents? In the dark night, her eyes were clear and bright. Without waiting for her mother to answer, she laughed softly and said, Actually, there's nothing to deal with. We can finally leave here. She stood up, walked to the shack, picked up the only long dress hanging there that could be worn out, and picked up the two clay pots. She felt that the pots were a little heavy, and said to her mother with some worry, 
I have to carry two clay pots and a linen skirt. Mom, do you think we can carry so many things? They are a group of cavalry, and they have to ride on horseback. We neither know how to ride a horse, nor do we have a horse. He doesn't know that he doesn't have a carriage. Do you think the Baron will let us ride in his carriage? Nika's mother glanced at her daughter softly, reached out, and touched her smooth forehead, nodded slightly, but said nothing. Nika hugged her mother's waist, rested her head in her arms, looked up at her mother's somewhat melancholy face, and asked, Mom, Mom, what are you thinking about? Pack your luggage with me. If you wait until tomorrow morning, it may be too late. Nika's mother remained silent, as if the entire shack had fallen silent. After a while, Nika's mother finally laid her eyes on Nika's face. Nika, just follow the Baron yourself. Nika looked at her mother in surprise, wondering why she had made such a decision. With an incomprehensible expression on her face, Nika's mother let Nika lie on her lap, reached out and stroked her long hair, and said in a low and calm voice, I'm old and don't want to leave Jilin Town. The neighbors around me are all people I know well. This is also the environment I'm most familiar with. I don't want to take risks outside. As long as you live a good life, I will have a hard time here. It's nothing at all. But Nika, you have to remember that no matter where you go, staying alive is the most important thing. Mom, why don't you come with me? Nika asked. Mother Nika closed her eyes in the darkness and said with a hard heart, Mom is reluctant to leave here. I heard that according to the laws of the Empire, widows must marry. If you hadn't dragged me down, maybe I would have married long ago. Nika also knew that there was such a law. But in the small town, only the Imperial immigrants had to enforce it. Perhaps this would allow widows who could not support themselves to find another source of support. But the Aboriginals did not never implement it. There are so many young Aboriginal girls to choose from. Who would want an old Aboriginal woman? Nika said to her mother. That is the law of the imperial people, and we aborigines do not have to abide by it. The mother reached out and patted her delicate face, squeezed out a forced smile, and said, Okay, I have decided on this matter. I will sleep with you in my arms tonight, and you will learn to take care of yourself in the future. Nika's mother did not say the last words, but said in her heart, Nika, only by leaving me can you truly grow up. The wind in summer removes the heavy dew on the grass in the morning. When it was dawn, the cavalry camp packed up the camp tents, doused all the fire pits with water, buried all domestic garbage with soil, and tidied up the area around the camp to its original appearance as much as possible. And then, they all mounted their war horses, walking west along the Belan River. According to the guide's guidance, the cavalry must bypass this mountain ridge and then go all the way north, which is the closest road to Duodan town. After the war horses had rested for most of the day, their condition had recovered somewhat. It seemed that the 27 herdsmen really took good care of these war horses. The girl Nika was standing alone by the river with a linen bag on her shoulder. When Saldak and Samira rode over, they found her eyes were red and she was wearing a clean skirt. Those burns and sunburns were completely healed and even shed a layer of old skin, revealing whiter and more tender skin. Why is it just you? Where is your mother? Serdak asked in surprise. Mom doesn't want to leave Killin' Town, Nika said with red eyes and a grieved look on her face. Samira took two steps forward on the horse, bent down and leaned under Nika's arm, and carried her lightly onto the horse. Without saying anything, she patted the horse's buttocks and followed the cavalry battalion outside. Go out. Unexpectedly, Nika's mother gave up the opportunity to leave Jilin town because she was worried about dragging her daughter down. Serdak didn't have time to explain, and he didn't know the situation in Duodan town. He estimated that the living conditions there must be worse than those in Jilin Town. So he didn't invite Nika's mother to go with him. Madam, the foreign cavalry battalion left this morning. The maid stood beside Baroness Goss's bed with a sleepy look on her face, lowered her head, and whispered in her ear. Baroness Goss suddenly woke up from her sleep and looked at the maid fiercely. Then she remembered that it was her instruction before going to bed last night, asking her to be there no matter when there was any movement of the cavalry battalion of the Luther Legion. After waking herself up, she closed her eyes and sat up from the bed, holding her forehead. Baron Goss was still fast asleep beside her. The maid brought the nightgown over and served Baroness Goss to put it on. She stood on the cashmere carpet with bare feet, glanced at Baron Goss, and pushed Baron Goss awake with her hands. Baroness Goss said a few words, but Baron Goss didn't hear it clearly. He hadn't fully woken up from his sleep. But when facing his wife, 
he couldn't vent his anger and lay on the bed a little irritably. I heard my wife say, I'm going to send someone to drive those horses to trade them. It seems that they are planning to give up the deal. They don't want to do it. But we must do it. After all, they represent the Lutheran Corps Cavalry Battalion. We have to establish a relationship with them. Only then did Baring Doss realize that the lady was talking about the cavalry battalion yesterday. He didn't care whether Baron Soldak was part of the Lutheran army. He said with some reluctance, Your gift is really generous. To actually want to sell the horses to them at their doorstep. Aren't these Gubwa horses already scheduled to have buyers already? Baroness Goss sat on the stool beside the bed, with a paranoid look in her eyes, and said, Selling a few hundred horses less will not affect anything. Besides, people would rather buy at a high price than let us participate in a share. This people of this kind are either very confident or too proud. Whatever you want. Just don't wake me up again and let me sleep a little longer. After saying that, Baron Goss covered himself with a velvet quilt and continued to sleep soundly. Chapter 706 Arrival Serdak did not expect that Baron Goss would change his mind. So he sent people to catch up with a herd of 500 Gubwa horses from behind and completed the deal in the wild. Although he was a bit slanderous towards Baron Goss, he was not cold enough to refuse this horse transaction. This transaction was also based on market conditions. 500 horses were converted into 10,000 gold coins allowing Andrew to bring a pocket full of gold coins. Following the attendance in Baring Goss's manor, he returned to Baring Goss's manor by Belan Lake and handed a pocket full of gold coins to Baring Goss in person. Then Andrew and a guide caught up with the cavalry battalion along the original road. The cavalry battalion suddenly had 500 more Gubwa horses, which doubled the size of the cavalry team, forming a long and long team on the grassland. Fortunately, Soldak hired 27 herdsmen in Wet's village. Thanks to their skillful horse herding skills, the newly delivered horses were properly placed. This time, the cavalry battalion has more than a thousand war horses. Basically, each cavalry can have a horse that can be exchanged at any time. In this way, emergency marching will be much more convenient in the future. Fortunately, there are pastures along the way, so there is no need to prepare any extra fodder for the war horses. As long as the war horses drink water on time, these war horses have to eat grass on the grass for half an hour after drinking water. Although such a small amount of time is not enough for the war horses to fill their stomachs. But it won't make them hungry. These ancient Bolai war horses sent from the ranch have not undergone formal training. They cannot understand simple riding instructions and have not worn saddle covers. These must go through a period of training before the cavalry can ride normally. Serdak gave the task of taming these 500 war horses to 27 herdsmen. Apparently the 27 herdsmen were very happy with Serdak's arrangement and started the work of domesticating the horses along the way. Nika and Samira rode on the same horse together and when the cavalry battalion rested, they also ate together with Samira's special care. It only took Nika half a day to get a preliminary understanding of the cavalry battalion. The cavalrymen in the cavalry camp were all kind to her. Only the girl named Zigna was a little hostile to her. Although the two had not said H, low yet, she knew that this little princess in the military camp must be difficult to deal with. Everyone in the military camp takes good care of Zigna. She spends most of her time on the white camel every day. She is a girl who doesn't like to talk much. Samira took Nika with her and asked her to familiarize herself with military camp life. Unexpectedly, this local aboriginal girl was very adaptable and soon knew what she should do every day. The cavalry battalion had extra horses in order to cover an extra distance every day. The cavalry would set off before dawn every day and camp after sunset. After four consecutive days of traveling like this, Soldak's cavalry battalion finally left Will. On the night of the eighth day in Kess City, we arrived at Duodan Town. Surrounded by mountains, Doden Town is an important pass leading to the Warcraft Forest in the northern part of the White Forest Plain. The town is built on a highland surrounded by mountains. There is a valley road here that leads directly to the Warcraft Forest in the north of the White Forest Plain. If you don't take this valley road, the surrounding mountains will be like huge sharp teeth like blades. If you go from high altitude to if you look down, you will find that the dangerous peaks around the Warcraft Forest are almost connected into one large area. If you want to bypass this pass and enter the northern Warcraft Forest, you will need to detour for at least two days. Therefore, it is no exaggeration to say that Duodan Town is called the gateway to the north of Belan. Doden Town is more like a fortress than a small town. Only Serdak and the cavalry battalion arrived at night. Since it was at night, everyone did not have an intuitive understanding of the entire town of Doden. 
Soldak originally wanted the cavalry battalion to be stationed outside the city to spend the night, and then change defenses with the garrison tomorrow morning. Unexpectedly, the cavalry battalion of Langdon's regiment gave up the garrison camp overnight. They were probably waiting impatiently. Before the garrison handover ceremony was completed, the commander of the cavalry battalion hurried to Wilkes City with the main force of the cavalry battalion, leaving only a few deputies to conduct garrison duty with Soldak. Handover. 500 cavalrymen moved into the garrison barracks in the town. The dormitories in the barracks were three rows of wooden houses. Each row of wooden houses had about 20 dormitories. They were assigned their own dormitories according to the cavalry battalion squads. This process lasted until midnight. There is also a row of newly built stables in the garrison camp. Most of the nearly 1,000 war horses can be kept in the stables. Due to the limited scale of the stables, there are nearly 100 horses left outside the stables overnight. Expanding the stables is probably a top priority. One thing. An officer wearing a magic pattern structure hurriedly walked over. He was also a noble baron. When he saw Soldak, he greeted him enthusiastically. Hello. I am from the 27th Cavalry Battalion of the Langdon Regiment. Deputy Commander Maynard has been specially ordered to stay in Doden Town to conduct the garrison change and hand over to you. In the darkness of the night, Baron Maynard looked older than Soldak and looked very steady. He was giving a military salute as he spoke. Serdak saluted him and inquired about him. Hello, Commander Maynard. I am Serdak, the commander of the Lutheran Legion Independent Cavalry Battalion. Next, I would like to trouble you to introduce the defense area and military affairs here. Your battalion commander is in such a hurry to rush back to Wilkes City. Is there something going on in the central city? Baron Maynard shook his head and said, It's not Wilkes City, but the home in Benna province was attacked by Lord Macdonald's private army. The summons was sent to Doden Town today. Even if your cavalry battalion does not arrive at Doden Town tonight, we will the main force of the cavalry battalion will also return to Wilkes tomorrow morning. Soldak was stunned for a moment. But he didn't expect Lord Macdonald to actually launch an offensive against the noble lords of the Benna province after the Luther army entered the Belan Plain. What surprised him even more was that the noble lords, who bore the brunt were actually the Langdon family. Soldak could only say politely, I didn't expect the situation at home to deteriorate so quickly. Baron Maynard also looked very bad. Anyone who heard such news would not be in a good mood. He said a little tiredly, Baron Soldak, have a good rest. I will take you first tomorrow morning. Familiar with the defense area that expands to the north of Duodan Town, as well as the defense areas that need to be responsible for each area in the city. In addition to being responsible for the security of the town, the garrison here is the border of the occupied area of the Belan Plain. They also need to patrol the border every day, in the morning, noon and evening. The defense targets are not only the natives in the mountains, but the natives resist, strength, as well as some gangs of robbers and monsters in the mountains. However, on the day that Serdak arrived in Doden Town, an adventure group outside the town was attacked by a group of thieves. Not only did people die, but some of the adventure group's supplies were also robbed. There are several adventure groups in Dan Town that have been hunting on the edge of the world of Warcraft Forest for a long time. Recently, the thieves group often appears to rob, and these adventure groups have already gone quite a bit. Baron Maynard had been very busy during the day, and he heard that the territory of the Benna province was being attacked by Lord Macdonald. At this time, he was also exhausted mentally and physically. The next morning, Baron Maynard introduced the defense of Doden Town to Soldak. After completing the handover ceremony, he hurriedly took the last cavalry squadron of the cavalry battalion and hurried back. Serdak ordered people to hang the flag of the Luther Legion on the city head. At this point, the defense of Doden Town has been handed over to the Luther Legion. Chapter 707 Duodan Town there is a city wall more than 40 meters high at the pass between the two mountains on the north side of Duodan Town. The stone gaps on the outer wall are filled with white ash. The entire outer wall is not a smooth surface. It is nearly 350 meters high. There are 69 guide grooves built on the defensive wall, which are guide grooves specially prepared for rolling stones. There are nearly 20 bed crossbows installed on this section of the city wall. On the 350 meter wide span, there are 15 arrow towers alone. It is hard to imagine how much the Belan natives in the north will pay if they want to attack Duodan Town, using this section of the city wall as a standard to evaluate the walls of other cities. Soldak felt that even the city walls of the main city of Benna would not be stronger than this section of the city wall in the north of Doden Town. Serdak saw the mountain rising straight into the clouds. 
and the shortest stone clusters rising into the sky were at least nearly a hundred meters high. The situation in Duodan town is not as optimistic as the official report. Because the report did not mention that a small-scale beast tide will break out in the Belan Warcraft forest every ten years or so. According to May Baron Nader said that the largest beast tide in the history of Doden Town was about 120 years ago. At that time, violent and ferocious monsters rushed out of the northern monster forest and bloodbath the northern part of Wilk City, including the whole town, almost overnight. There are more than 30 small towns including Duodan Town. At that time, the Bena army relied on the city defense of Wilk City to barely hold back the beast tide. After the beast tide subsided, the then Duke Newman spent huge sums of money to build an impregnable city wall here in Doden Town. The new Doden Town was also rebuilt on the original site of the old town. In the following years, although the Warcraft Forest there are no longer such big beast tides, but every ten years or so, small beast tides still break out. The worst news left by Baron Maynard is that eleven years have passed since the last beast wave broke out in Doden Town. So far, although there are some strange movements of the Warcraft in the Warcraft Forest, no changes have been found. Signs of mass gathering. Such a big thing was not clearly pointed out in the report submitted by the Langdon army to the Bena province. Apparently some dignitaries of the Langdon family made some small moves in it, fearing that the family's private army would fall into the northern part of the Belan plain. It is difficult to escape from the beast tide in the world of Warcraft forest. This time the Bena provincial house of representatives dispatched the Luther army, probably because they wanted to use the elite troops of the Bena legion to resist this beast tide. However, judging from the data of Duodan Town resisting the Beast Tide for more than a hundred years, this wall blocking the northernmost end of the occupied area of Bilan Plain is still trustworthy. It was on the eve of the war that Serdak needed to prepare as much as possible. Serdak stood on the city wall. Through the narrow gap between the pass and the mountain, he could see the edge of the Warcraft Forest in the northern part of the plain. He turned around and looked at the guards on the city wall. These wall guards are currently under the city defense of Duodan Town. The brigade is an armed force directly controlled by the town hall of Duodan Town. The city defense brigade is usually responsible for city defense affairs. These guards were wearing armor and weapons, all of which were standard weapons issued by the military. Captain Hans of the city defense brigade and several squadron captains accompanied Soldak and introduced the defensive capabilities of the city wall to Soldak. They opened the material warehouse behind the city wall and saw that it was filled with bundles of supplies. Giant crossbow arrows wrapped in all cloth boxes of kerosene, fire scale bombs, and rows of extremely smooth stone balls with a diameter of two on the wooden frame under the city wall. Serdak knew that in order to be able to defend the north of Duodan town, the senior officials, including Wilk City, have put a lot of effort into this wall. When Serdak stood at the top of the city and asked Hans how he had defended the previous beast tides, Captain Hans, who had already participated in two beast tide battles, immediately took Serdak to the wall stacks next to him, pointing to the underground ditches like drainage channels on the city wall plain. He said, In the past, when we were defending the city, when those monsters came up, we only needed to pour fire oil down the grooves on the city wall and ignite the oil before the beasts arrived, forming a wall of fire to block most of the monsters. Outside, as long as you prepare enough fire oil and allow it to continue burning for two or three weeks, the beast tide will recede on its own. Unexpectedly, the city defense forces of Duodan Town also arranged a fire wall outside the city wall. From what Captain Han said, it seemed that this fire wall was quite practical. Serdak nodded and walked down the steps of the city wall. Standing on the steps inside the city wall, you can clearly see the entire town of Doden. There are only two most conspicuous buildings in the town, and the other buildings appear ordinary. Looking at a two-story building in the center of the town, Captain Hans quickly introduced, Baron Serdak, that is the town hall of Doden Town, and the gardens and courtyards behind it are small the residence of Baron Marco, the consul of the town. Then he pointed to a three-story building in the center of the most prosperous neighborhood in the town and said, That is the largest trading house in our town. If you have any needs, you can go there to purchase. The goods in the trading house are very complete. A large clock was built on the roof of the three-story building, and the street outside the trading house was filled with magic caravans making the trading house look particularly lively. Lord Baron, it's not very safe outside the town recently. The beast tide is approaching. Some bandit groups can't survive in the Warcraft forest. So they go outside Doden Town to rob the business groups and weak adventure groups here. 
However, they usually hide in in the mountains north of the city wall. There will be no danger as long as you don't cross the city wall. When your cavalry team patrols the north of the city, you must be careful of the bandit groups. Hans followed Serdak and walked down. City wall and said. Serdak asked in surprise. At this time, there are still bandit groups who dare to loot the adventure group north of the city wall. Aren't they worried that they will be swallowed up by the beast tide in an instant? Hans smiled bitterly and explained. Those bandit groups are said to be bandit groups. But they are not just some local indigenous people in the mountains. But also some adventure groups who are familiar with this place. They usually hunt monsters in the monster forest. But when they see other the adventure group will also transform into a powerful bandit group. And when the beast tide breaks out, they will still swagger into Duoden town. As long as there is no conclusive evidence for an adventurous group like this, no one can do anything to them. This type of adventure group is also more dangerous than those pure bandit groups. Because the identities of their adventure group members can provide them with more information about other adventure groups. This kind of adventure group is also the target that the adventure union has been focusing on. Weiru, who had been following the group of people silently, almost becoming invisible, came out from behind and said to Soldek, I'm going out to check. Naturally, I can't let them mess around at this time. Let them be honest. Since we are here, we must send a signal to the people of Duodan town. After saying that, he turned around and walked towards the city wall without waiting for Serdak to express his opinion. Viru! Serdak shouted from behind. Viru, who was covered in bandages, stopped and turned to look at Serdak. Serdak waved to him and said, Be safe! Just when Hans was wondering how this bandaged archer with a long bow said he wanted to leave the city, why he climbed onto the city wall instead, he saw Vera jumping from the 40 meter high city wall. And Hans was stunned. In the eyes of the earth, the body disappeared instantly. Soldak was going to visit Baron Marco, the consul of Doden town in the afternoon. Instead of returning to the military camp, the group directly chose a restaurant in the town for lunch. This restaurant was just an ordinary barbecue restaurant. When the waiter at the door saw Soldak walking in, he quickly opened the door eagerly and arranged the group of people to a row of long tables in the corner of the hall. Zigna hid behind Selina, looking curiously at the restaurant filled with the aroma of barbecue and ale. Looking at the decoration in the restaurant, she felt a little dazzled. The waiters holding silver-plated trays were in the lobby. It is very ornamental to shuttle around. The cheap oil paintings on the walls and the flower pots in front of the hall attracted her attention. If Selina hadn't been holding her little hand, she would have almost stopped. In fact, Nika's performance was not as good as that of Zigna. When she stood at the door of the restaurant, she hesitated whether to follow in or wait outside. When Samira saw Nika standing at the door hesitating, she waved to him at the door, gesturing for her to follow him. Nika looked down at the slippers with exposed toes and was a little afraid to step into the restaurant. There is a similar restaurant in Kieran Town. She also peeped into the restaurant from the street outside, but was driven away by the waiter with a stick. Come in. It doesn't matter. You are now a retinue of Baron Soldak. They don't dare to stop you. Samira put one arm around Nika's shoulders and hugged him into her arms, saying go into the restaurant. The waiter at the door of the restaurant even took the initiative to open the door for them. His humble look made Nika a little unsure of how to deal with it. Her heart was beating so fast that she walked into the restaurant without doing anything. Soldak did not notice these episodes. He had been discussing the next training plan of the cavalry battalion with Andrew. Since the beast tide is approaching in Doden Town, the training plan for the cavalry battalion must be made. Some changes. At least the training intensity must be increased. High intensity training means huge physical exertion, which requires the cavalry to improve their food. Moreover, when the patrol team recently patrols near the border line in the north of the city, it must be led by Andrew, Samira, or Gulitem. Soldak plans to go to the border in the north of the city to inspect it tomorrow. The menu in the restaurant here is very simple. Apart from barbecue, there are only some seasonal vegetables and fruits. On the street of Doden Town, several aboriginal children were standing on the street. Through the window, they saw Nika sitting on a chair at the end of the restaurant, struggling to cut a piece of bloody beef. She was not very good at eating with a knife. It was a bit hard to eat such a large piece of beef, and the meat made her cheeks bulge. Those aboriginal children had the courage to lie down by the window. When they saw Nika stuffing a large piece of beef into her mouth, the saliva from the corner of her mouth flowed out in frustration. When the restaurant waiter saw a group of children surrounding the street window, he was worried that it would disturb the customers dining. 
so he quickly ran out of the restaurant with a handle, frightening the aboriginal children to scatter. Nika lowered her eyes and concentrated on cutting the delicious barbecue on the plate, but her mood was extremely complicated. At this time, she realized that the people in the small town outside had not changed. And the people in this town also looked down on the aboriginal people. The only one who had changed was herself. Samira opened her hood, revealing her beautiful elf-like face. But her light red eyes carried a murderous aura that could not be hidden. When her eyes fell on the waiters, they would feel a pain in their chests, as if they had been hit instantly. One arrow. She recently received Wary's guidance, and her strength improved a bit quickly. The side effect that followed was that she couldn't control her aura. Normally, if you wear a hood to cover your face, you won't feel anything wrong. But when you eat, you need to lift the hood. And those light red eyes filled with murderous aura are a bit too sharp. She ate half of the smoked fish and covered her face again with her hood. Probably after learning about the chief of the Doden town garrison who came to dine. The restaurant owner hurried over. Not only did he bring a bottle of golden cider and a dessert. He also planned to waive the meal fee for Serdak and his party. After lunch, the restaurant owner stood at the door with a smile on his face and sent everyone away. Duodan town is not big, and the restaurant is only six or seven hundred meters away from the town hall. Soldak led a group of people to the gate of the town hall. Selina hugged Zigna, pointed to Soldak at the small square opposite the town, and said, I will take them to wait for you over there. Soldak nodded, and then he and Andrew walked into the town hall. Chapter 708 North City Wall The town hall of Duodan Town is made of bluestone strips, and the walls are painted with a layer of white ash. There are two sculptures of imperial guards holding shields and spears on both sides of the steps at the door. When you walk into the hall of the town hall, opposite the door of the hall are it is a colorful mural depicting war. Under the mural is the front desk of the town hall. A middle-aged woman is standing behind the front desk, holding a quill and writing on parchment. Hearing footsteps at the door, the middle-aged woman raised her head and her eyes immediately fell on Soldek's chest. She saw that he was wearing a noble medal and a guard camp knight's badge on his chest. She quickly stood up from the chair and walked around the front desk. He walked directly to Serdak and said kindly, You must be Baron Soldak of the Luther Legion. Your transfer order has arrived three days ago. Our Lord Mayor has been looking forward to your arrival these days. But today is really an unlucky coincidence. Yesterday, outside the city, a vicious incident occurred in which a gang of bandits attacked an adventure group. Mayor Marco led the city defense team, the Merchant Armed Group, and the temporary organization of the adventure group to leave the city last night and have not returned yet. Only then did Soldak know that Mayor Marco was no longer in the town hall. So he asked the middle-aged woman, I heard about this from Baron Maynard. Is the adventure group's loss big this time? The specific losses have not been reported yet. It is said that this matter has also caused a big fuss in the adventure group union in the town. Yesterday, just in time for the Langdon Legion garrison to leave, the town did not have enough manpower. So the town mayor organized a joint the team went to search the mountains outside the city. The middle-aged woman said to Soldak with a smile. Serdak could feel her politeness and alienation. It seemed that the relationship between the local garrison and the town hall was a bit subtle. Serdak did not ask for details, but just asked, Has Mayor Marco heard anything from outside the city? Information? The middle-aged woman quickly said, I heard that some clues have been found, but that mountain range is the territory of a local indigenous chief. If the joint team wants to operate there, they probably need to communicate with the local indigenous chief. Sardak frowned and asked the middle-aged woman, Do you know the specific location? I'll send someone to ask Mayor Marco if there is a need to dispatch troops. The middle-aged woman said with surprise, It's great of you to come. Is there anything you need me to do? Soldak thought for a moment and then said, I need a guide who knows the terrain outside the town. The middle-aged woman quickly said, I happen to have an aboriginal here who is familiar with the surroundings of the town. Let him take you to Mayor Marco and the others. After speaking, she quickly walked through the hall corridor and walked to the stables in the backyard of the town hall. She ordered an aboriginal groom, Corey, stop what you are doing. Now you are following this sewer. With Baron Dark, take him to the north of the town to find Mayor Marco and the others. Okay, Mrs. Luna. The groom quickly stopped what he was doing, stood up, patted the grass clippings on his body, and said softly, after saying goodbye to Mrs. Luna, Serdak took the local aboriginal guide named Cory out of the town hall. Only then did Soldak remember that he still didn't know the identity of Mrs. Luna. 
Serdak inquired about the groom Corey and found out that Mrs. Luna was actually the secretary of Mayor Marco. However, due to the temporary lack of suitable manpower in the town hall, her secretary currently had multiple jobs, even for matters such as reception. Because Miss Delia, the only one who stayed at the front desk, asked for leave, she had to temporarily take over. It seems that this town hall is not big. Andrew walked out of the door and asked Soldek, Boss, do you want me to go to the camp to summon a cavalry squadron? Soldak nodded and told Andrew, Bring more people and get familiar with the environment of the mountains to the north in advance. Good. After Andrew finished speaking, he ran towards the cavalry camp on the west side of the town. Walking to the small square opposite the town hall, Soldak happened to see Zigna and Selina sitting on a bench under the shade of a tree to enjoy the cool air. Nika stood by the pool and raised her head, looking curiously at the stone statue of a water girl holding a water bottle in her hands. A stream of clear water flowed out of the water bottle held by the stone girl. Entering the pool, several small fish were swimming happily in the pool. Soldak walked to Selina and sat down, held her white and soft hand, looked at the small square with people coming and going, and said to her, We are going to live in this town for a while. Selina seemed to have not yet adapted to being held by Soldak in public. Her face was slightly red, but her eyes were extremely gentle. She held Soldak's thick and powerful hand with her backhand and nodded slightly. Signa, who was sitting on the other side of Selina, asked Soldak, How long are we going to stay here? We will probably stay here until the garrison mission ends, which is estimated to take at least two years. Serdak didn't know how long it would take for the garrison mission to end. In fact, if he wants to develop a mine and expand territory in Duodan town, it will take some time to operate it. Soldak asked, Does Zigna like it here? Although I feel reluctant to leave Wall Village, the environment here is better with grass and lush trees everywhere. And the climate here is much better than Wall Village. Signa sat next to her mother and said obediently, Signa is about the same age as Little Peter, but she is much more mature than Little Peter. Not long after, Andrew led three cavalry squadrons to the small square. Soldek asked Selina to take Signa and Nika back to the garrison camp by themselves, leaving them with two veterans of the cavalry battalion. Then he and Samira rode on the Gubo war horses brought by Andrew. A cavalry team of nearly 200 people marched through the center of the town and rushed to the North City Wall Gate of Duodan Town. The people in the small town on the street gave way to the cavalry and arrived at the gate of the North City Wall unimpeded. The gate of the city wall was usually closed. Seeing Soldak coming with a group of cavalry, the city the guards at the door quickly grabbed their spears and came forward. Lord Baron, are you leaving the city? The guard asked. I'm going to support Mayor Marco and help me open the door. Serdak said on horseback. Then I, the city gate guard, did not talk nonsense and quickly waved the flags in his hands to the guards on the top of the city, who were responsible for guarding the gate's iron cable winch. As the winch was slowly pushed by ten aboriginal coolies, the iron fence like an iron gate slowly rose with a clicking sound. Each iron bar of this iron fence had Soldak's big arm, thick and thin. The entire iron fence is three meters wide, seven meters high, and weighs several tons. However, this is only the first gate of the city wall. The entire northern city wall is almost 30 meters thick at the bottom. And the gate opening of the northern city gate is like a deep tunnel. There are five gates before and after the north city gate. And the gate guards need to open them one by one. After waiting for a long time, until all the city gates were opened, Serdek led nearly 200 cavalry into the V-shaped mountain pass canyon outside the north city. Chapter 709 Mayor Serdak rode out of the dark and narrow city gate and a wide valley appeared in front of him. On both sides of the valley are majestic and steep mountains. There are still green woods at the foot of these mountains. Looking into the middle of the mountains, you can see huge rock spurs as sharp as knives rising into the sky. The peaks of the mountains on both sides of the valley reach into the sky and are covered with white snow, contained in the clouds. Many local natives of the white forest plain hide in the valleys and forests among the mountains. These tribes live a life of half hunting and half herding. Looking through this valley, I saw the red pine forest at the edge of the Warcraft forest north of Duodan town. The aboriginal groom from the town hall rode in front along a winding mountain road. There are some large and small water pools on both sides of the road. Some of the water pools have dried up, exposing the dry and cracked soil at the bottom of the pools. Some small pools are filled with red insects, attracting many water birds to gather around the pools and chirp. Non-stop. A river in the valley has dried up. The valley is covered with fine-leaf glass grass. 
and the grass stalks half a meter high are already covered with heavy grass seeds. Walking out of Doden Town means truly entering the White Forest Plain. Although this valley is also the territory of the Green Empire, without the city wall behind it, there will be a feeling that the local natives may come out of the mountains at any time. In fact, the garrison patrols in Duodan Town pass through the city gate every day and walk to the end of the valley. The undulating slopes are truly the border of the occupied area of the Belan Plain. If you want to develop territory in the northern part of the Belan Plain, you must continue to develop northward from that border. Of course, it is not difficult for all noble lords to develop territories. The difficulty is how to hold on to this territory. Build walls to block wild beasts. Build some centuries. Or remove all potential dangers that may exist in this area. Although these methods can temporarily include the large area of land in the valley north of the city. By Lin's position the tide of monsters in the Warcraft forest has declined. Unless a northern city wall similar to the one in Duodan town is built at the exit of the valley. It will be difficult to block the ferocious beasts in the forest. The landform here is very different from that of Haranza's city. The mountains are taller and more majestic. The pine forests are denser and more compact. And the mountains are clearly layered. Looking at the mountains reaching into the sky in front of you. You feel like you are seeing a microcosm of the four seasons of the year. This guide only heard that an adventure group was robbed by a bandit group mixed with local indigenous people in the mountain forest on the east side of the north of the city. He only knew the general direction of the incident and had not been there. He rode his horse along the mountain road for a while. When he saw a fork in the road ahead, he walked towards the pine forest at the foot of the mountain ridge on the east side. The wilderness in front of us seems to be inaccessible. And the little beasts living here are very cute. They are not afraid of people. When they hear some disturbance, they will swish into the hiding place. After a few minutes, these little beasts will come again. He emerged from the cave and watched curiously as Serdak led a cavalry team past the moss-covered grassland not far away. Andrew looked around and could see that residents of Doden Town rarely came to the north of the city wall. The fertile soil here showed no traces of cultivation. Clusters of low shrubs grew on the ground, with some dried berries hanging on them. Unexpectedly, the land north of Duodan Town was also quite fertile. The grassland in the valley in front of me was very suitable for grazing. Serdak planned that he would not need to prepare fodder every day in the future. He would open the city gate, drive out the ancient Bolai horses, and let them graze in this valley. He would probably save most of the fodder. The pine forest at the foot of the mountain is very lush and overgrown. If the cavalry wants to pass through this jungle, it must use a machete to open a path in the woods. Fortunately, the groom guide is very familiar with this place and leads everyone to find a path. Hidden in the pine forest, this path is overgrown with weeds. But there are no horizontal branches blocking the path. Sure enough, in such a lush mountain forest, you still need a guide who is familiar with the surrounding conditions. As we go deeper into the pine forest, each of these tall and strong red pine trees requires several people to surround them. The gaps between the big trees also become wider, and the crowns above their heads are tightly connected, blocking almost all the trees. There was no direct sunlight, and the shrubs and trees in the woods were very sparse. What often troubled the cavalry battalion were the huge tree trunks that fell in the forest. The thickest diameter of these tree trunks is more than two meters, and they are dozens of meters long in the forest. The cavalry had no way to climb over the tree trunk and could only ride around on their horses. The aboriginal guide stopped in front and said to Serdek, Although it is very close to Doden Town, it is already the territory of the Inta tribe. The Inta tribe occupies a large area of mountain forest to the east of the valley. This mountain forest is only a quarter of the forest we see, and the woods at the foot of these mountains are everywhere in this mountain range. Probably this aboriginal guide has completely integrated into the life of the town. So I heard him say, It is difficult for our cavalry and heavy armored infantry to form battle formations in this mountain forest. So the soldiers of the Inta tribe have been active in this mountain forest. Serdak looked at this pine forest. There were almost no large beasts in the forest. It was probably the hunting ground of the Inta tribe. Maybe the adventure group was robbed by the indigenous people of the Inta tribe. Thinking of this, Su Erdak said to the aboriginal horseman guide, Can you tell us about the situation of the adventure group that was looted? The guide looked a little unnatural and forced a smile toward Seldak, revealing his big yellow teeth and his dark purple gums looked a bit oozing. Seldak thought he wanted some benefits. He felt that it was not easy for the guide to ride hard and lead the cavalry battalion into the mountains and forests so he didn't think there was anything wrong with taking out a few silver coins and took them out of his arms casually. Ten silver coins were stuffed into the guide's hand holding the reins. 
The groom guide stared blankly at the silver in his hand, hesitated for a moment, then leaned close to Suldak and whispered, Although I don't know much about them, I also know that they are not a regular adventure group. They usually travel through these mountains and forests, looking for lone prey in the mountains and forests. If they want to hunt Warcraft, shouldn't they go to the Warcraft forest further north? Serdak asked strangely. Andrew said with a cold face. Only slave traders don't need to venture into the Warcraft forest. They only need to wander around in the mountains and forests around the indigenous tribes to capture some local indigenous slaves. The groom guide's expression was a little unnatural. But he still said, That's right. Now that the beast tide is approaching, almost all adventure groups that entered the Warcraft forest to hunt Warcraft have evacuated Doden Town. Only those slave traders can still find opportunities to capture slaves in the mountains and forests. Andrew snorted. As an indigenous warrior of the Nanai tribe, this kind of thing probably happens from time to time in the Maka Plain. Just listen to what he said. I'm afraid this group of slave traders have offended all the tribes in the area around Doden Town. The groom guide couldn't help but take another look at Andrew. His thick-lined face was obviously different from that of the Green Empire people. He realized that he was an aborigine. His eyes became more kind, and he said to Andrew, Yes, no one in our town dares to leave the city alone for fear of encountering retaliation from those tribal warriors along the way. Serdak frowned and said, Mayor Marco brings his men just to help these slave traders and find their lost property? Unexpectedly, the groom guide failed to control his mouth and said so many hidden things at once and muttered, The mayor has to come out and show off, but they probably won't find anyone. Serdak asked the groom and guide, Why? At this time, Andrew explained to Suldak on behalf of the groom guide. The people who have the ability to rob this group of slave traders cannot be people from the indigenous tribes. It is estimated that they do not have this strength yet. And another group of people should be eyeing this group. Slave traders? Maybe other unclean adventure groups are taking advantage of others. The group of people walked through the pine forest and soon met the team that followed Mayor Marco to search for the missing members of the adventure group. These people had already spread out to search in the mountain forest. When Serdak saw the search team, they were handling a newly slaughtered porcupine in the forest clearing. They also lit a bonfire in the forest. It seemed that they were preparing to deal with the porcupine. Have to bake on the spot. The members of the search team saw a large group of cavalry emerging from the pine forest. They looked at each other for a moment, not knowing what to do. A search team member held up the porcupine in his hand, stood up subconsciously, and performed a military salute to Soldak. Where is Mayor Marco? Soldak asked the search team condescendingly while riding on his horse. The search team member quickly put down the porcupine in his hand, pointed deep into the woods and said, Sir, the mayor is searching in that direction. Serdak nodded, turned and left without saying a word. Seeing Serdak leaving with more than 200 cavalry, the search team members took a long breath and sat down next to the campfire. Who are those warriors? Serdak asked the guide. The guide quickly said, They are members of the armed team of the trading group. They are usually responsible for guarding the goods transported by the trading companies. They are a team organized with money from the trading companies. This time, the mayor brought their men here as well. Probably because he was worried about this. The side is understaffed. Serdak and his party were lucky enough to find Mayor Marco, who was gathering members of the search team in the forest before dinner. I saw dozens of search team members surrounding him, riding a green-scaled horse, walking majestically at the front of the team wearing half a magic pattern structure. A strong man with a beard and a red nose looked at the man next to him. The entourage scolded. There are only a few people. And you let them slip away. What a bunch of losers. Mayor, look across the way. One of the followers following him reminded him in a low voice. At this time, the strong man with beard raised his head, rolled his eyes, and looked towards Soldak. He could not see clearly in the jungle. When the two sides got closer, the man with beard the strong man took the lead and walked towards Soldak, said loudly to Serdak, Oh, I am Marco, and you must be Baron Soldak. Your letter of appointment has arrived a few days ago. I have been waiting for three days in Doden Town. I didn't expect that the person we met for the first time would be here. Here. His voice was loud and rough. And when he looked at Soldak, a cold light flashed in his eyes. Although it disappeared briefly, it fell into Serdak's eyes. Serdak puffed out his chest, rode on his horse, and gave him a military salute before saying, Mayor Marco, the Lutheran Legion Independent Cavalry Battalion is here to report. People from the search team kept gathering around the pine forest. 
Mayor Marco sat on his horse and said to Soldak arrogantly, I guess you have also heard that an adventure group in the town was robbed by a gang of robbers here. I brought people here to search the mountain last night. I have to give an explanation to the members of the adventure group who were killed. Unfortunately, I just let the gang of robbers slip away. It's great that you came in time to help me share the trouble. Mayor, should we close the team? The attendant beside him asked in a low voice. Mayor Marco angrily scolded the follower. If you don't close the team, you'll just be a savage in the mountains and forests. Go back. Sardak didn't expect that Mayor Marco was such a powerful nobleman. He looked more like an officer leading troops fighting on the front line. Without any discussion with Sardak, he just scattered the people in the forest. The search team gathered together and returned to Duodan town in a mighty manner. This time, the cavalry group had just arrived at its destination and returned to the town along the same route. Back in the town, it was completely dark. Hundreds of people rode back to the town in a mighty manner. And many town residents immediately came out to watch. Soldak originally thought of returning to the station and having dinner with the cavalry. Unexpectedly, when they separated, Marco Town the captain suddenly turned around and said to Sardak, Baron Sardak, there will be a trial of the band of gang members at the town hall tomorrow. You should also attend. Okay. Soldak agreed. He was also a little confused for a moment. Didn't it mean that the bandit group had escaped? So who is to be judged? Chapter 710 Military Camp Station Soldak walked into the military camp. Through the lights in the military camp, he could see a row of soldiers taking a bath under the water jar next to the stable. The open-air bathroom is built so simply that it looks like a wall from the front. The huge tank is placed on a wooden frame made of logs. This wooden frame was originally supposed to be an arrow tower. However, after Duodan Town built the northern city wall, the arrow tower lost its original function. Now the arrow tower platform, all the awnings on the platform have been removed. And apart from some sundries, there is only a large dark water jug on the platform. This water tank was originally prepared for the stables of the military camp. It was later abandoned and now serves as a bathing place for the cavalry. Below the water tank is a 10 meter long stone wall. And a stream of clean water flows from the water tank. Along the top of the stone wall, the wooden groove is divided into 20 or so thin streams of water. The cavalry can enjoy a comfortable shower as long as they stand under the thin stream of water beside the wall. Unfortunately, there is no water gathering magic rune board inside the water jar. So water cannot be gathered from the air into the water jar bit by bit. The water in the water tank was brought up by the cavalry in buckets from the only well in the camp, and then poured into this huge iron tank. Although it is a bit troublesome to fetch water from the well and pour it into the water tank. Fortunately, there are many young and strong soldiers in the military camp. Their usual excess energy cannot be vented. Every day, a small team of soldiers is arranged to take turns to fetch water. This matter is not considered a problem. Disaster. But for a few ladies in the military camp, this kind of life seems inconvenient. This inconvenience is not only reflected in the aspect of bathing. The barracks dormitories are also open plan. The toilets in the barracks are directly across a drainage channel at the back and are only blocked by a row of low shrub walls. This is not to say that the large facilities in the military camp are simple and crude. It can only be said that this garrison camp is not suitable for mixed housing of men and women. Fortunately, the commander's residence in the military camp is a small independent attic. It was originally supposed to be the residence of the commander of the Langdon Corps Cavalry Battalion. From the outside, this wooden attic looked very exquisite. The commander left in a hurry after the town of Doden. Almost all the furniture in the house remained. And the furniture was also very elegant. There is a set of soft leather sofas in the study room. And the furniture in the living room is almost all made of indigo wood. And these wooden furniture have fine relief carvings. Including the expensive magic cloth curtains in the room and the crystal chandeliers on the ceiling. All prove that the original owner of this room was a nobleman who lived a very exquisite life. The front hall downstairs is the combat conference room of the military camp. Normally. Sardak's office is in the study room on the first floor of this small building. In addition to these two rooms, there is also a bedroom with a large bed facing the room. There is a small yard outside the glass window on the north side. And there is a kitchen, bathroom, and small storage room behind the attic. However, the attic upstairs is currently just a simple wooden frame structure that has not been cleaned up and is full of dust and mice. Considering that daily meetings in the cavalry battalion are usually held in the living room of this attic, and the nine squadron captains in the cavalry battalion often come here, even if Selina and Zigna live in this small building. It would also be very inconvenient. Therefore, 
Serdak planned to rent a house in the town and let Samira and Nika live there on weekdays. Andrew led 200 cavalrymen into the military camp and ran directly into the restaurant of the military camp for dinner. Although this restaurant was a bit crude, it was very complete with wooden tables and benches and could accommodate six to seven hundred people eating at the same time. The cooking utensils here were also they are all existing. And even the restaurant's warehouse is still stocked with wheat flour, some mutton and vegetables from the warehouse. The soldier's dinner was mutton soup cooked by Selena herself. The mutton soup was very thick. She cooked a large pot of noodles and put them into wooden bowls. Then she poured a large spoonful of the thick mutton soup on top and served it with two pieces. The soft and juicy white radish is the most delicious meal the soldiers have eaten in recent times. This kind of food is a typical wall village delicacy. Pouring the cooked noodles with thick soup is also a specific idea proposed by Soldak. No one in wall village can cook better than Selena. She has been responsible for cooking a big pot of mutton soup in the village. So she is naturally experienced in making this kind of big pot of rice. The thick soup was boiling in the hot iron pot. The cavalrymen who had returned from outside the town returned to the camp handed over their horses to the herdsmen in Watt's village, and filled their stomachs in the restaurant before returning to the dormitory. In the military camp of Suldek Station, the herdsmen first scraped off the roughness on the horses, then led them to the stables and fed them some salt water, and then led them into the stables and fed them fodder. Seeing that they arranged the horses in an orderly manner, I just regretted not hiring more herdsmen when I was in Watt's village. The cavalry battalion obviously lacked such auxiliary soldiers who were proficient in raising horses. Andrew ate two large bowls of mutton soup noodles, walked out of the restaurant, and squatted on the edge of the military camp playground with Serdak. Looking at the dark night outside the military camp, Serdak asked Andrew, This is Doton, how do you feel about your first day in town? Andrew sat down on the soft grass. He leaned his body back, supported his upper body with his right elbow, stretched his left leg flat, and slightly curled up his right leg, and stretched out comfortably while lying on the grass, said to Soldak, the facilities in the military camp are better than expected. There are restaurants, dormitories, stables, and a playground for horse racing. These can fully meet the daily training of a cavalry battalion and the daily patrols we are responsible for. It is on the border of the occupied area outside the North City Wall, which may be a bit dangerous. However, when I handed over the defense with Langdon Corps in the morning, I found that the road conditions on the patrol route were not bad. It only took more than an hour to ride a horse. Goo and I will do it tomorrow morning. Lightem goes to check out the situation on the border in person. And maybe we will go to the Warcraft Forest to check out the specific situation. Did Goo Item hear that the beast tide was approaching and wanted to hunt in the Warcraft Forest? Serdek asked with a smile. Andrew chuckled and said, He said the food hasn't been very good lately, and he wanted to see what's available in the world of Warcraft Forest. I don't care what you do, but you must bring back the people you took out safely. Soldek said. Andrew pulled out the butcher's axe from behind, took out a whetstone from the bag on his waist and carefully polished the edge, while saying, I heard Hans, the captain of the city defense brigade, talking about the beast tide this morning, but it looks like the life of the residents in the town has not been greatly affected. From what I see, it's probably because the north wall is strong enough, and the previous beast tides have been blocked by the garrison, so there should be nothing to worry about. He raised his eyes, and glanced at Soldek, saw him looking up at the starry night sky, and said, But the town hall seems to be in some trouble. Mayor Marco is more powerful than expected. This is indeed Serdak's biggest headache. With an extremely powerful local governor, some collisions will inevitably occur in the future. Seeing that the cavalry battalion of Langdon's regiment couldn't wait to leave Doden Town, it was estimated that getting along with the local governor would not be too pleasant. Yeah, judging from his attitude in doing things today, he can't be considered easy to get along with. If you want to use Duodan Town as a base to expand outward, even if you can't get the right to speak in Duodan Town, you still need Mayor Marco. Only with cooperation. Soldak knocked his forehead helplessly and said to Andrew. After chatting with Andrew for a while, he walked towards the small building. When I walked to the steps of the small building, I saw Cygna sitting on the wooden steps of the small building, using a small stick to draw random patterns on the sand. Serdek sat next to Cigna and looked in front of her. The pattern is clearly a six-pointed star, and there are some inexplicable lines surrounding the six-pointed star. It seems to be irregular, but it is just right, forming a very wonderful composition. Serdak cannot recognize what pattern it is, and asked Cigna curiously, What is this you drew? Cigna stared at her big black eyes 
and said innocently to Soldek, I saw it in my dream. Sometimes when I close my eyes, these patterns will appear in front of my eyes. The circles around these six-pointed stars appear in front of my eyes. They keep spinning and are a bit dizzying. And sometimes I can't help but want to draw them. Serdak couldn't understand the pattern on the ring of this six-pointed star. But considering that Selena was the apostle of the Dark Goddess in the Green Empire, and was responsible for spreading some of the Dark Goddess's teachings, it was normal for her to have some influence on Signa. He guessed that these rings were probably related to the Shadow Word technique. But he was not sure. So he warned Zygna, when there are outsiders around, don't just draw these patterns for them to see. Our Zygna is very talented in painting. The hexagram's light wheel looks really good. I know. My mother told me so too. Zygna nodded obediently, and then asked Soldak, Dak, can you lend me that notebook again? Seeing the expectation on Zygna's face, Soldak felt that there was nothing wrong with it. So he took out Cyrus Hickok's magic notebook from his magic pocket and handed it to Zygna. Of course, Soldak said. Nika was still cleaning the floor carefully in the small building. She ate a little too much tonight, and her stomach was still a little full. She didn't even dare to drink water, and it was harder than usual to kneel on the floor. Selena cooked the lamb soup noodles tonight, so there was enough for her. He ordered a large bowl and carefully told her that if she couldn't finish the meal, she could bring back the remaining food. But Selena obviously underestimated the appetite of the aboriginal girl. Although she usually eats mutton, she has never eaten such delicious and smooth noodle soup. By accident, a whole bowl of noodle soup slipped into the in the girl's belly. Her only regret is that she could not bring her mother here. If she had known that the food here was so good, she would have to drag her on the road even if she was crying and shouting. After you eat, you have to work. This is what Nika learned when she was a maid at Goss Manor. When the housekeeper assigns tasks, she must work hard to do them well. If there is no task assigned by the housekeeper, cleaning the floor is the least likely thing to go wrong. She felt that Baron Soldak must have seen her pity and angered the young masters of Baron Goss family. So he brought her to Doton Town to avoid the anger of the young masters of Goss family. In her heart, I am very grateful to Baron Soldak. The housework she is doing now is all within her usual ability. She rolled up her sleeves, washed the rag carefully in the basin, lifted up her skirt, and wiped the floor of the room vigorously. When Soldak opened the door of the small building, he was also slightly startled. The floor in the entire living room was wiped as spotlessly as wax. He hesitantly took a step and stepped on it. Suddenly, a shallow footprint was left behind. On the floor, Sardak hesitated for a moment, feeling that walking in with boots on like this was really wasting the fruits of other people's hard work. He lowered his head and glanced at Zygna beside him. Zygna also spread her hands helplessly. Her big eyes seemed to be able to speak. That look clearly meant. Otherwise, why do you think I was at the door? Sitting? Serdak coughed slightly, walked into the living room bravely, and hung his sword on the shelf in the corner. Nick, who was mopping the floor in the living room, quickly stood up and saluted Soldak. Serdak glanced at Nika. After these few days of cultivation, Nika's body has obviously recovered. However, the thin figure caused by malnutrition since childhood cannot be quickly restored but the complexion on his face, but it is much better than before. And the skin color is not the deep amber color of other aborigines, but like light-colored beeswax, with a layer of delicate luster. I haven't had time to take care of this indigenous girl recently. I didn't expect her to be quite adaptable. Serdak said to the girl, Nika, it's so late. You don't need to do housework so hard. You can rest for a while. Nika stood in the living room a little at a loss, nodding her head like a chicken pecking at rice looking obedient and pitiful. Serdak thought it would be better to arrange something for her to do, so that maybe she wouldn't be so nervous. Um, can you make a fire and boil water? Serdak asked. Nika nodded quickly. Serdak breathed a sigh of relief and waved his hand quickly. Then you'd better boil a kettle of water for me and let me see if there is a kettle in the kitchen. As he said that, he walked to the kitchen with some uneasiness to see if there was a kettle on the stove. He also saw some small servant rooms next to the storage room. He patted his forehead. He hadn't arranged a room for Nika yet. Pointing to the servant's room, he said, That's right. Nika, you will stay in this cabin tonight. The conditions here in the military camp are limited. When I find a house in the town, you, Selena, Samira, and Zygna will all move out and live outside. The conditions will be better than here. Zygna asked in surprise. Are we going to move too? 
Serdak touched Zygna's head and said gently. Of course. The military camp is not very convenient after all. Not only you. I think those soldiers don't want to be seen by you while standing by the wall to take a bath. Zygna lowered her head. Obviously reluctant. Pouted and muttered in a low voice. Okay. Duck. The house you are looking for doesn't need to be too comfortable. It's best to be closer to the military camp. Soldak knew that Signa was timid and usually liked to hide in Selena's skirt, thinking that she lived in a strange town. He would probably be even more timid. He picked her up and said, I know. I will definitely consider Zygna's suggestion seriously. Chapter 7 11 Things in the Small Town After dinner, Serdak took off his salamander skin armor and changed into a set of ordinary linen clothes. He also did not wear the noble medal or knight's badge and took Selena out of the barracks. He only dressed like this for civilians. Only then can we have the opportunity to take over the lives of the people. Soldak was going to visit the town and stop by the tavern to inquire about renting a house. He did not let Andrew or Samira accompany him. Even Zygna agreed to stay in the small military camp building under Selena's persuasion. Sleep. Selena changed out of the black robe she was wearing and put on a beige dress made of silk fabric. She pulled her long hair up high, revealing a section of her snow-white neck. Her figure immediately appeared tall and slender. A little bit of lipstick instantly makes your whole person look extremely bright. When he walked out of the military camp, even Andrew, who had always been unfaithful towards women, was slightly startled. He stared at Selena for a while before remembering to move away. The two walked out of the military camp and walked along the dirt road in front towards the town. It was very dark, and there were no street lights on the dirt road. Fortunately, both Soldak and Selena's eyesight were not bad, and they walked into Doden Town in a few steps. The military camp is built under the North City Wall and is located in an open space in the north of Duodan Town. It is less than a hundred meters away from Duodan Town. When you walk into the town, the surrounding area becomes lively. A group of children are playing a game of catching thieves on the street. The clever and weird children hide in the shadows of the street buildings and stare with big eyes, peeping out at the friend looking for someone. Selena has fair and delicate skin, plump figure and no fat. The beige dress looks tight on her body, with a full arc from the edge of her chest to her armpits. She has a beautiful and white face, and her amber eyes look looking towards Duodan Town in the distance. My eyes are as charming as a fox. She didn't feel so relaxed in Wall Village, Alensa City, or Benna City. No more worries about life. No need to worry about food and clothing. And no need to worry about being arranged by the census clerk to marry an old man he has never even met. The black magicians of the Priory hiding in the shadows have all disappeared. Finally I can breathe the free air in the small town. She really wanted to throw off her shoes. Walk through the town barefoot. Stand in front of those men in the square in the center of the town. And no longer have to cover her face. She boldly took Soldak's arm. Her soft body pressed against Soldak's. And the two walked in unison to a tavern in the center of the town. The plaque at the entrance of the tavern is an ale glass drawn on a wooden board. The white hops on the wooden board are vividly drawn, swaying back and forth in the night wind. The town's tavern is located in the square in the center of the town. Almost all the buildings on the street here are rented by businessmen. At night, lights are lit in the shops, and the lights shine through the glass windows onto the square. Two groups of drunken young people were fighting outside the tavern. Some people were beaten until they were lying on the ground, covering their heads and wailing. Some people were chasing the escaped people with stones in their hands. This kind of fight only needs to be stopped. If weapons are used and no lives are lost, there will be no accountability. Selina glanced at Soldak in surprise. Are you wondering why I didn't take care of it? Soldak whispered to Selina. If it were in Helensa City or Wall Village, Serdak, as a guard camp knight, could immediately settle the dispute as long as he stood up. But this was not Helensa. Aren't there troops stationed here to maintain law and order? Selina pursed her red lips and asked. Soldak shook his head and said, We are just a garrison. As long as there is no fighting or killing, we will not pay attention to these energetic young people fighting in the town. We must give them a chance to vent their excess. Energy. Selina gave Soldak an intriguing look. On the other side of the square, there is a bard sitting by the pool. He is wearing a flashy leather armor. The collar of the leather armor is open outwards, revealing his bronze chest muscles. Apart from the fact that the bard has a good figure, there is nothing else. Usefulness. The bard was singing there holding the organ, surrounded by several young girls. Some were sitting by the pool and listening quietly. Some were holding their best friend's shoulders and whispering softly. Occasionally, 
there were whispers, and some where the footsteps twisted gently to the melodious music. Younger children used the lights in the windows to play outside the store. There are also some people who are busy in the shops. Those busy people are basically local aborigines. In order to ensure their basic life, they have to work late every day. Serdak opened the door and walked into the tavern. When the waiter at the door saw Selina, he even forgot his duty to open the door. He stared at Selina's charming face like the other drinkers, watching her and Soldak walk through the tavern hall. Selina, who was wearing light makeup, was like a magnet at the moment, attracting the attention of almost all the men in the pub. Soldak strolled to the bar and asked the bartender, who was cleaning the glasses for two glasses of local free wine and a plate of salted nuts. Then he and Selina sat in front of the bar and drank slowly. After the two had a drink, except for some people who were eager to come over and buy Selina a drink. It seemed that the pub had returned to normal. Probably the Roman dagger on Serdak's waist played a certain role. Because no one came over for a while. Soldak pushed two empty glasses to the bartender. And then pushed a silver coin to the bartender. The bartender asked, What else would you like to drink? He pressed his fingers on the silver coin and asked the bartender, Where can I rent a house in the town? The bartender leaned out of the bar and looked around the tavern hall. When he saw the group of drinkers by the wall, he shouted, Apperson, do you have a house to rent out? A thin man wearing a cloth apron stood up among the group of drinkers. He held a glass of ale in his hand and asked with a smile, What's wrong? You're not satisfied with your little house. Do you want to live somewhere else? The bartender pointed at Soldak and said directly without hiding anything, These two guests want to rent a house. The slender man named Epperson left his seat with ale in his hand and walked to the bar. Soldak also took the opportunity to loosen his fingers on the silver coins and asked the bartender to put the silver coins into his purse. The bartender took the opportunity and said to Soldak, He is the only tailor in the town. And he has a tailor shop at home. Tailor shop owner Epperson didn't seem to mind the bartender revealing his information. He just stared at Soldak and asked with some vigilance, Are you from out of town? Soldak stood up and said to the tailor shop owner, We came from Wilk City. The owner of the tailor shop squinted his eyes. His nasal voice was a little thick, and he snorted twice before saying, Now is not a good season for hunting. Are you planning to do business here? If you are a tailor, tell me as soon as possible. I can't possibly rent the house to you. We're traveling together. Ha ha! After saying this, he smiled humorously. Soldak left the bar with a second glass of fruit wine, sat in the corner of the tavern with the tailor shop owner, and said casually, I want to do some for business. The tailor shop owner was slightly startled and followed Soldak to the opposite side of him. His eyes stayed on Selina's face for a moment. Then he made a gurgling sound and took a big sip of cold ale. Soldak put his hands around Selina's slim waist and said to the tailor shop owner, I need a quiet place, preferably without anyone disturbing me. I hate these who lie outside the courtyard wall and peek inside. The owner of the tailor shop showed an I understand smile and whispered, It can only be a small single family building. I happen to have one that I want to rent out. But the price is not cheap. Is it convenient to take a look tomorrow? Soldak didn't even mention the price. The tailor shop owner readily agreed. Of course. The two of them raised their wine glasses and banged them. The tailor shop owner was not in a hurry to leave. And asked Soldak curiously. You want to start a fur business? Soldak took out a pile of wind wolf leather from his magic waist bag. Showed it to the tailor shop owner. Pointed at the wolf's skin and said. It's best to use leather that can be carved with magic patterns. I have friends in the magic guild who can sell that kind of precious leather at a good price. Seeing the magic halo flowing on the fur, the tailor shop owner's eyes narrowed and he whispered, Then you should be careful about the trading house. Their main business is also dealing in leather goods. If you go to Duodan Town to buy leather goods, you are obviously robbing other people's business. It is best to be careful at ordinary times. The people in the trading house and many adventure groups in the adventure guild are like with a cooperative relationship. They not only purchase for goods, but also help those people deal with some shady things. And the business group also maintains an armed group. So it is best not to let them find an excuse for conflict. Serdak smiled, put the leather in his hand into his magic waste bag, and said confidently, I'm not afraid of them. I have many magician friends in Wilkes. They told me that the most profitable thing here is for business. When the tailor shop owner heard what Soldek said, he shook his head and said, Besides the slave trade, the most profitable business is magic herbal medicine, followed by the sale of magic materials. Magic leather is just one of the magic materials. 
You are in well I know the magician in Wilk City. And I occasionally go to Wilk City to buy some magic cloth. I am very familiar with the magicians in the city. But they don't know me. Lord Magician Gerald. Serdek said without thinking. The tailor shop owner asked with some confusion. Does the magic guild in Wilk City have this master magician? Of course. If you want to buy magic pattern cloth again, you can tell me directly. I can ask my magician friend to mail some to me. And I can definitely give you an internal price. Serdek said, patting his chest. The tailor shop owner's eyes lit up, and he stared at Soldak and asked, Really? I really have to think about this. In addition to the magic pattern cloth. Can I get some rune cloth? Serdak readily agreed. I would like to ask about this. Most of the magic cloths I usually come into contact with are magic pattern cloth. If it is magic pattern cloth, you can mail some to me directly. It's good to have magic pattern cloth. The tailor shop owner had a businessman smile on his face. The two clinked their wine glasses again and took a sip of wine. Then Suldek asked, I don't quite understand. Those adventure groups go hunting in the Invercargill Warcraft forest and sell the harvested Warcraft leathers to trading houses. Why? Will there be anything shady? He looked like a newbie in the industry. The tailor shop owner sighed and then explained to Suldek in a low voice. What's so difficult to understand? The adventure groups that can stay here are basically criminals who have been exiled here. They want to avoid the guard camp, and they come to live in this remote area because of the investigation of the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Team. These people usually go to the World of Warcraft Forest to hunt, and occasionally do those things. You know? The tailor shop owner made a cutting motion with one hand and the other, and spoke in a very low voice. The black man eats the black man. Isn't he? Soldak looked a little surprised. The tailor shop owner took another sip of ale, and to prove that what he was telling the truth, whispered, How not? When you came here, didn't you hear that an adventure group just had an accident in the woods outside the town? Already? I know this, Soldak said. The tailor shop owner's voice came close to Soldak's ear. Nine times out of ten. It was that group of people who did it. Everyone here knows it. As he spoke, he poked his heart with a finger as thick as a radish. The tailor shop owner added, but our mayor said at the beginning that everything must be based on evidence. If there is no evidence, no one can frame anyone. Serdak asked in surprise. This group of criminals who have been exiled here are actually protected by the mayor? Of course not. Not only that, the mayor even hates this group of people. Epson, the owner of the tailor's shop, waved his hand and said, It's okay to tell you these things. Anyway, in Duodan town, these grievances have long been resolved. It's a semi-open secret, but last time it was a slave trader who robbed the adventure group of a glass beast skin outside. So the mayor came up with such a rhetoric, but now it is regarded as the code of conduct of Duodan Town. It is estimated that the mayor the grown-ups themselves must be secretly regretting it. Soldak asked the waiter to bring him two more glasses of ale. Seeing Soldak's generosity, the owner of the tailor's shop touched his big red nose and continued. Speaking of which, the fur business needs a high-level leather worker to be profitable. Doden Town alone cannot afford to support a high-level leather worker. The trading group usually hires a high-level leather worker from Wilk City. Then trading groups distributed in various small towns can purchase Warcraft leather at the best price. Because there are senior leather workers behind them who can greatly control the manufacturing cost of magic leather. So if leather is purchased in a small town, basically no one can compete for it. We pass the trading house here. So the Warcraft leather business has always been controlled by the trading house. And no one can get involved. The tailor shop owner glanced around and saw that no one was paying attention. So he whispered, You said that our mayor traveled all the way to Duodan town. It is impossible to come here for the benefit of the indigenous people here. Of course, he controls the most profitable business. Serdek asked, Trading slaves? The tailor shop owner hid one hand under his armpit, secretly pointed at the drinkers on the other side of the tavern and whispered, Look, the group of people drinking there are the most famous people in the town. Slave traders. They usually spend the whole month in the northern forest catching those tribesmen who are unwilling to attach themselves to the empire. If there hadn't been something wrong here in Duodan town, it would be difficult for you to see them. Sardak followed the topic and guessed. Could it be that the slave trader gang was being hacked by the adventure group composed of exiled criminals outside the town? Even if the adventure group of exiled criminals as a trading group as a backer. They there is no reason to do this. They don't know that those slave traders are the mayor's people. The owner of the tailor's shop laughed dryly 
and said in a low voice, You probably don't know that a beast tide is about to break out here. Those adventure groups that hunt monsters for a living are gradually moving to other places. You said that if they come before they leave. How about making such a fortune? Well, it's really possible. Soldak patted his forehead and said suddenly, Just when the two were chatting in a lively manner, the bartender ran to them personally and took away the empty wine glass from the tailor shop owner's hand to stop the conversation between the two. Hey, Epperson, you've drunk too much. Go home and sleep, the bartender said to the tailor shop owner, and then asked Soldak, By the way, where can I find you tomorrow? Sardak took out five silver coins and placed them on the table. Then he stood up and said to the bartender, We will go to the tailor shop at noon. Okay, see you tomorrow then. Chapter 712 The Truth At night, the moonlight is like snow. A dim patch of light was left on the floor through the glass window. Selina was sitting on the big bed wearing a gauze nightgown, combing her long hair that was still slightly damp. There were no lights in the room and through the moonlight outside the window. Her graceful body was clearly outlined under the nightgown. Saldak pushed the door open and walked in, wiped the water drops on his body with a bath towel, walked to Selina's side, held her fair chin with his hand, raised her beautiful face slightly, leaned over and pecked her soft lips. Signa was lying on the soft leather sofa in the study room, covering her head with a blanket. She hid under the blanket. The unfamiliar environment made it impossible for her to fall asleep. She originally wanted to snuggle in Selena's arms and feel comfortable. Get some sleep. But now I can only lie on some sofas and count sheep. One, two, three. The bed in the next room made a creaking sound, which made her even more sleepy. At this moment, she even wondered whether the girl named Nika in the servant's room was sleeping soundly now. She stepped on the floor with her bare feet and was about to walk to the square table in the study room to pour herself a glass of water. Tuck, tuck, tuck. The knocking at night was particularly clear. She was sure that someone was standing outside the door. She put down the water glass in her hand, walked out of the study with bare feet, walked through the living room and the hallway, opened the door and looked outside. Where he stood at the door with a tired look on his face. He had a faint smell of tree sap on his body, carrying a long bow, and seemed to be followed by someone behind him. Under the moonlight, Zygna couldn't see clearly, as if she was holding a child in her arms. Weru asked Zygna in a low voice. Where is Dark? Seeing the little girl wearing thin pajamas and standing barefoot at the door, Vera noticed that it was already past midnight. He looked inside the house and saw that the living room was dark. Just as Zygna was about to speak, Soldak's voice came from behind her. Veru! What happened? The sound was followed by footsteps. In a hurry, Soldak only put on a linen round neck shirt and a pair of boxer shorts. His two strong thighs were covered with hideous burn scars. Although the scar has recovered somewhat, it still makes people feel very scary when looking at it coldly. Where his eyes fell on Serdak's legs, and the coldness in his eyes seemed to condense the surrounding air into ice. Zygna seemed to be in an ice cellar at this moment. She shivered suddenly, and was picked up by Soldak with a big hand and blocked behind her. The man standing behind Weru said, Ouch! and fell on the wooden steps outside the small building. The child in his arms also fell to the ground. Viru suddenly woke up and quickly took back the aura of a second-level strongman exuding from his body. Zygna suddenly felt that the coldness around her body dissipated instantly. He stared at Soldak. His eyes paused on his face for three seconds. Then he took half a step to the left, pointed with a sullen face at the unconscious child who fell on the wooden steps outside the house, and said, This child is they had a high fever and they were a little helpless. So I thought you might be able to help. So I brought them here. Soldak nodded, indicating that he understood. He walked to the child, and the man behind Weru got up from the ground in a panic and held the child in his arms again. Only then did Serdak see the man's face clearly through the moonlight. It was a very distinctive face. The dark brown skin and wide cheekbones constituted the most obvious facial features of the natives of the White Forest Plain. He was wearing simple leather armor, barefoot, and holding an indigenous child in his arms. The person Villa brought back was actually a local aborigine. Serdak didn't care how they met and walked up to the child. I reached out and touched his forehead. It felt a little hot and his face turned red. But there was no sweat on his forehead. Soldak pulled the child's collar open and stretched his hand to his chest. His heartbeat seemed rapid and weak. And even his breathing was very light. With some wheezing, Serdak asked the native to lay the child flat on the platform at the door. 
kneel on the ground with one knee, and condensed a light group with his hand, and the weak light continued to spread outward. At this time, Selina walked out of the house in her nightgown. Soldak didn't even look back, and ordered Selina, Go and get him a glass of water. He needs to drink some warm water. When we get back, get him some more water. His last sentence was to the aborigine. He didn't speak loudly, but in the quiet night, everyone could hear him clearly. After saying that, the light ball in his hand fell on the child. This was Serdak's holy light technique, which used holy breath to forcibly heal the opponent's body. The holy light gradually poured into the child's body, and the rapid breathing immediately became calmer, and the strange sickly red tide on his face began to fade little by little. Serdak raised his head and said to the aborigine, Maybe it's a cold. I just made his body stronger. Whether he can get better gradually depends on whether he is strong enough. Seeing that the child's condition was improving at a speed visible to the naked eye, the aborigine still didn't know that it was Serdak's contribution. He cast a grateful look at Serdak and knelt in front of Serdak. He put his forehead on Serdak's instep and thanked Serdak, turning around and thanking Viru again. Vera held him up with one hand and said, It's not me who saved the child, so you don't have to thank me. Now, you can go back with your child. The aboriginal bent down to pick up the child on the ground. But then he stopped again, turned around and took out a silver leaf grass exuding a magical aura from the wicker basket behind him, placed it respectfully on the ground, and then hugged the child. Pick up the child and turn around to leave. Silver leaf grass is a low-level magic herb. In today's era when magic herbs are scarce, a silver leaf grass can be sold for at least two or three high-level gold coins. Moreover, it is still expensive in the market even if many people hold it in their hands. If you want to buy gold coins at a high price, most of the time you won't be able to buy them. Serdak saved the child. And the aboriginal people actually took out a magic herb as a thank you. Which surprised Serdak. Wait a minute. This herb is a bit expensive. Serdak called the aboriginal from behind, picked up the magic herbs from the ground, and walked to him. He saw that the leather armor he was wearing was extremely ordinary. And his face was also full of weather and wrinkles. He had almost nothing of value. And his daily life was very difficult. So this herb was even more important to this aboriginal family. My holy light technique is not worth such a magical herb. Soldak gave the silver leaf grass to the aboriginal. But the aboriginal refused to take it at all. He just said awkwardly, This magic grass is dedicated to you. Sir, I know. Okay, in that case, wait, you must get equivalent services for the remuneration you pay. Serdak said to the aboriginal man. As he spoke, he took out a wind wolf head from his magic pocket and said to the aborigines, Give him to me. Taking the child from the aboriginal, Soldak held the child with one hand and the wind wave head with the other. He turned and walked back to the small building, closing the door behind him, leaving Viru and the aboriginal outside. Not long after, Soldak walked out of the small building with his child in his arms. At this time, although the child was still sleepy, his complexion turned rosy and he no longer seemed sickly. Serdak handed the child to the aboriginal man, and then said, Okay, if there is no problem, he will wake up tomorrow morning, and his illness will get better soon. Don't worry. The aboriginal man held the child in his arms, bowed to Serdak again and again, and then walked out of the military camp quickly. After curing the boy, where he didn't leave in a hurry, he just sat on the steps at the door of the small building and remained silent. Soldak also sat down next to Viru, and said to Selina, Go and see what food is left in the kitchen and prepare some to send over. Selina nodded and took Zigna to the kitchen. The John Bach you are looking for is really gone. Look, he only left such an ugly body. Serdak opened two buttons of his shirt, revealing the burned scars on his chest, and told Villa said, I know. John Bach would not help a plain native like this. He is a proud noble to the core. He has always believed that people from the Empire should be superior to others. Your style of doing things has completely changed. Villa stared at him with a stern look. With Serdak. Are you deliberately targeting the person who saved your life and gave you a new life? Not only do you imitate his words and deeds, but also his code of conduct? Do you want to live like him and let his will continue? Continue? Is this the rest of your life? His cold eyes were full of anger. Serdak leaned on the railing of the small building and said to Villa. I have never thought about living in anyone's way. Maybe this kind of life is what I want now. I just take care of his family by the way. Weiru, wake up. I am no longer the same Jibok I used to be. Velu closed his eyes and calmed himself down. Well, 
I shouldn't have brought up this terrible subject. He will look at Soldak, take a deep breath to calm down, and then say, Let me talk about what happened in the forest north of the town today. The aborigine who just left I met him in the northern forest outside the town. He is an aborigine of the town and an herb gatherer. Later, Wary told the story of meeting the herbal collector. After leaving the city, I walked into the forest to look for clues. The forest in the north of the town was full of searchers searching for the bandits. The mayor was leading a group of men in the woods. But it looked more like they were in the woods. To show off, some members of the search team even hid in remote places to hunt small forest beasts and ate barbecue in tree holes. Where he said, It seems that there are two groups of people in their search team. Only one group of people who have no say in the matter wants to hunt down the bandit group. They even think that the bandit group is hidden in the local indigenous tribes and that the bandit group is the United Nations. Only by recruiting the indigenous tribes could we easily loot the adventure group. But the mayor didn't listen to this at all. He just wasted his time and planned to deal with this matter. As far as I know, this incident is most likely an adventure group composed of exiled criminals supported by business groups, united with local indigenous tribes, and robbed a group of slave traders backed by Mayor Marco. Serdike said, when Weru heard what Serdak would say, he waved his hand to indicate that what he said was wrong. In fact, the bandit group had no connection with the local indigenous tribes at all. When I was tracing the past, through the eagle eye's earth vision, I accidentally saw a bandit group at the foot of a mountain. They were indeed made up of an adventure group formed by a group of wanted criminals. But they did not cooperate with the local indigenous tribes. The things they grabbed were in a cave. When I found them, they seemed to be planning to bypass the northern city wall on the pass, and left Duodan town, entered the hinterland of the empire-occupied area, and hid in another remote town. Velu said, at that time, I also found the aborigine who was collecting medicine. He was hiding in a big tree, wrapped in vines, and watching those people. Serdak frowned and said, if they want to leave Doden town in a deter, it seems they can't take those slaves away. Weru clenched his fists and said with a hum, that's right. When I got there, the wanted criminals had already executed a group of slaves outside the cave. And I discovered that a few of those people were actually wanted criminals in Wilk City. As he spoke, Vera took out a stack of parchment from his arms. With some portraits and information on it. He dug out a few pieces of parchment from the pile of wanted posters and showed them to Soldak. Why do you have these things? Serdak looked at Viru in surprise. Viru said matter-of-factly, Of course, I got it from the Adventurer's Guild in Wilk City. For a senior demon hunter like me, whenever he goes to a strange place, the first place he sets foot on must be the Adventurer's Guild. I got the information on those prey to facilitate hunting. And the bounties on these wanted criminals were pretty good. So I solved them easily. After saying that, he pulled out a large box from his magic belt bag. The whole box was stained with sticky blood and filled with a strong smell of blood. But the team that these exiled wanted criminals robbed was not a regular adventure team. As you said, it was a slave-catching team. The aboriginal herb collector wanted to rob the indigenous people who had become slaves. He was rescued, but he was alone. He originally wanted to secretly release some of them at night. But before nightfall, he saw the exiled wanted criminals executing the group of slaves. Where he said, Soldak continued, So you just do him a favor, and not only deal with all the wanted criminals, but also free the living slaves? Where he nodded and admitted, and said, I released the rescued slaves on the spot, nailed all the members of the adventure group to the tree, and found a few heads that could be sold according to the wanted poster portraits, and brought them back. Chapter 713 Aung San's Troubles Aung San the native of Doden Town, is a gatherer. What he is best at is collecting various magic herbs in the forest. However, the Invercargill Warcraft Forest has recently been occupied by a large number of Warcraft. Aung San did not dare to go deep into the forest to collect herbs. He has been wandering around the mountains and forests around Doden Town, trying to find some valuable ornamental plants to bring back to the town and sell them to those in the forest. Immigrant. Most of the immigrants in Doden Town come from Bina Province. They go to Doden Town to do business. They all have a few dollars in their hands. When they see something they like, they are accustomed to paying for it. No matter what. Are things useful? Aung San still remembers, at that time. He happened to get into a bush and collected a few red pine mushrooms from the roots of a rotten pine tree. Before he could climb out of the bush, he saw a group of slave traders driving a group of people with hands and necks all tied up. The natives, 
who were tied with iron ropes, walk through the dense trees and return from the native tribe. These slaves are all young and strong indigenous people from tribes hidden in the mountains. There are men and women in the crowd, and there is no deliberate distinction. All the indigenous people are connected together by an iron rope, and their hands are tightly tied with ropes. Many of them, there were some minor injuries on their bodies, and some indigenous women were even half-clothed. Several slave traders with whips followed the team. When they saw a slave walking a little slower, they raised their whips and struck hard. The thorns hit their bodies and immediately made a gash in their linen clothes. The beaten slave shook violently and was about to continue walking. Aung San clenched his fist and smashed it on the rotten leaves in the forest. He laid down in the bushes without even daring to show his head. These slave traders walked quickly under his eyes. Aung San hid his backpack in bushes, following the group of slave traders all the way. He knew that the laws of the Green Empire prohibited the capture of plain natives. This group of slave traders did not dare to blatantly escort these natives into Doden Town. They might have to spend the night in the woods outside Doden Town and find some carriage trucks in order to transport these indigenous people to Wilk City. So Aung San felt that he could try to find opportunities to rescue these natives from the clutches of slave traders. He followed this group of slave traders and hid himself well. He watched the slave traders drive the indigenous people through the pine forest at the foot of the mountain and stopped in a clearing of a mixed forest near the town of Doden. The slave traders tied the indigenous people to the trees like dogs. And the slaves the dealers patrolled around the forest very vigilantly. And some were responsible for lighting fires and cooking. Aung San wanted to send a message to the indigenous tribes, but was worried that if there was such a delay, the slave traders would transport the indigenous tribes away. He was a little hesitant and saw a group of masked bandits rushing out of the dense forest. A group of slave traders were surrounded in the forest clearing. They fought almost without leaving any survivors. After a hail of arrows, the bandits who rushed into the crowd chopped down these slave traders like melons and vegetables. Aung San did not expect that things would turn around. He was about to crawl out to see what was going on. But he didn't expect that the bandits thought that there was no one around. After confirming that no one was left alive, they led the indigenous people into the forest without untying the iron chains on their bodies. Just when Aung San looked surprised, he happened to see the two robbers walking behind pull off the face towels from their faces. Those faces turned out to be members of an adventure group in a small town that he was very familiar with. He originally wanted to he was about to climb out of the bush and stopped immediately when he saw this scene. The robber walking in front shouted in a low voice, Follow me quickly! These people drove the young and strong natives into the dense forest like cattle. Aung San gritted his teeth. But the thorns in the bushes were too pricking. So he hid in the bushes and followed him all the way. He never expected that the gang that robbed the slave traders was actually a well-known adventure group in the town. There were many very powerful first-class warriors in this adventure group. They often came from Invercargill Warcraft. They hunt monsters in the forest. And almost everyone in the town knows them. At night, Aung San walked into his yard with his son, who was breathing steadily, and stopped the random thoughts in his mind. The three wives and brothers were waiting in the yard. When they saw Aung San walking into the yard, they came over. One of Aung San's wives, Yali, was waiting at the door. When she saw Aung San walking in, she asked him, Randy, what's going on? Has the adult found anyone willing to save Randy? Aung San nodded and said in a deep voice, That gentleman is a new garrison officer in the town. He took me to the commander of the garrison. The commander has healing skills. He has rescued Randy. Yali, Randy's mother, took over her sleeping son from Aung San. Seeing that his face was rosy, his breathing was steady, and his condition had improved significantly. She took a deep breath and whispered, Thank God for his blessing. Aung San took the water glass from the other wife's hand, took a sip of water, and then said to his wife Yali, When he wakes up, don't forget to give him more water. Although his wife Yali didn't understand why Aung San said this, she turned around and nodded, indicating that she had taken note of it. There are three brothers living in this courtyard. Aung San is the eldest of the family. His parents died in the forest outside the town during the last animal epidemic. Even the bodies were not recovered. At that time, Aung San was just 14 years old. I learned some basic skills of collecting from my father. There are two younger brothers in the family. One is eight years old, and the other is six years old. After his parents died, Aung San raised his two younger brothers alone. Although the two younger brothers have grown up now, the three brothers have not separated their families. Under Aung San's control, both brothers have married wives. 
Now Ong San is naturally the head of the family and the most outstanding man in Doden Town. Collector, seeing the eldest brother coming back from outside, the expression on his face was always very heavy. The two brothers knew that the eldest brother had encountered a problem, and they drove the women back to their respective houses. The three brothers sat on the roof of the main house, lying side by side on the tiles, looking up at the pre-dawn starry sky. This is usually the case when discussing important matters at home. Ong San placed a pair of thick palms behind his head, sighed and said, I didn't expect that the gentleman was a garrison officer. So this matter became more complicated. Brother, did you go to the military camp? The youngest brother looked at Ong San curiously. Ong San nodded and said, I also saw with my own eyes the commander of the new garrison. He personally saved Randy's life. I took out the silver leaf grass as a thank you gift and dedicated it to the commander. Latu, the second among the three brothers, is the one who likes to use his brain the most. He frowned and asked in confusion. Brother, how do you know that officer? Didn't they just arrive in the town yesterday? Ong San shook his head and said, We met him yesterday in a forest in the north of the town. At that time, he walked out of the woods with a hunting bow on his back. I happened to be hiding in a big tree nearby. I saw it with my own eyes. Until he shot to death one by one a group of adventure group members pretending to be bandits. And released all the tribal natives caught by the adventure group. Latu knocked his head hard and asked Ong San. Brother, wasn't that adventurous group secretly supported by the town's merchants? How did they loot those slave traders? Don't they know that the person standing behind those slave traders is Mal? Mayor Ku? What did you see in the forest yesterday? Ong San simply told what happened. When it came to the members of the adventure group killing all the slave traders in the forest outside the town, the three brothers fell silent. Ong San continued, I secretly followed them. And when I found an opportunity, I rescued those tribesmen. I counted as many as I could. I followed them for a whole day and night. But I couldn't find them. When I had the chance to take action, I also thought that if it didn't work out, I would go to the tribe to ask for help. But I didn't expect that the members of the adventure group were actually a group of cruel and ruthless people. By noon yesterday, I probably didn't receive any news from the town. So I wanted to leave here in a hurry. They didn't want to take these tribesmen away with them. So they started killing people outside the cave where they were hiding. They killed all the people in the tribe. And the officer came out of the woods. Killed them all with a hunting bow. Nailed their bodies to trees. And cut off several of their heads. Originally, I had been hiding in the tree. Unexpectedly, the officer discovered me. He was going to shoot me with a hunting bow. I saw that I couldn't run away. So I took the initiative to slide down from the tree. He probably saw that I was not a member of that adventure group. So he asked me if I knew Belan dialect. When I nodded, he asked me to tell the people in the tribe to hide further and build a village. Don't be too close to Doden Town. Hearing what Ansan said, Tula was surprised and said, This officer is actually different from other imperial immigrants. On the other hand, those members of the exiled adventure group should have been dealt with by someone a long time ago. Tula said angrily, These guys are not only bold enough to kill those slave traders, but they also intercept and kill us townspeople in the Invercarville Warcraft Forest. For the collectors on board, I'm sure that Croft's death must have something to do with them. Mayor Marco must have been mad yesterday. Right? Ong San turned to Latu and asked. Latu chuckled, nodded and said, the mayor can't wait to take all the people in the town out to find those who cut off his financial path. The business group is probably confused now. Do they already know that all members of the adventure group were killed? But they should be able to determine that the murderer was not one of Mayor Marco's men. Ong San finished. Then he hit his forehead twice with his fist. He closed his eyes and forced himself not to think about these things. But before he could close his eyes, he suddenly opened his eyes and said to Latu, Yeah. I didn't expect such a strong garrison to come to the town. Do your best tomorrow and go outside the city to inform the elders in the nearby tribes that these are extraordinary times and ask them to stay away from Duoda in town. Well, I'll go tomorrow. The beast tide is coming and they should hide deep in the mountains. Latu said. Chapter 714 Execution Ground The three Ansan brothers were lying on the roof chatting for a short time when they noticed that the stars in the night sky had receded and the sky lit up with a touch of fish belly white. The wife ran out of the house and shouted to her husband on the roof. Ong San. Randy is awake. Ong San sat up from the roof tiles and jumped down from the roof regardless of the dew on his body. He walked into the room first and saw his son sitting up from the bed. Although he looked a little weak, 
He was very energetic. Dad. The son sat on the bed and shouted this. An San felt his whole heart was warm. It seemed that the commander had not lied to him. This was the first time An San felt that the Green Empire people were not too difficult to get along with. And he felt a sense of gratitude to the commander of the garrison camp from the bottom of his heart. He walked over quickly and held his son in his arms. The wife brought back a clay pot of water from behind and fed it to her son. Aung San stroked the son's head and said to him, Go to sleep. Take another nap. And everything will be fine when you get up. He thought that in the forest yesterday, the officer did not kill him with an arrow. So he left the forest in a panic and returned to Duodan town directly along a path outside the city. It was already night when he arrived at Duodan town. Just as he climbed over the northern city wall, he met the officer standing behind him again. Are you a resident of Doden Town? The officer asked him, his voice so calm that his body trembled unconsciously. I am a gatherer in the forest. Aung San patted the flat wicker basket on his waist and answered honestly. The officer nodded, walked out of the darkness, and asked him, Do you usually enter the city like this? Aung San's heart brightened and he forced a smile. When I come back late, I will climb the wall like this. Otherwise, I will freeze outside the city all night. Our north wall is usually used to defend against the monsters in the Invercargo Forest. I don't really mind if someone climbs the wall. When he said these words, Aung San's calves were shaking. But what surprised him later was that the officer actually climbed over the 40-meter-high northern city wall with him by relying on the wall-climbing rope. As soon as he climbed to the top of the city, Aung San saw his younger brother Tula wearing the battle armor of the city defense army, waiting there anxiously. What happened? Aung San realized that something unsolvable might have happened at home. Otherwise, Latu would not have been waiting for him on the city wall in such a panic. He did not say that he would definitely come back to town tonight. The second brother Latu said to Aung San with a guilty look on his face. Randy is sick and has been in a coma for several days. Everyone is waiting for you to come back and make up your mind. Aung San's heart sank and he quickly walked down the city wall with Latu. As he walked, he said, Let's go home and have a look. Why did Randy get sick? Wasn't he still fine when I left? These city defense guards all knew Aung San. When they saw Aung San passing by, they greeted him cordially. Aung San just forced a smile and responded. He felt a chill on his back. The officer kept following Aung San, looking just like his companions. The three walked silently down the city wall. When Aung San returned home, the officer actually followed him all the time. When he saw the yard of his home, his son who had been sleeping in bed, and his wives who were in a mess. Aung San felt that only then did the coldness in the officer's eyes subside. When the wives saw Aung San coming back from outside the town, they suddenly seemed to have a backbone. They reviewed themselves in front of Aung San, cried and begged him, asking him to find a way to save Randy. But what could Aung San do? He thought of wicker, the silver leaf grass in the basket. I heard that this herb has always been the main ingredient in making primary healing potions. How about trying this magic herb? At this moment, Aung San heard the officer say to him, Take your child and follow me. I can help you. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Aung San's thoughts were interrupted by a knock on the door. Someone was banging on the door outside the yard. Aung San felt cold and told his wife, You are in the house. No matter what happens outside, don't come out. I will go out and take a look. The wooden courtyard door was kicked open from the outside and fell crashing into the courtyard shattering into several wooden boards. Several heavily armed city guards broke in from the outside, holding spears in their hands, aiming at the three brothers Lion Hill and Latu in the courtyard. Latu saw clearly that it was fellow soldiers from the city defense team who rushed into his home with weapons in hand. He immediately raised his eyes and shouted at them in a low voice, Why are you so crazy? Come to my house and kick in the door? I asked them to kick me. A knight walked in from outside the crowd walked in front of the city defense guards, and stared at Aung San and Latu with a serious look on his face. Latu was slightly startled, with an expression of disbelief on his face, and shouted, Captain. Obviously, everyone was gambling together yesterday, but unexpectedly, just after one night, someone came to break down the door. The captain of the city defense army scolded with a sullen face. Latu, you are no longer a soldier of the city defense army. Come here and tie up both of these brothers. Lata didn't understand what happened. He saw people rushing up around him. Just when he wanted to resist, Aung San grabbed his arm. The family members hid in the house behind him. The consequences of resisting would be to drag down the family 
and the two brothers would not be able to resist. He resisted and was captured. The youngest brother wanted to step forward to stop him. But Ong San shouted back. Seeing that Ong San was so responsible, the captain of the city defense team softened his gloomy expression slightly and ordered his soldiers to escort the two men back to the town hall. On the way, he asked Ong San, did you bring a stranger over the city wall into Doden Town last night? Well, I came back late from the city. I didn't want to spend the night outside. So I climbed over the city wall and returned to the town. Ong San said, he heard that the captain of the city defense team wanted to investigate Viru. And thinking that Viru had almost killed an entire adventure group, he certainly would not answer truthfully. The captain of the city defense team whispered to Ong San, Who is that person with you? Think about what you did outside the city yesterday. You can think about it on the way to the town hall. Don't say nothing when you meet the mayor. Ong San, we all live in the town, and we all know each other so well. You'd better be more knowledgeable, and don't make things difficult for your brothers. He did not continue to ask further questions. So he brought Ong San and Latu to the town hall. Under the steps outside the town hall, he actually caught some other collectors in the town. These people usually spend time in the Invercargo Warcraft Forest, collecting various mountain products and herbs. Everyone was familiar with each other. Ong San felt completely cold when he saw them. This is not to investigate what happened yesterday. The mayor sent people to capture these collectors. Nine out of ten have already reached an agreement with the business group. Now he just wants to find a group of scapegoats to make the collectors outside the city. The robbery case was quickly settled. He glanced at his brother Latu, who was trapped like a rice dumpling next to him. With an apology in his eyes, Latu was not a stupid aboriginal and he immediately guessed Mayor Marco's true intention. Although he was shocked and angry, he could only stand beside Ong San without saying a word. In the morning in the small town, the sun shines into the yard, and many people are already gathered on the street. Mayor Marco was standing on the steps in front of the town hall at this time. He walked up to Ong San and asked with a gloomy face, I heard that you left the city yesterday and came back at night? Yes, Lord Mayor. Ong San knelt at the foot of the steps his hands tied with ropes, and his body hunched over as he replied. What did you do outside the city? Marco walked down the steps and stood in front of Ong San, putting a foot in a long leather boot on Ong San's shoulder. Ong San was trampled by Mayor Marco and fell to the ground. His face pressed to the ground, and he reluctantly defended. Mr. Mayor, I just collected some mountain products in the forest outside the city. Mayor Marco angrily reprimanded. You are lying. It was you collectors, who colluded with the natives and bandits in the villages outside to rob the adventure group in the town. Come and escort them to the punishment stone in the square. Waiting for the town. When the last few chief officials arrived at the square, they were executed on the spot. Then, without giving these aboriginal gatherers a chance to defend themselves, a group of guards rushed up and tied strips of cloth around the mouths of all the gatherers, making them collectively silence. The collectors led by Ong San were escorted by the city guards to a square not far from the town hall. There is a punishment stone in this square. It is usually a place to punish prisoners and thieves. Thieves are usually sentenced to whipping. Some women who committed crimes would be tied to the punishment stone without eating or drinking and basked in the sun. Some women could not bear the humiliation and would die on the punishment stone. Over time, the entire punishment stone turned reddish brown seeing the mayor and town officials sitting on the edge of the square. The city defense guard standing behind Ong San had the opportunity to whisper to him. The mayor wants to kill a few people to get rid of this matter. Boss Ong San, my brothers can't help with this matter. I can only wait until the execution to avoid causing you too much pain. We know that there was a new face who went back to town with you. Boss Ong San, last night, if you can reveal the person who went back to town with you, you might be able to shift the blame onto that person. That would be enough. Let Boss Ong San and Brother Latu escape. The city defense guard continued to whisper. Ong San knew that he wanted to know information about Vilu. So he immediately puffed up his chest, stared at the city guard with cold eyes, and said, I was the only one who climbed the wall back to the town last night. The person following me was Latu. There was no one else at all. The city defense guard could only nod slightly, and sighed and said, Well, they say that you, Ong San, are the boss among the collectors in the town. You can indeed deserve the title of boss. Since you said so, what happened last night? None of the brothers on duty on the city wall saw any strangers. Ong San glanced at the city defense guard again, hesitated for a moment, and then said, If Latu and I die here, 
I would also like to trouble you to tell my brother and ask him to take the whole family and leave Doton Town as soon as possible. Go to Wilk City to make a living and never come back. And don't even think about avenging the two of us. The city guard promised in a low voice. Boss on San. Don't worry. The news will be brought to you. Mayor Marco was sitting on a chair on the edge of the square with a sullen face. The slave trade business had been messed up. He hadn't slept at all in the past two days. All signs pointed to the fugitives from the business group. He had his hands and feet. But he led people to search outside the city for a day and night. But no evidence was found in order to prevent the incident from expanding its impact. He had to swallow this breath and settle the matter hastily. There are only a few officials in the town who have arrived, including the captain of the city defense brigade, the tax collector of Doden Town, the census clerk of Doden Town, etc. Only the new garrison commander of Doden Town. Serdak before arriving at the square. Mayor Marco glanced impatiently at Mrs. Luna beside him. Mrs. Luna could only force out a smile and look towards the garrison camp. The garrison commander, Mr. Serdak, just walked out of the camp and walked along the dirt road towards the square. When Serdak walked to the square, Serdak did not go to join the officials in the town first. Instead, he walked to the punishment stone and saw a group of aborigines kneeling on the spot with their hands, feet and mouths bound. It looked like he was a criminal awaiting execution. He didn't expect that the mayor of the town, Marco, who said that, the members of the bandits will be tried at the town hall tomorrow actually found such a group of scapegoats. If Vera didn't happen to know the inside story, maybe he would have been suppressed in this matter. These officials were kept in the dark. Suldak walked slowly to where the town officials were gathered. Mayor Marco glanced at Suldak coldly and yelled at his secretary, Mrs. Luna, at the top of his lungs. When delivering notices in the future, try to be as early as possible and make the meeting time clear. And who is not in charge? There are a lot of things and you can't just keep waiting for someone to be late. Mrs. Luna blushed and replied softly, I understand. Mr. Mayor. Mayor Marco waved his hand impatiently, and without even looking at Soldak, he said to the town officials, Okay, since everyone's time is very limited, I will inform you about this matter as a routine. And then everyone voted by a show of hands. Mayor Marco paused for a moment. His cold eyes swept over the faces of the town officials. And then he said, those people in the square looted an adventurous group outside the city the day before yesterday. Now the town's city defense team has arrested them. Duodan Town is in an emergency period now. My idea is to execute them on the spot. Agreed? No need to raise your hands. This group of town officials all lowered their heads and looked at their toes. The scene was extremely quiet for a while. Mayor Marco's eyes widened and he cursed at the town officials in front of him. Why don't you people speak? Are you all mute? People who know you know that you agree with my decision. Outsiders see you like this. I thought your silence was silent resistance. The town tax official quickly forced out a smile that was uglier than crying and said to Mayor Marco, Mayor, we all agree that if there is no one else, I will go and sort out the tax accounts. Mayor. Mayor Marco's face softened slightly and he nodded slightly. I disagree. Sardak stood among these people, raised his hands and said loudly, Chapter 715 Execution Ground 2 The square suddenly became quiet, and almost everyone's eyes fell on Soldak. The town officials present looked at Sernak, who made questioning sounds in surprise. Their eyes were very complicated, and some even opened their mouths in an O shape. Many people at the scene were very unfamiliar with Soldak, and wondered how he had the courage to stand up and defend the local indigenous people in the town. Many aborigines were also discussing among themselves, trying to understand the brave man in front of them. Serdak stood there and exhaled, looking at Mayor Marco with a calm face, the smile on his face clearly showing a hateful look of I'm here to disrupt the situation. He originally planned to tell Mayor Marco that Vera was hunting wanted criminals outside the city after breakfast. I never expected that Mayor Marco had planned to find a few scapegoats last night and was waiting for him to come forward this morning. Everyone would sign and sign together to confirm the charges of these scapegoats and then send them to the execution ground to end the case. Finish. I never thought that the town of Duodan would be in such a rotten state that they would dare to publicly try these innocent aborigines in the town square. And no one would stop them. No wonder the cavalry battalion commander of Langdon's regiment couldn't wait to lead his troops to leave. After Soldak finished speaking, he walked directly in front of Mayor Marco. Soldak was half a head taller than Marco. But Mayor Marco had a beard and sharp eyes. And his aura was not inferior to that of Sue. Erdak. 
He glared at Serdak and said with suppressed anger, If Commander Serdak has any different opinions, you can raise them at the town council. Don't waste our precious time now. Since the majority agrees with this proposal, then I declare. Soldak reached out and pressed Mayor Marco's shoulder, saying before he could give the order, Mayor Marco, we need a fair trial. Mayor Marco stared at Soldak coldly, waiting for him to continue. If they are guilty, I am willing to swing my sword with my own hands and chop off their heads, Soldak said. Then he lowered his voice and said, But I want to know what crime they committed. I hope you didn't just catch a few aboriginal people in the town and do nothing. The last words he said could only be heard clearly by Mayor Marco and a few surrounding officials. At this moment, the officials looked at Soldak in horror. They glanced at Mayor Marco cautiously, fearing that the furious Mayor Marco would also get angry at them. So they all calmly took half a step back. Soldak stared at Mayor Marco, not afraid of his sharp gaze that seemed to choose people to eat, and said bluntly, Mayor Marco, please escort these aborigines in the town to the square to identify them as the masterminds of the robbery. There must be some conclusive evidence. Mayor Marco's forehead had veins bulging, and he said with a gloomy face, Of course, I have conclusive evidence. They are not only collectors in the town, but also secretly colluded with nearby indigenous tribes to form a bandit group outside the town. Rub the town's adventure group outside the town. He clenched his fists, resisted the urge to punch Soldak in the face, and continued. They gathered information about the town's adventure group and then sent it outside the town in advance, so that they could set up an ambush in the forest outside the town. These collectors, headed by Aung San, have recently been passing on information about adventure groups outside the town. They have committed crimes outside the town one after another in the past few months. We have enough evidence, including witnesses from the indigenous people of the tribe. In addition, just last night, people from the city defense team also learned the whereabouts of Aung San. He only climbed over the northern city wall, and returned to the town last night. Most of these people have confessed. Then he turned to Mrs. Luna beside him and ordered, Mrs. Luna, please take out the confessions of these aborigines and show them to Commander Serdak. Mrs. Luna quickly took out a folder in her arms and looked for the confession in which the ink was not even dry. Serdak glanced at the aborigines waiting to be tortured on the other side of the punishment stone. He did not accept the confession in Mrs. Luna's hand and said to Mayor Marco, if I say that the slave trade was looted outside the city, there is another person in the group. What would the mayor think? Mayor Marco narrowed his eyes and said to Serdak, who was very close at hand, Then I would like to ask Commander Soldak, What evidence do you have? Serdak turned back to Vilu and Andrew behind him and said, Bring the box over. Open it and show it to the mayor. As an indigenous warrior of the Nanai tribe in the Maka Plain, Andrew couldn't bear to see the imperial immigrants discriminating against the natives of the plain. Although this kind of thing often happened in the Maka Plain, it was not so blatant after all. Andrew opened the blood-stained lid of the box, and inside were heads soaked in light green tree sap. Each head has a hideous appearance and is soaked in green antiseptic tree sap, making it look extremely disgusting. The sap has a pungent, spicy smell that makes officials from surrounding towns cover their mouths and noses. Mayor Marco did not expect that Serdak would bring out a box of human heads. He frowned and asked coldly, Who are these heads? Serdak took out a pile of wanted notices on parchment from his arms and placed them on the square table next to him. Then he didn't care about the sticky sap and reached out to pick up the human head soaked in it. According to these, the wanted poster was placed on the table and the table was covered with sap and blood. Serdak reached out and wiped the sap off the head and face and then said, These people are wanted criminals requested by the Wilk City Guard Camp and the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group. The parchment notices in my hand contain their crimes and magical portraits, and of course some of their physical characteristics. Avoid mistaken identity during the arrest. The surrounding town officials saw such a disgusting scene and couldn't help but retched amid the pungent smell. Serdak, with a cold face, asked the crowd around him, Is the head of the Adventure Union in the town here? He guessed that there would be people from the Adventure Guild and the trading company coming to watch the fun. And sure enough, a middle-aged swordsman wearing exquisite magic patterned leather armor squeezed out from the crowd. The middle-aged swordsman kept his posture very low, put one hand on his right shoulder, saluted Soldak respectfully, and then said, Sir Commander, I am willing to serve you at any time. I don't know what your orders are. Serdak stood in front of the square table, pointed at the wanted notice on the table, and said, You can't say you don't know about this. Right. 
I think there should be a copy of this parchment wanted notice on your guild's notice board. The middle-aged swordsman put on a helpless expression and said with a smile, Your Majesty Commander, Doden Town is located on a remote border, and the information here is relatively blocked. Many news from Wilk City cannot be delivered in time. Come over. Facing the row of heads on the table, his expression was very calm. So this is the reason why you dare to allow them to appear in the Adventure Guild as adventurers? Sir Deck pressed. The middle-aged swordsman said with an innocent face. Commander, where do we start with this? You said that you have appeared in the Adventure Guild. But I can't know everyone who comes to the Adventure Guild. To me, they they're all new faces. Saldak snorted coldly, threw the head back into the box, and asked Andrew to carry it away. He found a handkerchief and wiped the thick tree sap on his hands and said to Mayor Marco unhurriedly, It was this group of people who robbed an adventure group in the forest outside the town. They were going to kill the slaves and carry supplies to leave Doden Town. Unfortunately, they met our cavalry battalion team last night. These wanted criminals were captured by us, all the people were killed, and the corpses are still hanging in the forest. I think there should be no large carnivorous beasts in the forest outside the town. Those corpses should not be eaten clean by wild beasts in the forest overnight. I rush to collect the corpses now. If you have time, you may still be able to find the lost stolen goods at the scene. I think the stolen goods at the scene are the best proof that they robbed the adventure group. Mayor Marco stared at Soldak and said in surprise. You actually found them? Where are they? Serdak looked at the trapped aboriginal Ong San on the other side of the punishment stone and said. You can ask the collector named Ong San to take you there. He is more familiar with the forest outside the town. Our cavalry battalion is new here. If you let us lead the way... You might get lost in the woods outside the town. Mayor Marco's face was uncertain. But he gave Hans, the captain of the city defense team, a look and asked him to bring Osan here. Among the crowd were a group of businessmen wearing gorgeous clothes. Their faces were very ugly at this time, although they tried their best to hide it and maintain their original composure at all times. Not all of them had such good self-cultivation. He stayed in the square for a long time and then left in a hurry. Ong San was brought here by the city defense guards. He did not dare to look at Suldak and Weiru for fear that they would get into trouble. But I heard Suldak call out his name accurately. Ong San, I would also like to ask you to take the mayor to the scene and find the stolen goods at will. Do you remember the way? Ong San hesitated, but reacted quickly and nodded vigorously. Mayor Marco waved his hand gloomily, asking Captain Hans to untie the cloth and rope that sealed his mouth. Lord Commander! Ong San prostrates himself at Serdak's feet. Go and lead the way for the mayor. By the way, don't forget to ask for the bounty from them. Go back as soon as possible. Don't delay and lead the way for our patrol. After all, we are new here and we are not familiar with the environment around the town. Familiar? Serdak reached out and grabbed Ong San's shoulders, lifted him up from the ground, and said in a relaxed tone, At this time, among the guards standing behind Captain Hans of the city defense team, someone recognized Viru, pointed at Viru behind Soldak, and introduced to Captain Hans in a low voice, that person this is the person who went into the city with Boss Ong San last night. Captain Hans could only look at Soldak with an extremely depressed look, feeling quite resentful towards him. We are all grasshoppers on the same rope. Why can't we take a breath before doing this? Those watching the excitement around the square also saw some clues. Although they were farther away and did not know the specific details, they were able to tell that Commander Serdak was actually the original leader of Doden Town this time. Residents came forward. At this moment, some people in the crowd are happy and some are worried. Serdak did not follow the search team organized by Mayor Marco out of the northern city wall. But Ong San, an aborigine in the town, became the guide. The aboriginal collectors in front of the punishment stone were also released on the spot and cheers from some aboriginal people immediately appeared in the square. And the sound was like a wave. Serdak, Viru, and Andrew will return to the garrison camp. Wherever they go, the residents of the town will immediately make way for them. A group of cavalrymen in the garrison camp are doing morning exercises in the yard. They are currently taking the time to practice their riding skills. Under the careful training of 27 local herdsmen, the cavalrymen's riding skills have improved significantly. Soldak has already written to the elders of Wet's village, hoping that he can send some more men to Doden Town if possible. You have completely offended Mayor Marco this time. Andrew smiled and said to Soldak. Serdak shrugged his shoulders, kicked a piece of roadside rubble away with his feet, and said, Otherwise, what else can we do to make Doden Town a mess? 
I just think this town can still be saved. One time. Besides, I still need to use Doden Town as a base to continue to expand territory to the north. It is impossible for the town to continue to be chaotic. Serdek said. Weiru looked at Suldek and said, You are quite confident about this beast wave. Suldek said confidently. There is nothing to worry about. Don't you think that the reason why Marquis Luther sent the great swordsman Chester to Wilkes this time is to deal with this beast tide? He thought that if the beasts in the forest formed a tide, he would take out the gunpowder that had blasted through the rock formations of the river and blow all the beasts into the sky. Suldek analyzed. Marquis Luther didn't mention this to me, but he arranged for our cavalry battalion to resist from the front, probably to see the cavalry battalion's defensive capabilities. Andrew habitually stretched out his hand and pressed it on the handle of the axe and said excitedly, We still have some time to make preparations in advance. The more dangerous it is, the greater the harvest will be. This time, I want to go to Invercargill Monster Forest. Look, it's better for me to go. I originally wanted to hunt in the Warcraft Forest, but I didn't expect to be delayed for three days by this matter. Vera continued. After saying that, he changed direction and walked along a branch road towards the gate of the North City Wall. Saldak patted Andre on the shoulder and said with a smile, By the way, at noon, I made an appointment with the tailor shop owner to view the house. I will leave the border patrol to you first. Chapter 716 Small Town Life A very characterful garrison commander came to the town. He actually didn't even give the mayor Marco face and made the mayor furious in the town square. What happened in the square in the morning quickly reached the ears of the residents of the town. The town is not big and word travels quickly. The garrison officer and the town mayor Marco do not get along. And for most town residents, they have no direct interest. Most of the residents in the town didn't care. They hoped to have more exciting scenes in the morning and become a topic of conversation after dinner. Serdak walked back to the garrison camp and saw Samira leading a group of recruits on the bow and arrow training ground under the North City Wall, teaching these recruits some skills and using alloy bows. This time, she taught them five Samira was wearing a set of tight-fitting salamander leather armor and was very patient in imparting her experience on short-range shooting skills within 10 yards. A group of recruits gathered around her, observing her sideways drawing of the bow. Each time the arrow accurately hit the target. The recruits cheered. But when Samira required every recruit to master this basic archery skill within a week, otherwise they would be subject to some corporal punishment. The recruits started to wail one after another. Serdak did not bother Samira's archery teaching and walked straight back to the small building. At this time, Andrew and Gulitam had gathered a group of veterans from the cavalry battalion. They all rode away from the military camp and went straight to the north wall of the town. They should be conducting border patrols. The first few patrols not only required with enough veterans from the cavalry battalion. Serdak also asked the ogre Gulitam to set off with the army to avoid encountering emergencies outside the city. Of course, this is also in line with the thoughts of the ogre Gulitam. He came to Doden Town with a cavalry battalion. Apart from the marching rations, he only had canned luncheon meat and wild vegetable soup. The last bit of oil and water in his stomach was consumed by this light meal every day. He is now the most what they need is to eat meat. But currently there is a temporary shortage of meat and eggs in the military camp. So if the ogres want to improve their food, they can only look to the small beasts in the woods outside the city. Andrew ran to invite him to leave the city with him. Gulitam didn't want to wait for a moment. He joined Andrew and brought a team of veterans drawn from each squadron. They marched out of the North City Wall and headed towards the Duodin Canyon. Go north. Soldak walked back to the small building. Selina was having lunch with Zigna and Nika in the restaurant. There was a plate of baked wheat cakes and stewed vegetables on the table. Both girls were holding wheat cakes in their hands. Head down to eat. Nika saw Serdak walk into the restaurant frowned at the table, and stood up from the table with some restraint. Selina looked at Suldek in surprise, put down the wheat cake in her hand, and asked, Why are you back? Serdek pushed the nervous Nika down on his seat, pulled out the main chair and sat down. Signa stood up knowingly and poured Suldek a glass of water. The things over there are over. Of course we have to come back for lunch. Suldek picked up a piece of crispy toasted wheat cake from the basket, broke off a piece and stuffed it into his mouth, while saying, Selina quickly picked up an empty plate, scooped out some stewed vegetables from the clay pot in the middle of the table, placed it in front of Soldak, and then asked, That Mayor Marco didn't even treat you to a meal. Work meal. Serdak looked at the light dishes on the table and said, I guess he is not in the mood to eat now. Why do you just eat these for lunch? 
Selena stood up quickly, rolled up her sleeves, and said to Soldak, I thought you wouldn't come back to eat. Omelette or fried steak. Whatever you want to eat. The stove here is very convenient for doing anything. Soldak shook his head and said, That's it. Zigna and Nika are both growing up. So they need to pay attention to balanced nutrition. Every meal must have meat and eggs. I see there is a store specializing in cheese in the town. I will buy some when I have time in the afternoon. I haven't seen you with such high demands in Wall Village. Selina sat down and muttered softly. Serdek said with some helplessness. After all, Wall Village's conditions are limited. Since there is no shortage of these materials in Duodan Town. We don't need to save on food. I know. Selina looked at Soldak with a gentle face and promised. Serdak broke the wheat cakes into pieces and soaked them in the vegetable stew soup. While eating, he said, Let's eat some for lunch. We will meet with the tailor shop owner later. After Selina heard what Soldek said, she no longer insisted on going to the kitchen to fry meat. Serdek raised his head and said to Nika at the end of the dining table, Nika, when the house in the town is rented, you can live with Selina and Zigna in the town. Are you literate? Nika quickly put down the wheat cake in her hand and shook her head. Serdak motioned for Nika to continue eating, and then said, Selina, you can teach Nika the Green Empire language first. After a while, Serdak asked, Nika, how old are you this year? Ten years old, Nika said, while trying to swallow the food in her mouth. Serdak lowered his head and thought about it, nodded and said, Oh, there are still two years of preparation time before you can participate in the Magic Awakening Ceremony. I plan for you to learn Chinese characters first. And then I will find a magic teacher for you and Zigna so that you can receive some magic enlightenment. I think you have some talent for magic. Nika didn't expect that she would be taken to Duodan Town and that in addition to working as a handyman. She would also have to learn Mandarin. I will study hard. Lord Baron. Nika said. Serdak said to her again. Now your task is to calm down and learn some useful knowledge. So that you can help me in the future. After a while. I will ask someone to pick up your mother from Jilin Town. You have to work harder to be with you. Mother has a good life. Nika raised her head. Looked at Soldak in surprise. And agreed. I will try my best. Lord Baron. She always thought that she was brought here to be a maid serving as a handyman. Now it seems that the life she wants is a bit different. The main task is to study. If she is asked to do some chores, she is quite sure to do it well. However, if she is asked to study, the aboriginal children in Jilin Town have never had the opportunity to enter school. After passing college, she couldn't even write her own name. Nika lowered her head and looked at the plate in front of her. Worry written on her face. After lunch, Soldak took Selina, Zigna, and Nika into the town. Serdak and his party stood at the door of the tailor shop, looking at the small tailor shop with its windows wiped clean. The hangers inside were filled with various styles of ready-made clothes. It was surprising that Doden Town could have such an exquisite tailor. Store. I was a little surprised for a while. He opened the door and walked into the store. The clerk standing at the door immediately greeted them and asked them what they needed. Whether they wanted tailor-made clothes or ready-made clothes. Selina and Zigna rarely visit this kind of tailor shop. And their eyes were immediately attracted by the exquisite clothes in the store. Selina reached out and touched the beautifully patterned fabrics on the counter. But said nothing. Neither you nor Zigna have any good-looking dresses. I usually don't have much time. Take this opportunity to pick out a few more if you like. Soldak said to Selina. Selina didn't say anything. She stood in front of the rows of clothes racks and carefully looked at the styles of clothes in the store. This tailor shop is not big. So I quickly looked through all the dresses, selected a few styles on the racks, and asked Serdak which one was the most beautiful. I don't like to do multiple choice questions. So of course I'll buy them all. Serdak said to Selina. He turned to the clerk in the store and asked, If the size doesn't fit, you can change it here. Right? Of course. If you have any additional needs for these styles of dresses, you can add them at will. The clerk in the store said quickly, The town of Doden is not big, and there are rarely customers, like Soldak who buys several sets of clothes in one purchase. Although he is a strange face, the shop assistant is also extremely enthusiastic. Such a large order naturally requires the shop owner to come forward and establish a relationship with the customer. Another clerk guarding the shop immediately called Epperson, the owner of the tailor's shop. Over. Epson, the owner of the tailor's shop, saw Soldak and his party and recognized him at a glance as the tenant he had made an appointment with last night. 
he quickly walked up to Suldak and said enthusiastically, I've been waiting for you in the shop. For a long time. I thought you were late. But it turned out you were here picking out clothes. Do you open this shop? Suldak asked the tailor shop owner. The owner of the tailor shop pretended to be a successful person and said proudly, Yes, it has been open for many years. When I was young, I heard that it was easier to make a living here and that people who immigrated to this plane could be exempted from military service. I came to the Belan plane with a pair of scissors and a measuring tape and stayed here for more than 10 years. I started a family here and saved a shop. Soldak handed the selected clothes to the store clerk and the clerk behind the counter began to quickly wrap the long skirts one by one. The owner of the tailor's shop said to Selena, Madam, if you think there is anything inappropriate about these skirts, you can always go to the shop to change the size. In addition, we also have some gifts. Then he whispered a few words to the young female clerk. And the female clerk took Selena, Signa, and Nika into the back room of the store. After waiting for a while, Selena walked out with Zigna and Nika. Nika was holding a cloth bag in her hand. Seeing the blush on Selena's face, Soldat guessed that these gifts were. It was probably some clothes fitting clothes. Unexpectedly, this tailor shop owner was quite good at business. Serdak paid the money readily and after a comparison, he found that the prices here were more expensive than those in Halanza City. Probably due to the cost of fabrics. After all, this place is located in the most remote place in the Belan Plain. If you come again in the future, if you don't need any gifts, I can give you a discount. The tailor shop owner said to Selena, although the house has not been rented out yet. After taking over such a business, the owner of the tailor shop was in a very good mood and did not forget to win over Selena before going out. The tailor shop owner's house is a bit far away from the shop on the street. But according to his introduction, this small single family building was built on the edge of a wealthy area. The people living here are immigrants from the Green Empire. The owner of the tailor shop also considered that this small single-family building was a bit far away from the tailor shop. After I had some savings, I bought a small courtyard behind the tailor shop and just renovated a small building. Now that their whole family lives there, the small building here has become idle. The tailor shop introduced them as they walked and came to the small single-family building. Serdek discovered that, just as the tailor shop owner said, the living area here was obviously cleaner and tidier than other places in the town. The small buildings were neatly arranged together, and they all had a small yard. The yard is not that big. A group of people walked into the small independent building. It looked a bit old from the outside, but the decoration inside was very warm. There were living room, kitchen, bathroom, and clean attic upstairs. Selena liked this house very much, but she was not satisfied with it. The backyard was full of debris. She wanted to build a swing under the grape trellis. In addition, it was a bit far away from the garrison camp. Serdek asked the tailor shop owner about the rent. The owner of the tailor shop said that he would pay 35 silver coins per month. And if he could live there for three months, he could pay one gold coin. But he could not damage the furniture in the building. The neighbor next to him heard someone talking in the yard, walked out of the house curiously, climbed up the ladder, and peered into the yard through the thick bushes. When he saw the tailor shop owner, he greeted him warmly. Epperson, you haven't been back for a while. And I thought you were going to sell the house here. Well, I haven't met a suitable buyer yet. These are my tenants. They are businessmen from Beta City and want to do some business in Doden Town. Maybe you can deal with them in the future. Epperson, the owner of the tailor shop, introduced it to his neighbors. The neighbor looked towards Serdak curiously, and Serdak raised his head. When he saw Serdak's face clearly, he was almost frightened and fell off the ladder into his yard. He finally managed to stabilize his body before saying H, low to Serdak with an embarrassed look. He couldn't figure out why the new commander of the garrison wanted to hide his identity in front of Epperson, the owner of the tailor's shop. Maybe he didn't want to make the matter of living here public. Soldak knew from the expression on the neighbor's face that he recognized him. Seeing that he didn't tell the tailor shop owner, he probably had some concerns. That's it. With that said, Soldak took out four gold coins from his money bag and handed them to Epperson, the owner of the tailor's shop, and said, Let's stay here for a while and take a look. But you have to clear the backyard before tonight. Get rid of the debris. I don't want to see that garbage when we move here tomorrow. Epperson, the owner of the tailor's shop, tightened his grip on the heavy gold coins in his hand. His eyebrows widened with a smile. And he said repeatedly, I'll find someone to move it out right away. 
you can take advantage of this afternoon to tidy up the things in the house. Except for the basic bed and wardrobe curtains. Don't leave anything behind. In addition, we will move in tomorrow. Saldak finished. Then led Selina and others out of the yard. The neighbor next door craned his neck to see Soldak and his party walking away. He asked the tailor shop owner with an exaggerated expression on his face. Epson, do you think you don't even know who he is? Did you rent the house to him? Chapter 717 Strong Weru and Gulitam led a group of cavalry from Doden Town to patrol the border of the occupied area in the northern area of Doden Canyon and did not return through the northern city wall until sunset. For a whole afternoon, they almost walked the entire border line that Duodan Town was responsible for. The ogre Gulitam hunted a huge Northland human bear in the forest. This human bear stood on two legs, almost half a head taller than the three-meter-tall Gulitam. The moon pattern is clearly visible. It is said that on nights when there is a crescent moon, this kind of northern man-bear can draw a steady stream of strength from the moonlight. So it usually stays up during the day and comes out at night. I don't know what method the ogre used to find it out of the hole. And with the help of Andrew, he killed such a second-level monster. The ogre cut off the man-bear's head. Although it looked a little bloody, he happily put it on his head and prepared to use the man-bear head to make a hat. The boreal bear rarely emerges from its burrow during the day. Serdak stood at the door of the small building, holding on to the wooden railing with both hands, and asked the ogre in confusion. Gilladam, how did you find such a big Northland bear? The ogre dropped the one-ton Northlander bear on his shoulders, and the ground made a dull sound. He sat down on the body of the northern bear, took off the bear's head on his head, and said happily, It probably smelled our scent and crawled out of the hole on its own. I was without doing anything. I saw it sticking its head out of a tree hole, trying to bite a war horse. Of course, I can't easily let go of this kind of man bear who wants to eat our war horse without even saying age, lo. Then let's take Andrew and fight together. It couldn't defeat the two of us, and it wanted to run. I blocked the entrance of the hole, and it could only wander around in the forest. Finally, Andrew chopped off its head with an axe. The ogre vividly recounted the battle. Seems to be still immersed in this kind of fun. Covered in blood, Andrew jumped off his horse and asked one of his cavalrymen to carry two buckets of water and pour them down to wash away some of the blood on the earth shield magic pattern structure. He wiped it off his face. He shook his wet hair again before walking to the small building and sitting on the wooden steps dripping wet. When the ogre Gilladam saw Andrew coming, he couldn't wait to move the Northlander bear to the canteen, preparing to skin and eat the meat himself. Andrew sat down and said to Soldek, We arrived at the border. The border there was very blurry. Many of the boundary stone writings had been damaged. Moreover, we also discovered some indigenous tribes who were preparing to migrate south. When they saw us appearing, they immediately got into the forest. They are quite hostile to us. They probably can't pass through the Duodan Canyon. If they don't take a detour, they will try to climb over this mountain. Serdak nodded. He knew that the territory of the Bena people in the Belan Plain was very concentrated. And at the same time, it was not very large. The large and small lords of Bena province have always wanted to develop more land on the Belan Plain. But the northern border of the occupied area has been unable to advance northward. It is not only the Invercarville Warcraft Forest that blocks the Legion. A larger part of the reason for the expansion is that the Legion needs to further squeeze the living space of the natives of the White Forest Plain. Although these natives cannot compete with the regular army, they will always cause some damage to the border drawn by the Bena army by virtue of their familiarity with the surrounding environment and terrain. This directly led to the formation of an irreparable rift between the local indigenous people and the Bena army. Therefore, even if the Beast Tide was approaching, the indigenous tribes had no intention of taking advantage of Duodan Town and taking the Duodan Canyon to avoid disaster, probably because of the deep hatred between the Bena people and the local indigenous tribes. Mayor Marco privately supported the slave traders in hunting the adult men and women of the indigenous tribes, so he never caused any big trouble. Otherwise, it would be harmful to Marco Town. The mailbox of the Bena Provincial House of Representatives has probably been piled up with long reports. Andrew added, Gulitam and I also went to the forest outside the border. The little beasts in the forest became very violent. Many beasts that had not reached estrus began to mate. And some herbivores also began to mate. Becoming extremely aggressive. Their bodies seemed to be infected with some kind of power. Really? Serdak knew that there would be no such second-level monsters in the nearby forest. Soldek said. Could these beasts be affected by high-level warcraft? It is said that on the eve of the beast tide, 
Traces of high-level Warcraft will appear in the Invercargill Warcraft Forest. The guard at the gate of the military camp quickly walked over, stood at the door of the small building, saluted Soldak and Andrew, and then reported, Sir, there is a local aboriginal who has been standing at the gate of the military camp for a long time and wants to see you. Soldak and Andrew looked at each other and said, Let him in. The guard at the door turned around and returned, and soon brought on San, a native of the town, to Serdak. Commander, please accept Ong San's most sincere thanks. Ong San's body was almost lying on the ground, which may be the etiquette of their aborigines. The posture was very strange. He was not kneeling. One of his legs was stretched back. His body was almost completely on the ground, and his hands seemed to be touching Serdak's boots. Serdak didn't want anyone to hold his feet, especially when the person in front of him was a middle-aged man. He motioned Ong San to stand up and speak and asked him, didn't you lead Mayor Marco to find the bandit group? How are things going over there? Ong San stood up respectfully and replied to Serdek. We successfully found the remains of the bandit group and found the stolen goods on them, confirming that they were the bandits who robbed the slave-catching group. We were cleared of guilt, and I was released without charge. The mayor is going to these remains were transported back to Doden Town, and it is said that the corpses of these robbers are being sent to the Adventure Guild. It seems that the Adventure Union and the Traders Group need to pay some price to appease Mayor Marco's anger. Soldak turned to Andrew and said. Andrew showed disdain on his face, as if he didn't want to comment on the mayor. He seemed to have a very bad impression of him. Serdak told Ansan. In the future, you must abide by the return time and always climb the city wall to enter the city. For the city defenders, this kind of thing is not a big deal. Ansan immediately agreed. Not only me, but also the collectors in Doden Town will definitely take a warning from now on. Hearing Ong San claim to be a collector, Serdak remembered his identity and asked him, By the way, Ong San, since you are the most famous collector in the town, what about you? You must be familiar with the Warcraft Forest? Ong San replied, I collect various herbs and precious mushrooms there all year round. Although I dare not go deep into the Warcraft Forest, no one on the edge of the forest is more familiar with this forest than me. I also know the territory of some high-level Warcraft. The range allows us to find some gaps at the edge of their territory and go deeper into the forest. That silverleaf grass is what I took the risk to bring back from the depths of the forest. Serdek rubbed his brow and asked Ong San. How is the current situation over there in the Warcraft forest? Ong San frowned and said. The forest is relatively chaotic at the moment. Originally, even some high-level monsters living on the edge of the forest had their own territories. But now more monsters are coming out of the depths of the forest. They began to invade the area at the edge of the forest. And now in the Warcraft forest, there are Warcraft fighting every moment. He glanced at Soldek, feeling a little hesitant in his heart. He lowered his head and thought for a moment before deciding to tell what he knew. Lord Commander, I know what you want to know. At that time, I was the youngest collector in the town. I experienced that beast tide. Many omens in the Warcraft forest now are very similar to those ten years ago. But I'm afraid this state, it will continue for some time. The beasts in the edge area of the Warcraft forest alone cannot form a beast tide at all. It will have to wait for the low-level Warcraft living in the depths of the forest to be driven out by the high-level Warcraft before a beast tide will form. Now it is far away. It didn't scale. Hearing Ansan say this, Serdak felt a little relieved. Finally, the beast wave broke out just after arriving in Doden Town. Afterwards, Serdak said to Ong San, After this beast wave, I plan to go to Invercargill Monster Forest. I haven't found a suitable guide yet. I wonder if you are willing to lead us. Ready to serve you. Ong San puffed up his chest and agreed readily. In the early morning, Serdak was still sleeping in bed, and a meter of sunlight shone into the room through the gap in the curtains. Selina got up from bed early, placed the prepared breakfast on the dining table, and took Zigna and Nika to the store in the town to purchase daily necessities. After Soldak woke up, he got up from the bed and ate a piece of fried bear steak. Then he put on a standard heavy armor and rode out of the military camp. Samira and Gulitam had already led a group of cavalry to leave the military camp. When Serdak walked out of the camp, he happened to see the tail of the cavalry team passing through the doorway of the city wall. I saw some aboriginal people on the road. Those aboriginal people retreated to both sides of the street. Although they lowered their heads, they still looked at Soldak secretly. It seems that what happened in the town square yesterday has spread, and his actions seem to have won some goodwill from some local aborigines. 
although many of the looks directed at him are still deeply wary. At least these looks also show show some kindness. When passing by the trading house in the town, I saw a fleet of four-wheeled carriages parked at the door. The guys in the trading house were loading supplies into the cars. It seemed that this trading house was going to make a big move. I don't know what kind of agreement Mayor Marco reached with the boss behind the trading house last night. Serdak rode to the town hall of Doden Town. With only the full heavy armor of the guard battalion knight on his body, the guard at the door of the hall immediately stood up straight and performed a military salute to him. After jumping off the horse, the guard on the side quickly took the horse's rein from Soldak's hand and led it to the stable on the side of the town hall yard. Serdak didn't say anything and walked directly up the steps into the lobby on the first floor. Standing in front of the reception desk was a young lady. Her eyes fell on the noble badge on Serdak's chest and she stood up immediately. Before she could ask, Serdak climbed directly up the stairs and climbed to the second floor with a dong 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 sound. When passing through the corridor on the second floor, some officials in the town looked at Soldak in surprise. But no one greeted him. Soldak asked a clerk about Mayor Marco's office, and then walked directly to the innermost side of the corridor, pushing open the wooden door of the mayor's office. The secretary, Mrs. Luna, sat at her desk in surprise and looked up at Soldak. This kind of office has an inner and outer closet, and Mrs. Luna sits at the desk in the outer room. Is Mayor Marco here? Serdak asked. Mrs. Luna originally wanted to say, the mayor hasn't come yet, but when she saw Soldak's eyes that could almost penetrate people's hearts, she trembled slightly in her heart and replied, Commander Serdak, you have not made an appointment in advance. Do you want me to make an appointment for you? The mayor is preparing to meet with guests. After saying that, she quickly lowered her head and opened the parchment notebook. Serdak said directly, I don't plan to take up too much of Mayor Marco's time. It only takes three minutes, and it won't affect his appointment. After saying that, there was no need for Mrs. Luna to go inside to ask Mayor Marco for instructions. She walked over and opened the door in the back room. Mayor Marco was sitting at his desk, holding a young and beautiful female clerk in his arms, with both hands already inserted into the female clerk shirt. Mayor. Mrs. Luna caught up with Serdak and shouted into the room with an embarrassed and mournful face. Serdak stood at the door and looked at Mayor Marco expressionlessly. Mayor Marco was able to keep his composure. He even calmly arranged the shirt and skirt for the female clerk, then patted the female clerk's butt and asked her to leave. His cheeks and neck were all red, and he ran out of the door. Mayor Marco sat up straight and ordered Mrs. Luna calmly. Miss Luna, please ask Commander Soldak to come in and make us a cup of black tea. As if nothing had happened just now, he asked Serdak. Commander Serdak, what brings you to my place? Soldak walked into the mayor's office and looked at the chair in front of the desk with disgust. Instead of sitting down, he looked around the room casually and then said to Mayor Marco, I'm here to remind the mayor that the command of the city defense team is under the unified jurisdiction of the garrison camp. When I handed over the defense of Duodan Town with Deputy Commander Maynard, there was no handover about the city defense. The command of the guard. I think the command of the guard is probably in your hands. So I will come over and hand it over to you. The mayor. The door to the mayor's office was not closed. And Mrs. Luna stood at the door holding a tea tray. Looking at Soldak in shock. There were several town officials passing by the door in the corridor. When they passed the mayor's office. They saw Mayor Marco's face flushed. He was so angry that the hand holding the pen was shaking. He quickly walked a few steps away and moved away. This is a place of right and wrong. Chapter 718 Business Group Mayor Marco is used to being strong in the town. He always speaks his mind in the town hall. And few people dare to be so rude to him. Especially the commander of the Langdon Legion Cavalry Battalion. He has never had any conflict with Mayor Marco since he came to Doden Town. Therefore, Mayor Marco feels that all the Cavalry Battalion commanders in the Legion are so easy to talk to. Usually in Duodan Town. They usually patrol the border and attack the indigenous tribes along the border. As a local dignitary who has taken root in Doden Town and is the town's top governor, Mayor Marco did not take the new cavalry battalion commander of the Luther Army in his eyes from the beginning. He was used to I thought that Soldak, like the commander of the Langdon Legion Cavalry Battalion, would keep a low profile in front of the local government. After all, Mayor Marco also had to make financial allocations to the cavalry battalion from the town to ensure the daily expenses of the cavalry regiment. Perhaps because of this, the commander of the Langdon Legion Cavalry Battalion has always seemed to have no confidence in front of Mayor Marco. 
and even handed over the military power of the city, Defense Guard to the town for management. Now Soldek suddenly stood up and asked Mayor Marco for the military power of the city Defense Guard. According to normal procedures, this is understandable. Even if the lawsuit is brought to the Wilk City Council, no one will accuse Soldek. Duck. On the contrary, Mayor Marco will inevitably be asked by the council to report on his duties in Wilk City. A round trip from Doden Town to Wilk City will take more than half a month if the horseback riding goes smoothly. And Mayor Marco knows that the congressman behind him will not stand because of such an unreasonable trivial matter. If you come out to speak for him, people may think that he is ignorant and extend his hand to the army. Although he could usually gain a lot of benefits by controlling the city defense team. And it would be extremely convenient for the slave-catching groups he secretly supported to enter and exit the town. But now, he had no reason to hold the city defense team in his hands. What are you doing standing at the door? You're so slow to make two cups of tea. Mayor Marco, who had nowhere to vent his anger, scolded Mrs. Luna, who was holding a tea tray and standing at the door unable to move forward or retreat. Mrs. Luna quickly lowered her head and placed two cups of black tea on the coffee table in the rest area. Mayor Marco was a little calmer at this time. Although he was destined to hand over the military power of the city defense brigade, he did not want to be obtained by Soldak so easily. Thinking of this, the anger and depression in Mayor Marco's heart were relieved a lot. He motioned for Serdak to sit down and said calmly, I will go to the city defense guards later to conduct a material inventory and check the personnel list of the city defense guards brigade. From now on, the city defense guards brigade will have to be managed by Commander Rayo Soldak. They are usually responsible for guarding the northern city wall of Doden Town. This is the north gate of our occupation area of the Belan Plain. And the north wall of Duodan Town that can be defended is crucial to the situation in the Belan Plain. The city defense guard in Duodan Town has always been under the jurisdiction of the town. The main reason is that we don't want to separate finance and government affairs. Since you want to take back the military power of the city defense guard, that would be perfect. However, the finance here in the town has always been reluctant. Maintenance. It would be great to be able to get rid of such a big burden of the city defense guards. Of course, Mayor Marco is not willing to pay another penny for the city defense brigade. Soldak will allocate part of the supplies from the garrison to the city defense brigade. Now that I think about it, this is probably the commander of the Langdon Corps. The main reason why officials were reluctant to take over the city defense brigade. Serdak did not want to hand over the management of the north gate of Duodan town to others. So he said, then I will go back to the military camp and wait for news from you. If you are ready, you can send someone to find me at the military camp at any time. After saying that, he turned around and left the mayor's office without drinking the steaming cup of black tea. Mayor Marco stood in front of the window, watching Soldak stride out of the town hall, mount an ancient bolai horse, and walk slowly out of the long street. He could no longer suppress the anger in his heart, and he was so angry that he threw away the teacup in his hand. It hit the oak floor hard. Yesterday, Serdak ran to the town square and stopped Mayor Marco from being executed in a very strong manner, which greatly reduced his prestige in front of the town residents. Today, he came to the town hall again and directly asked for the military power of the city defense brigade. He didn't care at all how ugly Mayor Marco looked at that time. This scene happened to be seen by several town officials passing by the mayor's office. Before noon, the news that such a powerful garrison commander came to the town quickly spread in the town hall. Mayor Marco was unwilling to hand over power and went directly to the city defense brigade to arrange backup. Nowadays, several important positions in the city defense brigade are almost all close associates of Mayor Marco. The material warehouse of the city defense brigade is like Mayor Marco's private warehouse. For the convenience of storage and withdrawal, the slave traders under Mayor Marco would store the materials they snatched from the forest in this warehouse. These include some shady adventure group armors and weapons and of course more Warcraft materials. Except for the plain native slaves. There is almost everything in the warehouse. Most of which are valuable things. These are Mayor Marco has accumulated a fortune in Doden Town in the past few years. At this time, we need to quickly count them out. Mayor Marco does not want to give all the belongings he has saved so hard over the years to Serdak in vain. Hans, the captain of the city defense brigade, was personally promoted by Mayor Marco Hans's biological sister, was the third wife of Mayor Marco. Among the many wives and brothers of Mayor Marco, Hans was regarded as the most important, the most outstanding one, who had at least become a knight and had some military talent, 
was promoted by Mayor Marco to the position of captain of the City Defense Brigade. Captain Hans did not expect that Commander Soldak, who seemed to have no temper, would take back the military power of the City Defense Brigade without saying a word. Mayor Marco was sitting in the office of the City Defense Brigade, with Captain Hans standing aside with his hands hanging down. Mayor Marco said, Ask your clerk, who is responsible for registering the warehouse material accounts to make a new account. We must transfer these materials before handing over the City Defense Brigade. Besides these, what else should we do? Captain Hans asked cautiously. Mayor Marco rubbed his brows with his hands, turned to look at the warehouse under the city wall, and said, I arranged a team of four-wheel trucks, found some trustworthy people, and used these knights to transport these things out overnight. All the supplies? Captain Hans asked. Mayor Marco said matter-of-factly. Of course it's all. Just don't forget to balance the accounts. When he thought that the large amount of war reserves in the warehouse would be transported away by Mayor Marco. Captain Hans panicked and quickly walked to Mayor Marco and asked in a low voice, Then what should I do in the future? What Mayor Marco hates most about Hans is that it's hard to stay calm when things happen. He said in a deep voice, What else can you do? Of course you have to keep your tail between your legs and don't let people find excuses to take you out of the city defense brigade. As long as you can control the third leg and don't make any major mistakes in the management of the city defense brigade, I still I can protect you. At this time, there was a knock on the door. Captain Han said in a deep voice, Come in. The guard stood at the door and reported, The tax collector would like to see the mayor. Let him in. Mayor Marco sat behind his desk and ordered calmly, Soldak is not in a hurry to take back the management rights of the city defense brigade on this day. After leaving the town hall, he was not in a hurry to find Selena. They were going to purchase daily necessities in the town and they probably wouldn't be able to finish all the things so quickly. Soldak wanted to check information about Invercargill's Warcraft Forest and the Beast Tide. There was no library in the town, but he found a magic grocery store. The grocery store was not big, but through the only glass window. He could see the bookshelves inside, which contained a row of ancient books. It can't be some precious magic book. Serdak just wanted to learn about some of the higher-level monsters lurking deep in the Invercargill Monster Forest through some local travel notes and gossip. Walking into the grocery store, there was an old man sitting at the counter at the entrance of the store who was copying the magic scroll patterns. In the corner of the grocery store against the wall and window, there were less than half a bookshelf of books. In addition, this there are also some magic scrolls, metal room plates, magic ink and magic engraving pens in the bookstore. When Soldak walked into the grocery store, the store owner did not greet him and allowed him to walk around the store casually, standing next to the bookshelf. Serdak found a biography of a ranger and flipped through a few pages. Most of the pages were about how many heads of high-level monsters and beautiful girls the ranger captured during his travels around the world. Heart. It took a lot of effort to find the chapter about the Invercargill Warcraft Forest. Unfortunately, the ranger did not seem to record this Warcraft Forest in a large space. He only said that he chased a ghost leopard into the depths of the forest and found it deep in the forest. Hippogriff's lair. He wanted to steal a hippogriff egg. But unfortunately, he was discovered by the alert Hippogriff. He escaped from the Invercargill Warcraft Forest with the Hippogriff chasing him. Soldak did not expect that there would be such a third-level flying monster in the Invercargill Warcraft Forest. But there is no trace of the Hippogriff in Bina Province. This rare monster is likely to be found in the Invercargill Warcraft Forest. Bien is also extinct. When it was almost noon, Soldak ran to the rental house and had lunch with Selina, Zigna and Nika at a small restaurant on the street. Selina said that she told Soldak during dinner. The owner of the tailor shop should have known that the garrison commander rented his small building. In the morning, he personally ran to the small building holding two exquisite vases and asked her openly and secretly. Selina offered to have the rent. But Selina refused. Serdak rubbed his nose and said self-deprecatingly to Selina. Why do you think he thinks I am the kind of person who can't pay the rent? No matter what, I am at least a noble lord with a private army. Selina covered her mouth and laughed and said, it's not like you noble lords are used to exploiting the small town residents. If they don't come over and actively give some gifts, you big shots will cause trouble for them. This restaurant was very small, and there were not many customers even at noon. So Selina dared to mock Soldak so brazenly. When she was a girl, she was a maid at whole manor and knew a lot of dirty things among nobles. There were bursts of horse bells outside the window, and four-wheeled carriages made it squeaking sound as they passed by. Only when these four-wheeled carriages are heavily loaded will the lubricating oil on the bearings lose their effectiveness and emit a 
squeaking sound. This harsh sound. Serdak couldn't help but look out the window. Four wheeled carriages passed by one after another on the street. Almost all of them loaded with goods. He remembered that these carriages were parked at the trading house in the morning. But he did not expect that they were already loaded with goods and were preparing to leave Doden Town. Recently, the adventure group has been unable to enter the Invercardville world of Warcraft Forest to hunt. But the trading group can still collect so many supplies. After waiting for a while, the motorcade passed by one after another. You don't need to guess. Probably to avoid unnecessary losses. The business bank is transferring materials. Of course, it is unknown whether this was affected by the bandit group's robbery of the slave-catching group incident. But before the convoy left Soldak's site, a group of guards wearing hard leather armor hurriedly chased after them. They held fine spears in their hands and quickly surrounded the convoy. Live. The convoy of the merchant group was forced to stop. And the coachman did not panic much. They just parked the four-wheeled carriage slowly on the street and accepted inspection by the guards. An armed group wearing leather suits. Alloy bows and long swords. Led by two knights. Rushed here quickly. The two sides faced off almost without saying a word. Although the atmosphere was a bit tense. It could be seen that neither side was ready to take action. Soldak and Selina sat near the window of the small restaurant. Just enough to watch the excitement. Some small town residents passing by on the street also stopped and stood on the street to watch curiously. A series of hoofbeats sounded in the distance. And Captain Hans of the City Defense Brigade was seen riding an ancient horse to the scene. Before he could dismount, a person in charge of the convoy came out of the convoy in gorgeous clothes. He frowned and looked up at Captain Hans. Across the glass window, there was still a considerable distance to the other side. And Soldak couldn't hear what they were talking about. The caravan leader and Captain Hans didn't talk for long before a group of city guards began to search the four-wheeled trucks. Some supplies on the trucks were also unloaded from the carriages and unpacked for inspection. The city defense guards left the street in a mess and left the street under the leadership of Captain Hans. Chapter 7 19 Magic Enlightenment The convoy of the trading company was parked on the roadside and the goods were scattered all over the floor. The person in charge of the trading company kept pestering Captain Hans. The two seemed to have some disputes. Captain Hans stood in the street. And he opened his hands. Putting on a posture ready to take action. A group of city guards immediately gathered around him. Pointing their spears at the mercenary soldiers and the armed group in front of them. As soon as the mercenaries of the commercial bank armed group gathered together. Their faces were a little nervous. But they did not give in. The streets were lined with onlookers. Some even whistling and encouraging. Let's go and see the cabin you decorated. Soldek said. Okay, Selina said. Soldak drank the last bit of tea in the cup and threw three silver coins to the waiter aside, indicating that the extra change would be considered his tip. The waiter quickly and diligently sent several people to the door. Aren't you worried that they will fight? A street fight of this scale would probably require the dispatch of garrison troops. Selina looked back and asked Soldak. Serdak waved his hand and said, Don't worry. I'll fight early. This restaurant is not far from the small rental building. Soldak walked into the yard and saw that the lawn in the yard had been mowed again, and new grass had been planted in some exposed areas. He walked into the house. Here, the furniture such as the sofa in the living room on the first floor was left by the tailor shop owner. Selina didn't make many changes. Just replaced the carpet with a new one. There was a brand new silver tea set on the table. He sat on the sofa and saw Nika standing in the corner of the living room with some restraint. So he waved to him. Nika! Come here, Serdak said. Nika was startled when she heard Soldak calling her. She raised her head and saw Soldak looking at her, and quickly walked to Soldak, looking at the overly thin girl in front of him. Soldak asked her to sit down on the sofa opposite him. Being able to work as a maid in Baring Goss's manner, Nika's face is still very delicate, and her body is very agile. Sitting down, she looks like a weak kitten, staring at Soldak nervously, but not dare to keep looking into his eyes. Serdak took out a metal rune plate and inlaid a magic crystal fragment on the gem base. Under the flow of magic on the magic rune plate, a little bit of moisture gathered together, and after a while, there was a drop of raindrops fell out of thin air. Nika, can you feel something special? Soldak asked Nick. Nika sat in front of Soldak and shook his head with a blank look on his face. Serdak let her feel it carefully for a while, and found that she was still confused but she was very curious about the water droplets falling out of thin air on the rune board. It seemed that she could not feel the magical atmosphere of the water element. Then he took out another magic scroll. Even if the scroll was not unfolded, 
Zerdak could feel the faint aura of fire element permeating it. What about this one? Can you feel the mysterious aura? Zerdak asked. Nika leaned over and looked at the magic scroll seriously, with a confused look on her face. She didn't know what Zerdak wanted her to see, so she could only shake her head slightly. Zerdak did not unfold the fire-gathering scroll, but just put the scroll back into the magic belt bag. Nika saw that Zerdak was a little disappointed, with some panic on his face. Zerdak patted her head and comforted her. It's okay. I will find a magic teacher for you and Zygna. You can try to do some magic enlightenment first, such as learning some spells and runes, meditation, etc. I think you all have some talents in magic. You have to have confidence in yourself. But don't put too much pressure on yourself. Signa sat aside curiously, staring at Soldak with her big eyes. Nika looked at Signa, who was several years younger than her, and thought to herself, if I believe what Baron Soldak said, then I will really be a fool. Is this really comparable? One is a daughter, and the other is a maid. If she always disappoints the Baron, she might have to face the same hard life as before. Her face turned a little pale, looking down at his flat and thin body. He probably couldn't please the Baron. Then she must be what the Baron wants. Thinking of this, she secretly clenched her fists. There is no need to find another magic initiation teacher. Let Magic Celia Cooper be our initiation teacher, Zygna suggested in a childish voice. When Soldak heard what Zygna said, he suddenly remembered that Cigna would look through his magic notebook several times when he came to see Selina. So you have met Celia Cooper, Soldak said. Cigna stared at Soldak with her big innocent eyes and said to him, I have not turned over that magic notebook once or twice. Once I accidentally turned to the last page. It was with Celia. Magic Cooper chatted for a while. Seeing her speaking in an adult tone, Soldak reached out his hand and pinched her soft face affectionately and said, of course it's best if you know each other. I'll introduce it to you if it saves you time. After saying that, Zerdak stood up and pulled up the curtains to block the sunlight outside, and then took out the magic notes from the magic pocket. Selina was busy in the kitchen for a while, then brought out a plate of washed plums and cranberries, and then went to the second floor with a basin of water to wipe the floor. Nika hesitated whether to go over and help. Zerdak turned the magic notebook to the last page and a three-dimensional picture appeared on this page of the magic notebook. Celia Cooper was sitting leisurely on the chair behind the railing, looking intently at the magic pattern frame constructed in front of her. She looked like a scholar when wearing glasses. Seeing that the middle-aged woman in the picture could move her fingers at will, Nika was surprised and subconsciously covered her mouth. At this moment, she was filled with fear, fearing that she would be trapped in this magic notebook like the woman in the painting. She couldn't help but glance at Soldek secretly, and saw that he didn't want to do anything to her, which made her feel a little more at ease. Just when she was suspicious, the dignified middle-aged woman in the magic notebook suddenly raised her head and glanced at her, startling her. Long time no see. Baron Soldak. Miss Cigna. Celia Cooper put away the magic framework in her hand and said to Soldak and Cigna through the railing. Soldak greeted her and said, How are you doing? Celia Cooper the magician. Fortunately, I just can't feel the passage of time when I stay here. It's a bit boring. Celia Cooper left her chair and stood in front of the railing. This way her face on the page could be seen more clearly. And she was surveying the room. You have been staying here. And you are indeed a little lonely. Soldek said. Celia Cooper said indifferently. So recently I have been thinking about the meaning of life. I feel that I have been pursuing the true meaning of space magic all my life. But now I can't arouse the slightest interest. Faced with these, I don't even want to take a second look at the boring magic structure. Maybe it's because of my change in identity. But now I think necromancy is very interesting. Soldek looked stunned. He didn't expect that Celia Cooper, a black magician, would actually have some interest in necromancy. This may be a step forward on the path of a heretical magic scholar. However, she was hiding in the magic notebook and could not come into contact with any necromancy magic, which gave him some peace of mind. Well, you have really changed a lot recently, Soldek said while rubbing his nose. Why do you have time to chat with me today? Celia Cooper asked Soldek with her hands folded under her neck. Soldek took the opportunity to get between the two girls Zygna and Nika, put his hands on their shoulders, and said to Celia Cooper, I want Zygna and Nika to learn something from you. Magical enlightenment knowledge. Celia Cooper looked at Zygna in astonishment and murmured, Zygna? Do you think she has it? At this point, Celia Cooper paused when she realized something, and then said again, I mean they are interested in learning basic magic knowledge? 
Serdak made a positive expression and nodded at the same time. Although Celia Cooper's expression was a little weird. She agreed readily. Of course. If they are willing. I still have some knowledge that I can teach them before they participate in the magic awakening ceremony. In that case, that's the best. Soldek found that Celia Cooper was quite easy to talk to except for her slightly weird temper. So he asked Celia Cooper. Their magical enlightenment will be left to you. Zygda behaved very well at this time. Sitting next to Soldek. Her big black grape-like eyes narrowed into two crescents. Soldek left Zygna and Nika in the living room while he climbed the stairs to the second floor. There are two bedrooms on the second floor. Selena is kneeling on the floor, carefully wiping the oak board. The long woolen skirt clings tightly to her body, revealing her round and plump buttocks. Serdak also approaching. He stood at the top of the stairs and admired the seductive figure in front of him without saying a word. Selena could also feel someone behind her. She knew that person was Soldak. And she felt like being stared at from behind by him was like a fire igniting in her body. Soldak stood by the railing on the second floor, which was connected to the living room on the first floor. He looked down just enough to see Cigna communicating with Celia Cooper in the living room. The girl seemed very interested. But basically, it's all up to Cigna. Nika sat on the sofa like a wilted little quail. Selena moved closer to Soldak and glanced downstairs. You don't seem surprised at all? Soldak took the opportunity to hold Selena's soft waist. What are you surprised about? Selena asked doubtfully, and then glanced at the living room downstairs, and then asked Soldak, Do you want to stay for dinner? Are you going to stay here today? Soldak turned around and took a look inside the small building. It was pretty much decorated. Selena had even prepared tea sets and tableware. Selena snuggled into Soldak's arms and said to him, The room has been packed. It is always inconvenient for us to live in a military camp. Serdak tapped his forehead and thought for a moment before saying, Today Samira led a team to patrol the border. I'm going to the garrison camp to see if there are any accidents. I'm afraid I'll have to keep an eye on it in the military camp these days. A little bit. After all, Soldak did not stay for dinner. So he rode back to the military camp, passing by the door of the restaurant where we had lunch. It turned out that the carriage of the business group that was stopped there had already left. There were some unpacked garbage scattered on the street, rolling randomly in the wind. Chapter 720 Blocking the Door From a distance, I saw two soldiers from the city defense brigade waiting at the gate of the military camp. When Serdak rode through the gate of the military camp, the two city defense soldiers quickly gave a military salute to Serdak. Soldak grabbed the reins of the war horse, turned to them and asked, Are you waiting for me? The two soldiers from the city defense brigade showed embarrassed expressions on their faces and walked up to them and said, Yes, Commander Serdak. Serdak asked calmly, What do you want from me? The two soldiers from the city defense brigade seemed a little embarrassed to speak. They looked at each other and finally mustered up the courage to say, Sir Commander, the city defense brigade has encountered some troubles. Mayor Marco said that you are the commander of the city defense brigade, so I would like to ask you to deal with it. Serdak frowned. In the morning, Mayor Marco looked like he wanted to hold the city defense team in his hands and was unwilling to hand it over. Unexpectedly, now I can't wait to hand over the city defense team. Soldek asked in a deep voice. What happened over there? The two soldiers of the city defense brigade were even more embarrassed. They lowered their heads and said, The town trading house armed group blocked the door of the city defense brigade. The city defense team of a dignified town was actually blocked by the armed forces of a private business group. And they were unable to fight back. Serdak didn't know what to say. So he just said to the two soldiers, I know. I'll make arrangements and go there. Yes, commander. The two soldiers agreed and walked away in despair. Serdak rode into the military camp and casually asked the guard at the door, only to find out that the patrol led by Samira and Gulaitam had not returned yet. Probably the ogres had tasted the sweetness yesterday and wanted to try hunting today. Game in the woods. Dinner preparations have already begun in the military camp, and the smell of wheat scones wafts from the restaurant. More than two dozen aboriginal herdsmen were carefully brushing a group of ancient bullen horses next to the stables. Since they joined the cavalry camp, these horses have been carefully brushed almost every day, and they have to go outside the town every day to cut white stem glass grass and green hairy vines to feed these thousand war horses in the military camp, in addition to rushing to the pasture outside the town every day. They also have to prepare fodder for these war horses to eat at night. These fodder are grass mixed with some wheat bran and crushed beans. Only a war horse that eats refined food can gain weight. 
Ordinary Gubwa Lai horses cannot carry a heavy cavalry wearing a full set of heavy armor and a full set of weapons. They can barely carry it in time. But they are also unable to charge. This kind of heavy cavalry is really too much for Gu Bo Lai horses. It's heavy. Only ancient Bo Lai horses that have been specially bred and trained to gain weight can barely bear the weight of heavy cavalry. With these indigenous herdsmen, Soldak was saved many troubles that he had not considered before. Andrew had just finished training with the cavalry. He stood shirtless under the stone wall and took a shower with a group of cavalry. The sound of water, talking and laughter mixed together, and a group of men lined up, waiting to take a bath at the bathing wall. Seeing Soldak riding over, Andrew walked out from the bathing wall naked and put the earth shield magic pattern structure on his body again, without actually wearing any linen shirt underneath. Serdak was very speechless, feeling that no matter how precious this set of earth shield magic pattern structure was, he didn't want to take it back from Andrew and wear it on himself again. Go out with me! Serdak jumped off the horse and said to Andrew, who was shaking his wet hair. Andrew threw the towel to a cavalry squadron leader behind him and asked Soldak, Do you want to bring some people? Serdak asked him. You know? Andrew chuckled and walked side by side with Serdak. He put on an earth shield magic pattern structure and looked extraordinary. I heard from the locals that the trading group's armed group blocked the gate of the city defense brigade. And they also know some inside information. Andrew said. Serdak asked. What's the inside story? Andrew took the reins of the war horse from a cavalryman and followed Soldak out of the military camp. He said, I heard that the trading company's truck was intercepted by the city defense brigade at noon. And both sides it was very unpleasant. But the trading company did not find any problems after all. In the afternoon, when the convoy left Doden Town, the armed group of the trading company blocked the gate of the city defense brigade. I heard their reasons I want to collect a debt owed by the city defense brigade. Mayor Marco is really good-tempered. Soldak snorted. Andrew got on his horse and chased after Soldak and said, The owner of Doden Town Trading Company is not an ordinary person. It is said that his uncle is a member of the House of Representatives in Wilk City. He has a great status in Wilk City and has no good reputation. Judging from this, it is estimated that Mayor Marco would not dare to touch the business owner easily. Isn't that a reason to let private armed forces block the door? Serdak said angrily. Soldak and Andrew rushed to the City Defense Brigade. The city defense brigade is not far from the military camp and is built under the north city wall. Many warehouses in the city defense brigade are built directly in the holes of the city wall below. A group of mercenaries, more than a hundred of them, stood at the gate of the city defense brigade. They surrounded five four-wheel trucks at the gate of the city defense brigade. The mercenaries headed by them all had several magic pattern structures on their bodies, and they were imposing. Obviously suppressed a group of city defense soldiers inside the gate. Captain Hans was not even able to wear a piece of magic pattern structure on his body. He was protecting Mayor Marco and did not dare to rush forward and disperse the mercenaries of the trading firm's armed group. Mayor Marco stood at the front, pointing at the person in charge of the trading firm's armed team, and scolded him sternly. The person in charge of the trading house always kept a smile on his face, bowed his waist slightly, and explained something to Mayor Marco. Serdak and Andrew crossed a group of onlookers and walked in on horseback. Mayor Marco seemed to see some hope. But when he saw that Serdak was followed by less than 20 cavalry, his eyes were filled with tears. Disappointment. He was about to scold Soldak. But the words rolled around in his throat, and he did not say them out after all. Mayor Marco. I heard that you came to me to hand over the military power of the city defense brigade to me. Soldak jumped off his horse and asked Mayor Marco loudly. Mayor Marco coughed muffledly in front of so many city guards and armed mercenaries and said with a dark face, Hans, Commander Soldak will directly oversee the city defense brigade from now on. The town has handed over this right. From now on, you must obey Commander Soldak's orders. Then Mayor Marco pointed his finger at Hans and said to Soldak, Commander Soldak, Captain Hans is the captain of the city defense brigade. He is usually responsible for the specific affairs of the city defense brigade. If you have anything to do in the future, just give him instructions directly. Serdak nodded and said, Since I am temporarily taking over as the commander of the city defense brigade, I have the right to resolve the matter at the door. His eyes fell on the person in charge of the trading firm and asked him, So you are the person in charge of the armed group of the trading firm? Anthony has met Commander Serdak. The head of the trading firm kept his attitude extremely low. Serdak was not polite and said directly to him, Why are your men surrounding the gate of the city defense brigade? 
according to the Green Empire Army Public Security Regulations. You armed groups have threatened the security of Doden Town. I can bring someone to arrest you and punish you for this dangerous behavior. The person in charge of the trading house spread his hands and said with an aggrieved look, Commander Serdak, your city defense brigade owes our trading house a batch of war preparation supplies. This is not a security incident, but it's an economic dispute and we didn't do anything wrong. As he spoke, he handed a parchment account in his hand to Soldak and said, Here is the account list. Captain Hans purchased a batch of materials from the trading company. Mayor Marco came forward to guarantee it and promised us to repay it in batches within one year. Now that the deadline has expired, the trading company is currently so far. Not a single gold coin has been received. Soldak flipped through the account book casually, stared at Hans and asked, Captain Hans, can you explain to me what is going on? Hans quickly wiped the sweat from his forehead and said frankly to Soldak. At the beginning, the city defense brigade was short of supplies. We did purchase a batch of supplies from the trading house. But this was also the city defense brigade's war reserve. It's just that the money has never been repaid. So what's the list of combat supplies for the city defense brigade? Captain Hans, can you show it to me? Soldak turned to Hans and asked. Then he said to Anthony, the head of the trading house, since this bad debt has not been cleared up, we can sit together. Carefully check the accounts and let your people push these five four-wheeled trucks to the yard of the City Defense Brigade. If it is true that the City Defense Brigade owes this money, I will pay off the debt even if I send the bill to the Wilk City Military Headquarters.